Ladies and gentlemen, a 50 feet of rope, 20 feet of steel chain, sealed bandages over the eyes, ears, mouth, and other natural orifices. Would anyone care to examine the restraints? Of course not. Colonel? No, not necessary, thank you. As you wish. Are you quite comfortable, my dear? Then I shall conceal you from view. And we can begin. Friends, let us pray. The Madness of Colonel Warburton by Bert Cools with Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson and featuring Timothy West as Colonel Warburton, Eleanor Braun as Mrs. Bessmer, and Struan Roger as Mr. Bessmer. The Madness of Colonel Warburton. Welcome home, welcome home, welcome home. Oh, it's good to be back. Mm. Now, you had a bad journey. The train was late. No, no, the train wasn't late. You you had trouble getting a cab. Oh, not now, old man. Yes, yes, trouble with a cab, trouble with a cab, trouble with a cab. Holmes. And then you had to wait in line behind two, no, not two, three, three other men. Then you had to lift your own suitcase on board. Three other men, that's dreadful. (laughs) Holmes, show me your arm. And then lecture me, Doctor. I'm too good a move. You're far too good. Come here. <laughs> N- now. I'm cutting down. Are you indeed? Five percent solution. It's better than seven, surely. I thought you'd be pleased. So, my dear, how is everything? Now, James, I've already told you stop fussing. It couldn't be nicer. There's plenty to occupy you, then. Well, I'm never bored, if that's what you mean. There are so many people to talk to, and there's always someone who needs my help. Now, don't you go squandering your time on every lame dog, Elizabeth. I know what you're like. (laughs) Squandering my time? Don't be foolish, James. (laughs) Oh, uh, right. I suppose that's not really an issue. No, not really. (laughs) Pleased? Good God! Oh, what's the use? You've heard it all before. Well, that's true enough. Just as you've heard my reasons. Holmes, just because you don't have any work, you don't have to poison yourself with that filthy stuff. Yes, I do. My work is my oxygen. Take it away and I suffocate. I'm only alive and my, my, my brain has something to do. And you're seriously telling me that cocaine supplies that? If only I could make you see... T- the clarity, the, the the insight, the understanding. Without it, I, I can't live in your empty, everyday world, Doctor. It's, it's, it's like a prison. Wasn't there anything while I was away? Nothing of any interest. Um, sorry, Watson. Oh, here, I brought up the post. Uh, there might be something. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing. Uh, social invitation. Bill. Nothing, nothing. Ah. Oh, what have you got? Uh, hmm. Posted late last night in central London, but the writer lives out of town. A young man, well educated, with firm opinions on the matters important but not urgent. Because. Because if it were, he would have sent a telegram. Bravo, or, Watson. Mm-hmm. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Mm. <clears throat> well? Well, what? It's something important. Oh, yes. Then it could be a case. It certainly could. Well, then, for the love of heaven, open it. I can't do that. Why not, for pity's sake? It's addressed to you. Oh. (laughs) Here. Thank you. Mm. 
Oh, it's from Michael Warburton. A friend? A son of a friend. Well... An acquaintance? Yeah, my old CEO from the Berkshires, Colonel James Warburton. Retired now. This is about him. Something's wrong. So, everything's looking good, then? Good. Good doesn't begin to describe it, my dear. It's simply beautiful, James. Heaven is simply beautiful. Yes. Yes, I think you could say that something's wrong. So, Mr. Warburton. Lieutenant Warburton, Mr. Holmes. I followed my father into the regiment. Very good. Now, the facts, if you please. But surely you've seen my letter. If you please. Very well. My father is Colonel James Warburton. He's a soldier of great distinction, a man of intelligence and honour, and the holder of the Victoria Cross. He is also absolutely convinced that his late wife, my mother, is communicating with him from beyond the grave. Uh, a man's beliefs are his own affair, surely. Not if they affect the lives of other people, Mr. Holmes. On the advice of my dead mother, he... Go on, Lieutenant. On the advice of my dead mother, gentlemen, the old man's planning to give away everything he owns. To the regiment? <laughs> well, to some charity? No, Doctor, not to a charity. He's giving the whole lot to the couple who bring him the messages from his wife. Of course, I'm sure it's her. I ought to know my own wife, man. <laughs> yes, of course. Besides, some of the things she says, no one else could possibly know them. Everyone here says the same thing. Uh, yes, I know. But even so, I, I, I mean, it goes against all reason. You still have doubts, Sir Robert. Mrs. Bespar. Uh, you still have doubts, but you were open-minded enough to come. Mm. The uh, colonel here was very uh, persuasive. Uh, we meet again on Saturday, Sir Robert. Come with an open mind and a clear heart, and there could well be a message for you. For me? We all have friends in the land of mist, Sir Robert. Companions, colleagues, loved ones. Will you come? <laughs> Yes. Yes, I will. Does your mother actually appear at these seances? My mother is dead, sir. Well, then does someone purporting to be your mother appear? No. As I understand it, there's just a voice in the darkness. Uh, who is the medium? Her name is Mrs. Besmer. It's her husband who runs things, that's all I know. And you desire me to demonstrate to the Colonel that these uh, Besmers are frauds and the message is fake? Exactly so. Hmm. Do you have any proof? Proof? I don't need proof. Good God, surely you're not suggesting that this business could be genuine. I have no data. Until I do, I prefer to keep an open mind. An open mind? The scientific approach. It's my way. Oh, for heaven's sake, Holmes. Well, sir, it may be your way, but it isn't mine. Look, my father is besotted with the Besmers. He insists on singing their praises to anyone who'll listen. His old friends, my friends. Dr. Watson, you understand what I'm saying. Yes, I'm afraid I do. The Colonel is making himself a laughingstock. Exactly. And you with him? I'm not denied. But it's him I'm thinking of. His reputation, his good name. And beyond that, the honour of the regiment itself is at stake. I can't just stand by and let it happen. I see. So if you can't help me, Mr Holmes, I'll find someone else to snap him out of this insanity. Insanity? You think the Colonel's actually lost his mind? <laughs> I wish I did think that. What do you mean? If he were mad certifiably mad, then he couldn't be held responsible for his actions. And if there's no accountability, there's no shame, no disgrace? Exactly. <laughs> the military mind. Fascinating. Ah. What's the matter? I believe we're about to experience a visitation of our own. Won't you come in, Colonel? It's a little unfriendly to converse across the room, though I understand you're accustomed to somewhat greater distances. I am Sherlock Holmes. You might recall my associate, Dr. Watson. I know who you are. What has my son been telling you? Father... Be silent, sir. You've no idea what you're dealing with. Mr. Holmes, has my son actually engaged you professionally? He's inquired after my services. I've given him no answer, as yet. Excellent. Then we can consider the matter closed. I think not. I beg your pardon. Lieutenant, I'll give you my decision in the morning. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. I'm not accustomed to being treated in this manner. And now, good day to you both. Watson. Yes, uh, this way, please, gentlemen. Dr. Watson, Mr. Holmes. 
Father, are you coming? The Colonel? Very well. Mr. Holmes, this affair has implications beyond your understanding. I suggest that you keep your meddling nose out of matters which do not concern you. Good day. Well, well, well. You were insufferably rude. Yes, it's a useful technique sometimes. Well, what do you think? Well, he's not mad. Just gullible. And you've made up your mind on the case. But, Holmes, the dead don't return in order to offer financial advice. Mm, perhaps not. We'll see. Yes, sir? It's all right, Rose. I'll deal with this. Of course, sir. Uh, can I help you? Uh, Mr. Besma, is it? Maybe. Who wants to know? Uh, Collins, Jonathan Collins. Uh, perhaps I have the wrong house. Well, that depends, Mr. Collins. Well, I was told uh, that you can put me in touch with someone. Who told you? A client. Uh, oh, I, I work at one of the city banks. Perhaps if I give you my card? Oh, thank you. A small establishment, but select. Perhaps you've heard of us. I have indeed. Please, come inside. My wife is a wonderful woman, Mr. Collins. A wonderful woman who's been blessed with a wonderful gift. Well, so I've been given to understand, yes. Who is it you have in spirit? Uh, beg pardon? Who is it who's passed through the veil? Your own wife, perhaps? A, a parent? Oh, I see. It's my sister, sir. Beatrice, taken from me by illness. Oh, it must have been a terrible blow. <sighs> Unendurable, Mr. Besmer. I wasn't present at, at, at the passing, you see. She called out for me, but I wasn't there. Oh, distressing. She wanted to say something to me. A, a message? Well, I can only suppose so, but I wasn't there. He's eating me up, Mr Besma. What was the message? What could it have been? I have to know. Can you help me? Tell me you can help me. We can help you. Huh? Uh, this is my wife. Uh, have no more fear, Mr Collins. You've come to the right place. Well, what happened then? <clears throat> it was all disappointingly down to earth. Hmm. For a trifling donation of 40 guineas. How much? Yeah, I'm invited to the next seance. 8 for 8.30. So the medium is secured. We can begin. If you'll take your places. Yes, of course. <sighs> there were six of us altogether, not including the Besmers. Was the colonel there? Oh, yes. Did he recognize you? Please, Watson. Oh, sorry. Now, as you all know, we have two new members of the circle with us tonight. Yes. Mr. Collins here has recently lost his sister to the spirit world. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. You're very kind. And Mrs. Fryer grieves for her daughter. Jane. Janie. No, you, no, you mustn't grieve, Margaret. Uh, she's not taken from you. She's just moved on. That's all. You'll see. Yes. Yes. Thank yes. you, Colonel. Thank you all. They come, as you all have come, in search of the great truth. Come, come, come. Uh, Mr. Collins, uh, Mrs. Fryer, friends, if you'll put your hands flat on the table. L like this? Yes, yes, that, that, that's the way. Now, we all grasp the hands of the people next to us. The circle of power. Oh, yes, of course. Holmes, this is the purest poppycock. Is it? Well, of course it is. Now, for the benefit of our new friends, I must explain that even though she's isolated behind the curtain, Mrs. Besmer is under our supervision at all times. The least movement will be felt in the control ropes tied to her wrists. Colonel, you have yours. I have. Mrs. Cole? As safe as the Bank of England. Very good, very good. Now, uh, if we can all compose ourselves. We all sat there with our hands touching. Mrs. Besmer was out of sight, tied up behind her curtain. Then Besmer reached out behind him and turned out the lamp. It was pitch black. <coughs> oh, my dear Lord. It's all right, Mr. Collins. The power is upon her. Mrs. Besmer. Don't be alarmed. This is perfectly natural. Mummy. <gasps> Mummy. Mummy. Oh, dear God. Mummy. Jane. Janey, darling. 
darling, is it really you? Of course it's me, Mummy. Janey, Janey, sugar cane. Oh, I used to call her that. I used to... No, 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 it's all right. It's all right. Talk to her, Mrs. Fry. Oh, yes. Yes. Janey, darling, are you all right? Of course I am. Oh, thank God, thank God. Amen. <laughs> I have to go now, Mummy. Oh, no. No, you mustn't. Stay here with me. I can't, Mummy. They won't let me. What? Who won't let you? What do you mean? I tried to come again, Mummy. If they'll let me, come every week. Come every week. No, no. <gasps> Something touched me. Something touched my face. What? It was her spirit departing from the circle. You are very privileged to have felt it. You are so lucky. So let's lovely. compose ourselves, friends. I feel there's more to come. Good evening, James. Ah, my dear. I have something for you. What do you mean, Elizabeth? S something for me? There's too much doubt in the world, James. Too many people have closed their minds to the truth. People who should know better. Yes. The power is strong tonight. Your belief makes it strong. Believe, James. I do believe. I bring you something for those with no faith. I bring you proof. <coughs> Elizabeth? Don't break the circle. Stay where you are, all of you. Oh, my God, look! Dear God, heaven protect us. Keep calm. Keep perfectly calm. There was something in the center of the table. Something darker than the darkness. A shape. Holmes, what are you saying? It moved. It was growing. Stretching. A trick? It changed. It became a form. <gasps> Nobody move. It won't harm us. No. No, she won't. Oh, now, come on. It was a figure kneeling in the centre of the table. There was something in its... in her hand. She laid it in front of the colonel. And then... she was gone. <gasps> I'm going to put the light on. Mrs. Bessemer. Is she all right? My dear. Uh, wait. What happened? This happened. What is it? What is that? It's what she promised me. My proof. It's my wife's wedding ring. She was buried wearing it. Well, Doctor. What kind of human being robs a grave for profit? You're convinced it was some sort of trick, then? Of course it was a trick. You were in total darkness. I could have done more or less anything. Were there any other manifestations? No, no, that was the grand finale. Oh, Mr. Collins' sister didn't show up, then? No. Oh, they hadn't had time to dig up enough details to make it convincing. Yes, the same thought occurred to me. Oh, so you're not completely on their side. Here. Thank you. I'm not on any side. Not yet. I'm pleased to hear it. So, what will you tell the Colonel's son? Hmm? Will you accept the case? Oh, didn't I mention that? I already have. I'm going out. Don't wait up. Wasn't that just a touch drastic, burgling their house? I didn't burgle it. I didn't get inside. No, only because you were nearly caught by the police. Oh, give me some credit, Watson. I'm more than a match for a tired constable with a nagging wife and lumbago. Besides, he wasn't the reason. Then what was? The reinforced glass, the triple locks on the windows, and the case-hardened bolts on the back door. Uh, how Mr and Mrs Bessemer value their security. What, what are they protecting, do you suppose? Hmm? Their lives? Or their secrets. 
There's been a development. Mm -hmm. Something happened while I was out. A message. From our client? From his father. Oh, another warning for me to back off. Actually, the message was for me. Oh. Yes, the Colonel wants to see me. Tomorrow. Uh, uh, gentlemen. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your health, Colonel. Uh, frankly, Doctor, I'm sick and tired of hearing about my health. The Berkshires. The Berkshires. Thank you for coming. I wasn't too sure that you would. Uh, why did you want to see me, Colonel? To ask you a question. What question? Do you believe that I'm mad? No, I don't. Then you think I'm deluded? Uh, I think you may have fallen victim to some very clever tricksters. But you've not actually made up your mind on the subject. Uh, well... Good man. Now, listen, Watson. I have a proposition for you. Splendid. Oh, you think so? Well, don't you? It means I don't have to risk the disguise again. You'll be there as a legitimate, invited guest. Couldn't be better. What's your objection? Well, suppose the best must know who I am. Oh, I'm sure they will. John H. Watson, the famous crime writer. And yeah. biographer of a certain celebrated detective. If I walk now, into house... Why should they make the connection? You said the Colonel hasn't told them that I'm involved. No, but even so. You'll simply be there as a friend of one of the regulars and a, and a possible convert. Oh. So why should they be suspicious? I still don't like it. Hmm. Alerting the Besmers isn't what's worrying you, is it? Hmm? What's really wrong? Well, you've already said it. The Colonel's invited me because he thinks I'll be convinced. He wants me to sing their praises in the Strand magazine. And you can't see that happening? Well, of course I can't. If I go, it'll be a betrayal of trust. I can't justify it. I've been making some inquiries of my own. A little discreet investigation into the other sitters. Oh, what were you looking for? Oh, discharged servants, garrulous neighbours, relatives, given to gossip, any possible source for the Bessemer's private knowledge. And? And I found nothing. I need more inside information. Watson. Open your hearts. Open your hearts and open your minds, and they will appear. Ah! John, John, can you hear me? John. My God. John? Aren't you there? Speak to me, please. Who is it? Oh, John. Have you forgotten me so soon? It's Mary. It's your wife. The Besmers are crooks. I want them stopped. You have proof. In, in all the years we've worked together. Now tell me, tell me what's they, happened. They presented me with Mary. They had the damnable gall to, to, to conjure up my wife like some tenth-rate musical act. You saw her? I, I saw nothing. I heard a lot of platitudes about love and faithfulness and, and heaven, and, and I felt... Well, never mind what I felt. And don't you dare ask me if it could have been real. I swear to you, on everything I hold dear, my Mary was not in that room. You believe me? I believe you. Beyond your first name and your wife's, were there any other private details? No, none. Nothing they couldn't have discovered for themselves, then. Your names, even the very fact that you had a wife who died young, it's all a matter of public record. Yes, but what about the other sitters? I heard things no one else could possibly have known. They all said it. It's their main reason for believing. So the Besmers must be getting private information from somewhere. Mm, there is another possibility. There is? Think about the atmosphere, the build-up, the expectation, the darkness, the tension. You must have felt it. Oh, yes, I did. And think about the others, the look in their eyes, the, uh, the hunger, the need for reassurance. You're saying they're more than halfway convinced, even before the sound starts? Mm, and so they read more into the messages than is actually there, exactly. Yes, that makes sense. It would help with the voices, too. They want them to be real. And the result is instant faith. Instant riches, too, at 40 guineas a time. 
But I still don't know... What's troubling you? The ring. How did they do the ring? Ah, yes. The ring. Here we are, gentlemen. The Warburton Vault. It's been in the family for more than ten generations. And the late Elizabeth Warburton is buried. And has been these thirteen years. How many people have a key to these gates? Only the family. So it wouldn't be possible to go inside the vault? I'm afraid it's out of the question. Ah. I'm sorry your journey's been wasted. Oh, my dear Sexton, it's been nothing of the sort. Neither the ground nor the locks have been disturbed in a very long time. Capital. The ring was a fake, then. A duplicate. Evidently. That must have involved a lot of work. Discovering the style, having it made, making sure it looked old and worn. Mm. Our friends are thorough. Ah, I think we've arrived. Time for us to divide our forces. If you come to see my son, Mr. Holmes, you should have sent word first. It would have saved you a journey. The lieutenant is not here, Colonel. He's at a regimental dinner in London. Well, perhaps you'd be interested to hear of my progress. I would not. What my son chooses to do is his affair. I'll have no part in it. Since I know that the Bessmas are genuine, why should I be interested in your futile attempts to prove otherwise? Why, indeed. Good day to you, Colonel. Mr. Holmes. Colonel? Some truths are the better for not being dragged into the cold light of day. I ask you to remember that. Colonel. What did you see when you walk around the gardens? Describe the house. Well, only the central part is occupied. The rest seemed to be empty. Wasn't in too good a state, actually. Mm. Any signs of repair work? No, none at all. Not recently. What about indoors? The same. Mm. Fascinating, don't you think? The servants were interesting, too. Oh, you spoke to them? I counted them. Tell Mrs. Hudson you'll be dining alone tonight. I have work to do. Watson. Oh, you missed an excellent dinner. Look at this. Oh, what is it? A copy of the Colonel's will. His first will before the recent changes in favour of the Bessemers. Hmm. How did you get hold of this? Well, it was simple enough to find out the name of the Colonel's solicitor. I went round to his office where at I... At this time of night? Holmes. Where I discovered him working late. He was delighted to see me, happy to reminisce about the time I saved one of his clients from the gallows, and only too pleased to do me a small favour in return. Oh, uh, sorry. You know, you can be far too suspicious sometimes. I didn't need these at all. No. <laughs> now, read that. Mm, let me see. <clears throat> well, it's unusual, but is it significant? I think it's extremely significant. You do? Why? Get your hat. I'll explain on the way. Oh. Good evening, Lieutenant Warburton. My apologies for interrupting your dinner. Oh, good Lord, man, never mind that. What have you found out? I believe I can prove to the Colonel that he's being deceived. You believe? Is your proof good enough to convince him or not? Uh, that's hard to say. His conviction is very deep-seated. It's based on something far stronger than simply the facts. But then that's exactly what you're counting on, isn't it? What? You don't want me to disabuse your father. You never wanted it. That's not why you engaged me. What are you talking about? You had to be seen to be taking action. How would it have looked to the regiment if you just stood by and let your father give away his entire estate? Are you making some sort of accusation? It would have looked suspicious in the extreme. And so you came to me and engaged me to uncover the very fraud that you yourself were perpetrating. Oh, this is outrageous. The Colonel's house was the vital clue. The house? What about the house? Your father's will. His old will was quite specific. You were to How the devil do you know what was in my father's will? Knowing things is my business. You were to inherit the house and the land on condition that you never sell them. Of course I wouldn't sell them. That house has been in our family for generations. Yeah, now it's all but derelict. It would take a fortune to restore it, leaving you with nothing. You could say goodbye to your high life. You're saying I cooked up this whole business just to get rid of the house. You fed private information to the Bessemers. You supplied the duplicate wedding ring. 
You did everything in your power to make the seance as convincing. I've never set eyes on the best. What, what was your arrangement with them? Hmm? What's, the, what's your cut going to be when they sold the estate? Hmm? What price did you put on betraying your father? By God, sir! All right, that's enough. I've listened to you, now you can listen to me. There's not one single shred of truth in anything you've said. The thought that I would do that to my father. I have more cause to be grateful to my father than you can ever know. If you don't believe me, then let's go now. Right now to these Besmers and see if they'll recognise me. And while we're there, I'll beat the truth out of them. Oh, I should have done that from the start. Well, are we going? No. It isn't necessary. Lieutenant, you have my profound apologies. What the devil was that all about? I was wrong. Well, I realised that much. But what's changed your mind? Well, weren't you listening to him? Well, of course I was. Oh, but you must have heard more than I did. What was it? Uh, it's, it's not important. The question now is, what do we do next? Do we have to start all over again? Of course not. I've solved the case. Y you have? Well, to be strictly accurate, Lieutenant Warburton solved it for me. But, but what now? Watson. Oh, I know that tone. You need my help, but you're not sure if I'll go along with it. Am I really that transparent? Oh, only to me. What is it? Another burglary? I'm afraid it's something rather more... upsetting. You want me to go to another one of those damned seances? That's part of it. Part of it. Are you sure this time? Quite sure. You can definitely put a stop to the Besmers? Yes, I can. Right. What do you need me to do? Are you comfortable, my dear? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now, if we could take our seats. Yes. This is uh, very good of you, Mr. Besmer. The Colonel is one of our greatest champions. Any friend of his? The other night, when, when Mary came through, it was just overwhelming. Same for me, first time. But with all those others there, uh, strangers, I mean, I, I, I just couldn't... You understand? Oh, there's no need to explain, Doctor. It's, it's an intensely personal experience. We understand completely. No, it's really very good of you. You're quite sure you want me here, Watson? I, I'd be perfectly happy to go, wait outside or whatever. Oh, no, 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 Colonel, no, no. You're used to all this, I'm not. I... I'd be grateful if you stay. Uh, now, gentlemen, you have the rope securely. Perfectly. Uh, doctor? Uh, yes. And you're quite satisfied with the restraints? I'd have been perfectly content to forego all this, oh, Mr. Besmer. No, 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 no. That would never do. You must be sure that whatever happens, my wife is not directly responsible. Now, if you're both ready. 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 Excellent. Uh, then I'll turn out the lamp. And if we link our free hands, then the circle is complete. Free your minds, open your hearts, and the spirits will come. They will come. <laughs> John. <gasps> John. Are you there? Answer her, Doctor. Call her to you. John. Uh, Mary? Oh, John. It's so good to talk to you. I've missed you so much. Oh, Mary. Is it really you? Oh, it is. It is. Oh, my dearest love. It seems so fantastic. Always believe, John. It's your belief that makes it possible. You do believe. I want to. I want to so much. I can help you believe. How? The power is strong tonight. Your faith can make it stronger. What's going to happen? Don't question it, Watson. Just do as she asks. All right. I will. Compose your mind. Empty your heart of all doubt and pain. Call to her. M Mary. Mary. <gasps> what happened? Someone touched my shoulder. I felt it. Don't break the circle. Can you still feel our hands? Yes. 
Oh, oh my God, it's happened again. She's trying to materialise. Are you still holding the ropes? Yes, yes. And again. John, stay calm. Believe. Believe. I believe. Release your hands, my love. Come to me. Where? Beside you. Here. Can you feel my touch? Yes. Yes. Then hold me. Hold me as you used to. Yes. Now kiss me, John. Kiss me, my love. I don't think so, thank you. What? Oh. Now what's going on? What what Everyone you? stay calm. Oh, let me free. Including you, please, madam. You're breaking my arm. No, I'm not, but you'll break it yourself if you don't stop struggling. <sighs> All right. All right. That's better. Oh. I've got her, Holmes. You underestimate yourself, Doctor. Oh, what? What you've got is all three of them. That's better. Magnesium flares have their uses, but they're hard on the eyes. You're trespassing. You broke in like a common thief. I'll be sure to mention it to the police when they arrive. Well, well, quite a haul. Two confidence tricksters and their accomplice. If this is your idea of a joke, sir... There's no point in pretending, Colonel. I know too much. So, this whole evening was just a charade. Colonel, I'm sorry. It was the only way. You've made a big mistake, the pair of you. You're finished, Warburton. Now it'll all come out, your sordid little secret. We'll ruin you and your worthless son. Uh, I don't think so. D no! <laughs> oh, give me the gun, Colonel. Keep your distance, Holmes. Colonel. You too, Doctor. And you can spare me the pitying look. They were vermin. If you know everything, you know that. I never said I knew everything. Then, be good enough to tell me exactly what you do know. I know that the Besmers were no more in touch with the next world than I am. And I know how they made your messages and your ring so impressively accurate. Their knowledge came from an impeccable source. You. Go on. We also suspect that you've been feeding the Besmers information on your various friends before you persuaded them to come to the seances. And that you gave a helping hand in the dark by releasing your control on the medium. Are we right? Quite right. And do you know why? Because the Besmers were blackmailing you. <sighs> I never realized what a relief it would be to have it known. I almost feel I should thank you. Somehow, they discovered the secret you've worked for so long to keep hidden. The secret you've spent a fortune to conceal. You really do know everything, then? And no. We know that this secret concerns your son. Beyond that, we know nothing. My son... It was a foolish indiscretion many years ago. He's repented it ever since. And you've successfully kept it from the eyes and the ears of the world. Not just the world, Mr. Holmes. The regiment. Michael has a glorious career in front of him. If the news had become known, he would have been finished. And the regiment itself, it would have been tainted. And the Besmers threatened you with exactly that? In return for their silence, I had to go along with their preposterous lies. I had to convince friends, valued friends, of the wonder of it all. And, to my lasting shame, I had to profane the memory of my wife for the sake of their play-acting. Eventually, you ran out of friends to introduce. The Besmers saw your usefulness coming to an end. And they demanded my very home, a final payment. And you gave it, at the cost of your own reputation. What was that to me? Do you have a son, Mr. Holmes? No. Yeah. Well, perhaps if you had, you would understand. <sighs> Look at this scene. Not exactly the glory of the battlefield. Hey, Watson. Uh, no, Colonel. No. Damaging to the regiment. I'm afraid so. Unless, of course, it was the work of a lunatic. Colonel? Someone not responsible for his actions. 
then the only blame would be on him. Don't you agree? Colonel, we know perfectly well that you're in your right mind. I take the liberty of disagreeing with you, sir. And I venture that this will prove me correct for the Berkshires and for my son. Was it difficult? What? Convincing the police that the colonel was insane. Mm. Scotland Yard brain runs on predictable tracks. No gentleman in his right mind would kill twice and then put a pistol to his own head in front of witnesses. Therefore, he was not in his right mind, exactly as your colonel intended. Mm. Do you suppose he planned to shoot them anyway, even if we hadn't exposed the whole thing? Why else would he have taken the gun? They'd driven him to his limit. Will it have to come out? The blackmail, the family secret? I don't see why it should. <sighs> Thank you. Some truths are the better for not being dragged into the cold light of day. Who said that? A good man of my acquaintance. Ah. Oh. Will you tell me something? What? Well, two things, actually. How did she get out of those ropes and chains? Hmm. It's a question of accumulated slack. Accumulated slack. The longer the rope, the easier to slip it off. The chain's the same. Actually, the hardest thing is stopping it falling off before you're ready. You almost sound as though you're speaking from experience. Mm -hmm. What's the second thing? What was it Michael Warburton said that put you onto the solution? Oh, that. <clears throat> I have more cause to be grateful to my father than you can ever know. And that gave you the whole story? Well, let's say it put all the other pieces into place. Well, I considered that the colonel might have been cooperating with the Bessemers, but I dismissed it. Why should he? It never occurred to me that he might have been protecting his son. Until that moment? Exactly. Hmm. Then it's a good thing that you did provoke him. I doubt he'd have said it otherwise. Hmm, it's true enough. <clears throat> Will you tell me something? Of course, if I can. Do you understand? I'm sorry? Perhaps, if you had a son, you would understand. Do you? Don't you? Not yet. <clears throat> Good night, Watson. Good night. In The Madness of Colonel Warburton, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Colonel Warburton was played by Timothy West, Mrs. Besmer by Eleanor Braun, Mr. Besmer by Struan Roger, Michael Warburton by Jamie Newell, Sir Robert by David Bannerman, and Mrs. Fryer by Claire Corbett. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Madness of Colonel Warburton was written by Bert Coules from a reference in the short story The Engineer's Thumb by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. What is going on here? Orders of the court, sir. The prisoner was found guilty. Conspiracy against the government by sending a false and misleading dispatch containing forged orders. <laughs> the court has been misinformed. That dispatch was never sent. Thank the Lord. So Captain Thorne is a free man. Captain Thorne. General. Or whatever your name may be. The President has been fully informed, and I need not say that we look on you as a cursed, dangerous character. Ha! You will be held as a prisoner of war! 
So, my dear Edith, what is it? Love and goodbye? No, no, only the first. Love, love every day, every hour, every minute, until we meet again. Until we meet again! The Star of the Adelphi by Bert Cools, with Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson, and featuring John Bett as Richard Arthur Prince. The Star of the Adelphi. Weather's certainly turned. Yes. Does it affect business? No, you know I don't worry about that kind of thing, Johnny. I, sir, am an artiste. Ready? Looking forward to it. Lead on, artiste. Oh, just a minute. What? I thought you were in a hurry. This is important. Mr. Terrace! Mr. Terrace, it is you, isn't it? Madam, I cannot deny it. This is such a thrill, a privilege. George, it is him. I was right. I told you I was right. Good evening, Mr. Terrace. Good evening to you, sir. Uh, my uh, wife is a great admirer of yours, sir. Oh, uh, as am I. You're very kind. Mr. and Mrs... Uh, Charlton, sir. Mr. and Mrs. Charlton. Emily. Mrs. Emily Charlton. It has a theatrical ring to it. Oh, Mr. Terrace. Come onto the stage with me, Emily, and I'll make you the most famous name in England. Oh. Uh, Mrs. Charlton works in a dress shop. Shut up, George. And I'm sure she does so most charmingly. Now, I believe I have... Ah, yes. Perhaps I might present this to your lovely wife, Mr. Charlton, oh. if I'm not being too bold. Oh, of course you're not. May I look? Oh... That's you in the Silver Falls. Eric Normanhurst. One of my favourite roles. We saw it six times, didn't we, George? We did, yes. Then, let me see. Ah, yes. To the lovely Mrs. Emily Charlton. One of my most devoted admirers. Oh, Mr. Terrace. And now, good evening to you both. Good evening. Uh, good evening. And thank you, thank you. Come on, Emily. Thank you. Come on, Johnny. Step out, or I shall be late. Well, I couldn't do it. Same thing, day in, day out. I go mad. But it's not the same, Johnny. Never is. Mad inside a week. <laughs> Hello. Looks like another one. Where? Oh, yes. Excuse me. Oh, you go ahead. I'll keep out of your light. <laughs> you know more about my business than you let on, you old fraud. Go on. Don't keep your public waiting. <laughs> Won't take long. Ah, good evening. Ah! What the devil? Ah! Good God. Hmm? Something interesting. Oh, something amazing. William Terrace has been murdered. By a theatre critic. That is in extremely bad taste. By an unknown assassin, it says here. Oh, any useful details? Well, let's see. Um, stabbed repeatedly outside the stage door of the Adelphi Theatre, where he was currently taking the leading role in The Secret Service, a successful... If melodramatic, no doubt. ...and popular stage play by the noted American author, Mr William Gillette. William? Oh, can't say I've ever heard of him. The attacker whose features were largely masked by a low hat and a muffler, was seen to smile down, to smile down at the lifeless corpse before walking slowly off into the night. If it was seen in that much detail, the witness must have been close by. Why didn't he chase him? Mr Terrace's dinner companion, Mr Jonathan Graves, retired surveyor... Too old to chase him. Perhaps he just wanted to stay by his friend. Mm, perhaps. Um, Mr Jonathan Graves, retired surveyor, immediately raised the alarm. Police Constable number 272E, John Bragg... <laughs> ah, we understand that the detective department at Scotland Yard has been brought in and a speedy arrest is confidently expected. Ha! <laughs> William Terrace. Good Lord.
Mr. Holmes, the police have achieved nothing. Uh, Miss Millwood, in my experience, that is not at all an unusual state of affairs. Uh, to be fair, Miss Millwood, they have very little to go on. <clears throat> the street was dark. The killer was muffled up. Something must be done. That is why I have come to you, Mr. Holmes. Your notes said that you're acting on behalf of the dead man's family. His professional family. Ah, you don't represent Mr. Terrace's widow, then? No. Amy Terrace is too overcome to make any decisions. Of course. I am here on my own behalf and that of the company at the Adelphi. Where the late Mr. Terrace has been leading man for some years. And where I am... where I was privileged to be his leading lady. Mr. Holmes, this has been a devastating blow to all of us. Please say that you'll accept the case. Mr. Holmes... I'm truly sorry, but I, I don't see that I can be of any help to you. I've told the police everything I can, and God knows that's little enough. I've been to Scotland Yard on three separate occasions. Well, my methods are somewhat different from theirs, Mr. Graves, which is why I brought you here. Please show me exactly where you were standing when the attack took place. Oh, well, um, I, I was standing here. We just walked up from Bedford Street. Where exactly was the murderer standing? To the left of the stage door. This is not the stage door? Not the main one, no. Oh. This is a private door. Only Will uses it ah, to avoid the crowds, you understand. Interesting. It's the old royal entrance. The management gave Will the only key. Solid silver. So, the attacker was standing. Uh, Watson, if you'd be so kind. Oh, yes, of course. Um, where? Here? Little more to the left. That's it. And Terrace walked up to him from here. Correct. How did he walk? I don't understand. But quickly, slowly, confidently, reluctantly? Oh, I see. Not reluctantly. Will was always gracious when he was approached in the street. Very good. Then he walked up to the man in a friendly, open manner. Exactly. Yes, and stopped... Uh, how far apart were they? Hmm? Uh, a little closer. No, no, no that's too much. Hmm? Yeah. There. Hmm. Mm. Uh, almost directly between you and the killer. Now, well, how, was, how was Terry standing? Relaxed or tense? Relax. His arms? Really, Mr. Holmes, I, I can't be expected to remember every detail. Did he carry his walking cane in his left or his right hand? Oh, his left. How did you know that he carried a cane at all? It was mentioned in the press reports. <clears throat> very good, very good. His cane is in his left hand. And his right hand? Yes. Yes, I do remember. As he walked up to the man, Will put his hand into his right coat pocket. Mm, like this? Exactly. I have the scene exactly. I'm sorry, gentlemen. How much more, Holmes? Not much. Terrace cried out. At least twice. Maybe three times. And then everything seemed to stop. It was the most extraordinary thing. And then he just sort of slipped down. Like, uh, like so? Yes. Yes. You're doing splendidly, Mr. Graves. Terrace was down. The killer smiled at him. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, if, his, um, <coughs> if his face was muffled, how do you know that he smiled? The muffler must have slipped. Yes. Yes, it had slipped. Excellent, excellent. Now, what else do you recall of the man's face? Nothing. I'm truly sorry. No matter. You've given me vital information. I have? Vital information. I'm glad you were able to make him feel a bit better, poor soul. I only told him the truth. Well, I, I think I can see some of it. Oh, yes, thanks. Mm. Good health. Health? Hmm. Not at all bad. <clears throat> Go on. Right. Well, first of all, the murderer was familiar with Terrace's habits. Because? Because he knew about the private entrance to the theatre. What else? Uh, Terrace probably knew the man. If it was a man. Holmes, I've seen the post-mortem report. Two of the blows penetrated the stern, and that takes incredible force. Well, not incredible, merely considerable. Why did Terrace know his killer? Because he walked up to him with no suspicions. Oh, well, we have Graves' testimony that he always greeted admirers in the street. Oh, that's true. So it's possible he didn't know him at all. I don't give up so easily. He knew him all right. How can you be so sure? Well, think about the scene. 7.15 at night. Darkness. Just a feeble gas lamp over the door. The man would have been in shadow. Exactly. However open he was with his public, I doubt if Terrace would have happily walked right up to a dark and, and a muffled figure lurking in a doorway unless he had a good idea of who it was. Well, that makes sense. Well, we can go further. Terrace not only knew him, he knew him well. How so? Precisely because he was in shadow, with his face hidden. 
And then Terence must have recognised him from his stance or his clothes or something. We have Graves' word for it. The man didn't speak. You're right. Yes, Graves uh, explained something that had been puzzling me too. Hmm? What's that? Why Terence didn't make any attempt to defend himself. Now, usually in a frontal stabbing, there are defence wounds on the hands and forearms. In this case, there was nothing. But now we know that Terrace had his cane in his left hand. And his, and his right, right hand in his coat pocket, yeah. Mm. Fascinating. Mm, the cottage. The mansion, more like. Mm, the rewards of fame. Have you ever acted, Watson? Good Lord, no. Mm. Well, it's a fine profession if you're at the top. And if you're not... Let's see if the grieving widow will receive us. Mr. Holmes? Madam, this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. My sincere condolences, Mrs. Terrace. Thank you, sir. Forgive me, but you are Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the detective? I am. I'm sorry, but why are you here? I have been engaged by your late husband's colleagues to investigate his murder. By his colleagues? The company of the Adelphi Theatre. All of them, sir? Or was it perhaps one in particular? It was. Jessie Millwood. <sighs> Presumably she informed you of her intention. No, sir, she did not. Um, do you object to our investigation, Mrs. Terrace? If you desire it, I can tell Miss Millwood that I'm relinquishing the case. You may tell Miss Millwood whatever you wish. Now, gentlemen, you must excuse me. I have to visit my daughter. I'll send in the maid with your hat. Hmm. Well, quiet. What do we know about Mrs. Terrace? Um, let's see. Uh, here we are. Amy Terrace, nay fellows, actress, gave up promising career when she married. Mm -hmm. One daughter, Elline, unmarried, also an actress. Mm -hmm. The Terrace's marriage was famously successful and happy. Yes, oh, more play acting to judge from her reaction to our client's name. Mm. Your hats and gloves, gentlemen. Oh, thank you, uh... Vicky. Ah, thank Sir? you, Vicky. Sir. Tell me, um, Vicky, where does Mrs. Terrace's daughter live? In Camberwell, sir, but you won't find her there. Huh? Uh, where will I find her? Where she's been for the past six weeks, poor woman. Charing Cross Hospital. There's something quite eerie about an empty theatre. Oh, do you think so? Hmm. Oh, I, I, I find the atmosphere invigorating. Hmm. <laughs> Yes, what is that smell? Size. They use it to stretch the canvas on the flats. On the what? Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Oh, Miss Millward. Come on up. There are steps on the left. <sighs> Excellent acoustics. Hmm? Oh, for a muse of fire! I want to send the brightest heaven of invention. A kingdom for a stage. Princess to act. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, let me find you a chair. No, no, I'm all right. Well, Mr. Holmes, have you come to report progress? I have. But that's excellent. What have you discovered? I've discovered that you and the late William Terrace enjoyed a most intimate relationship. I do not deny it. I'm glad to hear it. Honesty has of infinitely more use to me than deception. Do you object to discussing the subject? Not if it will help. It could well do so. Then ask me your questions. Hmm. Exactly how deep was the friendship? We were in love. And we were lovers. And your plans were? William was going to divorce his wife and we were to marry. Mrs. Terrace knew this? Yes, she did. Had Terrace already left her? No, he had not. It was all arranged and then that... And then Seymour Hicks appeared on the scene. Seymour Hicks, the actor? Seymour Hicks has been hailed as the new William Terrors. I believe that qualifies as dramatic irony, Mr Holmes. But Hicks has another role in this sorry affair. One his adoring public don't know about. What role is that? Seymour Hicks seduced Will's daughter and made her pregnant. When was this? Eight months ago. Oh, he did the honourable thing. He married the girl. In secret. Hicks didn't want his public to know. Dashing young actor, big following among the ladies, you understand? Why is Terrace's daughter in hospital? Do you know? A miscarriage. Lots of complications. Even if she recovers, the girl's career is over. Did you know she was an actress? Yes. Did Terrace accept the marriage? He had little choice. How did Hicks feel about his father-in-law? 
He was convinced that Will used his position in the profession to stop jobs coming his way. Was he correct? Of course not. Will wouldn't do a thing like that. But Hicks wouldn't listen to reason. He hated Will. Enough to kill him? I don't know. Perhaps. Anyway, the girl's illness. It brought Will and Amy closer. He wouldn't leave her while Ellaline was still so sick. But he promised me, once she was better, once she was back on her feet... Find out who did this, Mr. Holmes. My Will was the kindest, gentlest, most generous man who ever walked this earth. Find out who did this. Hmm. This is very interesting. Hmm? What is it? The programme for the Secret Service, the play at the Adelphi. There's a biography of Terrace. Ah, the public face. What does it say? Well, he had an amazing life. Sailor, tea planter, banker, wine merchant. Hmm? All before he was 20. And then he went on the stage. Ah, yes, but he made no progress and he gave it up. Hmm. And he came back to it after a couple of years. More success this time. Taken up by the Terry family. Ah, intelligent move on his part. Get well in with the profession's leading dynasty. Terrace was a star by 81. Hmm. Acted with all the greats, and then invited to head the permanent company at the Adelphi. Well, even if it's half fiction, it's a fascinating story. Ah, that's praise indeed, coming from you. Oh, what next? Are we going to talk to Seymour Hicks? I'm going to talk to Seymour Hicks. You're going to pursue a new line of inquiry. Oh, what's that? We really must learn to appreciate the value of minute pieces of information. We just learned something of great interest about the late Mr. Terrace. We did? Not from that program. What, from Jesse Millward? Yes. My will was the kindest, gentlest, most generous man who ever walked this earth. And in his profession, generosity would almost certainly have brought him into contact with one particular group of people. Sit down, Dr. Watson. Oh, yes, thank you. The Actors' Benevolent Fund is always happy to greet a new patron. Oh, I'm afraid that's not why I'm here. Oh, then how can I help you? It's about the late William Terrace. God rest his soul. What a terrible business. Yes, indeed. What do you want to know? Well, I'm trying to build up a picture of him. I understand that he was a very generous man. Well, it can't do any harm now, I suppose. What do you mean, Mr. Cotson? He'd have had my hide if I'd breathed a word of it while he was alive. Look, it's this way, Doctor. Some people in this business, they do their good deeds right enough, but they do them in the limelight, so to speak. You follow me? Oh, I think so, yes. Works wonders for the old public image. And fair's fair, the money's always welcome, whatever the motive behind the giving of it. But Terrace wasn't like that? Oh, bless you, no. Put his hand in his pocket for anyone in the profession, Willwood. But breathe a word of it outside, and he'd deny it like a shot. And it wasn't just the money, either. Just a minute, just a minute. Uh, ah, yes, here we are. Take a look at this. Um, thank you. This is to certify that I know the bearer of this letter, Richard Arthur Prince, actor, as a hard-working and deserving member of the profession, Will Terrace. Prince was down on his luck. He brought us that, and we helped him out for a spell. Let's see. Uh, no. No. Uh, no. Ah! Here it is, yes. Regular payments starting January 96. Yes, right after the last committee meeting. Well, Terrace was always doing that sort of thing. So, that much is confirmed, at least. How did you get on with Seymour Hicks? I didn't. He's not been seen since the day following the murder. Good Lord. Mm. The daughter. Complications following the loss of a child. Will she be lucid? Uh, Holmes, I will not have you browbeating a woman in her condition. Then you'd better come with me, hadn't you? Well, can I see her? No, you can't. Damn. Because she's not here. Mr. Holmes? I thought I made it clear that I did not wish to be involved in your investigation. I appreciate that, Mrs. Terrace. And if you'll answer one question for me, I leave this house and never return unless you ask me to do so. What is the one question? Where has your son-in-law taken his wife? Oh, smell that air. Good for the soul, see, air. Well, I'll take your word for it. Oh, come on, there are worse places than Margate. I'll take your word for that, too. There. Imperial Hotel. Just what are you hoping to learn from her? I'm not sure yet. Her husband certainly had an excellent motive for killing Terrace. I thought he had. 
Is it really possible for one actor to affect another's career like that? Well, certainly. The bigger the name, the greater the power. But the daughter doesn't even know about her father's death. How can she be of any help? Holmes, you are not going to break the news to her. I forbid it. Gentlemen, oh. Oh. Mr. Ah. and Mrs. Hicks will see you now. Please follow me. Holmes, do you really think Hicks is our killer? This whole case revolves around play acting, Doctor. Public faces, private truths. I'm simply trying to take a look behind the scenes. Mrs. Hicks, I apologize for disturbing your convalescence in this way. That's all right, Mr. Holmes. Seymour will tell you that I'm already much stronger than I was. Oh, I'm delighted to hear it. How can we help you, Mr. Holmes? Uh, perhaps I should first speak to you in private, Mr. Hicks. I keep no secrets from Ellaline. Not any more. Then you know, Mrs. Hicks? About my poor father. Yes, Doctor, I know. Are you looking into it, Mr. Holmes? Yes. I'm glad my mother-in-law went to you. Anything we can do, we shall. Oh, yes. Uh, my client is not Mrs. Terrace. Then who is? I was engaged by Miss Jessie Millwood. Dr. Watson, it's time for my wife's medicine. Would you be so kind? Well, of course. The bottles are on the dresser. They're all marked with the doses. Mr. Holmes, a, a word with you in the other room, if you please. Hmm. Now, Mr. Holmes, what exactly has that damn woman been telling you? He denied all of it. You mean he didn't hate Terrace at all? He says not. Of course, you'd hardly expect him to admit it. But well, what's he saying? Jessie Millwood is mistaken? No, no, not mistaken. Malicious. Well, why should she lie about such a thing? To divert our attention away from the truth. But she killed Terrace? Watson, you can be horribly direct at times. There are at least five other reasons why she should want to put the blame onto Seymour Hicks. Plus, of course, there's the distinct possibility that Hicks himself is lying. Hmm? You do any better with a daughter? I was giving her medicine, not interrogating her. You surely didn't let the opportunity slip. No, no, I didn't. But I couldn't push things too far. She also harbours a strong dislike of Miss Millwood. I couldn't find out why. Perhaps because she broke up her parents' marriage. That could be. On the other hand, they are both actresses. It could simply be professional rivalry. Uh, she was definitely concealing something. How can you say that? You hardly spoke to her. Well, surely you noticed where she was sitting. Well... In an armchair, by the window. Well, not simply by the window, with her back to the window, and therefore with her face in shadow and the sunlight in our eyes. She was anxious that we shouldn't be able to read her expression. Hmm? Significant. I'm afraid you're wrong. What? You're wrong. I can tell you exactly why she was sitting as she was. It had nothing to do with concealing her expression or, or hiding her emotions. Hmm? What then? Holmes, she's been deathly ill. She's still far from well. We gave her hardly any notice that we wanted to see her. So? When I gave her the medicine, I noticed that she wasn't wearing any makeup. Makeup? No rouge, no powder. She sat with her back to the light so we couldn't see how pale she looked. That's all. Women. How can you build on such quicksand? Everything hinges on the late Mr. Terrace's true relationships with those around him. Was he a loving husband or an adulterer? Did he take pains to block a colleague's career or go out of his way to support his fellow actor? Well, we have Charles Cotson's word on that. Terrace was generous to a fault. Uh, never forget, we're uh, dealing with people who dissemble for a living. Convincing performances sometimes take place off stage as well as on. Well then, what impression did you get of Seymour Hicks? Did he hate his father-in-law? He certainly hates someone. Who? Our client. Or perhaps he just wanted me to think that he hates her. Oh, good God. Actors. Uh, what are you going to do about Jesse Millward? Nothing yet. First, I want to get another viewpoint on the dead man. What viewpoint? The opinion of someone is helped rather than hindered. No. 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 Ah! Good old system never fails me. There you are, Mr. Holmes. Prince's card. Thank you. Uh, Richard Arthur Prince. Leading role, Shakespearean tragedy, a speciality. Address... Interesting address for an out-of-work actor. What does it say? Adelphi Theatre, Strand, London. Was Prince a member of the Adelphi Company? Bless you, no. Not in a million years. 
The real address is penciled on the back. Richard Arthur Prince. At your service, sir, Mr. Ralph. Sherlock Holmes. An honor, sir. And your companion is no doubt the prolific Dr. John Watson. How do you do, Mr. Prince? I do as best I can, sir. Come in, gentlemen. Come in. Thank you. Thank you. Please take the chair, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Dr. Watson, I'm afraid that all I can offer you is the bed. My other chair is uh, being repaired. Oh, the bed will be fine. Now, may I offer you some tea? Uh, thank you, no. No, thank you. Oh, very well. How may I serve you, gentlemen? We understand that you were acquainted with the late William Terrace. I had that honour. How well did you know him? Well, perhaps these will answer your question. Just one moment. Now, Terrace, Terrace, Terrace. Ah, yes, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. What are those, Mr. Prince? The record of our friendship. Please do examine them, Mr. Holmes. You see, I'm familiar with your methods. I believe that's the phrase, Doctor. One of your loyal readers, Watson. Hmm. Very interesting. The jewel of my collection, sir. This box contains letters from some of the highest in the land, but none mean more to me than those you are holding. The highest in the land? Yes, the Duke of York, the Prime Minister, Miss Ellen Terry, Lord Backwater, the Secretary of War, the personal equerry to Her Royal Highness, <laughs> Mr. Henry Irving. You've corresponded with them all? I have, and I have been privileged to receive their replies, see? Yeah. Mm. Oh, Balmoral. Her Imperial Majesty instructs me to thank you for your letter and your good wishes for her continued health. Mm. Uh, this is your hobby, Mr. Prince? Rather more than that, sir. It's judging by these replies, most of your letters to Terrace were requests for money. Yes, that was how our friendship started, I must admit it. But it developed beyond that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It did, Mr. Holmes. So, you knew him well? We were kindred spirits, you see. He told me once that he saw himself in me. He told me that once. Uh, did he have any enemies? All men have enemies. But not all men are murdered. No. Do you know of anyone who hated him enough to stab him to death in cold blood? Will was a great star. Many people were jealous of his success. We're looking for something more than that. Well, there was one person. I'm sorry, gentlemen. Mrs. Terris refuses to see you. Please give her this note. Sir. But, um, what did you put? I now know the facts about Jesse Millwood. So you've decided that Hicks was telling the truth? I've decided nothing. I'm waiting for confirmation from Mrs. Terris. It was a bluff? A bluff that worked. Good evening, Mrs. Terris. Thank you for seeing me. Do you know who killed my husband? No, I do not. Do you believe that you can find out? If you will answer my questions. Go on. My client, Miss Jessie Millwood, told me that the late Mr. Terrace despised Seymour Hicks for ruining his daughter's career. That Hicks, in turn, hated him for blocking his progress in the profession. And that Terrace was about to leave you, his wife, in order to marry her. I scarcely know where to begin. Then I shall help you. I suspect that it's a tissue of lies from beginning to end. The woman lives in a fantasy world. Indeed. But perhaps not all of the time. She certainly seems to harbour some sort of permanent delusion concerning poor Will. He wasn't in love with her? Oh, there was love, Dr Watson. But it was totally one-sided. The woman was obsessed with him. She would make up any story she could at the drop of a hat to bolster her pathetic illusions. How did Terrace react to her? Well, it was difficult for him. He had to work with her, appear with her on stage all the time. He, he tried to make her see the truth of it. But she just refused, point blank. And she wouldn't believe him? Would not. Or could not. When was this? Months ago. Will made his position perfectly clear and... And she turned against all of us and started spreading her disgusting lies. Terrace didn't blame Hicks for ending your daughter's career. Well, I knew perfectly well that Ella was planning to leave the stage anyway. I thought she had a promising future. 
Do you have any idea how hard it is living in the shadow of a famous father? I have heard something of the sort. When Ella fell pregnant, well, it was wonderful. It was what we all wanted. But, but the disgrace. What disgrace? What disgrace? I know your world is free and easy, but w surely... Wait, you... wait, Watson. Mrs. Terrace, how long has your daughter been married? Nearly two years. Why? Oh. What did that woman tell you? It's not important. What about the other accusations? Uh, Terrace put obstacles in his son-in-law's path and he hated Terrace for it. It's simply not true. Dr. Watson, Mr. Holmes, I only know of one person in the whole world who hated William Terrace. And that person was Miss Jessie Millwood. How much do you know? We know everything. He did love me, you know. He did love me once. No. He loved his wife and his daughter. He told you so. Repeatedly. And you refused to believe him. Do you deny it? Yes, I deny it. Miss Millwood. I deny it, I deny it, don't you understand? I did believe him. I did. I did, I knew he didn't love me. I... And what did you do? I wanted to hurt him and his sanctimonious family. I wanted to hurt him so badly and then... then... And then he was brutally stabbed to death and his family plunged into grief. Exactly what you wanted. When I heard, I wasn't glad. Not really. I didn't know how to react. Not at first. I'm still not sure. Isn't that ridiculous? Are you saying... You didn't kill him? No, Doctor. It wasn't me. How could it be me? I loved him. Even when I hated him, I still loved him. So she came to you purely to implicate Seymour Hicks? Mm, twisting the knife in the wound. Any member of the family would have sufficed. Hicks was simply the most convenient. Such hatred. You know... The killer was completely muffled and didn't speak. It could have been her. Hmm. Not here. Let's go somewhere quieter. So, you didn't believe her denial? She is an actress, and a good one. As you so perceptively remarked, on this case, we're surrounded by actors. Yes. And unfortunately, so was Terrace, both in his public and his private life. I've remarked to you that singularity can be a vital clue. You have. Regrettably, in this case, we're talking of a man with dozens of friends, hundreds of colleagues and, and thousands of admirers. Is there really nothing else to go on? Well, if there is, I can't see it. Actors, actors, actors. Public faces, private truths. I've often thought that the greatest criminals would have had excellent careers on the stage. You have? Hmm. Think of the late lamented Professor Moriarty. Hiding behind his respectable public face. <laughs> ah, it's acting of the highest order. I've never thought of it like that. Shakespeare had the right of it. But then he usually did. All the world's a stage. And all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man. <sighs> Holmes? Watson. I've been a fool. You know who did it? I have a suspicion. Well? Not yet. First, I need one vital piece of information. You want to know what? I want to know how frequently your committee meets and when. For God's sake, come to the office in the morning. Now, Mr. Cotson, if you please. The third Thursday of every month. Now, if that's all... That is not all. I have two more questions. <sighs> no one's home. No. Wait. Wait, if you're right... I'm quite certain of it. Well, then it's possible... Holmes, we have to get this door open. It seems you were wrong. No remorseful suicide's corpse to excite your readers. Thank God for it. But where do we look now? At the Temple of the Fallen Idol. It's hard to credit. It's entirely logical. You heard what Cotson said. But yes, but even so... Believe it, Doctor. 
It's time to ring down the curtain. Ah, uh, here we are. The number one dressing room. Good evening. Gentlemen, I don't usually receive visitors during a performance. Then we are honoured. Uh, how are you, um... Feeling, Mr. Prince. Have you discovered who killed poor Will, Mr. Holmes? I have. Then this is the climactic scene where you unveil your flawless chain of deductions. It's like one of your stories come to life, Doctor. Gentlemen, do sit down, please. You'll observe there's more than one chair here. Please, do sit. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's better. Mr. Holmes, the audience is waiting. I believe the stage is yours. All the world's a stage. And all the men and women merely play. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man, in his time, plays many parts. One man, in his time. That was the vital clue I had overlooked. I thought you never overlooked a clue. Why was Terrace killed then? Why on that particular day? Why at that particular time? What happened to trigger the murder? What happened on the 16th of December, Mr. Prince? What happened on the third Thursday in the month? Nothing. Nothing happened. It was the day of the Benevolent Fund Committee meeting. The day they stopped your payments. You went to the secretary. You wanted to know why. Well, I had letters. Letters from him. And still, they turned you down. It was a split vote. 50-50, Cotson said. And so it was the chairman's decision. Yes. You were angry. Yes. How dare someone treat you like this? Yes. The friend of the great William Terrence? Yes. So you asked Cotson, who was it? Who was the chairman? Yes. And he told you. Yes. And that evening, you went to where you knew he'd be. And you killed him. How could he do that to me? I loved him, and he loved me. He was training me, did you know that? He was teaching me everything he knew. First we were going to star together, then he was going to retire, and I was going to take his place. He said so. I loved him. How could he betray me? Are you confessing to the murder? Come on to the stage with me, my boy, and I'll make you the most famous actor in England. I could have been Horatio to his Hamlet, Mercutio to his Romeo. Brutus to his Caesar? Yes! No. You stabbed him three times. You smiled down at him. And then you walked away. No. No. How could I have killed him? He, he was everything to me. Until that day. But I forgave him. He must have had a reason. A good reason. So I forgave him. I didn't need to kill him. Yes, you forgave him, but only afterwards. And then you made yourself believe that it had never happened. You did it very well. You were totally convincing. I was. Admit it, Prince. Accept it. It will go better for you if you do. Mr. Holmes, you are quite wrong. I did not kill Will Terrace. I had no reason to. I'm afraid you're absolutely correct. What? What do you mean? I mean that you killed him for nothing. I, I don't understand. Explain yourself. Uh, Prince, uh, we've just been talking to Charles Cotson. We asked him who was in the chair at that meeting, just as you did. And he gave us the same answer he gave you. He told us he couldn't remember. What? He knew it was one of two men. He knew it was either Fred or Charles Terry. No. He knew it was one of the Terrys. That's what he said, one of the Terrys. And you misheard him. It's a lie. Your life. One of the Terrys, Prince. One of the Terrys. You murdered the wrong man. <laughs> the performance is over. Yes. I'm afraid it is.
Terrace. One of the Terries. It seems incredible. Mm, by no means. I could cite you a score of murders with far less likely causes. I should have realised that something was seriously wrong with Prince the first time we met him. Oh, don't berate yourself. True madness can be remarkably difficult to recognise. I suspect that he simply couldn't face the reality of what he'd done. So he slipped back into an earlier state of mind, when Terrace was still his hero. In a way, he was acting. He just didn't realise it himself. It was probably the most convincing performance he's ever given. Now, how did you know we'd find him at the Adelphi? Well, not merely at the theatre. In William Terrace's old dressing room, he played the role of the disciple so completely, he genuinely believed he was stepping into the dead man's shoes. <laughs> a lesson to all hero worshippers. And then we had to shatter the whole charade. Well, we took away his only justification for the murder. I'm afraid it had to be done. I suppose so. Ah, the senseless loss of one man's life and another's sanity. It's been a sobering experience. Yes, indeed. I can scarcely recall a case where I was on the wrong track for quite such a long time. You do understand now, I suppose, just why Terrace put his hand in his pocket. Mm, no, actually, I don't. Well, I can't be sure, of course, but I strongly suspect that he recognised Prince, realised his plight, and reached for some coins. Oh, dear God. He was going to give him money? Mm. At the very moment he was murdered for supposedly withholding it. Mm. Tragic. Terrace. Oh, both of them. Mm. <clears throat> you realise, of course, the, uh, the final... Supreme irony. Another one? Isn't the money thing enough? Mm. I rather think poor Prince would appreciate this one. What on earth are you talking about? Well, don't you see it? For all the self-deception, he was quite right about one thing. Thanks to Terrace, Richard Arthur Prince is about to become the most famous actor in England. In The Star of the Adelphi, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medison and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Prince was played by John Bett, Graves by Philip Anthony, Terrace by Andrew Wincott, Mrs. Terrace by Richenda Carey, Ellaline Hicks by Jasmine Hyde, Seymour Hicks by David Bannerman, and Jesse by Helen Ayres. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Star of the Adelphi was written by Bert Cools from a reference in the short story The Second Stain by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. So, Watson, what do you make of that? Oh, um... Um, what am I supposed to make of it? Oh, come on, Doctor, you know my methods. Observe and deduce. Huh. Observe and deduce. Um, Holmes, uh, where did this come from? Ah, well, there are two answers to that. Two answers? At least. What's the first? It arrived in the post this morning. Ah, who sent it? There was no letter. No letter? None. Is the second answer equally unhelpful? Mm, it's more interesting. It could hardly be less interesting. True. Hmm. Well? Well, what? Holmes, what is the second answer? Where did this thing come from? I can't be absolutely sure. Right. As you know, I never guess. Yes, I know. But that. if my deductions are correct... Holmes. It was extracted from the stomach of a dead millionaire. The Peculiar Persecution of Mr. John Vincent Harden by Bert Cools with Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson and featuring Jane Asher as Mrs. Harden. The Peculiar Persecution of Mr. John Vincent Harden You're not serious. I'm always serious. Well, almost always. And how in the world did you deduce that? Well, first things first, Doctor. The object itself. Describe it. Well, what's the point? We can both see the thing. 
In some ancient cultures, they believe yeah, that they, it, these wouldn't be ancient Eastern cultures by any chance. In some ancient Eastern cultures, they believe mm. that to describe a thing is to know it. Yes, and in some modern Western cultures, they believe that to infuriate a fellow lodger beyond endurance is to risk unreasoning acts of violence. You, my dear fellow, never. No, I wouldn't be so sure. No, I never can get your limits. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a perfectly sound idea. I'll give it a try. Yes, all right, all right. <clears throat> uh, well. It's made of metal, highly polished. Chromium plated. It's um, cylindrical, about, what, an inch and a half long by half an inch in diameter. Pointed at one end, blunt at the other. The squared off end is, um, um, what's the word? Knurled. That's it, yes. Mm, yes. Roughened to afford a grip. And the pointed end has a series of grooves cut round it. Bravo, you have it. Well, hardly. I hate to argue with your ancient Eastern cultures, but uh, I've still no idea what it actually is. Unless... Holmes, is it some sort of bullet? An intelligent deduction, given where it was found. I, I had the same notion. Ah, oh, then I'm right. Killed by a chromium-plated bullet. That has to be unique. I'm afraid not. Good Lord, it's not unique? It's not a bullet. Hmm. Even a surface as hard as that would bear the marks of having been fired from a gun or rifle. There are a few scratches, but they're the wrong sort at the wrong end, the pointed end. If it's not a bullet, what the devil is it? I haven't the faintest notion. Oh, well, then, what on earth makes you think it came from the stomach of a dead millionaire? I did say I couldn't be sure. Uh, I know you better than that. You have a pretty good idea. Yes. Uh, take a look at the wrapping paper. Oh. Well, it's perfectly ordinary brown parcel paper. Mm -hmm. um, stamps. Address written on a gum paper label. What about it? Well, there are several indications. Firstly, the paper isn't exactly perfectly ordinary. It's distinctly superior in quality. Mm -hmm. The same is true of the address label. You noticed, of course, that part of the label's been cut away. Show me. There. So one long edge is slightly jagged. Oh, you're right. The label has a printed return address, which tells us... That, um... Whoever sent you this sends out a good number of parcels? Exactly so, exactly so. Why else bother to have labels printed? The handwriting's clear and confident. An educated man. And he uses a good quality pen and expensive ink. Now, smell the paper. Smell it? Yes. Oh, if you say so. Oh. Well? What am I supposed to find? Try the inside. Oh. Ah. Is that, uh, is that tobacco? Uh, in a way. In a way? In what way? Well, try the evidence of the box. R what box? The box which contained the metal cylinder. The box you conveniently forgot to mention. <sighs> Here. Thank you. It, I know, it, I know. Mm. Observe and deduce. Mm. It's um, cardboard, rectangular, with a close-fitting lid. Ah, there was another label glued to the lid, but it's been torn away. Mm. Inside, lined with smooth, glossy paper. Oh, smell it, smell it. I was going to. Same as the paper, but stronger. No, it's not tobacco. Uh, I can't quite place it. Snuff. Ah, that's it. Never cared for it. No, nor I. But it's one of Brother Mycroft's weaknesses. And if I'm right, that's not just snuff. It's very expensive, exclusive snuff. But, um, snuff isn't usually kept in boxes like this, surely? Mm, I believe that's a sample box for sending out small quantities of shops or as a gift. Ah. Right, so, what do we have? Money, snuff, a mysterious object, an anonymous parcel from an educated man, and this final element in the puzzle which I believe you'll have no problems in recognising. Yeah. The metal cylinder was wrapped in that. Oh, this is surgical gauze. Exactly. Smell it, Doctor. Yeah, somehow I just knew you were going to say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Your diagnosis? Uh, preserving fluid. Yes, sir. Someone tried to preserve a polished metal cylinder. I fancy the smell comes from the gauze's former location, not its use. Does the name John Vincent Harden mean anything to you? The tobacco millionaire? The late tobacco millionaire. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's been kept out of the papers. He was found dead in his study a few days ago. Heart attack? Bullet. Wait, he was murdered? Shot at close range by an assassin who was seen but can't be identified. A mysterious stranger. Uh, I thought it might appeal to your sense of the melodramatic murder. So there will have been a post-mortem. Exactly. And the following day, or near enough, this little puzzle arrives to perplex us. Wrapped in gauze, which reeks of the mortician slab in a box used for high-quality snuff, hardened snuff, if I'm right. Is it so unreasonable to suggest that this mysterious metal cylinder was found inside the dead man's body? I suppose not. But the stomach's something of a leap in the dark, I admit it. 
A guest, in other words. Oh, certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, why was there no letter? Ah, I believe it's a test. A test? Hmm, to see if I'm up to the task. If I can deduce who sent it and why, I'll be judged fit to investigate what it all means. Damnable cheek. Oh, I don't know. It served to capture my attention. So, who did send it? At first I thought it might be Harden's widow, but the writing on the label is unmistakably masculine. And I suspect it was the dead man's secretary or personal assistant working on the widow's behalf. Yes, I suppose that's possible. Well, rather more than merely possible, I fancy. Anyway, we'll know soon. We shall? Hmm. I telegraphed the widow soon after I received the parcel. She'll reply straight away. Well, it'll be a touch embarrassing if you're wrong. Don't concern yourself. I'm not wrong. Mr. Holmes, I'm impressed. Thank you. Your stories do not exaggerate, Doctor. No, I've, um, I've never found it necessary, Mrs. Harden. No, I can understand that. Mr. Holmes, you are right in every particular. That object was in my husband's stomach. The police appear to be completely baffled. And I suggest that in this instance, appearances are not deceptive. Are you baffled, Mr. Holmes? I am <sighs> intrigued. So you will accept the case? I must warn you that the trail will almost certainly have gone cold. The presence of the British policeman is guaranteed to eradicate most clues, I'm afraid. Mr. Holmes, I wish to know who killed John and why. If you won't help me, I'm quite certain that no one else can. In that case... How can I refuse? This is a magnificent house, Mrs. Harden. Thank you, Doctor. Where exactly is your husband's office? It's one of a suite of offices, custom-built in the new wing. The hub of the empire, John liked to call it. A suite of offices implies a, a number of administrative staff. Just two. Michael Phillips, my husband's personal assistant, and Miss Johnston, who does the typing and filing. Oh, perhaps Mr. Phillips could tell us what happened on the day of your husband's... Uh, perhaps you could tell us what happened on the day. I appreciate your delicacy, Dr. Watson, but it isn't necessary. I can tell you myself. Uh, some of it, at least. Thank you. John rarely received visitors here, but it did happen from time to time. Five days ago, a man called to see him. Did you see this man yourself? No, uh, there's a separate entrance to the offices. Who did see him, Mrs. Harden? Miss Johnston was off that day. Mr. Phillips let the man in and escorted him through to John's office. And then I went back to my own. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I presume. And my associate, Dr. Watson. Uh, Mr. Phillips. Doctor, you passed the test then, Mr. Holmes? Well, Self-evidently. Was this visitor expected? He was not. He just turned up at the door. Uh, did Mr. Harden usually receive people without an appointment? No, Doctor. So why was this instance an exception? When I took in the man's name... Not his card? He didn't offer a card. Wasn't really the type. Well, we'll, we'll come to his type in a moment. When you took in the name... Mr. Harden immediately asked me to show him in. How did he react to the name? I've just told you, by asking me to admit the man. Yes, yes, yes. But how did he react? Hmm? With interest? With fear? With joy? How? I could see nothing in particular. Indeed. Mrs. Harden... Mr. Holmes. I have no wish to distress you unduly. I am not easily distressed, sir. Yes, so I observe. But nonetheless, perhaps you'll be kind enough to return to the main house and wait for us there. Very well. Hmm. Gentlemen. Uh, Mrs. Harden. Now, Mr. Phillips, there are two things you can do for me. And what might they be? Firstly, show me your office. Surely you mean Mr. Harden's office? Your office. And secondly... Yes? You can stop lying and start telling me the truth. This is my office, or do you believe please that I... Please, sir, say, stay here in the doorway. Or do you believe that I'm lying about that too? Oh, one, one moment, please. Yes. It's very good. Very good, you may enter. I'm much obliged to you. May I be permitted to know just what I've been lying about? About Mr. Harden's reaction to his visitor's name. Please don't bother to deny it. 
very well. But it was for the very best of motives. To protect Mrs. Harden from the truth. Exactly. And what is the truth? It seemed to me... It seemed to me, Mr. Holmes, that when I announced the name... Well, go on, Mr. Phillips. This will not go beyond these walls. Well, he went as white as a sheet. He was as scared as I've ever seen a man. Fascinating. I take it that this wasn't exactly in character. Most definitely not. Mr. Harden was fearless. Well, not always, it seems. You may show me Harden's office now, but before you do... What? Be so good as to tell us this name that drove such terror into the heart of a fearless man. Mr. Holmes, the visitor's name was Mr. John Smith. Oh, exactly as I feared. If Scotland Yard had driven a herd of buffaloes through here, they could hardly be more mess. When will they learn? May we come in? Yes, then? yes, yes, yes. Add to the mayhem. Now, uh, Mr Phillips, did you observe this, uh, this John Smith's departure? I could hardly have failed to do so. After I heard the gunshot, I rushed out into the corridor and the man practically knocked me down. Mm, deliberately, sir? I don't think he even saw me. He was rushing to get out. Did you try to catch him? No. Well, not at first. I came here to Mr. Harden's office. You stopped in the doorway, took in the sight, then turned back and ran after the man Smith. How on earth do you know that? I see it. I deduce it. Even Her Majesty's constabulary hadn't succeeded in removing all the traces. Now, what did you see when you reached the door to the outside? Nothing. He had disappeared. And so you returned here? Yes. Dear God, it was a horrible sight. Now, where exactly was the body? Face down beside the desk. Now, show me. Here. Now, show me exactly. You want me to lie down? Yes, the position may be of vital importance. If I must. Yes. There. Thank you. Thank you. And um, the gun. I understand it was left behind. Yes. Uh, may I? Hmm? Oh, yes, if you wish. Yes, 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 yes. Now, you were saying the gun, the gun? Underneath Mr. Harden's body. Oh. There must have been a struggle and he fell forward. Was this, this, this window open? Yes. Mr. Harden was fond of fresh air. Ah. That is immensely significant. I take it you described Mr. John Smith to the police? Hmm? As best I could. He was a nondescript sort of man. Mid-twenties, rather coarsely spoken, but uncommonly well-dressed. Too well, if you ask me. No, oh, can you be more specific? His suit was expensively cut, but he wore it as though he'd never owned one before. Describe the gunshot. Describe it? It was just a shot. Yes, well, I dare say that you don't routinely encounter gunshots in your line of work. Of course not. Now, I appreciate that you don't have many grounds for comparison, but I ask you again, please try to describe the shot. What is there to say? Well, for example, um, this room is panelled in oak. Uh, there's not much soft material to absorb sound. Uh, the shot would have been reverberant, echoing. Actually, Doctor, it wasn't. It was rather a dull sort of sound. And not as loud as you'd expect a firearm to be. Well, yes, that did occur to me. Hmm. Show me the door to the outside. Not more than a minute had gone by, but he was nowhere to be seen. You alerted the staff. The grounds were searched at once. And the house? I beg your pardon? Well, surely it occurred to someone that the man could simply have come back inside the house until the hue and cry was over. We didn't search the house. And neither did the police. Well, even if he didn't go back inside, there are dozens of places out here he could have hidden. So we've had sufficient rain to wash away the most obvious of traces. Oh. <laughs> uh, Mr. Phillips, uh, you will wait in your office. Watson, let's see what we can rescue from this mess. Close the door. There's a good fellow. Right. Yeah, Mr. Phillips is well within earshot, I fancy. You suspect him? Why hasn't it struck you that we only have his word for it, that the mysterious Mr Smith was here at all? Well, yes, it has. But why would Phillips want to murder Harden? He has a, had a good job, obviously well paid, lots of responsibility. Mm, he must investigate our millionaire's will. Oh. What do you make of the late Mr John Vincent Harden? From his office, you mean? Mm. Well, uh, it's neat and tidy, so I dare say he was methodical in his thoughts. And beyond that... Oh, I think I... we can go just a little further. He was a man from a humble background who enjoyed the affection of his father. He was ambitious in his youth, somewhat ruthless in later years, but more mellow as he approached retirement. His work took him all over the world, but he didn't play a direct role in the day-to-day -day running of the business empire. His marriage was content, and his general sense of modesty was marked. 
He was dissatisfied with his lot in life and yearned for a simpler, more primitive existence. <laughs> My dear Holmes. Is it really possible you don't see all this for yourself? Oh, please, you know perfectly well that I don't. Well, there's, there's, there's no great mystery to it. But take a look at the prints and photographs on the walls. The man's whole history is here. Our late millionaire's father ran a cigarette stand on King's Cross Station. He was joined by his son when he was old enough to help. The later print shows the new sign, Harden and Son. That speaks of pride and affection. The stand has grown somewhat. Ambition on the part of the new employee. You said he was ruthless. Well, he doesn't progress from a cigarette store to a worldwide tobacco empire by being kind and considerate to one's rivals. But, but he, he mellowed later. Yes, he was content to, to step back and let others manage the business. Now, there's, there's nothing here to the tedious day-to-day -day administration. Hmm. Uh, what else did I say? His trips around the world. Ah, but I saw that one. Hmm? That's a fine collection of souvenirs on the shelves. Hmm. And in the cases... Some of these pieces are very valuable. Uh, the, the happy marriage. Hmm? No man puts a photograph of his wife where only he can see it if the marriage is unhappy. Now, behind that pile of books, you'll just see the edge of a framed certificate, an honorary degree from London University. Only the modest soul hides such a thing away. And only a man who yearns for a simpler life decorates his walls with paintings of rural idylls and improbably happy peasants poiling in the fields. Well... And Mrs. Harden wonders why I see no need to exaggerate. <laughs> Bravo, Holmes. Thank you. But you'd be advised to save your applause until I've actually solved the case. Yes. And now, now what are you looking for? This. But I don't understand. Why should anyone want to burn a cushion like that? I'm afraid it was used to muffle the sound of the gunshot. Oh, how horrible. Tell me about your husband's trips abroad. John loved to travel. He said it was to check up on all the foreign offices and factories, but that was just an excuse, I'm sure of it. Did Mr Phillips accompany him on these trips? No, he liked to travel alone. So you never went with him either, or any of your children? We have no children. No, of course you do. If there were children, Watson, their photographs would undoubtedly have been displayed in the office alongside Mrs Harden. No, really, Holmes? Hmm? I'm sorry you were never blessed, Mrs. Harden. Thank you, Doctor. But some things are simply not meant to be. You didn't say if you ever accompanied your husband. Roaming around the globe is not for me, Mr. Holmes. I was always content to wait here for John to return. I'm sorry. Please go on with your questions. Uh, did Mr. Harden have any trips planned for the near future? No. Nothing at all, as far as I know. Thank you. Just a little more and I'll be finished. Now, tell me about Mr. John Smith. I know no one by that name, but surely it must have been false. The police certainly think so. Well, then I wouldn't presume to disagree. Had Mr. Harden's manner changed at all of late? In what way? Well, did he seem at all nervous to you? Not especially. Did he take any unusual precautions about the house? Locking doors, that sort of thing. The servants attended to all that. And you noticed nothing out of the normal? Nothing. I'm sorry. There's no matter. What about the mysterious metal cylinder? Watson, do you have it? Oh, yes. Here. <laughs> Mrs. Harden? Before the police extracted this from the body of your late husband, had you ever seen anything like it in his possession? Never, Mr. Holmes. I give you my word. As I see it, there are three possibilities. They are? He was forced at gunpoint to swallow it. Alternatively? It was introduced into his body after death. Or? Or um, he swallowed it himself voluntarily. <sighs> Why in the world would he do that? Extend your thinking. But I've been trying. But while a man swallows something other than good, wholesome food or drink? Well, any number of drugs have to be taken orally. Well, I doubt if small metal cylinders have any great medical efficacy. I, I've heard of items being swallowed in order to smuggle them from one country to another. And he travelled all over the world. We know that. If the cylinder is hollow... I'm afraid it isn't. And besides, there were no trips planned, assuming that the grieving widow is being entirely honest with him. Surely you don't suspect her? Well, there are parallel cases in the annals. I mean, did you think she was telling us the whole truth? Uh, maybe she was concealing something about Harden's state of mind. Yes, I wondered about that. An unexpected visitor with an uh, everyday name doesn't normally induce fear, unless the man uh, or, or the name is feared already. Is it possible... Well, that sounds ridiculous on the face of it, but is it possible that the metal cylinder and the murder are totally unconnected? Mm. 
Oh, there you are. Ah, brilliant observation, Watson. Mm. Mrs. Hudson has been muttering about ruined pork chops. Ah, if the wheels of officialdom do not turn to suit Mrs. Hudson's mealtimes, I'm afraid. Mm-mm. Can they do? Eventually, at least. Did you get it? Uh, I swear to you, Watson, it's easier to get a confession out of a murderer than a post-mortem report out of Scotland Yard. Are you going to eat that potato? No. Oh, oh. thank you. Mm. Mm. Delicious. You're welcome. Mm. Well? Well, what? What's it say? Well, exactly what you'd expect it to say. A single gunshot at close range, death instantaneous. No disease, deformity or inherited defects. There are two Two interesting observations. What are they? No damage of any kind to the teeth or jaw and no evidence of bruising or manipulation to the neck. So the cylinder wasn't forced down his gullet after no, death? No, seemingly not. Perhaps I'm right then. Perhaps it has nothing to do with the killing. Well, we've come across extraordinary coincidences before. Oh, true enough. Yes, but it simply doesn't feel right in this case. Mm, that doesn't sound very scientific. Yes, mm. you're quite correct. But I'm, I'm convinced of it. Well... <laughs> If I can work out what this is, I'll have the key to the murder. I know it. Mm. May I have another potato? Oh. <sighs> have you been up all night? I didn't disturb you, I hope. Oh, not in the least. Any progress? Uh, not in the least. Ow. Oh. Oh. Let's ring for some breakfast. Uh, Do you think Mrs. Hudson will have forgiven me for wasting yesterday's dinner? She probably gave it to the cat. That's what she usually does. Really? Uh. I've no idea. So that's why it's been getting so fat lately. I deduced a plague of mice below stairs. Yes, ring for breakfast, Doctor. Or the poor creature will be in grave danger of exploding. Mm. Um... What are, your, what are your plans for today? Uh, back to the house, I think. Or more particularly, the garden. Ah, to see just how the mysterious Mr Smith managed to vanish so completely. Actually, I'm more interested in why. Why? Because he just murdered Harden, of course. Ah, but had he? Had he? You were quite right. Any number of places to hide. And even the open path curves around those trees within 50 yards. We're wasting our time here. At least we're out in this glorious weather. If John Smith did shoot Harden in cold blood, there's every chance we'll never be able to find out why. Could he have been a business rival? Not from Philip's description. And besides, business rivalries are usually resolved by subtler means, if no less vicious. Back to Harden's office, I think. Everything comes down to this cylinder. Now, let's assume that Harden swallowed it voluntarily. But why on earth would he? Are you game for an experiment? Well, if it'll help. And as long as you're not going to ask me to swallow that. Rest easy, Doctor. Let me see. The body was discovered here. According to Phillips? From the traces on the floor, he was telling the truth. So, if he fell there, he must have been standing here. Do you agree? Well, it seems logical. Capital. Take his place, would you? What, you want me to be Harden? If you would. Oh, very well. (sighs) And I am the elusive Mr. Smith. Right. The door is closed. We face each other across the room. Mm. Uh, Holmes, this is getting us nowhere. Uh, Patience, Doctor. I I have a gun. You have this. Got it. I'm about to shoot you, and you decide to swallow that. Why? Uh, To prevent anyone else getting it. No, to prevent you getting it. Holmes, suppose he was killed for the cylinder. Then why did I shoot you and run? Why didn't I try to retrieve it? No attempt was made to mutilate the corpse. Well, perhaps you didn't have time. Now, if I'm bold enough to kill with witnesses to hand, I'm certainly bold enough to risk a few moments more. Well, then, um, I, uh, I swallowed it to prevent someone else getting it. Uh, Phillips or Mrs. Yes, Martin. yes, yes, yes. That, that makes more sense. But when did you swallow it? When? Well, obviously not long before I was shot. Yes. <clears throat> Let's change places. Well, you want me to be Smith? Yes, now? I'm sure your theatrical um, skills are up to it. Come on. <clears throat> cylinder, please. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I am Harden. You brandish your gun at me. You say... Um, uh, prepare to die. Very good, Watson. And I say, no, no, don't shoot me. At least not until I've swallowed this. No, 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 no. It simply won't do. It won't do. It doesn't exactly sound likely. Then nothing to do with that damn cylinder sounds likely. As usual, you cut straight to the heart of the problem. How high off the ground is this window? (laughs) Ah, not far. That's excellent. Why is it? Because I've no wish to break my neck. (laughs) Holmes! Oh, uh, uh, come in. Um, Sorry to intrude, gentlemen. Oh, I thought Mr. Holmes was in here. Uh, He was, Mrs. Harden. He's um, following up a clue. Oh, 
I came to ask if you'll be requiring luncheon. Oh, that's very good of you. I'll, uh, I'll go and ask him by the conventional route. Your client thinks you've taken leave of your senses. She's offered us luncheon. Holmes. What is that object, Watson? Why do I feel that the answer's staring me in the face? I'll take a break from it, old man. Come in and have something to eat. No, no, no. I can't spare the energy. Well, I hope you don't mind if I do. Perhaps I'll eat on the terrace. This weather's wonderful. I envy you your simple pleasures. Don't envy me. Join me. Look at the way the trees are silhouetted against the sky, like those old-fashioned cut-out portraits. Hmm? Oh, for heaven's sake, Holmes. My dear Watson. My dear Watson. What? You thought of something. Never again shall I criticise your glorious habit of thinking in only two dimensions. Mm, only you can be quite so insulting and complimentary all at the same time. <laughs> but come on, what do you mean, two dimensions? I'll show you. <clears throat> Look at this. Hmm? Solid metal. Cylindrical, yes? Yes. Oh, I've never seen anything like it before. Well, neither have I, but suppose I hold it up to the light. You're not trying to tell me it's transparent. No, of course not, of course not. I'm asking you to look at its profile. Think in two dimensions. Now, there. You see? Holmes, I'm sorry. It's squared off at one end, pointed at the other with a series of V-shaped grooves. Well, it looks like... Oh, dear God. Is it a key? It's a key. Close the door. Now, if I'm right, and this is a key, what does it unlock? Why make a key such a peculiar shape? Well, it disguise its true purpose. The lock is somewhere in this room. How do you know? Well, this is Harden's sanctum, his private domain. It has to be in here. A secret lock opened with a disguised key known to no one but its owner. A triple layer of security. Whatever that lock protects is valuable indeed. But where is it? Where? Where, where, where is it? Uh, Holmes, this room may be a private sanctum, but it still has to be cleaned. Yes, probably by some undermaid or tweeny to awed to ask questions or pry where she's not wanted. No, she still might have noticed something. It has to be worth a try. Yeah, it does. You're right. Find the girl and bring her here. Come in, Annie. Don't be scared. No, sir. Sit down, Annie. I couldn't, sir. Now, please do sit down, Watson. Yes, sir. Here. Thank you, sir. Mm. This um, <clears throat> this is the first time Annie's been in here since um, since it happened. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very grateful to you, Annie. You are, sir? You're being very brave. Now, this won't take long, and you might well be helping us to find out who killed your master. I might, sir. Yes, indeed. Now, I understand that your duties included cleaning in this room. Yes, sir. Did anyone else do so as well? No, sir. It was my job. The master picked me out special. Very good. And did he give you any special instructions? Sir? Well, did he ask you um, not to disturb the papers on his desk? Anything like that? Oh, I see. Well, yes, he did ask me that. And I never did, not once. No, of course you didn't. Now, think carefully, Annie. Was there anything else in this room that he asked you never to touch? Anything else at all? Well, yes, sir. There was. You'll have given her quite a standing with the rest of the staff. How I helped Sherlock Holmes. Huh, she'll be telling that story for years. She deserves all the attention she can get. You really think she's given us the answer? She was forbidden to go near two things. The surface of the desk and this display cabinet. What other explanation could there be? Well, perhaps these are the rarest souvenirs, the most valuable. No, there are far more exotic items in the other cases. Well, now, let's have a look at the door. Well, well. What? It isn't locked. The perfect smokescreen. Now, Holmes! <coughs> Relax, Doctor. I told you. Cheap trinkets for undemanding tourists now. Let me see. Harden was even cleverer than I thought. Ah. What is it? A safe? Yes. With a most individual style of lock. Uh, the mysterious cylinder goes in. And turns. Et voila. 
What's inside? Uh, this. Behold the item that the late Mr. Harden was at such pains to conceal from the world. A checkbook? A checkbook. In the name of... Fascinating. In the name of Mr. John Smith. I simply don't understand this at all. Well, Mr. Holmes, can you explain this madness? I doubt very much if madness is involved, Mr. Phillips. This checkbook is a most interesting document. Yes, the latest in a long series, if the serial numbers are correct. Are the counterfoils filled in? With admirable clarity. The baffling Mr. Smith has been writing out his checks with the precision of a chronometer. One every month, always on the first, always for £20. And always payable too. Well? And always payable to Mr. John Smith. What? <laughs> this is ludicrous. On the contrary, it makes perfect sense, as is the fact that the last three cheques are not for £20, but for £200. Mr. Holmes, if this makes sense to you, then for heaven's sake explain it to me. I should prefer to wait until I have all the facts at my disposal. And how long will that take, pray? Not long. Not long at all. At last, I was beginning to think they'd locked you up in a vault. Yeah, they would have liked to. Sir, this is the oldest and most exclusive bank in the city. You're not in the habit of handing out our clients' confidential details to private investigators. So you drew a blank? Certainly not. I obtained all the information I needed. How? I threatened them with a restraint, a top-level investigation by Scotland Yard. Ah. The prospect was so horrific, they practically welcomed me with open arms. Well done. The official force does have its uses after all, it seems. Uh, what did you discover? Not here. Let's get back home. Oh, oh that's better. Well, don't get too comfortable. We'll be off out again soon. Uh, your leg will stand in. Oh, certainly. Good man, good man. But I'm not stirring from this chair until you've told me what happened at the bank. But what happened was that my theories were proved correct. As I suspected, the majority of the cheques were simply cashed over the counter. Well, surely that was obvious. Why else would Smith make them out to himself? Well, quite. But also, as I suspected, the final three cheques were paid into another quite separate account. Almost certainly by another quite separate man. Oh, dear God. We're dealing with more than one John Smith? I believe so. Fortunately... Oh, oh, please, Holmes, no dramatic pauses. Oh, you know, you take all the fun out of this sometimes. Fortunately, I've discovered the first Mr Smith's address. Aha! Well, what have you been searching for? My Bradshaw. Pack your bag, Doctor. We have to go to Wales. Wales? Wales! <laughs> Look at those mountains! Yeah, I thought you'd appreciate the view. Mm. Ah, and the air! Oh, Baker Street might be a million miles away. The rush, the filth, the crime. Watson, crime is why we're here. Try to keep your mind on the matter in hand. Malchanthroin ad And what? The game's afoot. Come on! Oh. Uh, try again. Yes? Uh, Mr. John Smith? Who's asking? My name is Sherlock Holmes. And you'd better come in. When did you discover the truth? Four months ago. And the blackmail started soon afterwards. Seems to me you know all the answers already. Well, I'm damned if I do. Will somebody please explain what all this is about? Mr. Smith? Very well. It falls to me, then. Perhaps you'll be good enough to correct me if I go wrong. Just as you please. Watson, you'll excuse the fact that some of this is supposition. Oh, willingly. Just tell me. Very well. Do you recall my character sketch of the late John Vincent Harden? I particularly mentioned his humble origins and yearning for a simpler life. You did. Hmm. It's my belief that Harden did more than yearn. He created just such a life for himself. Good God. Some, uh, what, 20 odd years ago, our millionaire came here and somehow set himself up as plain, poor John Smith. 
He married a local girl. And made her life a misery. I find that hard to believe. You may have been poor, but did you ever actually go without? I'll wager there was always food on the table and a roof over your head. Well... We went without him. He was away more than he was here. What sort of a family life is that? What explanation did he give you? Did he invent some sort of job? Oh, he always had his reasons. Jobs, travelling, travelling. Who travels from these parts? And if they do, they don't come back. He came back. Only to leave again. And you came back too. Holmes, this is the man who called on Harden? Oh, yes. And this is the man who'd been blackmailing him these last four months. You were blackmailing your own father? He was no father to me. And no husband to my poor mother. Which explains the final few checks for such huge amounts. The fact that the names were the same threw me at first. Until I realised the truth. The first ones were for Harden himself. His income as Smith. Regularly cashed by his other self. The last three were blackmail payments to his son. I wanted what I was due. What we were both due. He had millions. What happened to your mother? She died last year. She worked herself to death keeping this place together for when her loving husband deigned to come home. And for me, she killed herself to give me some kind of a future. And he spent more in a week than she made in a year. Did your mother die before you found out the truth? Oh, yes. She went to a grave still loving him. A characteristic which you plainly have not inherited. If your mother is dead, why are you still here? Hmm? Why did you come back? There's a girl. I'm trying to persuade her to go away with me. A woman. I should have known it. Holmes, wait a minute. If it was Smith here who called on Harden that day, then surely it was Smith who killed him. You take that back! I'm no matter! Oh, what the devil? Take the hand easy, off his arm. easy, oh. easy. Watson, are you all right? Yes, I believe so, yes. yes. I know you're no murderer, Smith. You do? Then why are you here? Because all the answers are here. Was that the first time you confronted him face to face? When he was in his other life, I mean? Yes. The rest was all by letter. You told him you were coming? Proper put the wind up him, that did. But the meeting degenerated into a shouting match. He was raving. What exactly did he say to you? What the rich always say. He offered me money. More money than I'd ever dreamed of. All I had to do was go away and never come back. Do you know what he said? He said we were a mistake. A mistake. I told him there wasn't enough money in the world to buy me. Was that when he produced the gun? It was in his desk. And something else, too. I thought it was a bottle or something. He swallowed it whole. What the devil was all that about? It's not important. Then he just stared at me. He shook his head, like he didn't know me at all. And he grabbed up a cushion and, and he... shot himself through the heart. Dear Lord. I'm afraid it's all true. Smith made a full confession to the police. And your husband's bank will confirm the regular payments into his alter ego's account. I never had the slightest suspicion. Never. He concealed everything quite brilliantly. Hence his distress when the boy threatened to expose him. I can understand Mr. Harden being so distraught. But to kill himself... Well, I suspect that he could see no way out without grievously injuring you, Mrs. Harden. The knowledge of his other life, and especially the fact that his other wife had given him a son... You don't need to say anything more, Mr. Holmes. How could I have been so blind? Why didn't I see how distressed he must have been? Uh, Mrs. Harden, uh, you must consider yourself now. You're in shock. When the full realisation hits you, uh, is, is there someone you can be with? Someone you can trust? There is, Doctor. Don't worry about me. But when I think about that poor woman, what she must have gone through... I've never known what it's like to go without. How could he do that to her? And to his... Yes, I'll arrange for your own doctor to see you. It would be best. Mr. Holmes. Mrs. Harden. I should like to see the boy. Would that be permitted, do you think? Perhaps I might do something to ease his pain.
What an extraordinary woman. It's been an extraordinary case all round. Mm. Extraordinary is the word. Extraordinary that Harden was collected enough to swallow that damning key. Mm, but not enough to realise that there'd certainly be a post-mortem. Far from hiding it, he actually managed to ensure that the key would be found. Why on earth did he use a cushion to deaden the sound of the shot? Mm. I've been wondering about that. Did he want to suggest that Smith had murdered him? Or was he hoping that the sound wouldn't be heard at all and the boy would have the chance to get away? Well, I'm afraid mm. the answer's gone with him to the grave. Mm. Imagine his state of mind at the end. Blackmailed by his own son. Uh, suddenly made to see that he'd ruined two families by his selfishness, and both of them his own. Was ever a man haunted by a stranger agony? Hmm. What will happen to Smith, do you think? Blackmail uh, is no small offence. But money and position can work wonders. I rather believe that Mrs Harden will do what she can for him. After that... Who knows? Who knows? In The Peculiar Persecution of Mr. John Vincent Harden, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Mrs. Harden was played by Jane Asher, Phillips by David Thorpe, Annie by Claire Corbett, and Smith by Peter Darney. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Peculiar Persecution of Mr. John Vincent Harden was written by Bert Cools from a reference in the short story The Solitary Cyclist by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. I quite agree. The story does lack a definite ending, but the rest of the narrative more than makes up for it. <laughs> My dear fellow. So I'm correct? That is what you were thinking? Exactly so. It's very impressive. Oh, Watson, you're the perfect audience. However many times you've seen the trick, you still react as if it were fresh and new. <laughs> Firstly, I know full well that you've been busy writing up the Baskerville Stapleton inheritance case. Ah, yes, the Hound of the Baskervilles. Yes, yes, well, if you prefer. Uh, secondly, mm. your labours are at an end. Your face this afternoon bore all the self-satisfied signs of the successful author about to launch another tale onto the waiting world. And why not? It's been a lot of work and I'm, I'm pleased with the result. Mm. Except for the denouement. Well, yes. Mm. The criminal is unmasked, but the hero... Ah, uh, heroes. A thousand apologies. The heroes have to take someone else's word for it that the villain's dead. Mm. That's not the kind of neat and tidy climax your readers expect. No, quite. But I still don't see they how have everything you... ready to send to the Strand. You're about to seal the envelope, but you stopped. You were uneasy. You glanced up at the print of the good ship Alicia above the fireplace, a remembrance of a case that you'll never publish. Ah, because it had no ending. Exactly. Yes, the Alicia disappeared without trace, and I was never able to discover how or why. The connection with your latest opus is obvious. I suppose so. But then your eye moved again, back to your notes, specifically to that fulsome letter of thanks from Sir Henry Baskerville. Your doubts were replaced by a warm smile. You were remembering your friendship, the dangers shared, the obstacles overcome, the peril, the excitement, the thrill of the chase. Yes, I think you've made your point, old man. Yes, and you've decided, well, how could you fail to decide, that any story that has all that and a giant dog that glows in the dark is quite strong enough, even without a clear-cut ending. Hmm. Simple, you see. But if it's so simple, why can't I do it to you? Oh, that's an excellent question. Mm, I think you're just too polite. Or perhaps merely not as bored. Oh, heaven preserve us from quiet days and uneventful nights. Has the entire criminal population gone away on some sort of communal holiday? Well, there's a thought. Mm. What a pity we can't control reality the same way we can fiction. If this were one of your stories, as soon as I'd finished moaning, the doorbell would ring. I'll never complain about your powers as a writer again. Always happy to oblige. Mm. <laughs> uh, let's see who's come to rescue us. Hmm. 
The Singular Inheritance of Miss Gloria Wilson by Bert Cools with Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson and featuring Toya Wilcox as Gloria Wilson, Roy Hudd as James Fillimore and Sean Probert as Inspector Athelney Jones. The Singular Inheritance of Miss Gloria Wilson Don't you trouble yourself, madam. I can find my own way. I am a detective. Inspector Athelney Mr. Holmes. Doctor? Oh, Inspector. Ah, so what do we owe this singular pleasure? Come in, come in. Take the weight off your feet. Oh, don't mind if I do. Oh, would that be a coffee there, Doctor? Oh, coming up. Um, no milk and three sugars, I think. <laughs> oh, you've a fine memory. I've always said so. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure to sit down, gentlemen. Uh, I've had a busy old time of it, I can tell you. Mm. Oh, delicious. Mm -hmm. Well, I just... Uh, come to ask for my help, have you? No, 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 not a bit. Indeed? I've come, Mr. Holmes, because I knew you would be interested. No other reason? Take a look at this now. Straight from the scene of a crime. Well, well. Exactly. <laughs> uh, fascinating. How, how long has it been? Twenty-five years, if it's a day. <laughs> I was on the beat last time I saw one of those. And I've only ever read a description. Um, <clears throat> oh, Watson, my dear fellow, you haven't the faintest idea what we're talking about. I'm afraid you? not. Uh, I'll explain. It started 32 years ago. A series of robberies, very audacious, very clever. Big houses, all in London, all secure, all well guarded. But still the thief managed to get inside and away again without being seen. Now, here's the funny thing. He only ever took one item. Only one? But it was always the most valuable or precious thing in the house. Lady Rothermere's emerald tiara, Count Ellison's Shakespeare first folio, the Duke of Athlone's Egyptian bowl. In and out like a phantom he was. Mm. No broken locks, no smashed windows, nothing. For near on seven years. And then the thefts stopped. Sudden as they began. Seven years. And in all that time... He only ever left one trace. Yes, there was one of these at the scene of every crime. Oh, what is it? A postcard? Well, not exactly. Here. Oh, cheap card, plain black with a single letter G. Well, that's intriguing. And down at the yard, they called him the ghost. Yes, if you'd spent more time looking for him and less in dreaming up a foolish name, you'd have had him. Now, that's not fair, Mr. Holmes. He baffled the yard's finest brains, he did. Yes, well, that's not saying much. Holmes! You see, you can read my mind. When it comes to some subjects, yes, I can. I'm sorry, gentlemen. No, nothing, nothing. Jones, where did you get this? Ah, yes, well, that's what I came to tell you. That was lying in the middle of the floor of a locked room at Lord Torrington's townhouse in Hampstead. He'd been burgled, you see. A priceless diamond, just the one, and not a sign of the robber. Gentlemen, the ghost has returned, and I, <laughs> I am on his trail. Snow wind swept west, the unknown north, the snowy stormlands of the south. Music, marbles, monsters, all of them here, all of them real, all of them for you. Yes, gentlemen? My name is Sherlock Holmes. Please inform Lord Torrington that I'm here to examine the scene of the crime. I cannot do that, sir. Why the devil not? His lordship's specific instructions, sir. Only the official detective force has his permission to investigate this crime. Good day to you. Damn the man. Holmes. Well, he's a fool. If he wants his precious diamond back, he needs me, not some bumbling imbecile from the land of song. You don't care a fig about the diamond or about Lord Torrington. You just want to crack at this ghost character. Mm, your newly developed mind-reading skills are beginning to get annoying. Oh, for pity's sake, stop and think for a moment. Now that he's come out of retirement, this ghost's not going to stop at one burglary, is he? 
You'll get your chance. Another one. The Secretary for War, no less. A set of antique dueling pistols. When? The theft was discovered under two hours ago. Get your, get your hat, Watson. Hat. Uh, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. What? Sir Frank doesn't want anyone else involved. What? Oh, dear. No press, no publicity, no private detectives. <laughs> Some people still place their trust in the official forces of law and order, you see? Yes. Well, um, if you'll excuse me. Yes, go. Go! Gentlemen. Oh. Sorry, Holmes. There's something wrong. Something doesn't fit. Doesn't fit? Two robberies, two noble clients, two declarations that I mustn't be allowed to investigate. I don't believe it. My dear chap, you can't always expect to be called in. Yes, uh, very well. Then we must adopt another approach. What do you mean? Well, if I can't be directly involved, then obviously I must solve these crimes from the sidelines. But how on earth do you propose to do that? <sighs> this is the one. Ooh. <laughs> Details of the original robberies. It seems that at least one section of Scotland Yard has some claim to efficiency. Who'd have thought they kept so many records? Oh, right. Let's have a look at our friend, the ghost. Oh, good to be back in the fresh air. Oh, well, what did you learn? Very little, I'm afraid. The popular version of the story is more or less correct. No sign of entry or exit, no forcing of locks, virtually no witnesses. Oh, I did learn one new fact. What was that? He was seen once, on his final job, a servant saw a vague shape going into a room. That's not much of a description. It's as good as they were ever going to get. When they took a statement, the woman was terrified. Terrified? Why, did he attack her? Nothing so commonplace. As I said, she saw him go into a room. It was a small room with locked windows and just the one door. The woman had the presence of mind to shut the door and bolt it. I don't think I'm going to like what's coming next. I'm quite sure you're not. When the master of the house unlocked the door, the room was empty. Shh. Yes. Whoever he is, the man's a genius. I'm looking forward to meeting him. Before your very eyes, he will defy the laws of Mother Nature. He flaps in the air. He vanishes away like smoke. He melts through solid walls. Ladies and gentlemen, young ladies and young gentlemen, the amazing Giorgiano! There's been another one. Greenwich, retired bishop, valuable Bible. Mr. Holmes... Am I excluded yet again? I, I, I don't know. I haven't been there yet. Just got word. If you like, I can, I can try to use my influence, bring you in on the case like... In need of a helping hand, are you, Jones? Oh, Holmes, really? No, 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 not a bit of it. I just thought you might care to... I don't know, have a quick look. I know how much you like this sort of thing. Well, I suppose it might be interesting. Oh, you'll come. Greenwich, is it? Yeah, that's right, that's it. But we have to go somewhere else first. Why do we? Because this time he made a mistake. He was seen. And that's not all. Miss Marshall, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> I'm going to find out who did this to you, but I need your help. Do you understand? I understand. Can you tell us what happened? I'm not sure. I, I think he hit me. Who hit you? I don't know. Came from nowhere. You were cleaning in your master's library, is that right? Yeah. And he... He, he just appeared. He went through the window, in the doorway, what? I don't know. I didn't see. All right, all right, all right. Take it easy. Oh. Rest, rest back. That's oh. the way. 
keep this short, gentlemen. <laughs> Can you describe him, Miss Marshall? Short, thin, dressed in black. Well, what about his face? He had no face. What? He had no face. No face. The woman was hysterical. No, she wasn't. She was mistaken. A black mask, possibly, or some sort of makeup to hide his features. I hope you've got a man guarding the scene of the crime. Of course. There's been no disturbance. Then we have a chance. Lead on. Your constable did a good job, Jones. No one's been into this room since the maid was removed. Mm, he's a promising lad. So, uh, well... What have you found? Yes. Practically nothing. The Bible was evidently in that locked cabinet. It's still locked. What about signs of his break-in? Well, I can read where the encounter took place. The maid was by the hearth. She collapsed across the fender and in all likelihood broke her jaw on the iron bars when she fell. Uh, and that's the sum total of what the room tells me. For all I can see, your ghost might just as well have walked through the walls. You ought to eat something, you know. Uh, I can't spare the energy. I need it for thought. Now, uh, Mrs. Hudson will not be amused. Uh, Mrs. Hudson isn't trying to solve an impossible crime. Well, no, I don't suppose she is. Uh, Jones, won't you join us? I have the doctor's word for it that the devil kidneys are particularly fine today. No, oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Well, um, perhaps later. Um, whatever's wrong? I take it you haven't looked at the papers this morning. Not yet, no. Something of interest, is there? You could say that. Uh, John Scandalmongers. Do take a look at that now. Uh, Phantom Thief has Scotland Yard baffled. Oh dear, I am sorry. Well, it's the same in every one. But how did they get the story? Someone must have talked a servant, I expect. Well, probably for money. Oh, you're right, Watson. It's delicious. All there, every detail. The previous two thefts as well. Just as he was getting careless, just when he might have thought the net was tightening. <laughs> now, now he knows we're no nearer to catching him than we were 25 years ago. Mm, you, you could be right. On the other hand, it might give him the confidence to commit another crime very quickly. Uh, Watson, I'm beginning to suspect that you've engineered this whole case for maximum dramatic effect. Well, no such luck, I'm afraid. Come in. Uh, Mr Holmes? Uh, at your service? Uh, forgive me, but the street door was open. It... Uh, Seemed the easiest to come up unannounced. Well, no apologies are necessary, Mr. Uh, Fillimore. James Fillimore. As my friend the doctor here will tell you, we've seen far more unorthodox entrances onto our humble stage. Dr. John Watson, a pleasure to meet you, sir. Uh, Mr. Fillimore. And this commanding figure belongs to Detective Inspector Athelney Jones of Scotland Yard. Ah. Well, forgive me, Inspector, but I, I should much prefer to talk to Mr. Holmes in confidence. Oh, well, yes, of course, of course, of course. <laughs> I must be about my business anyway. I plan to talk to the maid again. See if there's anything she's forgotten. Uh, take it gently with her, Jones. I shall, Doctor. Never fear. Mm. Gentlemen? Uh, uh, Jones. Um. Ah, Mr. James Fillimore. Pray take a seat and tell us how we can be of service. Thank you, sir. Uh, you've uh, seen the papers, then? Hmm. This is a terrible business, gentlemen. A terrible business. How is the woman, do you know? I, I inquired at the hospital on my way here, but they, they wouldn't tell me. Uh, her injuries are quite serious, but she'll recover. Oh, I'm pleased to hear it. Very pleased. And this outrage is merely the latest of several. So it seems. We live in lawless times. Lawless times. And what is your own problem, Mr Fillimore? Oh, yes, yes, of course. It, it's linked, I believe, to that unfortunate maidservants. Gentlemen... Last night I too was robbed, and by the same thief, by the man they call the Ghost. I maintain a, a modest establishment, just a small house and one servant, my housekeeper, Mrs. Cotterell. Since I retired, I've lived quietly and contentedly too, until last night. And what was stolen from you, Mr. Fillimore? Oh. My one great treasure, Dr. Watson. A tiara studded with emeralds, presented to my dear mother on the occasion of her wedding and passed down to me. A thing of great beauty and no less emotional value. And what makes you believe that this uh, ghost is to blame? Well, 
The circumstances match in every particular. No lock was disturbed, no door forced, and uh, this was left in the centre of the room. Indeed. Ah, uh, yes. The golden G on a black background, you see. That's his calling card, all right. Why did you ask Inspector Jones to leave? Uh, according to the newspapers, the official forces have made absolutely no progress towards identifying this villain. I prefer to put my trust in you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Philippon. Uh, no sign of any force being applied. No. How many people know the combination, Mr. Fillimore? Only myself, Doctor. And as you can see, Mr. Holmes, nothing else in the safe has been disturbed. Yes, and no traces on the doors or windows. It certainly bears all the hallmarks of our elusive friend. No friend to me, sir. Uh, my apologies, Mr. Fenimore. The loss of such a valued article must have affected you deeply. I'm afraid it has, If yes. I examine the rest of the room now, perhaps you'd be good enough to wait elsewhere. Oh, rest assured, Mr. Fillimore. Mm. If anyone can catch this thief, that man is Sherlock Holmes. I certainly hope so, Doctor. Another biscuit? Um, thank you, no. Very well. Ah. Aha. Have you made any progress, Mr. Holmes? I believe I have, yes. Splendid. May I ask what you've discovered? If you've read my friend's literary efforts, Mr. Fillimore, you'll know that I have the regrettable habit of secrecy. All should be revealed in the fullness of time. Watson, we have to be going. You were a little short with him. Was I? No, oh, no matter. Are you going to tell me what you found? Our man's made another slip, perhaps two. Oh, he really is getting sloppy then. Look at this. Hmm? What is it? Mud. From the sole of our phantom burglar's right shoe, and not just mud. Use my lens. Oh. Something embedded. I can't tell what. Sawdust. Mud impregnated with sawdust. I found it on the windowsill inside the study. I thought the window was locked. It was. That's his method, then. Somehow he can lock the windows from the outside after he's left. Tch, genius. Very. Especially when you consider the dust. What dust? Our client's housekeeper is not exactly efficient. The windowsill was covered in a layer of dust at least three days old. It was completely undisturbed. Undisturbed? But surely that means... It means no. that we should concentrate on our one material clue. Mud and sawdust. Now, what does that suggest to you? And now, ladies and gentlemen, Johnston Circus Giganticus presents once again the incredible Georgiano, the mosque. Master of mystery, music maestro, if you please. This is the only circus currently in the capital. The mud outside is an exact match for the pellet I found at Fillimore's. This Giorgiano is our thief. A committee from the audience has locked the amazing Giorgiano into the reinforced steel trunk. The locks have been sealed with wax. The air is running out. And now, the curtain cabinet of the unknown will be put into place. The curtain cabinet of the unknown, dear Lord. Holmes, what's the greatest burglar of all time doing in a run-down touring circus? Yes, it is curious, isn't it? The curtains are in place, maestro! Stop the clock! The amazing Giorgiano! And the committee from the audience will let us. The locks are still secure and sealed. Oh, well done. Yes, I suppose that could be our man. Not exactly. What do you mean? Look. And now, the amazing Giorgiano's greatest surprise of all. Giorgiano, remove your mask. Good God above, it's a woman. Sit yourselves down, gents. Oh, Excuse me while I get out the working clothes. Uh, well, we'll wait outside. That repulsive, am I? 
Of, of course not. Relax, I simply meant to... love. You sit there and I'll be behind here. <clears throat> How's that? All decent and proper enough for you? Uh, it's perfectly. Uh, now, Miss Giorgiano... That's Wilson to you, love. Gloria Wilson. Yeah, Miss Wilson. Does the name The Ghost mean anything to you? Another act, is he? Uh, something of the sort. Well, I hope he's in a better gaff than this flea pit. What about him, this ghost? What, what's he do? Much the same as you, Miss Wilson. Yeah, but with one or two interesting variations. Where were you last night between the hours of midnight and four o'clock? Last night? Who are you? Please answer the question. That's oh, pretty much exactly where you are now, me old cock. You're sitting on my bed. And before you ask, I was asleep and on my own. So, no one can corroborate your story? Are you going to tell me what this is all about? Not yet. How long have you been in the circus? All my life. You're an extremely skillful performer. Yeah, I am. Worthy of better surroundings. I'm not arguing. Then why are you here? I never got the brakes. That's all. Not that it's any business of yours. Crime is always my business. Crime? The only crime round here is the ticket prices and the pay. Look, I'll ask you again. Just who are you? My name is Sherlock Holmes. This is my associate, Dr. Watson. Chuck me over that dressing gown. Oh, yes, yeah. Thanks. Sherlock Holmes. Stroof. <laughs> well, sorry, love, but you've got it wrong this time. What do you mean? I mean, you've got it wrong. You think I'm some kind of big-time crook? What am I supposed to have done, hmm? Not someone off. Blackmail? Arson? Robbery. Robbery? And just what is it that I've nicked? A pair of dueling pistols, an antique Bible... And price... various other valuables. <laughs> Miss Wilson? And I thought you was good. Look around you, gents. If I had money, do you seriously think I'd still be in this godforsaken dump? Do you really think I'm that much of a fool? Suppose I told you that I had proof. What sort of proof? We must be going. Thank you for your time, Miss Wilson. What sort of proof? Holmes. This is ridiculous. Why are we still lurking here at this time of night? You're perfectly free to go, Doctor. Oh, now you tell me. Please do so quietly. I don't want to alert our quarry. Miss Wilson, you mean? Of course. But surely she's too young. I doubt if she was even born when the robbery started. Possibly not. Besides, what she said made sense. If she's a master criminal, why is she still here? There are other reasons than monetary gain to commit burglary. There are? Look. It's a lantern. She's coming out. We've unnerved her. Exactly as I intended. <laughs> Shut your gob, you great toothless lump. That's better. Now shit over. <laughs> I told you, save it for the show. There was no need to be concerned. <gasps> it's all still there. Evening, gents. There you go. Thank you, Miss Wilson. I'd say good health, but I don't suppose I'm going to be in for too much of that, am I? That rather depends on you. What do you mean? <clears throat> first things first. You admit to the recent robberies? No, love. I just happened to find all that stuff. Levity won't help your case, Miss Wilson. No, I don't suppose it will. All right. Let's do it the proper way. Yes, Mr Holmes, I hold my hands up. Very sensible of you. Look, how's that maid, or whatever she was? Recovering. Thank God. It was an accident. She did say... At the moment, she can barely remember what happened. She saw me and screamed. Then she stepped back and tripped over the fireplace. You've got to believe me. I do. Thanks. 
I suppose you want to hear the rest. Not here. We ought to repair to somewhere more suitable. My name's Gloria Wilson. We're a circus family, always have been. Right back to me great, great God knows how many greats, grandfather. <laughs> I've never known anything else, not really. Not until recently, at any rate. Yeah, well, I'll get to that. Do you know many circus folk, Mr Holmes? I've encountered a few. Then you'll know what keeps us going. Pride. It's a great calling. Mm. Historic, noble, well, leastways it used to be. You've seen the dump I'm with now. So you decided to explore an alternative profession, is that it? You really have got away with words, haven't you? Yes, Doctor. I decided to explore an alternative profession. And a right pig's ear I made of it, obviously. I wouldn't say so. No? You caught me, didn't you? Mind you, that's more than the coppers manage, eh, love? You keep a civil tongue in your head. Anyway, it all started going wrong. First off, where was the glory? I thought I'd be all over the papers right from the start. I believe you have the good inspector here to thank. You know about that? You persuaded the victims to keep quiet, Inspector. Why? It was part of his plan to exclude me. He was also after the glory, until he realised he had no chance on his own. Well, Jones, you should talk to your colleagues rather more. I like to stay out of the limelight. All your efforts were a waste of time. Oh, whoever did it, I cursed them. Getting in the papers was the only reason I started doing it. You understand that bit, Mr Holmes. I know you do. The applause was dying. There were no more crowds, no more admirers. Yeah. My family used to be top of the tree. Played before royalty. My mum and her dad before her. Brilliant he was. The best. When you've lived through that, then a tatty old tent in Battersea. Oh, that's not easy. But to turn to crime... There must have been a better way. But it wasn't really crime, was it? Not really crime, good Well, God. it wasn't. I was going to give all the things back. Leave them somewhere where they'd be found. I thought that'd make the story even better. And so it would. And no one got hurt. At least that was the idea. Well, she's all right, that woman. No thanks to you. Yeah, she will be perfectly all right. Thanks. Well, that's it, really. That's why I did it. I wanted to be top of the bill. Even if nobody knew it was you? I'd have known. That would have been enough. Miss Wilson. Mr Holmes? Before the worthy inspector places you formally under arrest, why don't you tell us the whole story? I don't know what you mean. No more do I. Miss Wilson... You're obviously not old enough to have committed the original robberies. Why did you decide to copy the ghost? And how did you know so much about a criminal from so long ago? Uh, Mr Holmes, I don't need to answer it, do I? I think you know. There's one piece of information I still lack. What's that, then? Your family's been in the circus for generations. Yeah, like I said. Mm. And have they always done the same act? <laughs> See, I was right. You do know. And performer secrets are passed down from generation to generation. The original ghost. Your father? Him? No, he was useless. Couldn't escape from a paper bag. It was my granddad. And what happened to him? He died when I was eight. Left me a sealed letter with the whole story. I was the only one he trusted. <laughs> All these years, I've been the only one that knew. So, Mr Holmes, can I charge her now? Yes, Jones, you can charge her. Thank you, Cabby. Uh, uh, Holmes, why are we here? Has it really not occurred to you that things have been far too simple? What do you mean? Well, I mean that any criminal as clever as the magical Miss Wilson doesn't suddenly start leaving obvious clues at the scene of her crime. But she was getting sloppy, we saw that. The injured maid. Oh, it was an accident, pure and simple. It doesn't compare with the rest. The rest? Oh, I know about the mud sample. Ah, ring the bell, that's a good fellow. Mm -hmm. But um, what other clues did she leave? Oh, do you mean the undisturbed dust? What did that tell you? Oh, Watson. Not all signposts point in the same direction. What on earth is that supposed to mean? 
Ah, come in, gentlemen. I've been expecting you. You were successful, then? Completely. It was Gloria. Yes, you were quite right. You know Miss Wilson, Mr. Fillimore? Oh, yes, Doctor. Just as you knew her grandfather? Yes. Uh, yes, I knew him. I knew him when he was just a struggling magician, and I knew him when he was a household name. And I'm sorry to say that I knew him when the fame was no longer enough, and he turned to crime. Here. Yeah. Thank you. So, Miss Wilson was mistaken? She wasn't the only one who knew the truth. But like her, I've kept the secret to myself all these years. When I saw the reports in the papers, I suspected at once that she was behind the robberies. And so you faked a burglary, left a clue which pointed to her and no one else, and then called me in. Yes, that's exactly what I did. Yes, your clue was ingenious. Unlike the way you left the dust on the windowsill completely untouched. I know thief's that good, however oh. ghostly. <laughs> did I do that? Hmm. Well, I, I probably wasn't thinking as clearly as I should have been. I was so anxious to stop Gloria before the compulsion really took hold the way it did for their grandfather. Yes, but unless I'm wrong, he came to regret his career as a criminal. He realised that he had perverted what should have been honourable skills. The magical arts go back into antiquity. I, I couldn't see another member of the family disgrace that heritage. And, of course, there was that business with the maidservant. Which distressed you far more than the supposed theft of your own property. Another clue you didn't intend to leave, I fancy. No. But I was so upset that Gloria could have resorted to violence. And not a woman, too. No, she didn't. It was an accident completely out of her control. Really? Ah, oh, I'm so glad. And you needn't have been concerned about her giving in to the compulsion. She was planning to return everything. She was? Yeah, she's, she's no hardened criminal. She was after Gloria. Fame. Every hall was calculated for its publicity value. Nothing more. All she wanted was some acclaim. Oh, dear Lord. If I hadn't interfered, she might have just slipped back into obscurity. Or what have I done? Mr. Fillimore, if you were that worried, why didn't you simply go to the circus and confront her with what you knew? Surely you could have made her see sense. No, I couldn't do that, Dr. Watson. I... I haven't seen Gloria Wilson for nearly a, a quarter of a century. But why on earth not? Uh, oh, good heavens. Of course. But what? Open up! In the name of the law! For heaven's sake, Jones! You'll have the door in! Never mind that. Sanders, stay there. You watch the road. Very good, sir. No. Mr. Holmes, I think you know why I'm here. You'd better come in. Mr. Holmes, who on earth was it? It was Detective Inspector Jones and Miss Gloria Wilson. No. Bring her in here, Jones. Come on, you. Oh, all right. You have a keep your hands too. Hello, my dear. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I knew it. Well, who's the clever one now then, huh? Who's the reasoner now? Suddenly occurred to me what put you on to her so quick. Something had happened I didn't know about. Hardly an unusual state of affairs. Never mind those clever remarks. So, when you left, what did I do? I followed you, that's what. And I brought her with me. Uh, look at that. The proof positive. Of what exactly? Now, come on, come on. No more games. I'll bet my pension to a penny. That is the ghost. The real ghost. <laughs> well, Fillimore, what do you say? Well, I might inquire if you have any evidence, Inspector. Evidence, is it? Well, I dare say when I've turned this house upside down, I'll have all the evidence I need, and if I don't, well, a few days in a cell, and you'll soon be singing a different song. You take my word for it. There's no need for threats, sir. I am. I was. The ghost. I knew it. Didn't I tell you I knew it? Oh, yes, you told me. I thought you were dead. Why didn't you let me know? Why did you do it? I was ashamed. 
so ashamed of what I'd done. But you confessed the letter. I never should have written it. It's tortured me ever since. Tortured you? Why? Because I didn't know how you'd reacted. What you thought of me. You could have just asked me. Oh, my dear. Suppose... Suppose you hadn't been able to forgive me. I oh. couldn't bear the thought of knowing that. Of course I'll forgive you. So I stayed away. I, I stayed dead. Oh. But... <clears throat> yes, well, this is all very fine and touching, but I have my duty to do. Bring them out, Saunders. Inspector, come on, you two. That's the way. No need to shove. You all right, Grandad? Yes, thank you, my dear. Are you proposing that we should walk to the yard, Jones? Of course not. The local station's just round the corner. Yes, well, I think it's going to rain. I believe you're correct, Doctor. All right, then. Me at the front, uh, Sanders behind. Uh... Hang on, Copper. What do you want? A bit of common decency, that's all. Grandad. My dear? You should bring an umbrella. Now, come on. Oh, for pity's sake, Jones, he's an old man. Do you really think so, Gloria? Yeah, I do. Mm. Here comes the rain. Would you have uh, any objection to my fetching my umbrella, Inspector? It's not five minutes' walk. Bloody man. hell, Copper. It is only just inside the front door. Oh, go on, then, umbrella, but be quick. Thank you. Uh, Gloria, my dear, would you uh, give me a hand? No. I think I'd better wait out here. <laughs> but you all... Go on, Grandad. For you catch your death. You're a good girl, Gloria. Thanks. Won't be a moment, Inspector. Just get on with it. Would you excuse me, Mr. Holmes? With pleasure, Mr. Fillimore. Thank you. Now get the move on, you. Well, for heaven's sake, relax, Jones. Think what they'll say at a yard. Two ghosts in one day. Oh, no, that's true. That's very true. What was that? Why did he shut the door? Hey! Hey! Jones! Jones! It isn't locked. Fillimore! Fillimore! Go on, Gumpy. Fenton. Uh, Inspector. Yes. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, lad. Uh, what's your report? The back door's bolted on the inside, and anyway, there's no way out through the garden. And? Uh, well, I've been through the whole house, sir. Cupboards, loft, everything. He's not here. He's not nowhere. Ha! You knew, didn't you? You knew this was going to happen. Sorry. I wasn't talking to you, Mr. Holmes. You knew. Did I? You know, um, I've been thinking. Indeed? Yes. She did actually achieve what she wanted, didn't she? The story did get into the papers. Eventually, yes, it did. Then why didn't she carry on? More baffling crimes? More publicity for the mysterious ghost? Well, she said it herself. It was all going wrong. The business with the maid unnerved her. And I suspect that second-hand fame wasn't quite as satisfying as she'd hoped it would be. Yes, it sounds reasonable. <laughs> Lucky for you, wasn't it? What was that the news got out. If it hadn't, Fillimore would never have known what she was up to. Quite true. Is that, uh, is that what you were hoping for when you gave the papers the story? Mind reading again? Oh, not a bit of it. Simple deduction. Ah, there were too many details. If someone else had talked to the reporters, they would only have known the broad outlines, but the papers had the lot. Who else could have given it to them? Faultless logic. Bravo. Thank you. Actually, I just wanted to find out if there'd been any unreported cases. The rest was, um, well, as you say, lucky. What will happen to her, do you suppose? Well, first offence, genuine repentance, no real harm done. Well, I believe she'll be treated lightly. Oh, good, good. Mm -hmm. Publicity won't hurt her career. Her legitimate career, I mean. Excellent. Mm. <laughs> was Jones right? About what? Did you know that Fillimore would disappear? Well, it was his speciality, if you recall. And, um, <clears throat> do you know how he did it? I know this. No one will ever find him. So y you don't know? He's changed his name at least once. He'll undoubtedly do it again. 
Perhaps his appearance, too, this time. Or you, you do know, and you're not going to tell me. Uh, I think we can rest assured that Mr. James Fillimore will never again be seen in this world. What were you saying? <laughs> Doesn't matter. In The Singular Inheritance of Miss Gloria Wilson, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Gloria Wilson was played by Toya Wilcox, James Fillimore by Roy Hudd, Inspector Athelney Jones by Sean Probert and The Ringmaster by Sean Baker. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Singular Inheritance of Miss Gloria Wilson was written by Bert Coules from a reference in the short story The Problem of Thor Bridge by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. Look around you, my young friend. A library is a perfect reflection of the ideal world. Every single volume in my care has its allotted place in the great scheme of things. Move one, even by an infinitesimal degree, and you diminish its value. It is the relationship between facts which gives them their meaning. However well concealed, the truth is always there. To be detected. <laughs> At least, that is my view. And I should like to think that you agree with me, hmm? Mr. Holmes. The Saviour of Cripplegate Square by Bert Coules. With Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson. And featuring Tom Baker as Collington Smith, Siobhan Redmond as Mrs. Emily Guttridge, David Holt as Tobias Guttridge, and Jasmine Hyde as Jenny Snell. The Saviour of Cripplegate Square. What a filthy night. God only knows what's going on under cover of that. Crime, you mean? Yeah, of course. Oh, oh, damn weather. Not much, I'd wager. How's the old war wound? Oh, making its presence felt. Hmm. <sighs> what do you mean, not much? Well, it's fog. It's the criminal's friend. On a night like this, most self-respecting villains are safely tucked up with a drink and a good smoke. Mm, both of which they probably stole from some honest, hard-working citizen. Yes, no doubt. Brandy? Uh, thank you, yes. <laughs> uh, you don't mind? No, no, of course not. Take my mind off my damn shoulder. <laughs> I'll do my best. <sighs> No, don't stop. Uh, not too depressing for a cold winter's night? I wouldn't have called it depressing. Plaintive, yes. Plaintive. Yeah, that's the very word. A dying man lies alone, helplessly waiting for the woman he loves. For her sake, he's turned his back on everything. His friends, his country, his hopes for the future. And now... He waits for her, and she does not appear. What's it from? Tristan uh, and Isolde, a hymn to love and death. Oh, he had a pretty bleak view of love, your Wagner. Oh, it's a bleak emotion. Oh, come on. Well, the Elizabethans had the right idea. To them, love was a, a disease. If you caught it, you were doomed. I'll stick to my definitions, thank you. Here. <sighs> love 
It's a positive force for good. Love brings out the best in man. Well, I think so, yeah. Oh. You should have met Tobias and Emily Gutteridge. Who oh, the devil were they? <clears throat> the Gutteridges of Cripplegate Square. <laughs> yes, they caught the disease. You mean they were in love? Mm, it goes somewhat further than that. One of your cases? Just before you and I met. Hmm. Is it um, a good story? Um, come on, Watson, if you want to hear it, say so. Ah, of course I want to hear it. Uh, a dark tale for a dark night. Uh, very well, Doctor. Keep the brandy to hand, light up a cigar, and let me shatter your illusions about love. The Annals of Crime, Police Review 1880, Criminals and Their Characteristics, A Survey of Delinquent Behaviour. Your books, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I don't believe I've ever mentioned Collington Smith. Never. Nathaniel Collington Smith. He worked in the library at the British Museum. When I came down from the university, I spent a good deal of time there, reading up on various subjects. Like the history of crime? Ah, <clears throat> it's an essential study for a detective. If they'd put in a book collection down at Scotland Yard, their success rate would soar. <laughs> Only if you persuaded them to read the books. Uh, Smith could have persuaded them. He had that rare combination. He not only possessed knowledge, he was able to infuse others with the, uh, the thirst for it. If I might make a small comment. Uh, of course. Criminals and their characteristics. It is perhaps a trifle unsound. Uh, you've read it? Oh. <laughs> oh, dear, no. Librarians don't read books, Mr. Holmes. They simply know about them. <laughs> unsound? Well, that's a general opinion. Sloppily argued from some highly dubious data. Well, then please take it back. Why? I've no wish to clutter my mind with useless information. My dear sir, your mind may not have elastic walls, but it does at least possess both an entrance and an exit. Read the book. Decide for yourself what to retain. One can learn from the unsound as well as the sound, you know. Surely they taught you that up at the university. Oh, Mr. Smith, anyone foolish enough to have voiced that sentiment would have been rapidly removed from the building and confined as a lunatic. Really? <laughs> Fascinating. What a good job I never went there. <laughs> he was a remarkable man. He sounds it. Yes, I learned a good deal in that reading room, and by no means all of it from the books. This is the finest place in the capital to study one's fellow man. In the course of a single morning here, you can observe more characteristics than in a week outside. Only the other day, I noticed that... I heard nothing. I'm sure... Yes, listen. Ah, that's a woman crying. I thought I was right. Probably one of the cleaning staff. I I'm sorry, you were saying? Mr. Holmes, you disappoint me. In what way? I believe it's emanating from that storeroom. Come with me. <laughs> My dear child, what are you doing in here? Sorry, sir, it won't happen again, sir. I'll get back to work. You'll do nothing of the sort. Sir? Sugar? Sir? Do you take sugar? Oh, no, sir, no, thank you. Very well. Mr. Holmes, kindly pass over that plate of biscuits, will you? Oh, uh, y yes, of course. <coughs> here. I, I, I should be going. No, I think perhaps you should stay. Very well. Excellent. Now, I am Nathaniel Collington Smith, and this gentleman is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and you are... Jenny, sir. Jenny Snell. Drink your tea, Miss Snell. I shouldn't be in here. If Miss McCarthy finds out... Oh, you may safely leave Miss McCarthy to me. Drink your tea, then Mr. Holmes will pour you some more, and you can tell us what's wrong. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. That was typical of the man. She wasn't a servant to him, oh, just a soul in distress. 
What was the matter with the girl? Obviously it was nothing trivial. How do you know that? Well, if it were, you'd hardly be telling me about it, would you? When do we get to the gutteridges of Cripplegate Square? Patience, Doctor. Let the tale unfold at its own pace. That's better. Now, Miss Snell, what is it that so upset you? I... Uh, can't tell you. Is it something to do with your other job? How did you know about that? I've observed you once or twice arriving here in the evenings as I was leaving. You always come wearing some sort of uniform. Obviously, you have other employment during the day. I'm a nursemaid. Well, not really a nursemaid, just sort of a cleaner, really, ah. like here. During the day, I work at Guttridge's private orphanage in Clerkenwell. Have you heard of it? No. Mrs Guttridge, she's the owner. She takes in babies. Orphans, presumably. No, sir, not orphans, though most of them might as well be. Within what? Unwanted children, Mr Holmes. Unwanted? Well, for what reason? There are many. Caste space, social stigma, general encumbrance. Good God. Something else they didn't teach you up at the university? Hmm? Yes. Anyway, the women bring their babies to Mrs Guttridge and she takes them in. So she's a, a philanthropist? Sir? I think you'll find that money changes hands. Ah. Baby farming. You're talking about baby farming. The concept was totally new to me, though. It was quite a shock. It's a shocking practice. No, I mean it was a shock realising how little I actually knew of life. A valuable lesson. Yeah, I'm sure it must have been. So, uh, this girl Jenny worked for a baby farmer? Yes. The women pay so much a week, or sometimes they just make one donation. Uh, and what happens to the children? Mrs Guttridge looks after them until they're older. Then she finds people to take them. I see. And something's happened to upset this arrangement? Yes, sir. Something connected with Mrs Guttridge? No, sir, not her. Oh. It's her husband. Oh, he's a nasty piece of work, sir, though I shouldn't say so. Get out of here, girl. You've no business in here. Uh, please, sir. Mrs Guttridge sent me to fetch some iodine, sir. Iodine? Yes, sir. Oh, very well. You fetch this yourself, you understand. I was not here. Oh, very good, sir. Thank you, sir. Tell her otherwise, and I'll see you're dismissed. Now go. Where did this conversation take place? I in one of the storerooms, sir, where the medicines and things are kept. Interesting. Go on with your story, Jenny. I mean, surely you're not so upset just because someone told you off. <laughs> if I was, I'd always be crying, sir. <laughs> no, it's more than that. Give us the facts. Well... I'm not sure if I can. Not real facts, like... Without the facts? How can we help you? Well... There's more to life than cold facts, Mr Holmes. Jenny, suppose you tell us this in your own way. Yes, sir. Well, there's something wrong in that house. Something very wrong. If it was just Mrs Guttridge, everything would be so different. But it's her husband who causes you this alarm. He hates them, sir. The poor little babies, he hates them. <laughs> For the love of God, can't you shut them up? Some of them are sick, sir. What, again? Mistress says they'll be over it soon. <sighs> Why she has to devote her life to this, I cannot tell. She says they need her, sir. They need her. She was a rare woman. Most of them are only interested in the money. The babies come a very poor second. You speak from experience? Oh, indirectly. These people are supposed to be registered... Local doctors carry out regular checks. Oh, the stories I've heard. Oh, oh. Well, perhaps this one will be different. I hope it is. There. That's good. Oh, that's nice. He'll have nothing to moan about now, will he? The old misery. Feeling better now, are you? Are you? Many of them were dead. Three. There were three who'd been sick. And, sir, this was the day after I saw Mr. Guttridge messing about with the medicines. Mm. 
the very next day. Ah. As God's in his heaven, sirs, I... I think he killed them. It wouldn't be the first time, I'm afraid. Did the Guttridges have the babies insured? As usual, you cut straight to the heart of the matter. Yes, they did. Ah, was there a doctor's report? Mrs Guttridge did everything by the letter of the law. The doctor was sent for straight away. And? No obvious cause of death. Hmm. It may not have been the most rigorous examination. Those East End practices are desperately overworked. Mm, some of the doctors there are not above taking money to turn a blind eye. That is a dis. Disgusting suggestion. Which you know full well to be true. Every barrel has its rotten apples, Watson. They will always be so. Uh, yes, I'm afraid you're right. I take it you investigated this Guttridge man, then? Was it your first murder case? Actually, I was reluctant to get involved. You must go to the police. <laughs> the police? I can't! Don't you know what happens to servants who criticise the masters, sir? I'll be out on my ear in no character. Then what would happen to me? You have your job here. Four hours work at five pence a night. Could you live on that? No, he couldn't. I understand your problem, my dear. There's something else, sir. Something I haven't said. And what is that? She's afraid that Guttridge knows of her suspicion. That's it, sir. He knows I saw him doing it, whatever it was, with the medicines. When was this? Uh, five days ago. Have you been into work there since? Every day. I'd get the elbow otherwise. You are a very brave young woman. Brave? Not me, sir. I've been terrified, I can tell you straight. Has Mr Guttridge said anything to you or done anything suspicious? No, but I've kept away from him best I could. Very sensible of you. <clears throat> My young friend here will look into the matter. Oh, sir. Smith? I'm ever so grateful, sir. I had to tell someone. I'm glad it was you. Another fine night. Why did you say that to the girl? Well, my dear Mr. Holmes, surely you found her story interesting. Well, of course. The girl is observant, intelligent. Their suspicions are probably correct. And she appears to have great faith in your ability to help her, which I share. Well, thank you. The fact remains, I don't see what on earth I can do. You can stir yourself out from behind your books and look into the real world for a change. What sort of a detective turns his back on a possible murder case? I can hardly march up to this woman's establishment and tell her I'm investigating three suspicious deaths. Of course you can't. But there are other ways. Put that brain of yours to use. Uh, oh! oh. oh. Good evening, sir. What's your pleasure? Uh, whiskey, please. And one for yourself. Oh, thank you, sir. Pleasure to encounter a real gent for a change. Oh. There. Best in the house. Thank you. Now, sir, what tickles your fancy? Big, skinny, right for the plucking? What are you after? What I'm after is information. What sort of information? Do you know a man called Guttridge? It was a mistake, of course. She shut her mouth and didn't open it again. Oh, they're very suspicious of strangers in those parts, mm. especially ones from up west. Mm, so I discovered <laughs> it was a stupid miscalculation. <laughs> Don't berate yourself. The basic idea was perfectly sound. If you want the local gossip, go to the local pub. Mm. Just don't go dressed for the opera. <laughs> <laughs> well, I trust you didn't give up the quest quite that easy. No, of course not. I waited until it was full dark and went round to the house itself. The area wasn't pleasant. Guttridge's private orphanage was a rambling old building set back from the street. It must have been quite a place in its day. Didn't you feel even more conspicuous there than in the pub? Oddly enough, no, I didn't. Evening wear is ideally suited to hiding in undergrowth. Every burglar should invest in a set of tails. Easy now. Easy. She'll be safe and well cared for. And you can come and visit her whenever you want. I've told you that. I don't think I could bear it. I really don't. I understand. But if you change your mind, there's always a welcome for you here. You were so kind. Without you, I, I'd have had to... No. <laughs> There's no sense dwelling on might-have-beens. 
You'll be all right going home. <laughs> it's not far. I'll, I'll be quite safe. Oh. Oh. <laughs> there, there, child. It's mended. Everything's all right now. It was immensely frustrating. I could see in the front door, but I couldn't learn anything of use. There was no sign of Mr. Gutteridge at all. If I'm going to see this thing through, I need to get inside. And how exactly do you propose to do that? I don't know yet. If I might make a small suggestion. Oh, please do. This could be an ideal opportunity to put some of that expensive university experience to good use. Applied chemistry? That wasn't what I had in mind, no. Try to think in something other than straight lines. So that's where you got it from. Watson, you're interrupting my flow. Got what from? That infuriating expression. How many times have you told me to stop thinking in straight lines? Very good advice. Well, did it work? Actually, yes, it did. Oh! oh well, shit! I'm sorry, mate. Miles away. Yeah, the best place for you. All right, all right. Keep your shirt on. <laughs> Some people, eh? Are you really saying Watson. that was... No, 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 sorry, but this is fascinating. You're saying that was the very first time you ever used a disguise? Exactly so, thinking sideways, you see. What did I do at university apart from study? I acted. You've never told me that. You never asked me. May I continue? You know, no more interruptions, I promise. What did you find when you got to the orphanage? What I expected to find. My primary suspect. Yes? I want to see Mrs Gutteridge. What makes you think she's here? Oh, look, mate, don't mess me about. This is Gatrich's private orphanage, right? Where else is she going to be? Who are you? I'm, I'm someone who wants to see the proprietor. Look, please, please. Who is it, Toby? It's someone for you. Then why didn't you send Jenny to find me? Good afternoon. Mrs Gatrich, I was told... <laughs> yeah, look... Yeah. It's a chilly day. We'll be more comfortable inside. Now, Mr... Hawkins, ma'am. Albert Hawkins. Now, Mr Hawkins, you drink your tea and I'll tell you why you've come to me. Ma'am? There. Oh, uh, thanks. What do you mean, ma'am? You'll tell me. My dear Mr Hawkins, people only come here for one reason. The details vary, but the basic facts are always the same. Now, let me see. You're in work, yes? Yes, uh, market supervisor. Decent enough pay, but not enough to feed one more mouth. Am I right? Well, we've, we've got five already. Look, uh, no offence and all, but if there was any other way, I wouldn't be here. You're not alone, Mr Hawkins. Oh, no, you're definitely not alone. At least you didn't do something drastic. I'd have nothing to do with that, and no more would my else. I've seen what those butchers do. And so have I. I'm sorry to say, we shan't mention it again. Oh. Does your wife know you're here? Oh, yes. Good. Well, we do have space at the moment. Would you like to see round the house? Well, I wouldn't mind. Uh, put my mind at rest, like. Of course. Drink up your tea and I'll give you a tour. You've made a good choice, Mr Hawkins. I never take in more babies than I can cope with, unlike some, I'm sorry to say. Oh, we have heard stories, my else and me. And some of them are undoubtedly true, I'm afraid. Uh, what happens if they get sick? I can care for most common illnesses myself, and of course we're registered with a local doctor. Oh, good, that's, that's good. Um, <laughs> and they do look all right, like <laughs> Look at them, sleeping so peaceful. Happy, in it? So, I suppose all I, all I need to know now... Well, uh... I think there's still some cherry cake downstairs. We can discuss the practicalities over some more tea. Come along. The practicalities turned out to be threepence a day or a single payment of five pounds. Good Lord. Yes, it was certainly more than the going rate I checked, but it was a superior establishment. How many working-class women could afford five pounds? Well, when you consider the alternatives... Well, I'm afraid the alternatives are the only way for most people in that position. Something's going to have to be done, you know, sooner or later. I agree, but we're straying somewhat from the story. Oh, yes, sorry, sorry. Uh, did you manage to see that medicine storeroom? Uh, it would have been too out of character, I'm afraid. 
but I did at least succeed in getting another look at the alleged child killer. He was summoned to show me out. Your wife's a wonderful woman, Mr. Gutridge. So I'm constantly being told. Oh, you must be proud of her. There are perhaps nobler ways to make a living. Oh, I can't think of any. She's a real godsend, she is. Do you say so? I do, sir. God bless her, and you too. Good day to you, Mr. Hawkins. Good day. There's a definite undercurrent of... Oh, well, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Hate, possibly? Weariness, distaste? I'm not prepared to brand him as a murderer on the strength of it. I'm pleased to hear it. I have to know what's in that medicine store. And how do you propose to find out? Well, I've thought of two separate ways. Uh, neither of them is ideal. One is positively illegal. And the other? No! I can't! Jenny! I suppose he catches me. I'll make sure he's out of the way. But I wouldn't know what to look for. I'll give you a list. A list? Sir, what good's a list to me? You can't read. Nor write. No, sir, I can't. Thank God for it. Holmes, what the devil were you thinking of? Collington Smith used exactly those words. Good for him. To put that child into danger... I had a perfectly foolproof diversion worked out. Oh, did you? <sighs> As I said, it was a long time ago. I wouldn't do it now. Oh, unless there was no other way. The point is academic. I had to fall back on my second plan of attack. The illegal one. Quite. I know exactly what it was. Of course you do. Mr. Holmes, I cannot condone such blatant criminal activity. Unless, of course, it yielded the desired result. Arsenic. He's been concentrating pure arsenic and storing it in unmarked bottles in a locked cupboard. Then young Miss Snell was quite correct. It looks like it. What will you do now? Oh, uh, there's one more piece of evidence I need. And then? Then my case will be complete. A detective? Do you mean from Scotland Yard? A private detective. Are you sick? Injured? No. Sir, I have a room full of patients out there and a hundred more waiting to take their place. I don't mean to be rude, but I have no time to play games. This is no game. You were the official medical examiner for Guttridge's orphanage, are you not? What about it? I have been commissioned to investigate the recent deaths of three infants. Mr... Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Holmes, when you leave my rooms, look around you. Look at the filth and the squalor and the hunger and ask yourself which is the stranger, that children die or that they manage to live. Have you seen inside Mrs. Guttridge's establishment? Have you met the lady herself? Yes, I have. Then you'll know that the children there live like royalty compared to most. I've seen Mrs. Guttridge take in babies who are more bone than flesh. If some of them don't survive, then look outside that house for the cause, sir, not inside it. Now, if you don't mind, I have to do my best to help these people. Will you answer just two questions? If you will agree to ask them and then leave. I agree. Then ask me your questions. Did you conduct a thorough examination of the dead babies? As thorough as my time and my resources permitted, yes, I did. And did you detect any signs at all of arsenical poisoning? <laughs> arsenic? Good God, no. Not a trace. You believed him. I was impressed with him. I've said to you before now that when a doctor goes wrong, he makes a formidable criminal. Yes, you have. I can't say I was flattered. I think perhaps this will redress the balance. In all my life, I've not met many people who are thoroughly decent, uncomplicated, good men. And of the ones I have met, several of them were doctors. 
You appear to have arrived at something of an impasse, my friend. Well, why else is arsenic there, if not to kill all those children? Rats? Well, you can buy poison for vermin over the counter at any chemist shop. If I read the evidence aright, that arsenic was being produced in secret, then hidden away. Then what do you propose to do now? Well, I suppose it could be nothing more than a coincidence. I have to talk to that girl again. Jenny. Oh. oh. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to start. Oh, it's not you, sir, it's me. I'm just frightened at any little noise now. You're not going to ask me to spy on him again, are no, you? No, 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 no. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about asking you before. It was wrong. Please forgive me. Forgive you? Forgive? <gasps> My dear Miss Snell, I, um, please stop crying. Sorry, sir. I, I'm really... What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. It's just, well... People like me don't get apologised to, that's all. Then you do forgive me? Oh, of course I do, sir. He was only trying to help me after all. Thank you. So, what do you want this time? I want to ask you this. When you surprise Mr Guttridge with the medicines, can you remember what he was doing? Exactly what he was doing? Well... It might help if you tell me what he was working with. Do you remember? I, I'm not sure. No, no, recall the scene. Mrs Guttridge asked you to get some iodine. That's right. So you had to stop what you were doing. What was that? I was washing the sheets. I just put the clean ones on the beds and I was washing the old very ones. Very good, very good. So you had to stop washing the sheets and you went to the medicine store. Was the door open or shut? Shut. It was shut. Excellent, excellent. You pushed open the door and you saw Mr Gutteridge. Was he facing you? No. He had his back to the door. That's right. He was bending over the table. He turned round and he had... Fly papers. He was holding fly papers. Fly papers? Made by impregnating a strip of paper with a weak solution of... of arsenic. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Soak the paper in water, boil the solution dry, and what's left is pure, concentrated poison. Pretty damning. Conclusive. There you are. Oh, not too fast now. Good. When you've finished here, Jenny, collect up the bottles and leave them to soak. Yes, Mum. I'll be in the scullery if you need me. Mum. Oh, yes, you like that, don't you? Of course you do. That's the way. You, girl. Oh, sir. Stop that and come with me. I want to talk to you. Get in. Get in there. No! No! Quiet, girl. Go in, I say. Listen to me. I want to know exactly what you saw in here the other day. You understand? Exactly. I'm afraid I have some disturbing news. Oh? What news? I've been speaking to the cleaning supervisor. Jenny Snell hasn't come into work for the past four nights. Oh, God. No, it didn't look good. What did you do? I trusted that my disguise really had taken them in and went round to Guttridge's orphanage as myself. Quite a risk. It had to be done. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sherlock Holmes. I'm here to inquire about Miss Jennifer Snell. Then you'd better come in. What happened? I was presented with this. Here. But surely... Exactly. A fatal error. But what did it mean? Had he killed her, too? The girl had been silenced. I'm afraid I could see no other explanation. What did you do? To be honest, I wasn't sure what to do. I want to ask your advice. My advice? My dear sir, I'm just a tired old librarian too rapidly approaching an unwilling retirement. What could you possibly wish to ask me? If I should go to the police with what I know, or confront the murderer myself. What was Smith's advice? To do neither. Neither? Why on earth not? For a very good reason, which I'd completely overlooked. You're too eager to show off your cleverness. A calculating criminal has made a slip, and Sherlock Holmes has detected it, am I correct? Uh, well, yes, I suppose you are. But if I'm, if I'm right, 
and the girl has been done away with. Then justice must be done, of course. But it seems to me, Mr. Holmes, that you're proposing to confront your villain with only half a case. You may have solved this new crime, but what of the old one? The dead babies. He was quite right, of course. I had nothing to link the three dead infants with the secret store of arsenic. No evidence whatsoever of foul play. What did you do? Something you've seen me do many times. I just sat and smoked and thought. And eventually, I saw the truth. And then I knew exactly what course I should take. Mr. Holmes, I fail to see how I can help you further. I've given you Jenny's home address. I suggest you contact her at her father's. I doubt if I should find her there. What do you mean by that? But I'm not here solely about Miss Snell. I'm investigating the recent deaths of three babies in your care, Mrs. Guttridge. Those children died of natural causes, God rest their souls. I have the doctor's certificates. I'm well aware of that. Then what is there to investigate? A very great deal. For instance, I know that your medicine store contains a hidden supply of concentrated arsenic. What? And I know that the arsenic was used to kill those infants. But there was no trace of poison. You know that. Oh, yes. And finally, I know that Jenny Snell was unfortunate enough to stumble onto what was happening and was killed to keep her silent. Jenny's dead? Unfortunately for her killer, she came to me first. She can't be dead. It's a lie. Toby, tell him. I already have. She had to leave unexpected. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, my mum died sudden. I have to go home. There you are. Actually, it's, it's quite well done, except for one rather significant detail. What are you on about? Next time you forge a farewell letter, Gutteridge, I suggest you first make sure that your victim knows how to write. Tobias, tell me this isn't true. What did you do with the body, Gutteridge? There's new returned earth in the back garden. Shall we go and dig it up? Oh, dear God. I have you, Gutteridge. There's no sense in denying it. I'm not going to deny it. Oh, dear God. Oh, dear Lord. How could you do it? Why? Well, will you tell her or shall I? I had to shut her up. She knew I killed those babies. Toby! Don't say nothing, Emily. You admit it. You killed Jennifer Snell. I said so, And yes. the three children. Yes. Oh, Toby. How? What do you mean, how? Oh. It was brilliantly done. Not a trace of poison in their system. Tell me how you did it. Well, very well then. Tell me why. Perhaps it was for the insurance money. Yes. Yes, that's it. The insurance. The insurance money goes to your wife. I checked. I ask you again. Just how were the murders done? You don't know. Of course you don't know, because you were not the killer. I tell you, you I was. You found the evidence. You knew there had been foul play, even though you didn't know the method. And since then, you've done everything in your power to protect the real murderer. To protect your wife. Only she handles the children. Only she supervises their food and their medicine. And only she stands to benefit from their deaths. No! I've had enough of this. Please remain exactly where you are. Thank you. Ah, since one of you can't explain and the other won't, permit me. It's been done on adults before now, but never on children. So I congratulate you on a totally original crime. You start with the smallest of amounts, almost infinitesimal, I suppose, on an infant. Then you build up the dose, a fraction of a grain by a fraction of a grain, day by day, until you have a child hopelessly addicted to arsenic. Keep administering the drug, and the child lives. Withhold it, and the result is death, and not a trace of anything harmful to be detected. Clever and diabolical. You've got no proof. I have abundant proof. 
It's here, in this house. You'll find no arsenic here. Of course I won't. You've destroyed it all. Just as you destroyed that innocent young girl, and for the same reason, a perverted desire to protect your wife. Toby, my dear... Don't say anything, Emily. You're right. He's got no proof. Tell him, Mrs. Guttridge. What? Tell me what? Tell him the rest. Tell him the three wasn't going to be enough. What? Tell him that every single one of the babies in this house is already a drug addict, waiting to be casually snuffed out the next time you felt the whim or the need for power or some ready cash. Tell him. You are so wrong. I don't think so. A whim. Power. Money. That's not why I do it. Emily. Do you know what my babies have to look forward to, Mr. Holmes? Do you know about the factories and the workhouses and the filth and the squalor? Have you seen the children begging and stealing? Have you seen them selling their bodies on the streets for a penny a time? I've seen them. Well, before it comes to that, for a time, for a tiny, fleeting time, I can give them warmth and comfort and love. And then, then I can make sure the world doesn't get them and soil them and wear them down and finally destroy them like animals. And don't you tell me that what I do is wrong. It's the world that's wrong, sir. Forget about me. I don't matter. Do something about the world out there, if you can. What are you going to do with us? Take you to the police. And then it'll be the courts, and then... The hangman? I imagine so. Then tell me this, Mr Holmes. What will happen to my babies now? You tell me that. I didn't know what to say. I have one question. What is it? The evidence of the other children. Were you sure? Or was it just bluff on your part? It wasn't a bluff. One of the side effects of progressive arsenic addiction is unnatural lethargy and calm, especially in the young. I'd seen the signs when she showed me around the house on my first visit. I just didn't recognise them for what they were until later. So, all the children are due for the same fate. Dear God. The doctor thinks they can be slowly weaned off the stuff. They might live. If you can call the world that's waiting for them a life... Oh. Come now, Mr. Holmes. Whatever our experiences may suggest, I like to think that the world is basically a good place. There's still tolerance and warmth and humanity out there. Don't you believe that? I'd very much like to meet that man. I'm afraid that's not possible. He died last year. Oh. I'm... Um... I'm sorry. Thank you. Why didn't the doctor recognize the symptoms in the other children? Uh, I dare say I was a lot more familiar with the signs of poisoning than he was. Besides, he had no reason to look for them. He saw clean sheets and good care and was grateful for it. Hmm. So, that was your story about love? It was. Gutteridge loved his wife, murderer or no. He loved her so much that he was willing to take her guilt on himself and to kill to protect her. And she loved the children. And so she murdered them. You still insist that love is a positive force for good? Yes, of course I do. You can't argue from the particular to the general like that. It's, um, it's thinking in straight lines. Touché, Doctor. A palpable hit. Mm. Oh, uh, what a sordid business. Poor Jenny Snell. The wrong place at the wrong time. She must have walked in on Guttridge at the very moment he discovered the arsenic. How can a young girl's life hang on such a slender thread? Yes, how indeed. <sighs> yeah, was Smith right, do you think? Is the world basically a good place? I believe so. Don't you... I wish I could, my friend. I wish I could. Uh, I think the rain stopped. 
Yes, it has. In The Saviour of Cripplegate Square, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Collington Smith was played by Tom Baker, Emily Guttridge by Siobhan Redmond, Tobias Guttridge by David Holt, and Jenny Snell by Jasmine Hyde. The Doctor was played by Andrew Wincott, and the Landlady by Helen Ayres. The violinists were Leonard Friedman and Bernard Doherty. The Saviour of Cripplegate Square was written by Bert Coules from a reference in the novel The Sign of the Four by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. Wet day, isn't it? Yes. Shall I ring down for some tea? Do you want some tea? Not really. You? Not really. I shan't bother then. The Abergavenny Murder by Bert Cools, with Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson, and featuring Yoan Meredith as the client. The Abergavenny Murder. Three drops of this. Yes, and two of this. Bring out slowly. Heat. And wait. Wait. Well, come on. Holmes, what are you doing? Chemistry. Oh, yes, I had managed to work that out for myself. What's the experiment? It's obscure, unimportant, inconclusive, and exceedingly boring. Well. If it's unimportant, why are you doing it? In a vain attempt to prevent my brain from shriveling up and dying in this desert. Wet sort of desert? You know what I mean. Oh, there'll be another case along soon. You make crime sound like a London omnibus. If it were, Baker Street would be the busiest route. Not at the moment. No. And perhaps never again. What on earth do you mean? Haven't you been reading the papers? Three major crimes in the capital in the last month, and who solves them? Lestrade. Lestrade. And what's more, this time he really did solve them. It wasn't me pulling the strings and working him from out of sight. Well, at least you can take comfort from one thing. I can. Of course. You taught him practically everything he knows. That's completely irrelevant. It was on a lucky streak, that's all. I thought you didn't believe in such things. Well, if you want to put it in more scientific terms, random factors have operated in his favour. Three times in a row. No need to rub it in. With luck or skill, it won't last. Any day now, he'll be round here begging for your help. Mm, crowing in my face more like he and all the rest of them. What's supposed to happen? Not the subtlest change of subject, Doctor. No. Oh, well? Uh, the solution clears when it reaches boiling point. And that means? I'm not sure I remember. Perhaps you will when it happens. Perhaps. So I've sometimes thought about writing a monograph on memory and its relation to crime. What? How much witnesses can recall? That sort of thing. Mm, how much and how accurately. I did once get as far as doing some preliminary research. What did you discover? Well, that in most cases, most witnesses recall next to nothing, and what they do remember, they almost invariably get wrong. It doesn't sound too promising. For your monograph, I mean? Exactly the conclusion I came to myself. Ah. Here we go. Hmm. I'd say we've reached boiling point. An impeccable bit of observation, and the solution is still cloudy. What does that mean? Probably that I've been wasting my time for the last two hours. 
Ah, I swear to you, Watson, if someone doesn't call soon, you'll find yourself sharing rooms with a gibbering madman. <laughs> oh, how disappointing. What is? I was rather hoping the doorbell would ring. It would have been like a moment from one of your lurid adventures. Unfortunately, this is reality. Is it? Sometimes I wonder. Oh, well. Ah, you see? A client. Or the postman, the butcher's boy, a friend of Mrs Hudson's. Uh, not so one can have too much reality. It's a client. No, no. There's no need. You see? No time. I'll go straight up. An impatient client. Better and better. A very good afternoon to you, Mr... Oh, yes, do come in. How can we be of service? Dr Watson. You have to help me. Mr Holmes. They're going to kill me. Good Lord. Holmes, get the brandy. Right. Uh, sir. Sir, c can you hear me? What's wrong with him? Uh, just a moment. Uh, here, give him this. Ah. Uh, I'm afraid it won't help. He's dead. Dead? Looks like heart failure. They're going to kill me. Are you sure it's natural causes? I can't be completely sure. Not without a post-mortem. Shall I clear the table? Holmes, for pity's sake, a man is dead. Yes, my apologies, Doctor. We must get the police. Yes, I suppose we must. I'll ask Mrs Hudson to send a note round to the station. Make it Scotland Yard. Oh? Uh, I really don't want some local constable stumbling his way around the sitting room, do you? Oh, Scotland Yard it is, then. Besides, given the Strait's current monopoly, his colleagues are probably as bored as we are. Uh, this will give them something to do. How much shall I tell them? As little as possible. Right. Intrigue them. Dangle some of your trademark suspense in their faces and let their... What's wrong? <laughs> Incredible. I was about to say, and let their imaginations do the rest. This boredom really has addled my brain. The words Scotland Yard and imagination shouldn't be allowed in the same paragraph, let alone the same sentence. No, you're too hard on them. Impossible. There. Yeah. I'll take you down. It's, don't tell Mrs Hudson what's happened. She'll only want to come up here and tidy the poor chap away. I've no intention of telling her. And I, I'd better say we're not to be disturbed until the police arrive. Good idea. W what did you put? Oh, just that we require their urgent assistance. <laughs> the reverse of the old situation. That'll please them. Yes, it won't be a moment. Well, both of us will wait for you. You know, I think I preferred you when you were bored. <laughs> now, my friend... <laughs> Let's see if you can be more informative in death than you were while you were alive. That's interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, that's strange. Extremely strange. Well? She sent the maid. Was she curious about our visitor? Uh, uh, more angry than curious. I should have shown him up and denounced him, Doctor. But would he let me? He would not. Some King Wet he was, too. I, I should have taken his coat. Is he a bad lot? Will you and Mr Holmes be safe? Yes, and what did you say to that? I told her he posed absolutely no threat whatsoever, and that he wasn't in the least bothered about being wet. What have you found? Nothing. Nothing? His pockets are empty, his clothes are unmarked. So we know nothing whatsoever about him? I wouldn't go quite that far. To start with the obvious, he was a butler, possibly in a large townhouse. The obvious. His clothes, Doctor. Not a gentleman's, but not a tradesman's either. Add the formal collar and the rest and the conclusion's inescapable. I don't know. But the final proof was the way he entered the room. Well, it seemed to me he just staggered in. Well, he staggered along the landing, yes. We staggered once he was over the threshold, yes. But in between, he did something highly distinctive, which only subordinates do. Which was? Well, he stopped for a fraction of a second just outside the doorway. He straightened up and composed his features, or tried to, at least, the unmistakable sign of the well-trained servant at the quality of his clothing and his age, and you have a butler. A butler with no jacket and no hat. Yes, that is interesting, isn't it? As is the fact that he's neglected his general appearance, though not, I suspect, from choice. Oh? I believe he might have been living rough, though not for more than a night or two. We already knew, of course, that he was in fear of his life from more than one assassin. Uh, how did you deduce the living rough? 
Ah, a certain overall shabbiness, ingrained dirt under the fingernails, a rather less than comprehensive shave, and the fact that his boots haven't been removed for well over 24 hours. His boots haven't been removed? As you can tell by the mud encrusted on the laces. Hmm? Put all that together, and living rough seems a reasonable hypothesis. More than just reasonable, surely? No, there's not enough data for a firmer conclusion, though, of course, uh, a lack of information is in itself informative. You mean it's significant that he was walking round with completely empty pockets? Yes, no money, no means of identification, no keys, nothing personal at all. It's fascinating. You know, the police are going to be sorely disappointed. I beg your pardon? The police. Well, look at it from their point of view. They're summoned here, shown a body, told the tale. And they'll expect you to reel off every last detail about this poor chap, from his shoe size to his mother's maiden name. Oh. Holmes? You're right, you're absolutely right. Well, don't take it to heart, old man. My reputation, Watson. Oh, come on. No, 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 no. It's not vanity. Oh? No, it's sheer practicality. Let the official forces see me fail, and how ready will they be to bring me their cases? I thought they weren't doing that anyway. Then, then split hairs, Doctor. Sooner or later, they'll come up against something that's beyond even the strayed's lucky streak. Why should they bring it to me if I can't solve a mystery on my own hearth rug? Give them the facts you just gave me. They'll be impressed, all right. No, it's not enough. What more do we know? What more? Nothing, surely. Ah, there is something. There is something. You remember what he said? Of course. They're trying to kill me. No, that wasn't it. I could have sworn. Well, you and almost every other witness prepared to swear on the good book because you're sure. You're wrong, nonetheless. All right, then. What did he say? He said, they're going to kill me. Not trying. Going. Is that really a significant difference? Oh, shame on you, Doctor. And you're a man of letters. Well, I understand the distinction. I just meant, given the state he was in, would he have been that careful with his choice of words? I believe so. And there's something else. Do you recall the whole of what he said? Not just the part that grabbed your writer's imagination. Well, let me see. Uh, uh, while he was still downstairs, he insisted on coming straight up. I don't remember the exact words he used, though. No, not to worry. The speed and the anxiety are the significant factors there. What about when he reached the room? Well, uh, he said something like, um, Mr Holmes, I need your help. They're trying... No, no, they're going to kill me. And once again, you'd be prepared to swear to that, would you? Well, since you ask me, no, of course I wouldn't. I've obviously got something wrong. Uh, a detail. But if, if I'm right, a highly significant detail. All right, then, what did he say? Well, I was holding the door open for him. Mm -hmm. He staggered in and looked around and said, Dr Watson, you have to help me. Mr Holmes... They're going to kill me, and then he... Yes, you needn't recreate the rest, thank you. We'll run out of room on the floor. Dr Watson, you have to help me. Mr Holmes, they're going to kill me. You see the significance, of course. What, that he spoke to me first? Oh, that was just because he saw me first, surely? No, 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 he met my eyes as he came through the door. Oh, you really think it means... It means, my dear doctor, that he came here to see you, not me. It was your help he needed, not mine. I find that hard to believe. That's another interesting reversal, certainly. This case seems to have more than its fair share. Is it a case? Oh, most certainly. A case of the collapsed client. Mm, I think you should leave the writing to me. Uh, give me his words again. Dr Watson, you have to help me. Mr Holmes, they're going to kill me. It sounds to me as though he wanted help from both of us. But it was you he turned to first. He wanted you to do something for him, something specific, something that I couldn't do. What, something medical? Oh, no, surely not. If he realised how critical his condition was, why not go to his own doctor? Oh, I don't know where he lived, remember? My placing him in a townhouse, that was just speculation. But why me? It's not as though he was only taken ill when he got up here. He must have been feeling bad while he was still down in the street. Why not ask someone there for help? Why not stop a policeman? Now, that is a very interesting question. <sighs> yes, but back to our main investigation. Let's allow that he came here specifically to talk to you, to Dr John H. Watson. What is it about your good self that made him do so? <sighs> My medical qualifications are nothing special. I've been in the army. I've more experience than most with crime and criminals. My dear doctor, you're altogether too modest. You've omitted your most significant characteristic. I have? Watson, you're famous. 
Oh, I'd hardly put it as strongly as that. Well, you should. It's as capital a mistake to undervalue yourself as it is to do the opposite. You are John H. Watson, author. John H. Watson, biographer and confidant of Sherlock Holmes. John H. Watson, on whose every word hundreds of readers... Uh, thousands. My point exactly. John H. Watson, on whose every word thousands of avid readers hang enthralled and entranced. What you have, what our unfortunate friend there needed, is an audience. You're suggesting that he wanted me to tell his story? To publicise his case, exactly. What you see on the rug, my dear doctor, is a man who believed that he'd been done some grievous wrong. And more than that, he hoped that the weight of public opinion might have put things to rights if only the facts could have been shouted abroad. It's an awful lot to hang on the order of words in a sentence. But it makes logical sense, admit it. Mm, yes. Yes, it does. Ah, we progress. But what on earth could his story have been? Someone was going to kill him. No, more than one person. They, he said, they're going to kill me. Oh, a criminal gang of some sort? A secret society out for revenge? Now, you raise an important point. Why didn't he stop a policeman down in the street? And more significantly, why didn't he simply go to the police in the first place? Now, wouldn't that be the first instinct of any law-abiding citizen faced with a threat of death? Yes, it would. So he isn't... Uh, uh, he wasn't a law-abiding citizen? Well, it's a possibility. And one we can use as a starting point. Right. The man is a criminal, one of a gang. As you suggested, he falls foul of the others, he double-crosses them, and they swear revenge. No, I'm sorry, that won't work. Oh, why not? Because The Strand is a family magazine. No criminal would expect me to publish his story there. Hmm. Some of your stories... ...have been carefully edited for public consumption. You know that perfectly well. No, if this man expected me to publicise his case, then I don't think he could have been a criminal. Besides, appealing to the public, that's the act of an innocent man, isn't it? Yes, yes, you're right. <laughs> and, of course, the real answer's been staring me in the face. It has? Where can a hitherto respectable man acquire grime and general dishevelment in a very short space of time? Well, several places spring to mind. A hitherto respectable man who pointedly avoids talking to the authorities? Good Lord. You think he'd been in prison? Well, at the very least, in a holding cell in a police station, which means he must have escaped, hence the anxiety, the rush, and the empty pockets. Ah, because his possessions would have been taken away. Mm, standard procedure. Mm. And however attached a man might be to his pocketbook and his keys, if he just escaped from his cell, I doubt if he'd stop to retrieve them. Besides which, you already said that his state of mind would have been confused. In the extreme, if you're right, and coupled with his failing health, yes... Yes, I'll allow that it's possible. But well done, Holmes. Hmm. Well, I think we can go further. A man recently in jail who declares that he's about to be killed. The death penalty? Yeah, it seems a reasonable assumption. Murder? Or, or treason? In either case, he was so utterly convinced of his own innocence that he went to extraordinary lengths. A police station holding cell isn't an easy crib to crack. You don't think he's faced trial yet? He doesn't bear any of the signs of a condemned man. His hair has not been shaved, and those hands certainly haven't seen hard labour, even for a short time. No, you're right. So, no trial yet, but he was completely convinced that he'd be found guilty. The evidence against him must be overwhelming. Oh, probably circumstantial. Court standing over the body with a gun in his hand, that sort of thing. Add a motive, and there you are. Doesn't take much to condemn a man to death. I'd like to think it took more than that. Couldn't he have brought character witnesses? We don't know his character, do we? For all we know, he might have been a bully and a, a thug. That doesn't necessarily make him a murderer. It makes it easier for the police to decide he's the right man for the vacancy, present them with a likely enough candidate, and they do tend to stop looking. Outrageous. When the police get here, will you tell them so? Well, I would if I thought it would do any good. But whoever comes, and whenever they turn up... How long do you think it'll take? It's unlikely they'll have any direct connection with his case, whatever it was. So we might never know. Unless he has still more to tell us. Is that likely? No, probably not. Well, my friend, we found ourselves in some strange situations in the past. But waiting for the official constabulary to remove a corpse from our sitting room floor is probably one of the strangest. There's no probably about it. Uh, and the rain stopped. So it has. I wonder. What? I wonder if I could determine which station he was held in. Is that possible? Yes, yes it could be. It depends on the dirt under his nails. Yes, let's, let's have a closer look. 
Uh, pass me a sheet of paper, will you? Oh, yes. Uh, here. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you. And uh, small scissors from my desk. Uh, which drawer? Uh, left hand top, uh, in with the lock picks and the uh, handcuffs. Right. Uh, yep. Good, thank you. Now, if there's enough material to work with... Is there? Uh, I'm not sure. <sighs> to tell you the truth, I'm also not sure. It would be distinctive enough anyway. The walls of a cell are not particularly individual. Now, if he'd been crawling around on his hands and knees in the mud outside the station, I'd be rather more confident. Uh, now, <clears throat> you know, sometimes I wonder if Scotland Yard will ever recognise the power of science in this work. I mean, will there ever come a day when there's, uh, there's a microscope in every police station in the land? Only if they can find a way to make tea with it. <laughs> Uh, now, let's see. Hmm. Hmm. Anything? Nothing. Brick dust, uh, General Grime, could have come from anywhere. So he's told us all he can, has he? Taken his secrets to the grave? Not necessarily. What do you mean? I've been investigating the wrong part of his life. It's what happened before he was arrested that's the real point. Don't you agree? Well, yes, but we can't find out anything about Watson, that. Watson, how many times have you heard me astound a client with a list of deductions? You've recently been in China. You have a liking for strong coffee. You're a mason. Your maiden aunt died suddenly last October. I can't say I actually recall that last one. Never mind the details. It's the general principle that matters. Well, then, yes. I've seen you do it dozens of times, as you know full well. Written up a few of them, too. But so what? Well, there's the client. There's no reason why I can't do it to him just as much as anyone else. I thought you already had. Oh, there has to be more. <coughs> Can't we turn him over? And, uh, do you think we should? Well, there's precious little more to be told from a view of his back. Uh, but shouldn't we leave him exactly where he fell for the police to see? The police? They look at him and make their one stunning deduction, blimey governor, he snuffed it, and then they'll cart the unfortunate gentleman away. We could strip him naked, wash the body, anoint him with strawberry jam, and then cut off his head, and your average Scotland Yarder would scarcely even notice. You know, this fixation of yours borders on the obsessive. Have you ever thought of seeing an alienist? Hmm? <laughs> Be a good fellow. Help me turn him over. Hmm? Right. right. <laughs> oh, Damn leg. It's bad today, isn't it? Oh, it's this foul weather. Plays it up. Well, I can do this on my own. No, 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 no. I can manage. No. Oh, thank you. Right, you're welcome. <sighs> now, so we have a whole new drama unfolding in front of our eyes. I'm pleased to hear it. It's including a better view of his face. Now, you'll agree that the contortions support your diagnosis. Hmm? Death by cardiac arrest. I still wouldn't like to be definite without a proper examination. I'm not asking you to sign the death certificate. Just give an opinion. I say the odds are in favour of a heart attack. Do you agree? Yes, they are. Very good. Then, for the moment at least, we'll rule out some exotic murder weapon. No darts from a blowpipe or snakes down the bell rope for your readers this time, I'm afraid. Oh, well. Yes, but enough of these distractions. We don't know how long we've got until the Yard honours us with its presence. So... <sighs> Is there anything I can do? Uh, what you always do. Pay close attention, be ready to question everything I say, and feel free to comment at any time. Very well. All right. Let us begin. Uh, ah. What have you found? I collected my dirt from under the nails on his right hand. His left's far more interesting. Take a look at the back of it. Uh, what is that? Just more dirt? No, no, no. It's something far more particular. Soot, I think. Yes, yeah, soot which isn't coming off. I, I want a doctor. Hold his wrist for me, would you? Oh, yes, of course. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> ah, yes. Look at his shirt sleeve. Looks like the same stuff. I believe it is. Perhaps he just brushed up against something. Oh, perhaps. For now, just a fact to be noted and filed away for future reference. Ah. ah. Oh, so we can add something else to our store of information. I was a little hasty when I said there was nothing in his pockets. <clears throat> Here. Looks like ash of some sort. <laughs> this old Virginian ready rubbed smoked on a cherry wood pipe. And from his left hand coat pocket so so the odds are very good that he was right-handed handkerchief in the right pocket pipe in the left there are exceptions but as you say the odds are in favor another fact for the file 
Anything else? Uh, not that I can see. <clears throat> so, what do we have? A man of advancing years, a butler in a good household, an individual accustomed to deference and possibly respect from his staff and appreciation from his employers. Who finds himself involved in some sort of crime. I suppose murder is more likely than treason. Murder it shall be then until we learn differently. Our man is discovered in a position so compromising that his guilt seems quite certain. The police are summoned. He's arrested and led away under guard, not being permitted to dress properly, only to throw an outdoor coat over his shirt sleeves. Ah, the missing jacket. Yes, that makes sense. It's taken away, locked in a cell, a none too secure cell, as it turns out, so we might be talking about a country setting rather than a town one, after all. Imagine the effect all this has on him. His dignity destroyed? His loyalty impugned? Not to mention the shock if the murder victim was someone he knew well? All that on top of failing health, if I'm right about the weak heart? He knows that he's innocent. He says as much to the police. But they're more than content with their circumstantial evidence, whatever it is. And driven by his despair, he somehow breaks out of his captivity and comes here to us. Holmes, that's masterly. Bravo. Thank you, thank you. What's the matter? It should be possible to find out more. More? Oh, come on. Those, those marks on his hand. Perhaps if I take a sample... Oh, damn. Oh, you think it's the police? Why do they have to choose today to move faster than their customary crawl? It's not the yard. No? No, it's the boy from the news agents with the early evening editions. Ah, well, I might still have time. Uh, Watson, where are you going? Uh, well, down to get the papers. I don't want Mrs Hudson to come walking in here and find you crawling all over a dead butler. No, you're probably right. Yeah. Yes, right. A scalpel, I think. Yes. A sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 careful, 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 doctor. I don't want these scrapings blown away. Uh, sorry. Just one second more. Uh, there. You can come in now. It's in the papers. They've all got the story. Huh? What story? Oh. Um, a shocking death of the head of one of the oldest families in the realm, Edward John Neville, 14th Lord Abergavenny of Cuckfield House in the village of Eridge West. Just the south of London? Yes. Was shot dead last night by his butler, Mr James Davison. Davison was discovered with a fatal weapon still in his hand and offered no resistance as the rest of the household staff retained him until the police arrived. However... He escaped from police custody in the early hours of this morning and is still at liberty. The public is warned to be on the lookout for this most dangerous and desperate criminal. He doesn't look too dangerous to me. Aren't you pleased? You were right in every particular. It was a perfectly straightforward chain of logic. Just at this moment, I'm more interested in getting this soot or whatever it is under my microscope. D just don't, don't flap those papers about for a second. Oh, good chap. Right. right. <clears throat> They are safely stowed. Right. What else do the public prints have to tell us? Oh, most of them seem to have the same details. Oh, no. No, here's something new. Um, a junior night shift constable heard the prisoner protesting his innocence, but in view of the incontrovertible evidence against him, <laughs> took little heed. Uh, there's a man who'll rise on the force. Nothing else? I don't think so. Oh, no. One thing. His lordship was killed with one of his own antique duelling pistols, a 17th-century double-barrelled flintlock which had been specially prepared for a demonstration the following day. More so-called evidence against the butler. He would have known that the gun was in working order. Why are, you, why are you so sure that he was innocent? I'm not at all sure, but I'm certain that the evidence is far from conclusive. He came here for our help, remember. We, we must keep an open mind. Holmes, the man is dead. A client's a client, dead or otherwise. Oh, but I'm slow. An antique flintlock pistol. What of it? Well, guns of that era are wonderfully informative. Did you move out of the light, would you? Oh, no, sorry. How's that? Ah, Watson, the bringer of light. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Ah, 
Well, that does seem to make things clear. What have you found? It's only by eye, of course, but I don't believe this is soot. No, it's gunpowder, embedded in the skin by the force of the blast from the gun. So he did fire no, it? No, we shouldn't take it for granted. I could be wrong. Yeah. Well, what are you doing? Well, placing the matter beyond doubt. I've been working on a chemical test for gunpowder traces. Does it work? Well, this is not a hundred percent foolproof, but it's a good indication. And would you open a window? Why? Just what does this test involve? Well, concentrated sulfuric acid, amongst other things. Yeah, I'll open the window. Thank you. Well, it might be a good idea to stay over there until I've finished this stage. I was planning on it. So I don't need much of the acid. Yes, that should be sufficient. Now I mix in this. What are you adding there? Uh, a little something of my own compound of carbon, nitrogen and water. There, there. Stir. Now, Doctor, I'd be grateful for your assistance. Yes, what do you need? I need a candle from my bedroom. You'd like me to get it? If you don't mind. I was always taught that if you're using concentrated acid, it's good practice never to walk away from your bench and leave it unattended. Very sound advice. So I found out on the only occasion I ignored it. Brother Mycroft will give you the details if you're interested, but I warn you, it's rather a touchy subject with him. I think I'm probably happier in ignorance. Yes, I think you are. Is that how you first got interested in chemistry? You picked it up from your brother? Good Lord, no. Mycroft's interest in science begins and ends with the correct temperature for roasting beef. Right, one candle. Yes, light it, uh, would you? Mm. Uh, here. Uh, excellent, excellent. Um, now what? Now I want you to drip wax across the back of our client's left hand. Well, may I ask why? Well, of course you may, but I'd hate to spoil the suspense. Well, you'll find out very shortly. All right. There. Uh, how large an area should I cover? Well, the larger the better. Normally I leave half the evidence for the Scotland Yarders, but in this case it would be a waste of time. Watson, are you smiling? Do you find this amusing? No, of course not. Well, to a certain extent, yes. Six years at university, Netley Hospital, the army, general practice. And here I am, solemnly dripping candle wax onto the hand of a dead butler. And doing it very well. Suppose the police turn up now. You'll think of something. No, that's enough. Oh, right. Uh, have we finished with the candle? We have. Uh, would you mind putting it back? Yes, my pleasure. <laughs> I always enjoy looking at the decor in your bedroom. Hmm, really? No, of course not. How in the world do you sleep? with all those eyes staring down at you. Very well, usually. I like being surrounded by famous criminals. Old friends, some of them. Most people are content with a nice landscape. What's next? We have to wait until the wax is completely hard. It won't take long. Not long at all. I still can't see the purpose of it. You will. Think of hedgehogs. Hedgehogs. Ah, I think it's ready. <sighs> yes, now. What are you going to do? <laughs> Watch. Uh, we have to prise off the wax without breaking it, which is not always easy. <sighs> Here it comes. <sighs> there. You see? It pulls away the embedded dirt. That's damnably clever. The dirt, any other particles, a few hairs. <laughs> yeah, I got the idea from the way gypsies cook hedgehogs, except uh, they use clay, of course. Isn't the skin pattern fascinating? I suppose I must look at my hands a hundred times a day, but I've never consciously taken it in before now. You look, but you don't observe. As I believe I've told you before. The odd time or two, yes. But well, observe now. You're looking at the future of detection. Skin patterns? Specifically, on the ends of the fingers. Oh, you mean this new theory. You really think there's something in it? <laughs> Depend on it. But for now, that's not what I'm interested in. Now, the final stage of the test. The wax goes into a dish. The sulfuric acid solution is dripped onto it. And? It takes a few seconds. If the traces were from a gun being fired, they'll contain various nitrites and minute fragments of lead, and the solution will turn... Well, there you are. The solution will turn blue. So he did fire the gun? So it seems. But that's wonderful. Is it? Well, the test, I mean. 
I can't understand why you're not more excited. Surely it'll change the whole face of detection. An infallible way of determining who fired the fatal shots. No, it's too early to call it infallible. Well, even so, I mean, you, you remember when we first met? Ah, the Sherlock Holmes blood test. Yes, you just discovered it. And you were dancing about like a demented chorus girl. Why not now? <sighs> this is going to sound odd. Oh, there'll be nothing unusual about that. I mean, in the midst of all this uh, scientific rigour. Oh, go on. I, I just had the strongest feeling that he was innocent. What happened to keeping an open mind? No, you're quite right to be critical. And in any case, when have you ever placed any credence in feelings? No, I know, I know, I know. I, I've no evidence, nothing uh, concrete, just a feeling. <laughs> Perhaps I really am losing my grip on reality, after all. Oh, nonsense. There's nothing wrong with following your instincts. It's not something to be ashamed of. Uh, perhaps not. But in any case, it's academic. I wonder how much longer we'll have to wait for the official forces of law and ignorance. Holmes, really. Quite apart from anything else, you've just proved that they arrested the right man. True enough. Yet another reversal. Hmm. I beg your pardon? No, no, not, 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 not you, my dear fellow, me. <laughs> fool, fool, fool. Watson, he kept his pipe in his left coat pocket. Well, yes, so you said. What of? Ah, ah, ah. you've seen it. Ah. It's not conclusive. No, no, it's not, but it's highly suggestive. You said it yourself. The odds are that he was right-handed. So what was he doing firing a gun with his left hand? Exactly. Of course he wasn't. Well, then... Now, just, just one moment while I check my theory. Aha. The palm of his hand. What's the significance? There's even more staining on the palm. Once I saw the back of his hand, I stopped looking. A beginner's mistake. Well, how did the stuff get on his palm? compounded by totally neglecting his right hand, an error which I shall now rectify. Uh, well? The right palm's the same as the left. Coated up. If he held the gun between his two hands... Now, it still wouldn't have produced this pattern. Well, what then? Well, the late Mr. Davison didn't fire the gun at all. But he was standing close to the person who did. There was someone else there. And what's more, Davison was reaching out to the gun, either to grab it or simply to push it away from its target. Like, uh, <clears throat> like, so, you see? Well, that would account for the marks on the palms. What about the back of his left hand? Uh, let's see, let's see. Ah, ah yes, right, right. You, you're the killer. Uh, uh, all right. All right. Just there, you stand so. Yes. The gun's in your right hand, levelled at his unfortunate lordship. Like so. Uh, to the life. And I am Davidson, faithful old family retainer. I come into the room, see this appalling sight, move towards you as quickly as I, I can manage. And I? You fire, you shoot Lord Abergavenny. There's a considerable noise. A bang? Thank you, Watson. A cloud of discharged particles and smoke, which, thanks to my position, slightly behind you and to your right, embed themselves in the back of my left hand. Well, why not your face? Well, because my instinctive reaction was to shield it with my hand. Ah. You, know, you see, you see? Right. Yes, I keep moving towards you, turning slightly, this mm -hmm. time with my hands outstretched to grab the weapon, or possibly your arm. And I fire again. Bang! Thank you, yes, neatly coating both my palms with a discharge from the gun. What do you think? That's wonderful. Thank you. So he was innocent. I knew it. That much desperation doesn't arise from fakery. He must have walked in on his employer and the killer as they faced each other. But if a third person was in the room, why didn't any of the other staff mention it? Come to that, why didn't Davison tell the police himself? You supplied the answer a few minutes ago. Yes. Yes, I did. W uh, wait. Yes, here we are. Davison was discovered with the fatal weapon still in his hand and offered no resistance as the rest of the household staff retained him until the police arrived. No resistance. He was too shocked to speak. Exactly. It wasn't until late at night that he was heard trying to tell his side of the story, and then only by some fresh-faced lad, barely out of training, who paid him no heed. All right. That explains why Davison didn't mention the true killer. What about the rest of the staff? The man... If it was who, a man. Uh, the killer, then. He, or she, must have been admitted to the house. Evidently not. One of the other servants? It's a possibility. But you don't think so? 
Now, a more immediate effect of discharging a pistol, especially an antique flintlock, is the highly distinctive smell. It permeates the clothes and the hair. A servant reeking of gunpowder would surely be noticed by the rest of the staff, if not in the murder room, then later, below stairs. Hmm? So the killer got into and out of the house without being seen? So I read it. Hmm. Lord Abergavenny. What do we know about him? Well, next to nothing, I'm afraid. <clears throat> Let's see if the good old index can be more helpful. Yeah. Right. Uh, Larry Green, the Limehouse lounger. Latimer Street slaughter before your time, that one. Uh, yeah, it's Legion of Honour. <laughs> uh, the Lighthouse, the Politician and the Train Cormoran. Tedious little case, that. There's a long man of Wilmington. And... Ah. The noble Lord Abergavenny. Well, well. What? Holmes, don't be so infuriated. My apologies. I, I got quite caught up in the saga. What saga, for heaven's sake? And why have you collected information on this Abergavenny, anyway? It was for a case some years ago. You were away at the time. Now, don't look at me like that, Watson. It's a very commonplace affair. Nothing for your readers to get their teeth into. But you turned up something about Lord Abergavenny that's still relevant? Yes, I, I believe so. He was quietly selling off most of his possessions. Pictures, furniture, heirlooms. Very quietly. I'm pretty sure even the old man's son didn't know about it. He was in serious financial trouble and he didn't tell his own son. <laughs> the pride of the landed classes. And the boy lives overseas, so it would have been an easy deception. But that's beside the point. <clears throat> now, let's suppose that the intervening years have done nothing to change the situation. More and more of the son's due inheritance is sold off until finally, the last to go, his lordship has to part with his prized possessions, his collection of antique firearms. The murder weapon was cleaned specially for a demonstration, it said in the paper. Exactly. What if the boy finally got wind of what was going on? Hmm? How would he react? Um, deep disappointment that his father hadn't felt able to confide in him? Yes, and in all probability, despair at the, at the hopelessness of his own future. Well, certainly. And out of that despair, fury, huh? Hatred. The boy comes back to England, confronts his father. And kills him? Well, think about it. Who better than the son to come and go as he please, without exciting any suspicion? Who better to know the fastest route to the nearest convenient hiding place until the hue and cry had died down? It does hang together. Yes, but you resist the very notion of a son murdering his father. Well, oh, yes, of course I do. That level of hatred, it, it's not natural. Well, natural or not, I'm afraid it happens. And my theory, it does, as you say, hang together. It does. My dear Holmes, you realise what you've done? Managed to fill 40-odd minutes in an otherwise empty and boring day? False modesty doesn't become you. You know perfectly well what I mean. You've not only identified our wretched caller and deduced why he was here, you cleared his name and identified a prime suspect for the real criminal. And you were worried about your reputation. <laughs> Perhaps I should dust off my laurel wreath. It would be well deserved. But not until after the police have gone, I think. The police? Totally forgotten they were coming. Oh, I can't wait to see their faces as you take them through the whole thing. You know, listen. I can't hear anything. Oh, I, I thought it was. Uh, you know, wait. Yes, it's a four wheeler. Right on cue. The official detective forces arrive on our doorstep. Whom have they sent? Some uniformed sergeant or other? No, not exactly. Watson, I believe I'm going to enjoy this. Oh, we mustn't let Mrs. Hudson come up. I'll go down. No, 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 no. I'll, uh, I'll deal with it. <clears throat> Astrid, my very dear fellow, won't you come up? In The Abergavenny Murder, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. James Davison was played by Ewan Meredith. The Abergavenny Murder was written by Bert Cools from a reference in the short story The Priory School 
by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. Children, everybody ready? Now, then I'll begin. I'm going to tell you a brand new story today. It's about a poor princess who lived in a lonely kingdom far away. More than anything else, she wanted to see the great wide world outside, but she knew that she never would. Then one day, do you know what happened? A handsome prince came riding into the kingdom. Yes, he fell in love with the poor princess, and she fell in love with him. And he said, come away with me to my land and be my wife. And she did. And the princess and the prince lived very, very happily, forever and ever after. Isn't that a wonderful story? The Shameful Betrayal of Miss Emily Smith by Bert Cools with Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson and featuring Mark Gatiss as Bert Stevens and Christian Rodska as Inspector Dawkins. The Shameful Betrayal of Miss Emily Smith Tell me your name. You know my name. This is for the official record. Your name. <sighs> my name's Bert Stevens. And you're the odd job man at the school in Pengate. <sighs> well, not anymore, I imagine. Just answer the question. Uh, yes, I am. Was. You worked with Miss Emily Smith. Of course I did. Why do you keep asking me questions when you already know the answers? All right. Here's a question I don't know the answer to. Have you ever killed anyone before? Or was this your first time? What do you make of these? What are they? They arrived in the morning's post, examples of contemporary art. Uh, this one first, I think. Hmm. Landscape. What is it, chalk and charcoal? Well, oh, decent quality anyway. Uh, what's that in the snow? As usual, you penetrate straight to the heart of the matter. The second drawing gives a closer view. Thank you. Uh, Oh, someone lying down. And finally, uh, closest of all, the highlight of the collection, sensitively titled A Study in Frozen Death. Ah. Well, I can see why they appeal to you, but I'm not sure I want them over the mantelpiece. What do you make of the footprints? Hmm. This single set leading to the body, they're meant to be hers, obviously. And? The second set goes up to the body and then away again. Presumably they're meant to belong to whoever stuck the knife in her chest. Chisel. Oh, chisel, then. Uh, I still think it's a macabre set of pictures. Where did you buy them? <laughs> That's a perfectly reasonable question, given what you know of my taste in art. But? But, as it happens, I didn't buy them. They've been sent by one Detective Inspector, Geoffrey Dawkins, of New Horton in Kent. He asks for our assistance with, and I quote, a most extraordinary and baffling crime. These are pictures of an actual murder? Hmm. Drawn from life, or lack of it. Oh, please. It was committed two days ago and captured for posterity by an enterprising local artist. Well, I can't see anything baffling about it. Because I haven't yet given you all the facts. Well, what is it you haven't told me? That second set of footprints, the ones that come from the opposite direction. What about them? Well, you've already remarked that they go up to the corpse and then away again. Well, yes, it's obvious. But what isn't obvious is that they were made by the man who found the body. But that means... Exactly. But he and his wife swear that when they first saw the scene, the snow was completely undisturbed, except by the dead woman's own footprint. It was the stab wound that killed her? Without question. A suicide? She left no notes and the idea is unthinkable, according to the inspector. Oh? Well, he doesn't elaborate, but self-stabbing to the heart isn't exactly a common method, at least not this side of Japan. But she's in the very centre of the field. You see the problem? With a wound like that, 
She could only go two, maybe three steps before she collapsed. So the fatal attack must have happened more or less where she fell. She walked into the open field, leaving her footprints in the snow. And then someone murdered her. But left no footprints at all. A most extraordinary and baffling crime. To an official detective inspector, at least. This thing's as sharp as a scalpel. Observation of details. Very good. Mr Holmes would be proud of you. What a pity he's gone home and can't see how well you've learnt your lessons. He'll be back for the trial. Oh, and you're looking forward to telling him how clever you've been since he left. <sighs> There's no point in having tools if you're not going to treat them properly. You know about tools, do you? Of course. I need them for my work. Hammers, screwdrivers, saws... Chisels. Oh, yes. Chisels are especially useful. Mr. Holmes, an honour. Inspector Dorkin. And Dr. John H. Watson. Inspector. Oh, I'm a great admirer of your writing, Doctor. Never miss a Strand magazine. Oh, very kind of you. The case, Dawkins. Have there been any new developments? Yeah, uh, to be honest, Mr. Holmes, I'm afraid I've brought you down here for nothing. The fact is, gentlemen, I have the killer under lock and key. Oh, good work, Inspector. Thank you, Doctor. You have a confession? Not yet. But then you have proof. <laughs> well, not only is the murder weapon this man's property, he was seen having a blazing row with Miss Smith, uh, with a dead woman, two days before her death. And that's the whole of your case? Well, I'll get more. So you're quite certain of this man's guilt? Oh, yes, I am, Doctor. I've dealt with a good few murderers in my time. They all have something in common. Something in their eyes that says they're capable of taking a life. This man's got it too. I didn't kill her. How many times do I have to tell you? You've got no right keeping me here. I've got every right. You've got no proof you can't have. What, why are these two here if you can prove it? Mr Holmes, hasn't he sent for you to find his proof for him? Tell me about your argument with Miss Smith. You won't find any proof. I didn't kill her. Mr Holmes, you've got to get me off. The argument, Stevens. It wasn't an argument, just a disagreement. What was it about? She was keeping something from me. Did she normally confide in you? Oh, yes. She was my friend. <laughs> a school teacher and an odd job, man. It didn't matter to her. She wasn't like that. She used to enjoy talking to me. Until recently. She changed. She was secretive. Something was worrying her, eating away at her. I, I told her I wanted to help. What did she say? She told me she didn't need my help. She'd sorted everything out for herself. I've got witnesses who heard raised voices. She was short with me. I'm afraid I forgot myself. Shall I tell you what really happened? You've already told me. I think you made advances to her. No. I think those advances were unwelcome. She put you in your place and you didn't like that, did you, Stevens? I would never have done that. Never. Dawkins, you have no case. This tea is disgusting. I've got enough. And he'll cough, you'll see. Tell me about the dead woman. That's not easy. Oh, why not? Because Miss Emily Smith was a retiring sort of person. Well, if it didn't sound so insulting, I'd say she was almost anonymous. What about her family? Her friends? Her family were local people. They're all dead now. And she wasn't anxious to make friends. No admirers, no fiancé. So it seems. You must know something about her. She was quiet. Courteous and well-respected. And good at her job? Or oh, more than just that. She set up the school. Indeed. Yeah, when her parents died, I suppose she needed something to do. She'd care for them for a long time. It leaves a vacuum in your life. What sort of school is it? For village children too young to come into town here to the board school. Miss Smith went to the parish council with the idea and they let her use an empty house. She got a tiny living from them too. You seem to have a good deal of information on this anonymous young lady. Only what's common knowledge, Mr. Holmes. Oh, you're right, it is disgusting. Uh, Inspector, what about the footprints? Or lack of footprints. Just how did Stevens <laughs> manage to stab Miss Smith without leaving any traces? Oh, uh, yeah, it puzzled me too at first. Yes, and now? The snow that night fell in flurries. Heavy bursts with gaps in between. Stevens brushed out his footprints after he stabbed Miss Smith, and the next flurry covered the brush marks. It wasn't heavy enough to obscure the dead woman's print. Exactly. 
Simple, you see. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's a London train in about half an hour. I'll order the wagon for you, shall I? I believe I'd like to stay just a little longer. Tell me why you did it. I think you know that, Inspector. You told me Emily Smith was your friend. You told me and you told Mr Holmes. Yes. You were lying, weren't you? No. You weren't friends. In all the years you knew her, you were never a friend. Well? I never said I was. I said she was my friend. But you felt very differently about her. There, you see. I knew you understood. You of all people. Pretty girl with a whole life ahead of her. Those sketches show her wearing a nightgown with a coat thrown over it. Are they accurate? Yes. Lawrenson, uh, that's the artist, makes something of a fetish of being accurate. Better than a photograph, he says. A coat over her shoulders and boots on her feet. It wasn't clear from the drawing, but I assume the boots weren't buttoned. No, they weren't. How did you know? Uh, who'll do the post-mortem? The official police surgeon from Dover. He's coming over this afternoon. Bit of a formality, really. Well, perhaps we can anticipate his findings. Watson, would you take a look? With your permission, Inspector? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, of course. She told me about you, you know. All about you. She felt sorry for you. Did you know that? That was all. You couldn't give her what she wanted, you see. There was one thing she dreamed of more than anything else in the world. But you couldn't give it to her. Could you? Me? <laughs> no. No, of course I couldn't. My dear Inspector, it's a capital mistake to allow personal feelings to interfere with your investigation. <laughs> what do you mean, personal feelings? You knew this woman. You cared for this woman. You demonstrated the fact in a dozen ways. How well did you know her, Inspector? Not that well, actually. There was a robbery at Pangate Church. Petty hooligans down from London with the hot pickers. I met her then. We fell to talking. You had something in common. Your parents had died. You were both alone in the world. I gave that away too, did I? <laughs> Well, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. Yes, Mr Holmes, it occurred to me that we had something in common, so I asked her if I could call. It seemed reasonable enough. But she said no. Oh. She was very gentle about it, but no is still no. Doctor, do what you need to do. I'll be outside. Dawkins? Oh, thank you. Here, let me. Thank you. Ah, Doctor, what news? I was right. The blow went straight into the heart. Mm -hmm. No deflection from the ribs or sternum, mm -hmm. and she was struck from directly in front. D directly? You're certain? Completely. Excellent. Is that significant? Almost certainly. Show me where the body was found. So, uh, the village is there, path to the church runs so, uh, and the unfortunate young woman, uh, what's on the first drawing, if you please, uh, the general view? Uh, here. Uh, thank you. Yes, the body was there. Quite right. Yes, it should be standard practice to invite an artist to the scene of every crime. I could cite you three dozen cases where it would have been invaluable. I'd be extremely interested. Hmm. Well, perhaps later. Uh, what now, then, Mr. Holmes? Hmm? Uh, uh, oh, yes. <clears throat> the couple who found the body? Dr. and Mrs. Tranter. Yes, where do they live? Uh, the house is just over that rise. We passed it on the way here. Oh, very imposing for a village doctor. Jealous, Watson. Just noting the facts. The doctor married into money. That poor young woman. 
I'll never forget the sight of her lying there. Oh, Dawkins, why is this necessary? Haven't you shown Mr. Holmes our official statements? Oh, I have, sir. But I'd still like to ask a few questions, if you've no objections. Well, not if it will help. Of course not. And, Mrs. Tranter, do you feel up to it? It could be enormously valuable. Then I'll try, of course. I'm most grateful. Dr. Tranter, at what point did you realise who the dead woman was? Not until I was beside her. You didn't recognise anything about her from further away? I really didn't know her that well. I see. Mrs. Tranter, uh, were you acquainted with Miss Smith? I couldn't say so, no. She wasn't a frequent guest here. Hardly, sir. I suppose the servants might have known her, but I don't encourage visitors below stairs. Ah. Well, perhaps you saw her occasionally about the village? Yes, I did. Sometimes she took the children out for a walk. Hmm. Doctor, how was the body lying? On her back, with her head turned to the side. Hmm. I didn't see the, uh, the weapon immediately. Her coat was covering the handle. She always looks so young. Just a few more details. Mrs. Tranter, having established that Miss Smith was dead, your husband returned to the path and asked you to go down into the village and summon help. Yes. Yes, he did. I found some people and told them what had happened. You're surely not suggesting that I should have left my wife alone there and gone myself. I'm just trying to build up a picture of what happened. While you waited, did you go back into the field? I had no reason to do so. Did you see anyone? Not a soul. Two final points. Do you know of anyone who disliked Miss Smith or wished her ill? On the contrary. How does it feel to hate someone that much? I'm sure you already know that, Inspector. Never mind what you think I know. Answer the question. I'm awfully sorry, but I can't. I'm afraid I don't remember. Well, it's about time. What do you mean, sir? I fancy Mr. Lawrenson's referring to his recent burglary. Huh? I most certainly am. You've been burgled? Good God above, of course I have. I discovered it this morning and sent a note to your police station, Dawkins. Isn't that why you're here? No, sir. We're here in connection with the death of Miss Emily Smith. This gentleman would like to ask you a few questions. My name is Sherlock Holmes. I know who you are. I've seen the pictures of you. Pretty poor work, some of them, too. And you're Watson. Dr. Watson, good afternoon. Well, you haven't fared any better, have you? Paget hasn't caught you at all. Man ought to be shot. Oh, we're, we're not here to discuss the deficiencies of the Strand magazine, Mr. Lawrenson. What was taken in the burglary? I thought you weren't here to talk about that, either. Just tell us, please, sir. Nothing. Nothing was taken. But the robber made a pretty mess. Yes, he did, damn the man. I suppose that's how you knew about it, Holmes. That and the broken lock on the window is perfectly obvious, even from here. Shall we continue this conversation outside? If you'd taken more pride in your garden, your burglar might have left us some clues to his identity. There's nothing like a freshly turned flower bed for preserving evidence. I have no interest in gardening, Mr. Holmes. No, oh, but you do have an interest in murder. Only as a subject for my art. Well, Holmes, what can you tell me about my burglar? Nothing, as yet. Oh, so it's not just your features that the Strand exaggerates? Perhaps not. How well did you know the late Miss Smith? Know her? I didn't know her at all. He was lying. Yeah. She took delivery of several of his paintings for the school. How do you know that? There was a receipt for them amongst his scattered papers. The date was over two months ago. So he'd known her for quite some time? Yeah, but felt the need to conceal the fact. If he was the killer, then he's as cold-blooded as they come. To stand there cool as ice and sketch his own handiwork. Could he have faked the burglary to throw us off the scent? Yes, he could. Well, the window was crudely broken. I didn't bring Stevens in until early this morning. I think I'll have another word with him when we get back. So now you think I'm a burglar too? You tell me. I have told you. I didn't break into anyone's house. I didn't kill Miss Smith. I haven't done anything. Stevens, what's wrong with your back? I, I fell off a ladder last week. You can ask Dr. Trencher if you don't believe me. Did he treat you at the school? At first, then I went to his surgery. Why? How much longer can you hold Stevens without formally arresting him? Just until tomorrow morning. Uh, do you intend to charge him? 
no. I have to agree with you, Mr. Holmes. I don't have a good enough case. Well, don't be too downhearted. I rather think that Mr. Albert Stevens will be far more valuable to us at liberty than he would locked in your cells. What are you staring at? Stop that staring. Oh, don't be angry, Inspector. I didn't mean to offend you. I was just thinking. Huh? What? Thinking what? Thinking how much we have in common. Don't you say that. Shut up! But it's true. You wanted to do it too, didn't you? You wanted to do exactly what I did. Who else holds the key, Stevens? Uh, Miss Smith had one, probably the school board too. What will happen to the place now, Inspector? Do you know? I suppose it'll have to close. Well, it mustn't close. What about the children? Or well, maybe the board could find someone else to run it. Could that have been a possible motive? Someone wanted the position. She was killed for a job. Her murders have been committed for less. Now, presumably she used one room as an office. Through there. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, Mr. Holmes? Well, uh, there's surprisingly little. Most people's characters can be read quite easily from their workplace. Unfortunately, our school teacher was not one of them. You've seen nothing at all? Well, beyond the obvious facts that she was tidy, methodical, musical, creative, well liked by her pupils, and much concern for their general welfare, I can deduce nothing. Oh, that's right. That's exactly how she was. Tidy and methodical, yes, you can see that, of course. Musical, you got from the song copies. How did you know she was creative? Uh, story for the children, written in her own hand. Ah. Yeah, there are many. Yeah, she was always writing stories. Yes, and her love for her charges was reciprocated. Look at the affectionate nature of the paintings they've done of her. Her concern for their health and welfare? It's a copy of a letter to Dr. Tranter, asking if he can arrange a regular visit. Yes, but none of this is important. Let's hope that her home proves more forthcoming. The villagers found the cottage unlocked on Sunday morning. Do you know if anyone went inside? Well, if they did, no-one's admitted to it. I put a man to guard the door as soon as I could. So how long did you keep him stationed here? Until I got here myself. I went inside, found the keys, and made the place secure. Yeah. They were on a hook in the hallway, so I didn't have to disturb anything at all. Ah, yes, that's excellent. <clears throat> uh, have you been in here before, Stevens? Of course not. Well, I thought you were friends. She was my friend. But she never invited you here? Well, she'd like to privacy. Indeed. Uh, there are several points of interest in this hallway, wouldn't you say, Sir Dawkins? Well, I... Uh, well, just stay here, if you please, while I examine the main room. Ah, yes, this is better. We shouldn't be doing this. It's like a violation. Don't you want her killer brought to justice? This is all wrong. I keep expecting her to come down the stairs or something. She won't be coming down the stairs. You think I don't know that? You think I don't know she's dead? I know it. Yeah, and so you damn well should. I didn't do it. How many times? Is that why you brought me here? You think I'm going to break down and confess? No, that's not why you're here. Then why? Because Mr Holmes thinks you can help. Help? How on earth can I help? By telling me where she was planning to go. To go? What do you mean? Come through. I no doubt you observed the travelling trunk under the stairs in the hallway. It was brought into this room very recently, opened and packed. Now, why should she do that if she wasn't planning to go away? She would never have left the village. What about the children? We'll come to that in a moment. How do you know about the trunk? From the marks on the floorboards and the rug. Oh. The trunk was dragged in here, opened out, packed, and then unpacked in some haste and put away again. Why on earth would she do such a thing? She didn't. Miss Smith packed the trunk, but it was emptied by someone else. Someone who was strong enough to return it to the hallway without leaving any extra marks on the floor. I'm sorry, but I can't see that there's been any packing and unpacking done at all. Remember, remember how tidy she was. Yeah. Yeah, how neat. It's perfectly plain. There are a good many items in this room are not in their proper places. 
personal things, things she was planning to take with her. I mean, they're close, but they're not exact, because they were put back by someone working at speed and almost certainly under some emotional strain. Someone who wanted to disguise the fact that she'd been planning a journey. Exactly. So we now know three things of some importance. Firstly, Emily Smith intended to leave this village possibly for good. I don't believe... Secondly, this lady who so valued her privacy had a visitor late Saturday evening. Stevens, not me. And lastly, this cottage was broken into probably on Sunday night. Good God. A rear window was forced, the signs are unmistakable, and the window frame was extremely informative. Can you tell if anything was stolen? Not yet, but I don't believe so. Now, I think it's likely that this remarkable burglar broke in for the express purpose of unpacking that trunk. Now, Watson, these should interest you. Now, wait here, please. What are they, Doctor? Well, this one's a letter, finished and signed. It's to the school board. It's a resignation. So she was leaving. Why didn't she tell me? And this, um, this is older, I think. Looks like a draft for a story. Huh? A princess lived in a kingdom far away from everywhere else, where she had to stay because she was very poor. Her only friends were the children. Her only friends, dear God. And they loved her, and she loved them very much. Stop it. It's private. Then one day, a handsome prince came riding into the kingdom and fell in love with the poor princess, and she fell in love with him. And he said, come away with me to my land and be my wife. And she did. And the princess and the prince lived very, very happily for ever and ever after. Unfortunately, the fairy tale turned out to have a rather different ending. Watson, I can now answer your question. Something was taken, but it wasn't stolen. Mr. Holmes, please, no riddles. Patience, Inspector. He'll explain when he's good and ready. Dawkins, I'll tell you this much. This was a callous, cowardly, and despicable murder. You know who did it? Stevens. No. I suggest you go home. You have my word that Miss Smith's killer will be brought to justice. So, assuming you're right, and the story's autobiographical... The travelling trunk suggests as much. And there's the recent change in her personality, you know, torn between her own happiness and the children in her care. Well, then, was it this mysterious lover who killed her? Or someone else who didn't want to see her leave? And in either case, how was it? Well, I suggest that you ask yourselves a different question. What's that? Why did she die in that particular spot? Never mind the lack of marks in the snow. Why was she in that field, dressed as she was? Well, uh... It'd be interesting to hear some more opinions of this singular young woman. I suggest we repair to somewhere more congenial. Hi, well. Oh, oh. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Well, did you learn anything? Oh, no, next to nothing. For once, local gossips let us down. Well, I did say. Anonymous. Oh, I did discover one thing of interest. What? That popular opinion is that you had the right man, Dawkins. Well, frankly, Mr. Holmes, I'm still inclined to think so myself. And you've just let him walk free. Can you tell me something? Tell you what? Well, some uh, local information. If I was a village odd job man, where would I go if I wanted to lay my hands on some opium? Uh, opium? Are you saying there's a drug connection to all this? I'll explain in a moment, but, but first, first, please, answer the question. Well, you'd have to go into Folkestone or Dover. And then you'd need to show good cause why you wanted it. You don't know of an illegal source closer to hand? In a village the size of Pangate? Hmm. I'll be prepared to swear that there isn't one. New Horton, the same. As I thought. Thank you. You've discovered something. Was it at the cottage? Yes. Take a look at this. It's just a cheap drinking glass. Yes, containing the dregs of something very interesting. I, I, mean, I can't be sure without a proper analysis, but the odour is quite distinctive. Watson. Mm. <clears throat> oh. I think you're right. Some sort of opiate. Hmm. Mixed in with a strong red wine. Where was it? 
in Miss Smith's bedroom. It had rolled under a cupboard. What on earth made you look there? Well, the fact that I couldn't see it anywhere else. You were expecting to find it. Well, let's say there was a very strong possibility. You can't be suggesting she was in the habit of drinking that what stuff. You, what I'm suggesting is that her Saturday night visitor provided it for the purpose of rendering her insensible. The wine would have been ample disguise, especially if the young lady wasn't used to it. But that doesn't make sense. If this visitor was a lover, why would he want to harm her? And in any case, if he planned to kill her, why content himself with just drugging her? Oh, surely to God... She wasn't attacked by two separate people. No, 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 no. no. I, be I believe the caller was our murderer. I think he was concerned about being seen either arriving at the cottage or leaving it. If he'd stabbed Miss Smith there and then, the time of death would have pointed straight to him. Ah, but with her whole system affected by the drug, the time the blow was dealt could never be accurately fixed. So our man planned to coerce her to drink the wine and then return either later that night or early the next morning. Oh, my God, that's devilish. But who was it? Opium's extracted from immature poppy seeds. Simple enough process. The poppy's an interesting plant. Its seeds are highly prized by cooks, and its oil much favoured by those who mix their own paints. Of course I mix my pigments. Show me any self-respecting artist who doesn't. What of it? Do you use poppy oil? That insipid stuff. It's too thin for decent dark colours. Dawkins, have you caught the burglar yet? No, sir. Then why are you wasting my time with these damn fool questions? Well, you might be interested to learn that yours wasn't the only house broken into. Not in the least interested. The other victim was the late Emily Smith. Really? You told us you didn't know her. That wasn't the truth, was it? Be careful what you say, Dawkins. She liked your work. At least to begin with. What caused the change of heart? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, she agreed to hang several of your paintings at the school. They're no longer there. Though the places where they were are obvious enough. They were taken down in a moment of anger and never replaced. The petty-minded little prude. Oh, so not only did you know her, you didn't like her. Sorry, Doctor, I didn't kill her. Your precious Mr. Holmes has got it wrong this time. Seems to me he's got it quite right. Why did you lie about your relationship with her? Uh, my relationship? I don't know that you could call it that. Call it what you like. Just tell us about it. Yes, I knew her. Yes, she agreed to show some of my pieces at the school. She liked them. And she thought other people might too. Waste of time. No one in this nest of peasants knows the first thing about art. Just the facts, if you please. You want to know why she suddenly went off me? Because I flattered her, that's why. Ah, you asked her to pose for you. And little Miss Purity took offence. You mean you asked her to pose nude? Good God, you're shocked too. But why lie about it? <laughs> Look at him. Look at the good inspector there, guardian of law and order, defender of the right. He thinks I'm only one step away from a white slaver. That's why I lied about it. Your reason was as transparent as your attempt to dissemble. If you'd spent more time reading the Strand and less sneering at the pictures, you'd know that it's a mistake to lie to me. You didn't seriously think it was Lawrence, and did you? No. Yeah, but there were several loose ends I had to tie up. About his story? About his window. I wanted to take another look at the way it had been forced. Uh -huh. I saw what I was expecting to see. So we're right back where we were. Oh, on the contrary. We progress in giant strides. I still don't quite follow this matter of the opium. Obviously, the plan went wrong. Emily Smith was stronger than her killer thought. And she didn't succumb completely to the drug. Well, she spent a fretful night slipping in and out of consciousness. There's ample evidence in the state of her bed linen. And finally, this wretched woman, probably with no idea at all of what was wrong with her, staggered out of her cottage and into the field where she met her end. Oh, dear God. She must have thought she'd been taken ill. Exactly so. And, naturally enough, she was trying to reach her doctor. 
Well, gentlemen, what can I do for you? You can help to clear up a few final points, if you'd be so kind. I'd be happy to help, if I can. What do you want to know? You said that Miss Smith was a patient of yours. So she was. You also said that you very rarely saw her professionally. She enjoyed good health. Rest her soul. Good health, quite. Her constitution was robust. I'd say so, yes. That, that would be your professional opinion. Certainly. And is it also your professional opinion that you should have used a stronger concentration of opium in your claret? I beg your pardon? Well, it's certainly my professional opinion that you persuaded Miss Smith to drink quite heavily when you called on her on Saturday evening. A celebration to mark the start of your new life together. I've absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Was she flattered by your attentions, Tranter, the, the wealthy, well-established doctor interested in, in the humble school teacher? Hmm? You promised her undying love. And something else as well, something that you correctly guessed would win her over completely. You promised her a wonderful new life, far away from this place, with all its unhappy memories, and she believed you. You callous, cold-blooded bastard. I thank you to moderate your language, Inspector. And not to believe the ravings of this madman. How long did it take before she realised the truth? That she was nothing more than just a mild diversion, an escape from a life of respectability and routine? I think you'd better leave my house. What happened then? Did she threaten to tell your wife? You killed her to save your marriage. Good. No, not, not just his marriage, his whole way of life. Power and position, wealth and respectability, hard things to turn your back on. You can seal it better than your wife does, Tranter, but you're just as much the common snob as she is. That's enough. You'll be hearing from my lawyers. The only way to prevent her ruining you was to convince her she was wrong, that you were genuine, and heaven help her. You succeeded. She resigned from her job. She tried to prepare the children with that story. And you called round with your celebratory drink to ready her for your final move. I imagine it was easy enough to hide the fact that you weren't actually drinking yourself while you made sure she took enough to knock herself out, except that, unfortunately for you, she didn't. By God, you must have had a shock when you saw her lying in that face. Yes, but you thought quickly, and your new plan bordered on genius. You had Stephen's chisel in your pocket. You'd already stolen it to frame him, and under cover of lifting the woman up to see if she was still alive, you stabbed her to death. Oh, bravo. That's the most imaginative bit of fiction I've heard in years. I look forward to our encounter in court, Holmes. There's more than enough proof, Tranter, thanks to your own foolish mistakes. The next time you break into a cottage, I suggest you use something more substantial than a surgical knife. I found the tip of the blade still wedged into the window frame. The shape and the steel are completely distinctive. Uh, oh, I'm accused of burglary too, am I? Anyone can obtain a surgical knife. You had to remove the evidence. You unpacked her trunk and put it away. And you took the damning wine bottle. But you couldn't find the glass she'd used. And you assumed she'd washed it and put it away before your drug took effect. And once again, you were wrong. We have that glass. And what was left in it. And the post-mortem will detect the remains of the opiate in her you, body. You made a fourth mistake. Breaking into Lawrence's studio for the sketches that weren't there. And a fifth... They carry no information to link you to the crime anyway. Fantasy. Every word of it. My so-called affair with this woman. You have witnesses, do you? You have letters, you have dates and times, you have evidence of assignation. We have more than enough. Dr Frederick Tranter, in the name of Queen Victoria, I'm placing you under arrest for the willful murder of Miss Emily Smith. Frederick, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but aren't you going to offer our guests some tea? Honestly, gentlemen, what sort of hosts must you think we are? No tea, thank you, Catherine. I'm very tired now. I think I'd like to go back to my cell. In a minute. More questions? Just the one. Well, Mr Holmes, Dr Watson, what can I say? Well, perhaps that you've learned the value of keeping an open mind. Yes, I have. Hmm. And that the doctor's stories don't exaggerate, whatever Mr Lawrence might think. <laughs> I've never found it necessary, Inspector. No, I can see that. 
Uh, we'll need you back down here for the trial. Oh, it's so pleasure. Oh. If I might offer one word of advice... Oh, I'll be grateful for yes. it. Keep questioning the villagers. It won't hurt your case to have some concrete evidence that Tranter and Miss Smith were in the habit of meeting. I plan to do that anyway, Mr Holmes. That's good man. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be quite a business, I reckon, once the papers get hold of it. It could be something of a boost to your career, Inspector. I doubt it, Doctor. <laughs> Seems to me all I've done is tag along in Mr. Holmes's footsteps. He's the one who should get all the glory. You should reread Watson's stories, Dawkins. Hmm? I play the game, for the game's own sake. The official forces of law and order always get the credit. I prefer it that way. Well, go on, Inspector. Ask me a question. I can see why you did it. Of course you can. You understand everything. I said that. <laughs> you understand me better than the famous Mr Sherlock Holmes ever could. But why did you make it so obvious? Why did you want me to catch you? If you'd done things a bit differently, you could have probably got away with it forever. It was a telegram for you, mm -hmm. from New Horton. Yeah, it's probably the date of the trial. Yeah. <coughs> oh, that was a decent thing you did, letting Dawkins take the credit. Well, when is it? There isn't going to be a trial. What do you mean? See for yourself. Come on, Tranta, stir yourself. It Good morning, Inspector. Two bars on cell window expertly removed. Tranter dead. Murder weapon. A carpenter's chisel. So, Dawkins deserves his credit. He was right. He saw murder in Stephen's eyes. Get away with it. I didn't think about getting away with it. It had to be done, that was all. And I was the one who had to do it. It was for her. That was my job. Doing things for her. That was my job. I'd like to go back to my cell now, please. May I go back to my cell? In The Shameful Betrayal of Miss Emily Smith, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Bert Stevens was played by Mark Gatiss, Inspector Dawkins by Christian Rodsker, Emily Smith by Jamie Barbacoff, Dr. Tranter by Philip Fox, Mrs. Tranter by Rachel Atkins, and Alfred Lawrenson by Chris Moran. The Shameful Betrayal of Miss Emily Smith was written by Bert Cools from a reference in the short story The Norwood Builder by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. First slide, please. My friends, the objects of our campaign, the deserving poor. Next. The industrious poor. Next. The poor with the moral resolution and strength of spirit to pull themselves out of the morass. These people, our people, need only the guiding light of knowledge and inspiration to set them on their road. And, my dear friends, to provide that light, that is not merely our Christian duty, it is our privilege. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Matthew Crosby. Oh. The Tragedy of Hanbury Street by Bert Cools with Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson 
and featuring Lindsay Duncan as Mrs. Adams and Colette O'Neill as Miss Wallace. The Tragedy of Hanbury Street. It was a better day today. No fights, no real drunks, and only a few knife wounds. And Jonathan says that the abandoned baby will live. I held her in my arms. She was so light. Jonathan said we should call her Charlotte, since it was I who found her. But I think we should call her Hope. Any sign? Rachel Gaddle. What does she think she's playing at? I should have followed her when she ran out. I was busy. We're all busy. Jonathan, what on earth did you say to her? Doctor! Miss Wallace! Have you found this stupid child? Dr Crosby, you'd better come. Dear God. This stupid, stupid little girl. Help me get her down. How old was your daughter, Mrs. Adams? Sixteen, Doctor. And you'd no objection to her working at the clinic? It is our Christian duty to succour the poor and the sick. But Hanbury Street, even by Whitechapel standards, that's a rough area. The place is well supervised. And frankly, I thought she'd get tired of the whole thing inside a week. And when she didn't? It would have been merely a matter of time. Charlotte was given to... whims. What does she use? A scarf, Mr Holmes. Tied to a hook in the ceiling. They said the room used to be a cold store. For meat. And this happened on the 10th? Three days ago. The 10th, yes. And you've no idea what drove her to such a desperate act? That's why I've come here. You understand, of course, that I might not be successful. Yes, I realise that. There is also another possibility. You might discover something about my daughter which I would not wish to hear. Exactly so. I don't care. I won't be able to rest until I know the truth. You're a very brave woman, Mrs Adams. No, Doctor. Not brave. Not one little bit. Mr Holmes, you should see this. They found this clutched in Charlotte's hand. Thank you. Does it mean anything to you? Nothing. Hmm. Watson. Oh, thank you. Forgive me. I didn't know. I didn't know. Had you heard of this Crosby Clinic? No, but I imagine it's typical of its type. Full of good intentions, but providing little more than a drop in the ocean. Well, a drop's better than nothing. Well, there are those who resent even that much. One establishment of the sort was burned down in 79. Oh, why, for God's sake? Well, because his clientele offended the morals of the arsonist. He turned out to be the local vicar. <laughs> a young woman volunteer leaves home happy and contented, and a few hours later, she, she takes her own life. What in God's name could have happened? Why didn't we drive right up to the door? Yeah, I wanted to observe without being observed. Oh. Ah. What are your impressions? Well, it's just a rambling old house. Well, I think we can go a little further than that. The building used to be a rooming house, but fell into ruin a good few years ago and was boarded up. And it changed hands and money was spent to make it habitable. It looks as though it could do with some more. Yes, the Crosby Clinic's evidently seen better days. I wonder who Crosby is? Let's find out. Frederick Crosby, gentlemen. He was born in this house. There were 32 separate families living here then, if you can call it living. You can still find the same thing today, God help us. Mr Crosby evidently escaped from his poverty. An example to us all, Mr Holmes. He rose by his own efforts, bought the building and established the clinic. Free medicine, hot food, warm clothing and sucker for the soul. That was 20 years ago. Is he still involved? He passed away nine years later. But his work continues. His son, Dr Jonathan Crosby, is in charge now. And exactly what is your position? 
I look after the day-to-day -day running of the establishment. Tell me about Charlotte Adams. There's very little to tell. She'd been a volunteer here for just over three months. Uh, do you have many helpers that young? We are grateful for anyone who'll give us that time, Doctor. She had her mother's permission. Was she a good worker? I believe so. She spent most of her time assisting Dr Crosby in the surgery. I shall need to speak to him. I'm afraid that's not possible. Why not? Because he's not here at the moment. Our Dr Kelly's helping out. He comes in from time to time. Where is Dr Crosby? Occupied with a personal family matter. But I can tell you anything you need to know. Dr Crosby told me that Charlotte suddenly just ran out of the surgery. Up to that moment he'd noticed nothing out of the ordinary about her. Do you know what they were doing? What sort of patient they were treating? I asked him that, of course. He said it was a purely routine case. Nothing that could have upset or distressed her. Mr Holmes, Charlotte Adams was made of sterner stuff than that. We do quite a few amputations here. Ah. Did Dr Crosby follow her? He was too busy. But later we realised that she hadn't been seen for some time. And you mounted a search? That sounds a little grand. We looked around for her and found her in there. Yeah. Do you have any idea what could have driven her to take her own life? All I know is this. Whatever it was, it had nothing whatsoever to do with my clinic. I'll be downstairs in my office if you should need me. Gentlemen. Oh, Miss Wallace. My clinic. Hmm. It's an interesting choice of words. Hmm. Now. Oh, what a dismal little room. Why here? Well, as her mother said, the, uh, the hooks in the ceiling. Well, stay here for a moment, would you? Oh, yes, of course. So I doubt if there's anything still to read after two days, but you never know. Yes, yes. Ah, yes, you can come in now. Have you found anything? Well, no, not much. Uh, she used this chair uh, first to secure her scarf, uh, like so, and then to uh, position herself. Yes, a moment of stillness. Have you observed how the prospect of imminent death quietens the mind? And then... It's a mistake to believe that the young can't feel the anguish and the darkness of their elders. What terrible burden drove her to such a measure? There's nothing more to be learned here. Well? I, um, I talked to the doctor, uh, Dr Kelly. Hmm? What's he like? Uh, elderly, a bit shaky. Retired from general practice a few years ago. Doing his best under the circumstances. Well, what do you mean? It's not just the building that needs money. They're using patched up equipment, makeshift supplies, and treatments out of the ark. Hmm. What was his opinion of the girl? Quiet, serious, very pleasant, interested in his work. She told him she wanted to be a doctor. Oh, that sounds like rather more than a whim. Does he have any idea why she did it? No, oh, he said not. And you believed him? Yes, I did. How did you get on with the volunteers? Oh, everyone told the same story. She was hard-working, uh, dedicated. If she wanted to become a doctor, she'd have needed to be. So, we know she had a strong desire to help her fellow man. Hmm, well, highly commendable. As long as it's not taken to extremes. Holmes, 16 years old is an age of extremes. It's an age when you want to change the world. And when the smallest thing can assume a significance out of all proportion to reality. Well, Mr. Holmes, what did you learn at the clinic? Nothing of significance, I'm afraid. Uh, but uh, we haven't yet spoken to everyone. Mrs. Adams, just how much time did your daughter spend at Hanbury Street? She was there almost every day. And the rest of the time? She stayed here at home, reading mostly. She loved to read, anything with print on it. Did she have many friends? My daughter was a quiet girl. She wasn't given to socialising. Mm. 
She wasn't um, walking out with anybody. She was too young for such things. So, apart from yourself and the people at the clinic, Charlotte had very little contact with anybody else. Where is her bedroom? Ah, oh, there's nothing here. The room's practically been emptied. It's a common enough reaction to a bereavement. You either find this or the opposite. Everything left exactly as it was. Well, a shrine would have been highly informative. This is like a slate that's been wiped clean. What are you looking for? A uh, diary. In my admittedly limited experience, most solitary young ladies can be relied upon to unburden themselves in a diary. You find it and it could crack this case wide open. Perhaps her mother's already found it. Yes, then why hasn't she mentioned it to us? Uh, 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 this is useless. Nothing behind the furniture, nothing under the rugs, and no hiding places in the walls. Maybe she simply didn't keep a diary. Begging your pardon, sirs. But she did. Ha! And where is it now? Well, I, d I don't know. Um, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry, sir. Oh, don't worry, Alice. It's all right. Yes, sir. No, please, please, don't be scared. No, sir. Where's the other gentleman? He's talking to your mistress. He thought you might be more comfortable with just one of us. <laughs> Between you and me, he can be a bit frightening sometimes. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, Alice, it's all right for you to talk to me. Mrs Adams won't be angry. I, I shouldn't have brought you below stairs, sir. Oh, I like it here. Oh, yeah, upstairs is too, um, stuffy, don't you think so? Well, I've never heard a gentleman say that before. You should see where I live, Alice. Not stuffy at all. <laughs> Miss Charlotte liked it down here. Yes. Yeah. She she liked your scullery, did she? Oh, yes, sir. Mm. Did she come down here to see you? When her mum... When the mistress was out. We used to talk down here. Ah. She, she said... Well, well, go on, Alice. What, what did she say? She said we was friends. Ah. I, I told her no, I wasn't allowed to be her friend. But she just laughed and said that was old-fashioned talk and one time soon everything would be different. Is that true, sir? It was all right for me to be her friend. I think it was a very good thing. Oh, I'm so pleased. Mrs Adams, I must ask you about the day your daughter died. Of course you must. It's good of you to be concerned about my feelings, Mr. Holmes, but I'll not collapse in tears. I may not be myself at present, but I'm made of sterner stuff than that. <laughs> Miss Wallace used exactly the same phrase about your daughter. She did? Hmm. When Charlotte left the house, did she appear at all upset or distracted? I've already told you, no, not at all. No, she said nothing to you about something that was troubling her. Nothing. Now, if there had been something wrong, would she have mentioned it? Not necessarily. Not even to you? Mr. Holmes, it's evident that you're not a family man. However close they might be, 16 years old is not an age at which a young woman confides in her mother. Alice, tell me this. Do you know what made your friend Charlotte do what she did? No, sir, I don't. Well, I wish so much that I did. I want to understand it more than anything. And I want to be able to tell Mrs. Adams, too. I, I hear her crying, you know, oh. when she thinks no-one's there. Breaks my heart, sir. Well, perhaps between the two of us we can help find out. I'd like that, sir. Good girl. Did Miss Charlotte ever talk to you about the clinic, uh, about the people there? Oh, yes, sir. Well, she loved that place, she did. She told me once she found a little baby what nearly died, but they saved it. Oh. Oh, she was so happy. <laughs> Did she ever talk about a gentleman called Crosby? Dr Jonathan Crosby? Oh, yes, sir. All the time. And what did she say? Well, I think... Well, what? Go on, Alice. I want to know what you think. Oh, sir. I think she really liked him. Did you approve of Charlotte's ambition to become a doctor? A doctor? You didn't know? A doctor. Mr Holmes, last year it was an artist and six months before that it was a lawyer. Well, 
Thank you very much, Alice. I'll tell your mistress how helpful you've been. Sir? Yes, what is it? Well, Miss Charlotte did say something. Something I didn't understand. What was it? It was just a few days before... Well, you know. Go on. We was down here talking. Only she was angry about something. Do you know what she was angry about? No, sir. She didn't say, and I didn't like to ask. But she was really angry, I could tell. And she said something which puzzled you? Well, she was talking to herself. I don't think she even knew I was here. She said, wait till he gets it. Over and over. Wait till he gets it. Wait till he gets it. What on earth can it mean? I don't know. But we're, uh, we're gathering threads. Sooner or later, we'll find the one thing that will bring them all together. So, what next? Ah, I've done enough running around for one day. It's time for some dinner and some thought. And tomorrow morning... Back to Hanbury Street? Well, we talk to Dr Jonathan Crosby. Try ringing again. Yes. What was it Miss Wallace said? Uh, that he was occupied with a personal family matter. Yes, this could mean almost anything. Even assuming that it's true. We think she was lying. <laughs> uh, gentlemen? Uh, we wish to speak to Dr Jonathan Crosby. It's my card. I'm sorry, Mr Holmes, but I'm afraid that is not possible. Well, when will it become possible? Never, sir. At ten o'clock yesterday evening, Dr. Crosby took his own life. Well, what did they say? Pistol to the temple. He was dead by the time they got him here. Damn the man. Why couldn't he have waited? Oh. There's something else. Hmm? What? I asked if they knew why he'd done it. The surgeon was surprised. That you were interested? That I needed to inquire. Apparently the butler volunteered the information to the ambulance men. Dr. Crosby had been severely depressed following the death of his brother. Another death, another Crosby. Yes. Did this informative surgeon know when he died, this brother? Very recently, on the 8th. Two days before Charlotte Adams. Uh, mm -hmm. Ah, here it is. Mm, what does it say? Uh, Tragic death of prominent city banker, Mr Matthew Gordon Crosby was found dead in his bed at his London home on Tuesday morning, having suffered a massive hemorrhage while he slept. Mr Crosby will doubtless be remembered by our readers for his tireless efforts to bring education and enlightenment to the less well-favoured portions of the capital's population. Another philanthropist. Mm, seems to run in the family. But how can any of this possibly be connected with Charlotte Adams? Jonathan Crosby's brother dies. Two days later, the doctor's back at the clinic. Work as an antidote to sorrow? Yeah, rather a rapidly taken antidote, wouldn't you say? Well, everyone reacts to these things differently. Well, whatever his motive, he's back in his surgery, and assisting him is Charlotte Adams. Sixteen, idealistic, ambitious. And very fond of him? Well, what would that mean? She'd be upset on his behalf. Uh, assuming she knew about his loss. That's a good point. Perhaps it was then that he told her. And she was so distraught that she ran from the room and killed herself. I wasn't suggesting that. Yes, even for a 16-year-old female, that's taking an emotional reaction rather too far. But something happened. I suppose we should consider the possibility... Yes? Uh, well, you have a man in emotional turmoil and a sympathetic and attractive young woman. And he might have turned to her for some consolation. And she might have misinterpreted his meaning. This is not a pleasant thought, but... It... It is possible. I refuse to countenance the idea. Jonathan Crosby saw the Adams girl as an intelligent child. No more than that. Besides which, they were treating a patient when she suddenly ran from the room. The whole notion is preposterous. Did Dr Crosby strike you as being particularly upset that day? His only brother had just died, Mr Holmes. And yet he was here, as usual. The work doesn't go away just because we have problems of our own. Gentlemen, I am extremely busy. Is there anything else? Was Dr Crosby close to his brother? Certainly. Did Matthew Crosby ever come here? On occasion, I believe. Because of his own interest in aiding the disadvantaged? No doubt. Now, if you'll excuse me... 
Why didn't you mention Dr. Crosby's suicide? I wanted to see if she'd mention it first. Would she know already? There's been ample time for a message to arrive. But if she's heard, why didn't she tell us? She couldn't know we've already discovered it for ourselves. And she must realise it might be relevant. Uh, I rather think Miss Wallace has her own ideas about what is and isn't relevant. What? What the devil? Oh, you fool! You'll only make it worse! Get your hands off of me! Dr. Kelly! I'm all right! Help him! Do keep away from no, me! No, 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 calm, calm down! That's a nasty-looking knife. You must be in agony. Keep away! I tried to take it out. Our friend here objected. That's because it's a Romanish shiv. The blade's been barbed at the tip. Stay where you are! Don't be a fool. I can help you. Holmes, whatever you say. Now! Keep his arm still. I've got it. Let go of me! No! Oh, 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 what? No, no I'm, I'm all right. Somebody give me a scalpel. Now! Right. This, this is going to hurt a little. And so is this. There. That's got it. Uh, you can stop struggling now. It's over. You cut me, you bastard. And that's quite enough of that. I had to clear the flesh away from the blade. It was either that or push the whole knife through to the other side of your arm. Perhaps you'd have preferred that. Oh. Did it hurt you? Uh, I've had worse. It's a nice atmosphere for a 16-year-old girl. Damn ruffian. Mm. He was a perfectly respectable market porter till he took to drink. Mm. I'm glad you took the time to notice that while he was beating the living daylights out of me. Now, oh, really, Doctor, don't exaggerate. Uh, it was interesting to see inside that surgery. Ah, you saw what I meant about the state of things. Yes, of course, but that wasn't exactly my principal concern. Everything hinges on what happened in that room. When Crosby and Charlotte were alone together. Not alone. Huh? Oh, no, that's right. They had a patient with them. If we could find out who it was. Oh, I don't think there's much chance of that. They don't keep any records. And the patients are in and out of there like flies. I doubt if any of the volunteers would remember. It wasn't the volunteers I was thinking of asking. We get our soup now, do we? That's right, love over here. You stick with me. Why didn't you just talk to the patients while we were there? It could have helped. Well, we've learnt nothing. We were well-dressed, well-fed and strangers. The the enemy... Oh, I oh. suppose you're right. Oh. That's better. So, did you learn anything? I had to work my way through several lunch companions, but eventually I found a regular customer. And as luck would have it, she'd been waiting just outside the surgery when the late Miss Adams rushed past her, looking like she'd seen a ghost, apparently. Did this woman see what happened? No, but she was able to tell me who was actually in with them at the time. You have the name? I have rather more than that. All right, all right, three cards. Three cards and no more cards. Two of them is aces and one's the lady. You know what you've got to do. Here she is and there she was. And round and round they go. Put your penny on the lady, I'll give you back six. Can't say fairer than that now, can I? No, he never is. A sovereign on this one. What? Where the hell do you come by that sort of money? Yeah, we'll set to you. Are we playing or not? <laughs> yeah, but I'll, tell, I'll tell you what. If you win, you keep the sovereign. If I, I win, ain't got no if six I sobs. win, you let me buy you a drink. Hey, let's take a look, shall we? Yeah. Hey! <laughs> well, well, it must be my lucky day. Oh, good health to you, whoever the hell you are. Yeah, good health. Oh, oh that's good, that is. I'm pleased to hear it. Uh -huh. All right. That's enough games. What do you want? He went to the clinic because his hand had swollen up. He kept dropping his cars, which didn't do his business much good. And he was there when Charlotte Adams suddenly ran out. Oh, yes, he remembers it vividly. Well, what happened? Crosby was draining the blood from his hand with a couple of leeches and explaining about them to the girl. It's common gossip at the clinic that he was teaching her basic medicine, something else Miss Wallace omitted to mention. Well, there's no reason why that should have upset her. 
If she assisted at amputations, a bloodletting's nothing. A conversation moved on to Crosby's brother. Ah, well, that sounds rather more interesting. You were right. She hadn't heard the sad news. And Crosby told her. Was that what did it? He told her. She was shaken, yes, but no more than that. Well, then. And then she asked what he died of. Was natural enough. And? And Jonathan Crosby told her, and it was that one piece of information which sent Charlotte Adams running straight to her death. You don't object to a spot of mild deception? Not at all. I've been thinking about this anyway. And if it'll help the case? I think it will. Hmm. You're a natural confidant, Watson, especially where the fair sex is concerned. Uh, what will you be up to? Uh, a little light reading. Good luck. Uh, there. I'll dissolve this in water and drink it straight down. It should help. Oh, thanks, Doc. Oh, who's next? Uh, Mrs Quilly? Doctor? Wheel in the next patient, would you? Oh, there's no one waiting, Doctor. Good grief. You mean I get a chance to sit down? I expect you could do with a nice cup of tea. Ah, oh, Mrs Quilly, you're a lifesaver. There you are, sir. Excellent. Just let me know when you're ready for the next volume. Yes, thank you. Hmm. Oh, that's very good. Thank you. Enjoy it while you can, Doctor. They'll be pouring in again before you know it. Yes, so Dr Kelly said. This is so good of you. The poor man needs a rest, God knows. Oh, it's my pleasure. Good to be back in harness again. <laughs> How long have you been a volunteer here, Mrs Quilly? Nearly 12 years. Oh, I imagine you've seen some changes. I certainly have. I remember when we didn't have to scrimp and save quite so much for one thing. What happened, do you know? I don't really understand these things. My husband says it's down to the stock market. Ah. Your founder might have been a saint, but he had no idea about making money. That's what my husband says. And I suppose that young Dr Crosby was the same, God rest his soul. But the old place keeps on going somehow. Thank heaven for it. Amen to that. Dr Watson. Yes? Why aren't earth would Dr. Crosby do such a thing? I simply can't understand it. I don't know, Mrs. Quilly. Depression can do strange things. Depression? I had a brother who died. We weren't really on good terms, but I still felt... Um, uh, it must have been terrible for Dr. Crosby. What do you mean? But being so close to his brother like that. Oh. Doctor, I don't know who you've been talking to, but Jonathan Crosby and his brother weren't what you might call close. They hated the sight of each other. Not only were they daggers drawn, everyone at the clinic knew it. There'd been a stand-up row in full view of volunteers, patients, everyone. Mm, so much for Miss Wallace's firm statement to the contrary. You said from the first she was lying to us. What was the row about? I'm afraid the details are a little hazy, though money seems to have been at the heart of it. Yes, that makes sense. But Mrs Quilly was quite certain of one thing. Jonathan accused his brother of, and I quote exactly, mm. of wanting to bleed this place dry. Ah, vital link in the chain. But what does it mean? Tell me, did Charlotte Adams observe this fight? Yes. I'm afraid she saw the whole thing. This case keeps throwing up little snippets of vital information that no one seems to have bothered to tell us. Such as? Such as that both Crosby brothers lived in this house, not just Dr Jonathan. How did you find that out? I spent the day in the newspaper library reading up on Matthew Crosby and his charitable pursuits, and then I had a quiet word with a grateful ex-client in Chancery Lane. The late Mr Crosby's legal activities have been quite the talk of the Inns of Court. Ah, good afternoon, Treves. Uh, Mr Holmes, Doctor, may I ask why you're here? Because it's essential that I see inside this house. I'm sorry, Mr Holmes, I have no authority to admit you. I say again, it's essential. For what reason? I'm acting on behalf of Mrs Margaret Adams. Her daughter was a volunteer at the Crosby Clinic. I believe I've heard Dr Crosby mention the young lady, sir. Well, then you'd be sorry to hear that she's dead. Well, I'm very sorry indeed, And that sir. both of your late employers might well be implicated. Now, may we come in? Who discovered Matthew Crosby's body? I did, sir. 
when I brought his morning tea to his bedroom. In here, gentlemen. He died in his sleep? Yes, sir. What condition was he in when you found him? He was lying quite normally. I'd have thought he was asleep if it hadn't been for the blood. What was the source of the bleeding? His nose and ears, sir. Cranial hemorrhage. I believe that's what the doctors said, yes, sir. I want to see all the posts from the last seven days. I think this is everything, Mr. Holmes. Has anything been thrown out? No, sir. With the house in such disarray. It's excellent, excellent. Yeah, it won't be a letter, a parcel. What are you looking for? Ah, this. Addressed to Matthew. It's unwrapped, but most of the label still attached. No postmark. Creaves, do you recall when this arrived? I'm afraid not, Mr. Holmes. Yeah, but it was Matthew Crosby who opened it. No one else would have done so, sir. No, very good, very good. Wait till he gets it. <sighs> Watson, take a look. If I'm right, this package contains the clue to three deaths. What on earth is in it? Well, I have my suspicions. Let's find out if they're correct. Good Lord. And so the case is complete. Please, take a seat, Mrs. Adams. Thank you, Doctor. Yes, it's... Uh, it's good of you to come here. I know it can't have been easy for you. <clears throat> Mr. Holmes, I hope this isn't going to take long. Miss Wallace, from the very beginning of this investigation, you have done everything in your power to stand in my way. How dare you, sir? And now you will have the courtesy to grant me your time. Very well. But if you have something to see, sir, then see it. Thank you. The most important element in this case, and one of the key facts which you have striven to conceal from me, is that until very recently, the whole future of this clinic was in doubt. I don't know what you're talking about. Kindly do not insult my intelligence. This is what I'm talking about. The festering infection of the East End slums will never be eradicated while well-intentioned but dangerously misguided do-gooders insist on soothing the ills of drunken sots and filling the stomachs of common whores so they can go back onto the streets and continue to spread their corruption. What a terrible sentiment. All the more terrible considering its source. What do you mean, Doctor? That was an extract from a speech given by Mr Matthew Crosby. Clearly, his charitable instincts had some very well-defined boundaries. He was attacking his own father's work. Many misguided people have done so, Mr Holmes. But no others have taken quite such extreme steps. He was planning to seize control of this clinic, sell the building and reinvest the fund, and then use the proceeds for his own purpose. A grand educational institute for the population of the district. Except, of course, those the enlightened Mr Crosby deemed unacceptable. Do you seriously suppose that any of my people would be allowed to put a toe over the threshold? Yes, you knew all about his scheme. So did Dr Jonathan Crosby. And so, tragically, did Charlotte Adams. She heard the brothers arguing. She realised what Matthew Crosby was planning to do. And she decided to show him that it wasn't only his brother who objected to his attitude. She sent him this. Mrs. Adams, I believe you'll recognise your daughter's hand on what's left of the label. Yes. Yes, that's her writing. What is in the box? She wanted to make her point as forcibly as she could. And she had the materials to hand, amongst the antiquated supplies in the surgery where she worked. She heard Jonathan accuse Matthew of wanting to bleed this place dry. And so she sent him these. Take a close look, Miss Wallace. And now you, Mrs. Adams. Oh, dear God. Are they dead? They are. But your reaction's understandable. Dead or alive, a box full of leeches isn't a pleasant sight. Unless, of course, you're expecting to see it. Isn't that so, Miss Wallace? I can't believe it. Charlotte did that. Your daughter's work here wasn't a whim or a passing fad. She believed in this place with all her heart and soul. And Matthew Crosby was threatening its very survival. Sending that package was an empty, childish gesture, but it did have the virtue of making her point with admirable directness. 
Very well, very well. My daughter made a silly, futile protest. At least she took a stand. I'm proud of her for that. But, Mr Holmes, what has this to do with her suicide? Events took a turn which changed everything. Matthew Crosby died. Charlotte learned the news from his brother, and not unnaturally, she was considerably shaken. She asked exactly what had happened. And was given the devastating news that he'd suffered from haemophilia. I'm sorry, I don't understand. I'm afraid it's all too simple. Your daughter thought she was a murderess. In her mind, she saw Crosby reach into the box, the leeches fasten onto his skin, the blood-sucking begin. She'd seen it often enough in the surgery here, and more. She'd seen some patients pass out as the leeches did their work. She pictured Crosby unconscious on the floor as the bloated leeches removed themselves and the bite wounds continued to bleed. Unstoppable and fatal. There are few adults who could live with that image haunting them. And for all her intelligence and maturity, your daughter was still only a 16-year-old girl. Forgive me. I didn't know. She didn't know about his haemophilia. She didn't know that her gesture of defiance was deadly to him. She had dedicated her life to helping other people and healing the sick. And now she was convinced that she'd killed a man. And she couldn't live with that guilt. And you? What about me, Mr. Holmes? You knew this. You knew the whole story. Do you deny it? I found this in with Charlotte's things. It's a diary. It's all in here. You've had that the whole time. And told no one? What were you thinking? Were you trying to protect me? No, Mrs Adams, not you. I hoped you'd find nothing. The girl's death would be put down to hysteria and the whole thing just blow over. How could you do it? How? Why do you need to ask? I did it for the clinic. Your daughter wasn't the only one who loved this place. Mr. Holmes. Mrs. Adams. You said that Charlotte thought she was a murderess. Yes, I did. Then she was mistaken. She was. You're sure of that? Completely sure? He died in his sleep. The package had been opened long before. Charlotte was not in any way responsible for Matthew Crosby's fate. Thank you, sir. Miss Wallace. Mrs Adams. The diary, if you please. Thank you. I believe it's time I got to know my daughter. Oh, what a terrible affair. Well, at least the clinic is safe. Mm -hmm. Might be rather more than that. Oh? A fresh look at those investments could well improve things. Good. That would be good. You know, I've been thinking about Jonathan Crosby. Indeed. I still don't understand why he put a pistol to his head. Well, I suspect it was guilt. Because of what he told Charlotte Adams? Oh, surely not. Even if he knew about her sending the leeches. Miss Wallace confessed to telling him. He knew. It's all right, but to kill himself over an innocent, casual comment? Well, it was rather more than that. If his brother hadn't died, Charlotte Adams would still be alive. But he couldn't have done anything to prevent Matthew's death? Well, certainly he could. He could have refrained from killing him. Uh, 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 Jonathan Crosby murdered Matthew? His father's work was being threatened. His work, too. And a fatal hemorrhage is remarkably easy to induce if you happen to be a doctor. And he just stood there and watched while his own brother bled to death. Well, we don't know that he watched. Well, that's hardly the point. Good Lord. Will you tell the police? Tell them what? That Jonathan Crosby was a murderer. Was he? Well, you... 
You just said so. Well, well, Watson, all I did was outline a theory, nothing more. A theory? There's no proof? Well, none that I'm aware of. Uh, you? No, of course not. Matthew Crosby died of natural causes, and his brother couldn't live with the loss. Charlotte Adams killed herself over a tragic misunderstanding, and the clinic will continue its work, untainted by scandal. It's a good enough ending, as endings go. Why change it? I've sent the package. I have no illusions that it will make any difference. But at least I've done something. The clinic must not close. Too many lives depend on it. Too much love and dedication has been poured into it. <laughs> I suppose it was a silly, nasty thing to do. But sometimes in life, one must do terrible things for what one believes in. The clinic has been so good to me. It's wonderful to be part of something so worthwhile and so needed. I found my purpose here, my future. I've never felt so alive. In The Tragedy of Hanbury Street, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Mrs. Adams was played by Lindsay Duncan and Miss Wallace by Colette O'Neill. Charlotte Adams was played by Lydia Leonard, Matthew Crosby by John Rowe, Jonathan Crosby by Chris Moran, Treves by Philip Fox, and Mrs. Quilly by Francis Jeter. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Tragedy of Hanbury Street was written by Bert Coules from a reference in the short story The Golden pince by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. Adelton. Uh, Sergeant. You should go upstairs now. Uh, we're going to... Uh, we're going to bring them out. Oh, yes, thank you. If you please, Miss. Sergeant, you will remember what I said, won't you? Yes, of course, Miss. It's important. Why won't you listen to me? If you'll just let us get on with our jobs, Miss. All right, all right, I'm going. But, Sergeant... Miss? I know what I'm talking about. Something's wrong here, and if you won't take me seriously, I'll find someone who will. The Determined Client by Bert Cools, with Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson, and featuring Fritha Goody as Caroline Adelton. The Determined Client. There you are, Miss Adelton. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's a cold day. Indeed. Uh, I thought it was rather clement. You're probably right, Mr. Holmes. It's me. I haven't felt properly warm, not since it happened. Could that be some sort of delayed shock, Doctor? Bereavement can give rise to shock, yes. Mr. Holmes has told you what's happened. Well, only the basic facts. I should prefer you to tell the story in your own words. Oh, but it's all in my letter. It would be of enormous value. Oh, yes. Y yes, of course, I understand. You must forgive me, gentlemen. I, I can't seem to think clearly just at the moment. Just take your time, Miss Adelton. There's no hurry. Quite so. Drink your coffee, gather your thoughts, and wait until you're completely recovered from the rigours of your journey up from Sussex. I trust the delay to your train didn't cause you undue concern. Oh, why, why, no, it was a, no more than 15 minutes, and the... But how in the world could you know about that? 
The trains from Upper Chiddingly are scheduled to arrive at half past the hour. There are always cabs at the station at this time of day, so you should have arrived here in good time and feeling rested from your journey. Instead of which, you were two and one half minutes late, and forgive me, somewhat flustered and out of breath. How do you know it wasn't the cab from the station that had the problem? Leaving a defective cab and finding a fresh one would hardly occupy a quarter of an hour. The deduction is a simple one. To you, maybe. To me, it seems rather more like magic. I can see that I was right to come to you, Mr Holmes. Let's hope that I can justify your faith. Oh, I'm sure you shall. Very well. I suppose I have to begin some 40-odd years ago. And so to the final and main provision... The control of the family business, together with all holdings, property and investments pertaining thereto, these I bequeath in their entirety to my younger son, William Arthur Adelton. What? Mr Adelton, please. Yes, show a little decorum, brother. Decorum? <laughs> it's an outrage. He must have lost his mind. Not according to his doctors. Your late father was, uh... Ah, yes, here we are. Perfectly lucid to the end. I'll fight this. I rather doubt that you'll meet with any success. Come on, Tom. Don't be a bad loser. We were going to be treated equally. He always said so. Equality has to be earned. Who took over the reins when he couldn't cope anymore? Who looked after him? Who was there? I was abroad, for God's sake! Because you couldn't wait to get away from the old man. Well, now you've got your reward. Favouring the younger son. That rarely leads to harmony. I'm afraid it certainly didn't in this case. William Adelton, my father, came into money, power and responsibility. My Uncle Thomas got nothing at all. What on earth had he done to deserve that sort of treatment? I don't know. Did you never ask your father? I tried once. He made it very clear that the matter was never to be raised again. It angered him to think of it? I don't think it was anger. I think it made him sad. Terribly sad. But, of course, I honoured his wishes and never mentioned it again. So the rift between the two brothers was never healed? Never. My uncle moved away and the family was broken forever. They had no contact at all with each other? Not for a long time. Then there was a particular incident. My uncle Tom came to see my father. For heaven's sake, William! I told you I'd help you if I could. And just what precisely is stopping you? It's not a good time. The business, it's not doing well. Oh, you expect me to believe that? I don't see too many signs of deprivation. You know nothing whatsoever about it. William, my son is ill. Seriously ill. I need money. I'm sorry. You'll have to find it somewhere else. Very well. But I'm warning you, brother, if the boy dies, his blood will be on your hands. Was your father telling the truth about the business? I've no reason to believe otherwise, Mr Holmes. Quite so. Pray, continue. The boy, my cousin Frederick, didn't die. I'm pleased to hear it. But from that day on, the separation was complete. My father and my uncle never again had anything to do with each other. What of yourself and your cousin? Frederick and I hadn't met at all. The first time I ever saw him was just over a year ago. In the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life still to come. Amen. Amen. It's over. Come along, Karen. Yes, Father. Excuse me. Yeah? I'm Frederick Adelton. Your nephew, sir. Indeed. And your cousin, Miss Caroline. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. Uh, cousin Frederick, uh, my condolences on your loss. Thank you. I'd like to speak to your mother, too, may I? My mother died when I was a baby. Oh, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. Sir, uncle, I'd like to thank you for coming. I need no thanks for attending my own brother's funeral. And I want to invite you back to my house. There's not much, just some food and a bit to drink. But I thought we could see the old man off properly. Please, say you'll come. It sounds as though he was trying to repair the family rift. Yes, that's what I thought. And I don't mind telling you, gentlemen, I welcomed it. Hmm. And your father? Uh, he wasn't an effusive man, Mr Holmes. But yes, I thought I saw signs that things might improve at long last. Unfortunately, I was mistaken. 
How dare you, sir? I? The offence was yours, sir. Oh, no. Now, will you please calm down and display a little decorum? Calm down? You insult me. You insult my father. I knew nothing of the sort. For heaven's sake, remember the occasion. I'll remember it, all right. This conversation is at an end. Just as you wish. <sighs> Damn the man for a... Sorry. What on earth did you say to him? Nothing he didn't deserve to hear. Had your... Had your father been ill for long? He hadn't been ill at all. The old man drank himself to death. Oh. Couldn't cope with life and looked for the easiest way out. I'm so sorry. You're not the one who should apologise. After that, Cousin Frederick didn't contact us again. I saw nothing of him for at least a twelve month. And then, three days ago, quite out of the blue, he called at the house. Who are you? I'm Mrs. Sindon, sir. Well, Sindon, my name is Frederick Adelton. I'm the son of the man who was cheated out of owning this house and being your master. I see, sir. I've come to see my uncle and I won't be told no. I'm afraid he's not here, sir. When do you expect him back? Well, I'm afraid I couldn't say, sir. I'll wait. You witnessed this yourself? No, I was out walking. Mrs. Sindon told me about it afterwards. Very good. Please continue. You're being admirably clear and precise. Oh, I know how important that is for you. Model client, Watson. Yes, indeed. You're very kind. Well, Mrs. Sindon showed Cousin Frederick into the library to wait for Father. But after nearly two hours, he said he wouldn't wait any longer. Were you back at the house by then? Did you observe his departure? I did, yes. I'll be back tonight, nine o'clock. Yes, sir. May I tell Mr. Adelton why you want to see him? No. I think I'd rather it came as a surprise. You're sure of his words? Completely. Thank you. Continue. Frederick did come back later, just as he said he would, and my father agreed to see him. They went into father's study. Where were you at this time? I was upstairs in my room, reading. What? Father? Frederick was lying against the hearth. My father was just behind the door. There was a gun in his hand. His head... There was blood. So much blood. Both of them were covered in blood. Your father had killed your cousin, and then himself. But that's what I thought at first. An entirely natural supposition. But I was wrong. Then what had happened? I was wrong on two counts. Firstly, Frederick wasn't dead. The bullet had hit him in the shoulder, the left shoulder. The doctor said that the force had thrown him backwards and he'd hit his head against the edge of the hearth. And knocked himself unconscious? It's rather more serious than that. A fracture to the base of the skull. Damage to the spinal column? Mm, possibly to the brain itself. He's still unconscious. He can't talk or move, but he is still alive. And your father? Killed instantly. Yeah. Oh, I'm very sorry. Thank you. Miss Adelton... You said you were wrong on two counts. What was the second? After the first shock of that awful sight, I realised the truth. Dr Watson, my father would never have shot a man. Never. Well, it's very natural that you should think so, Miss Adelton. But the evidence... My father was not capable of such a terrible act, and I'll not have his memory blackened by such a lie. But... W forgive me, but what other explanation is possible? I don't know. But there must be one. There must be. Tell me about the gun. Whose was it? It was my father's. I, I know, I know. Yeah, but you have to believe me. Well, I'd like to, of course. But you have to admit that all the evidence points to your father being guilty. No, sir, not all the evidence. You have proof of his innocence? I have something that doesn't fit, something that isn't right. Holmes, you know about this? Miss Adelton put it in her letter, yes. It was the reason I agreed to see her. 
Dr. Watson, ten years ago, my father was injured. He was visiting a factory and there was an accident with one of the machines. His hand was terribly damaged. The doctors worked miracles. You'd never have known to look at him. But he completely lost the use of his fingers and his thumb. Oh, it sounds as if the tendons were severed. Yes, that's right. That's what they said. He couldn't pick up or grip anything ever again. You can ask anyone in the household. They'll swear it's true. Oh, Miss Adelton, I've no reason to doubt your word. Oh, but it's important. It's so important. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not putting this at all well. Uh, the point, Watson, is that this crippling injury was to William Adelton's right hand. He trained himself to use his left hand instead. He had no choice. But what does that have to do with the shooting? Dr Watson, when I found my father, he was clutching the gun in his right hand. Thank you. Thank you for believing in me, Mr. Holmes. Mm. We'll join you at the house as soon as we can, probably later this afternoon. I'll make sure the study stays locked until you come. Huh. Though I'm afraid all sorts of people have rather trampled over everything. The doctor, the servants, the police. Did you tell the police about the gun? Oh, of course, but they didn't seem to understand what I meant. Well, they had a straightforward crime with a straightforward solution. I'm afraid that asking them actually to think about things was rather too ambitious. Have a safe journey, Miss Adelton. I shall. Well, my heart is so much lighter. Thank you both. All right, driver. Waterloo Station. Yeah, Waterloo. Yes, miss. Yep, yep. What an exceptional young woman. Observant, too. What do you think really happened in that room? Uh, let's get back inside. Well, you obviously think that something's wrong or you wouldn't have taken the case. Something is wrong. If he did somehow manage to use his damaged hand, it could explain why he missed. Missed? He hit the man's shoulder rather than his heart. His left shoulder. Was that significant? Or it will be. Why do you assume he was aiming for the heart? Uh, yes. I suppose that's true. We don't actually know that he was trying to kill him, do we? No, we know remarkably little, in some areas at least, and yet in others. I'm going out. Ah. Uh, uh, can I help? Uh, yes, you can. Would, would you like to tell me how? By meeting me at Waterloo in time for the 2.45 to Upper Chiddingly. Oh, very good. And, Watson, bring your revolver. Uh, there, you see? Ample time. Uh, I'd hate to be with you when you cut it fine. <clears throat> uh, have you thought any more about the case? Well, of course. But I'm no nearer making sense of it. Uh, we lack data. Well, you were quite right in describing our client as observant. There are too many details still to be filled in. Principally, just what Frederick Adelton said to his uncle. Well, not only what, why then? If you wanted to confront the man, why wait a year to do it? Perhaps he discovered something new about his father. We need to know what he'd been up to during those 12 months. Mm, that's what I've been trying to find out. Did you have any success? Mm, a little. Just over 10 months ago, a Frederick Adelton was arrested in London. Was he by Joe? On what charge? Drunken brawling. Oh, dear. Like father, like son, do you suppose? Yeah, that was the only time he actually fell foul of the law, but it was exceedingly useful. Useful? In what way? Well, because it furnished me with his address, of course. He was sharing a room in Soho with one Elliot Matthews, a market worker. Does he still live there? Did you speak to this Matthews? I don't have time. Oh, no, I suppose not. So, <clears throat> did the younger man want a share of the business? Or at the very least, some financial help? Presumably there was an argument. The older man produces his gun, uh, the wrong hand. Why was it in the wrong hand? Well, we'll know more once we've examined the scene of the crime. Until then, my advice is to sit back, relax, and enjoy the journey. Hmm. This is the door to Father's study. Before we go in, there are just a few things I'd like to have clarified. Firstly, what will happen now to the family business? I don't know. I have no brothers to take over. 
Perhaps your father had a trusted colleague, a protégé? Very possibly. He never talked to me about such things. I suppose it's all in his will. Yes, no doubt. And now, next, you mentioned that a good many people had been in the room since the shooting. Yes, the police, the undertakers, of course. Yes, plus your servants and yourself. I've not really been inside after that first time. I couldn't. No, naturally not. But I've tried my best to leave things as they were, even... even the blood... It's not been easy, Mr. Holmes, knowing what was on the other side of that door. It must have been enormously difficult for you. And I appreciate your diligence. Thank you. Very well, then. Uh, just, just one more thing, if I may. Uh, of course. Now, you said that the gun belonged to your father. Yes. Do you know where he kept it? I assumed it was with the rest of the collection. He collected firearms? In a small way. He'd only recently taken up the hobby. Where did he house this uh, collection? In a cabinet in the library. The library? Is it important? In a case like this, everything is important. You may open the study door now. Do you... Do you need me to be in the room with you? No, no. Please wait somewhere else. If I have any questions, I'll come and find you. Thank you. That was good of you. Ah, I simply didn't want her disturbing the evidence. Tread carefully, Doctor. Hmm. As, as if there was a fight. Yeah, not a fight, exactly, I fancy. Upturned furniture and stuff all over the floor, and there wasn't a fight? Uh, first things first. <clears throat> the older man lay there, and the younger was by the fire. Oh, yes, that's very singular. What is? Yes, just a detail, but a very interesting one. Now, just now, stay by the door, please, while I examine the room. Is, uh, is there anything clear enough to read? Uh, yes, a surprising amount, thanks to our client's care and a well-polished parquet floor. Yes, the two men faced each other across the desk. The younger man was agitated. He moved around a good deal. And the, the, the older... Uh, what? Uh, it's harder to see. Ah, yes. At one point, both men were standing at the side of the desk. Now, Watson, come and be William Adelton. Oh, very well. Mm. Uh, where exactly? Uh, well, just, just, uh, here. No, no, a little further left. Mm -hmm. Just left. That, that's good, good, good. Now, this is where he was when the fatal shot was fired. Oh, oh, from the blood stains on the wall? Quite. And from the corresponding stains on the floor, we can see precisely where and how he collapsed. Do you need me to reenact the fall? Not unless you particularly want to. Well, I think I'll stay on my feet, thanks. Wise decision. Right. <clears throat> now, I'm the nephew Frederick. Now, where was I standing? Um... Well, surely over by the fireplace where it was found. Uh, the shot would uh, push you ba uh, him backwards, but not all that far. Exactly. Exactly. Huh? What? What have you seen? Precisely what I expected to see. Uh, if I take up my position here... Well, I certainly have a clear shot at you, whichever hand I use. Yes, indeed. Holmes? Someone's been clever. Very clever. But not clever enough. Well, Mr. Holmes, have you discovered anything? It's rather too early to say. Oh, of course, I'm, I'm sorry. I want you to leave the study exactly as it is for a while longer. You can do that, I trust. Well, yes, I suppose so, yes. Capital. And now I'd like to speak to your housekeeper. That's right, Mr Holmes. I showed the young man into the library that afternoon. Mr Adelton usually had visitors wait there for him. Did you um, close the door or leave it open? I left it open. And did you return to the library at any time while Frederick Adelton was there? Once, sir. To offer him some refreshment. How would you describe his mood? Tense, sir. I found him on his feet rather than sitting. I had the impression he'd been pacing up and down. Indeed? Oh, yes, sir. And what of his face? The uh, expression? Well, sir... Apprehensive? Uncertain? Frightened? Oh, no, sir. I couldn't say so. It was more... Well... Yes? Well, triumphant. Was it indeed? Uh, tell me, Mrs. Sindon, where is the library? Quite a decent collection. Hmm, I'm rather more interested in the display case, or more specifically, the lock. Uh, the light's not very good in here. Uh, 
Ah. What have you found? Uh, there, uh, take my lens. You see? Ah, it scratched a high heaven. Yes, not the neatest of jobs, but it did the trick. The lock's been forced. And you can see where the gun used to be. There's still an imprint on the velvet. Yes, so there is. Oh, Mr. Sindon said you were in here. Y you've had no objection, I hope. Oh. Mr. Holmes, please feel free to go wherever you have to and to ask whatever you must to. Is there something important about the gun cabinet? Exceedingly so. And now, if you'll excuse us, Watson and I will return later. You're leaving? So soon? For a couple of hours at the most. Uh, your groom can drive us to the town. No, sir. He was a right good master. Never a cross word. Uh, Miss Adelton? What about it, sir? Does she treat you kindly? She's a very gracious lady, sir. Is she, um, content here, would you say? Hardly my place to comment, sir. No, I, I just thought it might be rather a quiet life. She's always struck me as happy enough, sir. Well, till recent, of course. With the tragedy, you mean? That's right, sir. That's what I meant. Now, Watson, you're quite clear on what you have to do. Completely. Good man. I suppose I don't get anywhere. Well, then we'll be no further advanced, but I have every confidence in you. What's the matter? Well, I was just remembering a previous occasion of this sort. My efforts were greeted with the charming comment that I've made a complete mess of everything. Really? Really. Miss Violet Smith, hmm? Bob Carruthers? Oh, my dear fellow, that was years ago. You've been coming on quite nicely since then. Now, off you go, you'll miss your train. Sergeant McGann, sir! For it's, pity's it's, sake, Stevens, dignity, uh, there, dignity. Yes, sir. Dignity, sir. But it, it's. Well, it's, spit it's, it out, boy. You've got the chief constable out front, have you? <laughs> Bloody how far you haven't, have you? Not the chief constable, no, sir. Good afternoon, Sergeant. I wonder if I might have a moment of your time. Oh, my Sunday helmet. Are you? Yes, I am. How do you do? Matthews. Elliot Matthews. What about him? I need to speak to him. Oh, yeah? Yes, I'm a solicitor. What makes you think he might be here, then? Well, I've just spoken to his landlady. Are you going to help me or not? That depends. What's your business with him? He's coming to some money. Oh. Oh, well, that's different. Sorry, sir. You can't be too careful, can you? I'm Elliot Matthews. At your service, sir. Uh, no, I don't think so. I tell you, I'm Matthews. Your, your name is George. I heard someone call out to you as I walked up. And you're a moderately well-off married man with at least one child. Elliot Matthews is younger, single, and too poor to afford a room of his own. But you know where he is. Your eyes gave you away. Well, I'll get him. Oh, yes, the young lady pointed it out to me. Made quite a song and dance about it. But between you and me, I put it down to hysteria. Seen it before. There, and I dare say you have too. So you attach no importance to it? I knew a farmer once. Had a lamb trapped under a fallen tree. Massive great oak. Yes? He picked up that tree and tossed it aside like it was a matchstick. God's honour. When it comes down to it, if a man's got sufficient cause, he can be capable of damn near anything. There you are. Thanks. Cheers. Ah, cheers. That's good. Look, I'm uh, <clears throat> sorry about the money business. Don't be. I knew it wasn't true. Who's going to leave me money? Clever, though. That was the way to get old George listing right enough. He's probably expecting a cut, grasping old sod. There'll be a sovereign in it for you, though. I'm all yours, sir. What do you want? Tell me about Frederick Adelton. Sergeant, you've been extremely helpful. Oh, my pleasure, sir. Uh, just one final question. Presumably you still have William Adelton's gun. Well, of course. It's under lock and key in the evidence room waiting on the coroner. Excellent. I'd like to see it. Well, I suppose we had a laugh sometimes. Few and far between there was, though. And the rest of the time? He was miserable as sin. Mind you, he was cheerful enough last time I saw him. When was that? Just a few days ago. He was like he was finally onto a winner after a string of lame old nags. Sir, do you know when he's coming back? The rent's due Friday. I'm afraid he won't be coming back. Not ever? No, I'm afraid not. Bit of a blow, that. Nice diggings, they are. Well, I dare say that sovereign will see you through for a while. It will, sir. You're a gentleman. 
Do you know why he was so cheerful all of a sudden? I've got a fair idea. Yes, sir. Oh, he told you? He didn't mean to. It was his big secret. But he was a touch too fond of places like this, was old Freddy. And sometimes it got the better of him, if you know what I mean. I believe I do, yes. Right, Matthews. Tell me everything you know about Frederick Adderton's big secret, and that sovereign might just be joined by its twin. Once again, thank you for your assistance. My pleasure, Mr. Holmes. Uh, there's nothing dodgy about the case, is there? We went by the book all along the line. I've simply been commissioned to look into a couple of trifling details. Nothing you should be concerned about. That's good. Tell me, how are you faring with your burglaries? How did you know about them? It's a careless habit to leave witness statements lying about your desk, even if they are upside down. Four break-ins so far, is it? And nasty, too. At least one old gentleman laid about their head with a cudgel. I suppose you wouldn't care to take a look at the business, sir? It's hardly necessary, Sergeant. The solution's in your own hands. Ask yourself what the stolen items all have in common and where the thieves could sell them, then you'll have them. A very good day to you. What's wrong? I, I was just thinking about what Matthews told me. The depths that people can sink to. Well, some people sink, others soar. Well, there's a, a balance to these things. So cheer up, Watson. Uh, hmm? Your information solves the case. Are you certain about what happened? As certain as if I'd stood in that study and watched the whole thing. Do you see some flaw in my reasoning? Not at all. It just seems so, well, incredible. Huh? Deep hatred. Great intelligence. <sighs> Fatal combination. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to tell our client that I've solved the mystery. Ready. Ready. I think we should have the door closed. Watson, would you mind? Oh, yes, of course. Mr Holmes, please don't keep me in suspense. What have you discovered? Ah, very well. First of all, let's remind ourselves of exactly what you saw when you opened the door on that fatal night. Your cousin lay here, his head against the edge of the hearth, his shoulder and chest covered with blood, and your father here, the gun still clutched in his hand. His right hand? Quite so, his right hand. To anyone not understanding the significance of that vital fact, what had happened was obvious. William had shot Frederick and then himself. The police thought so and so did the doctor, but that one fact paints us a very different picture. I saw the implications before ever I left Baker Street. I knew I was right to come to you. Watson, would you oblige? Oh, certainly, yes. There. Thank you. Now, Dr Watson is standing exactly where William Adelton stood when the fatal shot was fired. And I shall be Cousin Frederick. But first, observe the displaced furniture. Hmm? The chair, the drinks table, the shattered glasses, the footstool. The police said there'd been a fight. Hmm. A curious fight which toppled furniture along so straight a path. What if I return everything to its proper place? The chair here by the desk, uh, the footstool, naturally enough, by the fireside armchair, the drinks table here, a broken glass I shall leave on the floor. Now, are those the correct positions, Miss Adelton? Exactly right. Thank you. And finally, these few scattered books to the end of the desk where they so obviously join these others. So, now, Doctor, are you ready? Ready. You are William. I am Frederick. And I have this. <laughs> Dr. Watson's ever trusty service revolver. Oh. A more than adequate substitute for the actual murder weapon. Mr. Holmes! Oh, I assure you we're completely safe. It's not loaded. Oh. But on that night, the gun most certainly was loaded. Frederick had ample time to get hold of the bullets after he stole it from the case in the library earlier that afternoon. Frederick had the gun? Having called here to get it precisely when he knew that your father would be out. Yes, he had the gun. And this is what he did with it. Firstly, he held it to William Adelton's head. And then... <laughs> and William Adelton fell dead. Now, Frederick had to act quickly before the shot brought people running. He moved back to the fireplace, where... He shot himself? In the shoulder. He took a big risk, 
The wound had to be serious enough to look convincing, but not so crippling as to prevent him from carrying out the rest of his plan. And the risk paid off. He was able to stagger back across to the older man's body and put the gun into his dead hand. But it was the wrong hand. He didn't know about father's injury. That, that was the first of his mistakes. The second was that he barely had enough strength to get back to his position by the fire. He was so weak and disorientated. And so, on his way... Everything's back where it was. Exactly. He left a trail. It was invisible to the police, but not to me. So finally he was back in his place. He planned to lie down and feign unconsciousness. And when someone arrived, he'd miraculously come round, ready to explain just what had happened. Willie Maddleton had shot him, and only by the grace of God was the wound not fatal. This is incredible. And my father's death? I can see that Frederick made it look like suicide, but how would he have explained it? As remorse. Thinking that he'd killed a man, your father took his own life. A dead murderer is still a murderer. And remorse, however sincere, doesn't affect the crime. Your father's reputation would have been ruined. Possibly his business too. Frederick's revenge for a lifetime of poverty, illness and emptiness. The villain. What a calculated, vicious thing to do. There was no excuse. None. Oh, but I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. If he was just going to pretend to be knocked out, why is he in the hospital? Fate took a hand against him. Doctor, the decanter from the desk, if you would. Here. Yes, sir, I think uh, that will serve. <clears throat> Look at the floor, here, by the hearth. It's all stained where the drinks went over. It was slippery. Polished parquet. A loose rug and a spreading pool of liquid. It would have been like ice. And Frederick Adelton, already weak, already dizzy, lost his footing, fell over backwards and... Oh. How can I ever thank you? You've saved my father's honour. Now, all I've done is read the evidence so amply provided by this room. It was magnificent. The evidence so carefully put here for me to find. M Mr. Holmes? Well, I don't understand. Then allow me to spell it out for you. Everything I've just told you was a lie. Frederick didn't shoot my father. And he didn't try to disguise the fact, no. Well, then what do you believe really happened? What the police and the doctor think happened. The evidence, the genuine evidence, still just visible under this uh, blanket of deception, shows that your father did indeed shoot your cousin and then, mistakenly thinking that he'd killed him, take his own life. No. The gun didn't come from the collection in the library. The imprint left on the velvet in the case is of a much larger and heavier firearm. Your father kept the murder weapon in this room, in the top drawer of his desk. And he kept it loaded. I didn't understand why, until I learned of the recent spate of burglaries. He was a prudent man, who knew the value of his possessions, and he was taking every precaution. But it was in his wrong hand, for God's sake. Of course it was. Placed there deliberately to reinforce the myth of Frederick's deception. Just as the furniture and books were also planted carefully in position to look as though they'd been knocked flying by a wounded man. How can you possibly tell that? There are seven different indications, but I'll give you the two clearest. Look at the rugs. Now, they're as displaced as the furniture. They were kicked and rumpled as I stumbled over them. But when I first walked in here, most of them were completely undisturbed. And if Frederick really had staggered twice across the room, he would have left a, a quite distinct trail of blood in his wake. There is none. What are you saying? The conclusion is inescapable. Someone had gone to considerable lengths to brand Frederick Adelton as a cold-blooded killer. But who, Mr. Holmes? Who did this? Someone consumed with hatred for your cousin. Someone who wanted to see him hanged for murder. Someone who had access to this room before the police arrived. Someone with the best possible reason to despise Frederick Adelton and everything he stood for. The best possible 
personal reason. How much do you know? I know everything. Then for God's sake, let's get out of this damned room. Mr. Holmes, do you really know everything? Your cousin inherited his father's weakness for drink. I'm sorry to say that the whole story came out one night when he was in a drunken fit. Oh, dear God. Including my name? Uh, no, not your name. We three are the only ones who know the details. And you have my word that they will go no further. And mine. You're not going to tell the police? That is not my intention. Oh, I thought... <sighs> I just assume. I have been engaged to act on your behalf. That's exactly what I propose to do. Thank you. Both of you. Miss Adelton, I said that we knew the details. The truth is, one or two of the finer points remain just a trifle hazy. Would it distress you to answer a few questions? Ask me whatever you wish, Mr. Holmes. I'll do my best to answer. Thank you. Now, first of all, you admit to planting the clues. Placing the furniture, removing the decoy gun from the case, putting the murder weapon into your father's damaged hand. I felt sure that the police would notice it all immediately and believe exactly what I wanted them to believe. I should have paid more attention to your stories, Dr. Watson. You pointed out the oddity of the gun, but not the rest. I didn't dare. It wouldn't have been... in character. Quite. And so you came to me. Thinking that I was cleverer than you. What a fool I am. Oh, my dear young lady, you've hardly been in your right senses. When you said that you hadn't seen your cousin for almost a year, you were lying. Yes. The truth being that for some little time following his father's funeral, you and he had enjoyed a most intimate acquaintance. Yes. Specifically, you and your cousin were lovers. Holmes. It's all right, Dr. Watson. Did he propose marriage to you? You surely don't think I'd have... Oh. Yes, Doctor, he did. He proposed, I accepted, we... <laughs> he wanted to reunite the family, that's what he said. And I believed him. How could I have been so naive? He never loved me. He felt nothing for me. He must have been very plausible. Oh, yes, he made me believe him. But then I'd no basis for comparison, had I? For most of my life, the only man I'd known was my father. Whose idea was it to keep this um, happy news a secret? Frederick's. Wait, he said. We mustn't tell my father until the time is right. But that time never came. Frederick broke off the engagement, leaving your hopes dashed and your prospects... Ruined. <laughs> That's the word you're seeking, Mr. Holmes. What you're looking at is soiled goods. I believe that's the currently fashionable term. But Frederick wasn't satisfied with just that. Oh, no. It wasn't me he wanted to destroy. It was my father. He planned to tell him what had happened, to gloat about what he'd done. And how he'd make sure everyone knew of it. He told you what he was going to do? Laughing in my face while he said it. Laughing at how everyone would know about William Adelton, pillar of the business community, and his shameless slut of a daughter. He came to the house and told your father everything, goading him beyond endurance. But not realising that William had a loaded gun immediately to hand. Not content with everything else, he made my father a murderer. Or as good as. He succeeded beyond his wildest dreams. But at least he's paid the price for it. Dr. Watson, will he live? I think it very unlikely. Will it shock you if I say I'm glad? No, Miss Adelton. It won't shock me at all. Mm. Strictly speaking, did she actually commit a crime? Tampering with evidence, interfering with the course of justice, attempting to frame an innocent man? Hardly innocent. No, and as you said, I fancy he'll soon be answering for his crimes in a rather higher court than the Sussex Assizes. Yes. So you've no qualms about not telling the police? None whatsoever. You? Certainly not. I thought not. What do you suppose will happen to her? Uh, I don't know. 
She has a formidable brain. Oh, that's true. To come up with that scheme... <laughs> How soon did you know? Before we left Baker Street. Oh, come on. Well, didn't it strike you that she was just a, a little too tearful and a touch too thankful? And then she gave us her cousin's background with admirable clarity. It was strangely vague about the scene of the shooting. Hmm? Well, she said it herself. She was wary of being too obvious, of pointing out her own false clues. Well, I must say, she took me in completely. <laughs> My friend, it's your lot in life to admire women. Mine is to distrust them on sight. You miss so much, you know. <laughs> Imagine trying to set herself up against me. <laughs> As she said, she should have paid rather more attention to your stories. In The Determined Client, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Caroline Adelton was played by Fritha Goody. William Adelton was played by Ian Masters, Thomas Adelton by Philip Fox, Frederick Adelton by Rhys Meredith, Mrs. Sindon by Joanna McCallum, and the lawyer by John Rowe. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The Determined Client was written by Bert Cools from a reference in the short story The Golden Pansne by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. Well, George, here's to the next stage of your career. George! George. This is all rather premature, I'm afraid. Come on, it's in the bag and you know it. Oh, no! Damn it to hell! Oh, good the lord. The blazes with a lot of you. You can go and rot for all I care. Give me some of that. Harold. For heaven's sake. What? Keep my voice down. Behave myself. Showing you up, am I, Father? It's yourself you're showing up. I'm taking you home. Kindly take your hands off me. I can walk. I can do so. Settle your debts and we'll leave. Settle my debts? Come on. We're getting you out of here. Sixteen. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. Not a bad night. I hear there was trouble. Young Upwood got a bit drunk. Did he pay anything off his account? Oh, what do you think? I think, Mr. Catterall, that my patience is running out. The Striking Success of Miss Franny Blossom by Bert Cools. With Clive Madison as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson. And featuring Geoffrey Whitehead as Colonel Upwood, Maggie Steed as Mrs. Ricoletti, and Stephen Thorne as Inspector Lestrade. The Striking Success of Miss Franny Blossom. Well, sir. Are you going to tell me or not? It's two thousand near as damn it. Two thousand pounds. And do you owe this to your so-called friends or to the club? The club. Always play against the house. Better odds. Until they started rigging the games, that is. You're accusing the non-parade club of rigging the games? It's true. Stupid young fool. I hope you've kept this nonsense to yourself. It's bad enough that you owe them money. I suppose you don't have it. Well, of course I don't. Why do you think I've been trying to win it back? Hmm. I... Uh, I might be able to help. Have you got that sort of money? I can get it. Are you certain? One of the girls earned him. And just how many people has he said this to? Not many, she thinks. But he was talking about spreading the word. Something's got to be done.
Good morning, Harold. Father? Have you, um, got the money yet? Not yet. But I said I'd get it and I shall. It's taking you long enough. Be careful, boy. My patience has its limit. Look at this. From Catterall. Tonight. That's what it says. In full. Can you get it by tonight? What's the time? Quarter two. Time for us to go. Us? There's something very wrong about all this. I'm coming with you. He said alone. He meant alone. Give me the bag. Here. You sure it's all there? For heaven's sake, boy, shut it. You don't know who's about this time of night. Now go. I'll wait here for you. I think I'm old enough to find my own way home, don't you? Harold. Sorry, but I have to do this on my own. Please. Very well. I'll see you at home. Right. Father, thank you. I mean it. Dog. What's the matter with you? You wake up the ducks. <laughs> what you got there, Gil? What you found? Angels and ministers of grace defend us. Carol? Hmm? Carol Upwood, sir. What? What? Jenkins? There's a man downstairs, Carol. What? What do you mean, a man? A gentleman? No, sir. He's from the police. A Mr. Lestrade. Ah. Oh. Yes. That's him. Thank you, sir. Oh, I'm very sorry for your loss. Sir? Inspector? Not now, Molly. It's very important, sir. Excuse me, Colonel. Of course, of course. All right, what is it? I found this, sir. Just before you arrived. What do you mean you found it? Where? In the wound. Push right in. Show me. Good God above. What sort of lunatic sticks a playing card into a dead man's throat? The Ace of Spades. The death card. Colonel, you shouldn't have seen this. Show me the back. Show me the back, Inspector. Sir. The non Club. Right, sir. What's so significant about the non parade club? Harold was a member. He received this yesterday morning. The non parade club. Make sure it's all there and come alone, Catterall. He's the manager. Yes, I know. Looks genuine. Oh, I take it this is about a gambling debt. I'm afraid Harold owed them rather a large sum. That's why he was there, to hand it over. West Ring Bridge, Hyde Park. One o'clock in the morning. Didn't you think that was just a touch unusual? Of course I did. But you don't argue with a man like Catterall. The non parade club might be highly respectable, but I wouldn't say the same for the people who run it. No, Colonel. Neither would I. We're closed. Not to me, you're not. Police. What do you want? A word with the man in charge. He's not here. Will I do? I doubt it. Who are you? Nicholson, assistant manager. Then you know where I can find Albert Catterall. I wish I did. It's not the first time he's run off and left me to sort things out for him. All right, Nicholson, I'll deal with this. Ma'am? I do apologise, Mr... Uh... Lestrade, ma'am. Detective Inspector. Oh, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Mr Lestrade. Nobody told me you were here. My name is Francesca Ricoletti. I own this establishment. I know who you are, ma'am. Yes, I imagine you do. Please have a seat, Mr Lestrade. No, thank you, Mum. Just as you like. Now, Detective Inspector, before you start, please listen to me. Whatever I used to be, I'm now a legitimate businesswoman. Oh, kindly wipe that look off your face. This isn't the 18th century. And I run a legitimate establishment. Do you know why this club is called the Non-Pare? 
No, ma'am, I don't. Because it's exactly that. Without equal. Unique. This establishment has some extremely important and influential members, Mr Lestrade. Extremely important. I advise you to tread very carefully. For heaven's sake, girl, what's the matter? In there, Mr Jenkins, in there! Have you been in the master's study? Blood! There's blood! Oh, oh Colonel! Oh. Jenkins! Dear God! I'm all right. Send for the police. The police? Tell them it's Albert Catterall. And tell them he's dead. You're very quiet. Sorry. You didn't like it? Well, I wouldn't put it quite as strongly as that. You didn't like it much? I'm afraid not. I did enjoy some of it. Oh, then you're in good company. You're familiar with Rossini. William Tell over your... That's the chap. He said that Wagner had magnificent moments for terrible quarters of an hour. Very perceptive. My choice next week? That was the arrangement. What's it to be? Wait and see. Did you know that we're being watched? We have been ever since we emerged. Ah, and now we're being approached. Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Good evening, Mr. I'm uh, to give you this. Well, on whose instructions? Come uh, back here. Hey! Damn, shall I go after him? Holmes, shall I go after him? No, 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 no. He's not important. Who's it from? A very old friend. Mrs. Riccoletti. Mr. Holmes. You're looking well. And so are you. Your recent trip to Paris was enjoyable, I hope. Still doing the same old tricks, then. They have their uses. With some people, perhaps. And you, of course, are Dr John H. Watson. At your service, madam. I wonder if you really mean that. Enough pleasantries. Why are you here? You're quite sure you're well enough to talk, Colonel. I am, Inspector. I've had far worse than this in the field. Very good. So, this man Catterall came here demanding money. The money he'd already been given. The gall of the man amazed me. And you accused him of murdering your son. He stood there and laughed in my face. Damned villain. Just kept on and on about the money. And when you insisted that he'd already had it... He pulled a knife and came at me. I tried to dodge him. I planned to grab his wrist, disarm him and hold him while Jenkins went for the authorities. Uh, not as young as I used to be, I'm afraid. There was a messy struggle. You were badly injured and he... Yes. I, I don't quite know how it happened. I, I think I caught him off balance. He fell. He was still holding the knife and... I'm not proud of it, Inspector. A man has the right to defend himself in his own home, Colonel. That's not the point. I wanted Harold's killer to face a jury. I wanted justice for my son. You appear to be very well informed about these two killings, Mrs Riccoletti. I have my methods, Doctor. Uh, which clearly extend even to the back door of Scotland Yard. What exactly do you require of me? I want you to find out what really happened. You don't accept the official version of events. Mr Holmes, Albert Catterall did not murder Harold Upward. You know this for a fact. Just as I know that Catterall didn't send that note, didn't go to Hyde Park and didn't collect the money. How do you know this? The note because it's preposterous. That's not how we conduct our business. The rest because I know that he was somewhere else all that night. Where? Dr Watson knows. <sighs> Watson? Well... Please say it, Doctor. I assure you I shan't be in the least offended. Uh, well, then, I believe he was with you. Is that true? Yes, it is. Very perceptive, Doctor. You say that Catterall didn't kill the upward boy. What about the other business? Hmm? Why did he attack the Colonel? I don't believe that he did attack him. 
There was no fight. I didn't say that. Well, then your contention is that Colonel Upward somehow lured Catterall to his home, murdered him in cold blood, and then arranged things to look like an accident? Why did he do this? Oh, because if Catterall had lived, he would have been able to prove that he didn't kill the boy. And then the police would have started looking elsewhere. You're saying that the Colonel himself, his own son... I'm saying nothing of the sort. In my position, I can hardly accuse a prominent servant of the Queen of multiple murder. Not without proof. Exactly. So, will you take the case? I'm very grateful to you. Your gratitude is premature. I don't believe so. Doctor, would you? Oh, of course. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Holmes? Mrs. Ricoletti. I've come to you because I want this done properly. But if you fail, I do have other methods available to me. It would grieve me to have to use them, but I won't hesitate if it proves necessary. You understand me? Perfectly. I knew you would. Thank you, Doctor. And madam? All right, driver. Very good, sir. Up there! Holmes. Not here, Doctor. Let's go back inside. You're wondering who she is. Well, of course I am. But look, it's really none of my business. If you prefer not to tell me... Oh, there's no secret about it. I was once able to do some small service for the late Mr Riccoletti. And you met her then? Yeah, she was a plain Franny Blossom in those days. An actress no one had heard of, <laughs> nor was likely to. Riccoletti was married to a, well, a very different class of woman. Oh, different in what way? Well, uh, mostly in the way of trying to kill her husband for his money. Charming. Hmm. Well, eventually she gave up trying and went off to find an easier target. She succeeded, too. Hmm. Bought a rather pleasant seafront hotel in Eastbourne on the proceeds. Leaving the matrimonial path clear. Had she loved him from afar, Miss Franny Blossom? A hopeless yearning, fulfilled at last? Uh, no, actually, the lady's affections had been directed at um, someone else. But to put it in your uh, rather overwrought terms, she was doomed to disappointment. And she married Riccoletti as second best? Oh, that can lead to disaster. Happily, not in this case. They were one of the most contented couples I've ever known. And two of the most successful criminals. I knew it. Holmes, how can you justify working for a criminal? By the fact that she no longer is one. When she was widowed, she inherited her husband's uh, business interests. But without him, her heart wasn't in it. She put the life behind her, and she's been beyond reproach for years. And what about that little farewell speech of hers? Well, evidently she hasn't thrown away Riccoletti's address book. Get your hat. Frankly, Mr Holmes, I wouldn't have thought this was your cup of tea at all. It seems to be a very sordid little affair. Well, no doubt you're right, Lestrade, but I've been asked to look into it nonetheless. By the Riccoletti woman, I suppose. Well, I'd advise you to watch yourself with that one. Look at this. Harold Upward's throat was slit. We found this pushed down inside the wound. Yes, I know. The ace of spades out of a pack from the Nonpareil Club. How the devil did you know that? No, never mind. I ought to be used to it by now. The point is, Catterall was planning a repeat performance on the Colonel. This was in one of his pockets. Another ace of spades? And from the same source. As far as I'm concerned, Catterall was our murderer, and this is an open and shut case. There's only one more thing to find out. And what is that? Whether or not he was working under orders from your client. What did you find out about our Colonel Upward? Oh, he had an outstanding record in his younger days. Several decorations. Huh? Naturally. The thing's rather flattened out for him. He was taken off active service because of his health and uh, put behind a desk. Happens to a lot of good men. And presumably, some take it better than others. Ring again. Yes. Oh, this isn't going to be easy, is it? The room's probably been cleaned. There weren't any witnesses. How can you find out if it really was an accident or if it was murder? I thought I'd ask him. No, Mr. Holmes, I didn't kill him. You have my word on it. Though things might well have been different if I'd still had my old revolver and a cartridge or two. 
It would be wiser not to say that at the inquest, Colonel. It's the truth, sir. I've never shrunk from it before. I see no reason to start now. You're in no doubt that Catterall killed your son. None whatsoever. How much more proof do you need? Did you know the man yourself? I'd seen him at the club. Had no direct dealing with him. The police told me he was a shady character, not that it needed saying, of course. The man was obviously a thug. How did you come to be a member of the Nonpare Club, Colonel? Oh, some of the chaps in the regiment put me onto the place. They serve a first-class port. And gambling? Well, I enjoy the odd hand. Who doesn't? Can't let it rule your life, though. That's the thing. Pity my son never learned that lesson. Uh, Mr Holmes, do you know if Catterall had any family? Why do you ask, Colonel? I was just wondering if the man's father is still alive. May I inquire why? I should like to send him my condolences on his loss. I think this is the place, the southern end of the Westreen Bridge. Isn't that what Lestrade said? Uh, Holmes? Uh, I'm sorry, Doctor. I was thinking about our remarkable Colonel. Oh, you mean the comment about Catrell's father? Mm. Yes, I suppose it was a trifle strange. But it is the decent thing to do. Yeah. What, do you think it was an act? If it was, it was a damn good one. Sometimes I think I spend my entire life surrounded by very good actors. Yeah, but I'm falling into your bad habit, my friend. Building theories on sand. Uh, yes, this is the place. A strange spot for a rendezvous. Mm, but not for a murder. Ah, there's too many people have trapped across here. Yeah, there's nothing to be read on this page. You know... What? I'd rather like a cup of tea. Could you read anything from the Colonel's study? Well, I, I could tell where the body fell. That was about all. You know, you were right. Someone had done an excellent job of cleaning and tidying. Oh, there was one thing. What was that? Mm, the view from the window. It was full of interest. I have to see that letter from Catterall. I thought you'd asked to see it while we were at the yard. Why didn't you? There was no point. Of course there was a point. I didn't have a sample of his writing to compare it with. Ah. Mm. Well, time to remedy that, I think. I'm going to the Nonpare Club. Oh, you don't want me to come with you? No, I have another mission for you. Go down to the police mortuary and see if you can't get a look at the post-mortem reports on Upward and Catterall. Excuse me. What do you want? Nothing that need alarm you. Mr. Holmes. Sorry, sir. I thought you were another policeman. That he most certainly is not. Good afternoon, Mr. Holmes. Good afternoon, Mrs. Ricoletti. I've come to ask for your no, help. No, 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 no. It's a little too public here. We'll go up to my office. You must excuse Mr. Nicholson. That policeman was here again. The Strayed thinks that Catterall was acting on your orders. So I discovered. Was he? Do you think I've been lying to you? You used to be able to tell. No, Mr. Holmes, he was not. What can I do for you? Firstly, you can tell me if you had any reason to want Harold Upward dead. I? Yes, I'm afraid I did. Does the Strayed know that? I told him. Oh, that was wise. If he thinks you're concealing evidence... He already thinks that. Don't you want to know what my reason was? The money? The money was nothing. This was far more serious. Young Upward somehow got it into his stupid head that my games are fixed. He was threatening to put that word around society. It would have caused a major scandal. <sighs> Only if the accusations were true, surely. Holmes, I have royalty playing here... Even the suggestion of cheating would have been enough. It would have been a major embarrassment for the palace, and I'd have been ruined. Did Albert Catterall know all this? Yes. Yes, he did. Here, Doctor. Oh, thank you, Mr Morley. You... What do you understand about the post-mortem reports? Oh, if Lestrade says they're confidential, we must respect that, of course. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, this is a good job. I don't want to lose it. Besides, I believe I found everything I need from the bodies. 
I really don't know why you're bothering, Mr. Holmes. I've already compared it to a known sample of Catterall's hand. It's a perfect match. Mm, may I see the envelope? Yeah, of course, for all the good it'll do you. Thank you. Hmm, delivered by hand. From the district messenger office in Piccadilly, which Catterall used for all his important post. A rather interesting point, wouldn't you say, Mr. Holmes? Exceedingly so. Thank you, Lestrade. I'm most grateful. May I offer you a word of friendly advice? <laughs> Can I stop you? Hmm. It'll be Christmas before we know it. Ask Mrs. Lestrade to put a magnifying lens in your stocking. The letters of forgery. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes, I remember most particular. We simply don't get that class of person in here, you understand. Quite so surprise. I remember most particular. Saw the girl from a non-parade drop one of her letters in the street, followed her here and handed it in so it could go off safe with the others. Goes to show, doesn't it? Poor yes. broken soul, living rough, but honest as the day's long. There's a lesson there, Mr. Holmes. Uh, tell me, tell me, <clears throat> what did this uh, paragon of virtue look like? Well, to be honest, sir, all I could really swear to was the coat. The coat? Had it all wrapped round like a shroud. Ooh, great heavy brown coat, all ripped up and stained with God knows what. Is that any help to you, sir? Both men were killed with a long-bladed, double-sided knife. It needn't necessarily have been the same weapon, but the odds are very good that it was. Upward's throat was cut almost from ear to ear. Really savage attack. And Catterall? Stabbed to the heart. I say the angle of the thrust was quite consistent with it happening accidentally in a struggle. Thank you, Doctor. But um, there was one odd thing. Oh? This struggle must have been pretty fierce, wouldn't you say? You saw the state that Colonel Upwood was in? I saw a lot of bandages. I prefer to reserve my judgment about the actual wounds. Well, this might help you make up your mind. Catterall's body didn't carry any signs of a fight. None? No contusions, no abrasions, and apart from that one single fatal wound, no cuts at all. Fascinating. Excellent work, Watson. Thank you. Now, how did you get on? Did you look at the note? Oh, yes. And was it Catterall's handwriting? It was superficially similar, but to the trained eye there were at least 11 vital differences. The T's alone were conclusive. So it was a forgery. Mrs Riccoletti was telling the truth. Did you doubt it? Well, didn't you? You're the one who said that women can never be trusted. What was it? Not even the best of them. And you know what they say? Once a criminal... They say many things, Doctor. I prefer to rely on facts. So, if Catterall didn't send the note, who did? Gentlemen, good evening. Mrs Riccoletti. Well, Mr Holmes, have you made any progress? Yes, I have. And now, once again, I need your help. With what? Colonel Upwood told me that he was introduced to this establishment by a group of army friends. Are they here tonight? Some of them are. Perhaps you'll be good enough to point them out. Of course. Are you going to talk to them? No. The military mind is Watson's territory. To your success. Mm, I don't like to anticipate the outcome of a case. Cautious as ever. Mm. All right. I'll settle for your very good health. Mm. And yours. Oh, this is, this is excellent. Oh, I have it imported specially. I got the taste from my late husband. Oh, he did always insist on the very best. Yes, he did. I'm afraid your Dr. Watson rather disapproves of me. No, the good doctor can be somewhat uh, conventional at times. Do you share his opinion? Have I given you that impression? Please, just for once, answer a question without thinking about it first. Do you disapprove of me? No, I don't. See? You can do it if you try. Why didn't you keep in touch? I didn't realise you were expecting me to. No, I don't suppose you did. Understanding women was never your strong point, was it? Even women on the wrong side of the law. I thought those days were all behind you. And so they are. When Alberto died... I was sorry to hear about that. But not sorry enough to come to the funeral. I was out of the country, a murder in France. And if you'd been here, would you have come? Yes, I would. It was a bad time. I could have done with a friend. And now it's happened all over again. Was he a good man? Catterall? Yes, he was. Oh, a bit rough round the edges, I grant you. Something of a past. 
But no violence, and most certainly no murder. I wouldn't have tolerated that. I know it. You do? Perhaps you understand me better than I thought. Perhaps I do. Will you tell me something? What? Back when Alberto and I were in business together, why did you never interfere? Our paths simply never crossed. I can act only when I'm engaged to do so. And do you accept every commission which comes your way? Certainly not. Oh, one has to be selective. Ah. Our lives are defined by our choices, as the old philosopher said. And sometimes by other people's. Come on, finish your drink and we'll get back downstairs. Twenty-three red, gentlemen. Twenty-three red. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Holmes. Hmm? Oh, anything interesting? Let's get away from this crowd. Apparently, Colonel Upward has been dropping hints about some great opportunity coming his way. What sort of opportunity? They're not sure, but they know this. It has a royal connection. Now, what would our ruling family want with a retired army colonel? It could be some sort of honorary position. Military advisor, perhaps. A, a tutor. Well, these things do happen. All it takes is a friend in the right place, someone remembering an old favour. Oh, they're highly sought after, too, jobs like that. Because of the material rewards. In the Fusiliers, they still talk about Major General Frederick Bellamy Smith. He was made master of the sword to one of the more obscure princes. It got him an income for life, a butt of sherry every lady day, and an apartment in Eaton Place. Upward's not a wealthy man, quite the opposite in fact, but I, I don't think he'd murder purely for material gain. No, it's not just that. These posts are very prestigious. They grant you an entry to the court. So, our colonel was about to go from obscure and abandoned to having the ear of the highest in the land, except that his son's making a public spectacle of himself and is about to embarrass the crown. And so he had to die? Men have been killed for less, Watson, a very great deal less. Oh, perhaps they have, but the man's own son. Stepson. Stepson. He wasn't his natural son. Uh... Upward's first marriage was childless, but his second wife was a widow with a 15-year-old son. The woman died of pneumonia uh, five years ago when Harold was 20. And the boy stayed with his stepfather? Mm, roof over his head, money on tap, and the colonel mm, tolerated him. Until the boy's behaviour threatened what he's always wanted. It's not proof, Holmes. No, it isn't. And if you're right, I can't see Upward confessing. How can we prove it? One way or the other. Short of a witness in the park who saw the murder. If there had been a witness, Lestrade would have ferreted him out. You know how persistent he is. It's possible that he didn't look. As far as Lestrade's concerned, that side of the matter's closed. It's Mrs Riccoletti he's after now. Inspector, this is harassment, pure and simple. I just want to ask you a few more questions. Wouldn't you prefer to resume this conversation inside? No, sir, I would not. And unless you want to hear from my solicitors, I suggest you don't try to force your way into my premises again. You're not doing yourself any favours, you know. I don't stand in need of any, sir. Not from the police. And don't think that Mr Sherlock Holmes is going to get you out of trouble. Not this time. <coughs> Who's dead at this hour? Get that bacon on the plate, girl. You know what he's like if his breakfast's late. Yes, Mr Jenkins. <clears throat> we don't give to beggars. Be off with you, woman. Not a beggar. Got a message. Keep your distance. That coat's crawling. Got a message for the colonel. Well, what is it? Tell him I sleep under the bridge every night. But I don't sleep well. Be on your way before I fetch a constable. He wouldn't want you to do that. Tell him. Mm. Mm. Very good. <clears throat> now, can you entertain yourself today? We're not working on the case. There's something I have to check. And you don't need my help? 
Ah, uh, not until later, just after midnight. Your assistance will be vital. Are you planning something illegal? Not another burglary? Not burglary, no. At least not by the strict definition of the word. I'll be back tonight. <sighs> Come on, then. Show yourself, woman. Show yourself, damn it. Well, if you've something to say, then say it. Very well. Thank you, Colonel. Exactly the reaction I was hoping for. Drop your knife. What? Very sensible. What is the meaning of this? What do you want? I want justice. Mr. Nicholson? Ma'am? Blindfold him. No. Keep away from me! Well, Colonel... <laughs> How does it feel to be about to meet your fate? Oh, for pity's sake, Holmes. Oh, thank God. Ah, you found something. Yes, I did. Several things, in fact. Do they prove that he's guilty? Let's get back to Baker Street. I told you there was no danger of discovery. I spent the day making sure of it. The movements of the servants, the neighbours, uh, the constable on the beat. You never said anything about a policeman, didn't I? No. Must have slipped my mind. Surely that's not a visitor at this hour. No doubt about it. Don't you recognise the coachman? Good evening, gentlemen. You've met Mr. Nicholson, I believe. And you know the Colonel, of course. Mm. 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 Sit there and be mm. quiet. Mm. This is outrageous. Doctor, the man's a murderer. Look, I've bound and gagged a man before. I know what I'm doing. Thank you, Mr. Nicholson. Beautifully done. Please wait for me downstairs. Um. You've jeopardised the entire case. This is common assault. Nonsense. I made a citizen's arrest, based on very good evidence. He was going to attack me with this. <coughs> you were told to be quiet. <coughs> Keep still, Upward. What are you doing? I want him to be able to talk. There. <sighs> oh. Oh. You thugs. I'll see... I'll see you all in jail for this. Release me at once. All in good time, Colonel. Perhaps you'd be kind enough to answer one question first. You're insane. The lot of... It's a simple enough question. Why is it, when you have an admirably efficient domestic staff, that you've taken to the very odd habit of disposing of your household waste by burying it in your back garden? I've absolutely no idea what you're talking about, sir. Oh, I think you have. <laughs> the patch of newly turned earth was perfectly visible from the French windows in your study, and so were the footsteps leading from them straight to it. An odd starting point for a spot of gardening, don't you agree? This is arrogant nonsense. If the need ever arises again, I recommend an incinerator, but I suppose that would have excited too much attention. Hmm? Mr Holmes, what exactly did he bury? Oh, some extremely interesting items. Watson, the sack. Mm. Here, here. <sighs> Prosecution exhibit number one. A somewhat disreputable brown overcoat. It bears a curious resemblance to the one worn by the mysterious tramp who obligingly picked up a letter which nobody had dropped. It's just an old coat. It proves nothing. Exhibit number two, a handwritten note on the stationery of the Nonpareil Club. A fine example of the late Albert Cattrall's handwriting, perfect for copying. And before you speak, Colonel, yes, I agree, it proves nothing. A competent defence lawyer would dispose of it in minutes, even in conjunction with your attack on this good lady. These things aren't sufficient to sway a fair-minded British jury. At last you're speaking sense, Holmes. But consider exhibit number three, also buried, let us remember, with the rest. <clears throat> Two packs of playing cards from the Nonpareil Club, both of them brand new, 
freshly unsealed and quite unused, and both of them lacking the ace of spades. So, another triumph for the great Sherlock Holmes. Another victory to be lauded to the skies and written down in the history books. Be thankful, Mr. Holmes. For what? For fame, for prestige, for power, for the fact that you can make a difference in this miserable world, for not having been forgotten. Well, Mr. Holmes, what can I say? You saved me from making a fool of myself. Even if between the two of you, you and the Rigoletti woman broke half the laws on the statute books tonight. Oh, nonsense, Lestrade. And that's no way to speak of a respectable lady and a concerned citizen. Hmm. I suppose you want me to apologise to her. I want you to do only what your conscience dictates. So I hope you understand, ma'am. I had to do my duty. What's past is past, I do accept that, but, uh, well, if you look at it from my point of view... Inspector, it... please. There's not a word more to be said. To err uh, is human. And even detectives are allowed to be human sometimes. Well, in that case, ma'am, I wish you a very good night. Uh, good night to you, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Ed. Good night, Inspector. And thank you again. Oh, do you know, he's really rather sweet if you look at him in the right light. The light doesn't exist, which could make me describe Lestrade as sweet. I don't think you've ever thought of anyone as sweet. Not in your entire life. You should unbend a bit, you know. Let that mask slip from time to time. You might actually enjoy it. Thank you for everything you've done. You took an enormous risk tonight. It was quite like old times. Even if it was all for nothing, you'd already found proof that he did it. Well, on the contrary. I had the sack, but I, I could never have proved that it was the Colonel who buried it. It was only because my evidence came on top of yours that he decided to confess. So, it took the two of us. And we achieved the result you wanted. Justice for Mr. Catterall. I probably shouldn't be saying this in the shadow of Scotland Yard, but when I was standing there with Upward and I had my gun in my hand, I don't know why I didn't pull the trigger. I think you do. Well, maybe I do. I should go. A very good night to you, Mrs. Riccoletti. And to you, Mr. Holmes. You know... What? If you do ever feel like a change from dear Dr. Watson... A change? Bear in mind that I like opera, too. Oh, when the stabulary duty's to be done, to be done, a policeman's lot is not a happy one. I rather enjoyed that. Yes, I thought you might. Home? Home. In the striking success of Miss Franny Blossom, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Colonel Upwood was played by Geoffrey Whitehead, Mrs. Riccoletti by Maggie Steed, and Inspector Lestrade by Stephen Thorne. Harold Upwood was played by Scott Brooksbank, Catterall by Philip Fox, Nicholson by John Rowe, and The Maid by Alice Hart. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The striking success of Miss Franny Blossom was written by Bert Cools 
from a reference in the novel The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. The remarkable performance of Mr. Frederick Meridew by Bert Cools, with Clive Merrison as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson, and featuring Hugh Bonville as Meridew. The remarkable performance of Mr. Frederick Meridew. You're going out tonight? Well, Yes, I am, but I don't see how you deduced it. Well, it's obvious you're looking forward to an evening of entertainment somewhere in the suburbs in the company of a male friend. And this is obvious? Oh, it's perfectly. Hmm. But exactly which friend proved an interesting puzzle until I recall what happened earlier today. You opened the latest copy of The Lancet, which you'd ignored for almost a week. Your mind had turned to the world of medicine. I know lots of people from the world of medicine. Well, but only one of them could have revoked a nostalgic expression, a look around our humble home, and a final glance at me. Your old colleague from Bart's Hospital. The amiable, but vacuous, Stamford. Oh, vacuous is a touch harsh. He did have the good sense to introduce us. True, but that was probably the only really useful act of his entire life. Oh. I am right. <laughs> yes, yes, you are. Bravo. Hmm. <laughs> An evening out with Stamford, whose tastes run even more to the light and popular than your own. Not the theatre, then, or even the operetta. You, my pleasure-seeking friend, are off to the music hall. <laughs> All right, Stamford, no more guessing games. Get quite enough of that at home. <laughs> oh, come on, what's so special about this place? Two things. Firstly, there's an enchanting little dancer in the ballet now. Oh, not again. Didn't you learn your lesson last time? Watson, old man, this is different. Yes, it always is. And secondly? One of the turns is really something special. Look, we've got half an hour. Let's go round backstage and I'll introduce you to Flora Bell. You know, you've changed since the old days. Sometimes I have to remind myself that I ever was a medical student. Seems like a lifetime ago. <laughs> you haven't changed. Uh, please to hear it. Get your hands off me! No, I uh, don't think I shall. Oh. I say, that's married you. Chap I was telling you about. Which one? The one you wouldn't want to argue with. You're making a big mistake! I'm sorry, but you brought it on yourself. <laughs> When you started, it was flattering. Flattering? But enough is enough. George! Freddy, you can't do this. Be quiet, Charlotte. No, let him go. Step back. Oh. For God's sake, man! Freddy, Get please. Get back to the dressing room and wait for me. No. Ah, George. Uh, Mr. Meridue, sir. This is Mr. Henry Turner. Please don't let him backstage again. Very good, sir. Thank you, Turner. In future, keep well away from me and my wife. This way, sir. All right. A very big mistake. All right. Well, 
Well, quite. Not exactly how I saw the evening starting. So, which one is your flora bell? There. What do you think? Anymore. Then come away with me. Now. Right now. How, how can I? He'll track me down. He'll find me. You know what he'd do then. He won't have the chance. Do you think I was bluffing? I'm going to the police. I'm going to tell them what I know. Oh, and what about me? I'm as guilty as he is. Only because he forced you. You think they'll believe that? Are you really willing to take that chance? Well, then what can we do? There's nothing. There's nothing at all. Oh, God. What if we could be rid of him for good? Harry. Look at you. Sooner or later, it's going to be more than just bruises. You know that. Oh, but you can't mean that. Charlotte, if he'd been caught back then, he'd have hanged. The man deserves to die. Oh, it's horrible. My love, it's the only way. And you'd do that? To save you, I would. Say yes. No, I can't. Then you're going to live in pain and misery for the rest of your life. Is that what you want? Well, of course it's not, but Then I say yes. May God forgive me. Yes. What do you think? Best of the bunch, eh? Oh, I don't know. Some of the others come close. That redhead and the blue dress. Ah, that's more like the Watson I used to know. I'll ask Flora to introduce you. Oh, no, please don't. Oh, your loss, old man. Ah. Here we go. My name, it is Sam Hall. Sam Hall. Oh, my name, it is Sam Hall. Sam Hall. Oh, my name, it is Sam Hall. And I hate you, one and all. You're a bunch of muckers, all. God damn your eyes. Ah! They say I killed a man. So they say. Yes, they say I killed a man, so they say. Oh, I killed a man, it said. Then I left him there for dead. Yes, I split his bloody head. God damn his eyes. And now dangling on a rope, I must go. Yes, dangling on a rope, I must go. I'll be swinging to and fro while you people down below Yell up, Sam, we told you so. God damn your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. My name, it is Sam Hall. Sam Hall. Yes, my name, it is Sam Hall. Sam Hall. My name is Samuel. And I'll see you all in hell. And I'll watch you roast as well. God damn your eyes. Told you, didn't I? Oh, that was amazing. Now, tell me this, tell me this, tell me this. What's the difference between a ruin boot and tune of iron? One's made of wood, the other's made of Orleans. Right, tell me this, tell me this. Uh, come on, time for a drink. Bad husbands, bad coal.
Mm. You know, I've met murderers. I've looked into the eyes of men who knew they were going to hang. He really has it right. Uh, that combination of defiance and despair. Incredible bit of acting. Ah, but is it just acting? What on earth do you mean? Word is he's actually killed someone. Oh, come on. Before he went on the halls. That's how he can do it so well. He knows what it really feels like. The rumor's everywhere. Oh, it's just publicity. Mm, maybe. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> Oh, oh, that was a damn good show. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Knew you'd enjoy it. Now, where's she hiding? I wonder how long Mary Dew's here. I'd like Holmes to catch him. Sherlock Holmes in a musical? Uh, no, maybe you're right. <laughs> <laughs> what the devil? Help! Help me! Charlotte, what's the matter? Is it Turner? Freddy, he's got a gun. Stay here. No, Freddy! Oh, my lord. Oh, Mrs. Merridew. Uh, uh, it's all right, it's all right. I've got you. There you are, my dear. Sit yourself down. Uh, thank you. What's going on? Who's been murdered? Mrs. Merridew? George, stay with her. Stanford, come uh, with me. Uh, Where the deuce have they gone? Stanford, the window's open. What's out there? It's just an alleyway, I think. Uh, I can't see a thing. It's black as pitch. There could be streets away by now. God almighty! How do we get out there? Quickly, man! Yeah. Yeah. Quiet! Pass me one of those lanterns. Yes, sir. Thank you. Stanford, come with me. Right. The rest of you, wait here. Oh, careful, careful. Grounds like ice. Rotting. Food and goblins. What else? Look. Oh, no. It's married you. Here, take the lantern. Is he dead? No. No, he's still breathing. There's no blood. Surely he didn't just faint. I think he fell and cracked his head on the flagstones. Watch where you're standing. Oh, what's wrong? Uh, yes. Either that's Turner's gun or married you had one too. Uh, Mr. Married you. No, don't try to speak. Is he... is he badly hurt? Save your strength. I had to stop him. What? He fired at me. Had to stop him. Aimed for his legs. Had to stop him before he fired again. His, his legs. Oh. Oh. Pulse is almost gone. Uh. We need help here! Yes, sir! Uh. Well, get him inside. Raise his feet and keep him warm. Uh. Sanford, give me the light. Uh, come on, come on, stay close. There. Dear God. You check Mary, do you? I'll talk to his wife. Right. Oh, where the devil is she? George! Where's Mrs. Mary, do you? I still wandered off, sir. I told you to stay with her. Freddy! Mrs. Mary, do you? Where is he, Freddy? You, you shouldn't be wandering about. What's happened? Something's happened. Someone said there was shooting. Freddy! Then, Mrs. Mary, do you please stay calm. Your husband hasn't been shot. He hasn't? No. Oh. Oh, thank God. Good evening, sir. Sorry to keep you waiting. Detective Sergeant Fragson. Sergeant. And you are Dr. John H. Watson off Baker Street. May I shake you by the hand? Oh, certainly. I'm obliged. Well, bit of a change for you, this, eh, sir? Is it? Nothing bizarre here. Nothing outré. Whole thing's cut and dried. Oh. Seems that Turner's one of those pathetic types who latch onto people in the public eye and then get a bit carried away. Well, that seems rather an understatement. No. Nope. I'm afraid your famous friend won't be gracing this one with his presence. Pity. A night at the music hall can be more interesting than I realised. Here, 
Oh, thank you. Mm. Good health. Health? Mm. Mm. Oh, that's good. Mm. Oh, carry on with your reconstruction of events. Uh, Fraxen's reconstruction. You disagree? Well, it's reasonable enough on the face of it. Turner lost his nerve. Possibly when he saw the gun in Meridew's hand. Yes. Anyway, he escaped through the window, the way he got in, and Meridew chased him. Shots were exchanged, Turner was killed. And then something happened which culminated in Meridew being not senseless. Hmm? According to Fragson, he started to run towards Turner to see how badly he was hurt. Lost his footing, fell and hit his head on the flagstaff. Ah, ah, yeah, that's where your doubt lies. Well, if a man's running and slips, I'd expect him to topple forwards onto his face. Hmm. Meridew had fallen in the opposite direction. Onto his back, you mean? No, no. He was lying face down, but his feet were towards the dead man, as if he'd been running away from him. Well, perhaps he was doing exactly that, to get uh, help. Mm. But why run? It was obvious that Turner was dead. Even a layman would have known. The wretched man's blood was everywhere. Mm. Did you mention this to Fragson? No. Well, it's not much, I know, but not very scientific. Well, it's a detail, and details are always important, one way or another. But it's not just Meridew's fall that bothers you, hmm? No, it isn't. But there's nothing specific. It's just... I don't know. Something feels wrong about the whole business. I was wondering if you'd look into it. Hmm? How can I? It all happened on private property. I can't just walk in uninvited. Well, suppose someone involved in the case engaged you to investigate. Well, that would be different. Is it likely? I'd say it was extremely likely. Indeed? Well, who is this potential client? Me. <laughs> This family locks have not been open for a long time, but a substantial gap in the railings and some definite traces on the ground. Yes, this is where Turner got in and where he was hoping to get out. Well, Fragson used almost exactly the same words. Oh. <laughs> they must be putting something in the tea down at Scotland Yard. Yes, you're right, it's like walking on goose fat. Um, but, ah, yes, Turner's body lay here. Hmm? Yes. Yes. Obsession that escalated to violence. And presumably, Meridew anticipated it since he'd already obtained a gun. Ah, but he didn't need to. Hmm? Oh, Detective Sergeant Fragson. Uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Holmes, this is a very great pleasure, sir. Fragson, uh, what did you mean about the gun? Uh, Meridew didn't have to get it, he already had one. He and his wife used to be Billy Madison and Maisie Wild West sharpshooters extraordinaire. Fascinating. It's about the only thing that is. I'm afraid there's nothing here to interest you, sir. Straightforward affair from start to finish. Then why are you here? To collect the final bit of evidence. Couldn't find it in the dark. Oh, the bullet that Miss Merrowed you? Just dug it out of the wall at the other end of the alley. May I see it? Of course. Thank you. Now, it's hardly worth bothering the coroner. Self-defence, cut and dried. Uh, what's the news of Merrowed you, Sergeant? Well, he's alive, Doctor, but still out cold. Isn't that a bit odd, just from a crack on the head? Oh, it's not unheard of. There can be any number of complications. Where is it? There's a cottage hospital just around the corner. Oh, how very convenient. Thank you. Sir, Mrs Meridew's there as well. She was in quite a state herself last night. Yes, shock. Perfectly normal. Quite. Well, I'm off back to the yard. Perhaps someday we'll meet on a case that's worthy of you, Mr Holmes. Hmm. Good morning to you both. Braxton. Sergeant. Right, let's see if he's left any evidence intact. Oh... The ground here is even more churned up than at the other end. Yes. Uh, ah, yes. the bullet hole. Yes, he dug it out with a thin-bladed knife with a serrated edge. Mm, quite a clean job. Oh, that brickwork's in a terrible state. Yes, Fragson did well not to cause any more damage than he did. He does seem to know what he's doing. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Now, now, Doctor, have the courage of your convictions, even if you don't know what they are. Uh, what was the visibility like last night? Uh, pretty poor. But better than I thought when I looked out of the window. But my eyes hadn't adjusted. Huh. Right. Time for a charitable visit to the sick, I think. Meridew's come round. They've sent word to the yard. Then we don't have long before Fragson gets here. I'll meet you back at Baker Street for lunch. Uh, I'm not going in with you? No. I have another task for you. Miss Floribel Dainty? 
Dr. John Watson. Oh, delighted to meet you, Miss Dainty. Yeah, that's only for the stage, Doctor. It's Hawkins. Emily Hawkins. Shall we sit down? Good morning to you both. My name is Sherlock Holmes. The detective? The same. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. I don't understand. What are you doing here? Mm. Ah. Mm. Lovely. Mm. Mm. Right. Where would you like me to start? Well, when did you first see Turner? Has he been backstage all this week? This week? <laughs> Doctor, that man's been hanging around the Mary Jews for months. He just came round to the stage door one night. He said he'd seen us when we did our old act. Yes. He started turning up almost every night. Of course, I knew why. Indeed. He was completely besotted with Charlotte. Was he not, my dear? <laughs> I've been on the same bill as Fred and Mary Jew, quite a few places recently, on and off, all over the country. Mm -hmm. Turner was always there. Uh, did the Mary Jew seem to mind? Not at first. But then things changed. They'd always been so close, so loving, even in public. But they started having little rows, snapping at each other, that sort of thing. I saw her crying more than once. Here. Thank you. He kept asking when she'd be back on the stage. Why did you give it up, Mrs. Meridue? I didn't want to. It was because of her health, Mr. Holmes. Did you tell Turner that? It was none of his business. But we tried to make it plain that it wasn't going to happen. And he wouldn't drop the idea? He started saying that she should be doing a solo act. He got more and more intense about it. And finally, last night, he passed a remark to Charlotte. Yes. Yes, that's right. He really frightened me. When she told me, I had him barred from the theatre straight away. I had no choice. What was it he said? Oh, he said... I mean it, you know. You could do great things without him holding you back. And, and if you won't get rid of him, just say the word and I'll do it for you. Most of the time, Fred Merrigy was patient with him. Polite. Most of the time? Yes. But there were moments, as if he'd let his guard down. And then... Look, I could be wrong about this. You'd still like to hear... Well, just at those moments, I could have sworn that Mary Jew was actually afraid of him. Now, were you surprised when Turner returned with a gun? Thank you, Mr. Holmes. I was amazed. It was brave of you to face him. To be honest, I thought that Charlotte might have been mistaken. And when you discovered that she wasn't? Frankly... He didn't look that much of a threat. He was just standing there with the gun down at his side. He didn't seem at all inclined to use it. But nonetheless, you produced a gun of your own. Have you always kept a loaded pistol in your dressing room? People on the stage attract all sorts. It's just a precaution. I, I thought it would intimidate him. And did it? Yes. He was out of there like a scalded cat. Well, why did you follow him? Well, to make damn sure that he kept running. Which, of course, he didn't. He fired at you and missed. And I fired back... God knows I'm not proud of that, and I'll take whatever's coming, but I swear I had no choice. He was about to shoot again. I could see the moonlight glinting on the barrel of his gun as he aimed, so I fired. And then? Well, I hate to sound even more melodramatic than I do on stage, Mr. Holmes, but then everything went blank, and I woke up here about an hour ago. The value of different testimonies. Yes, Mary Dew tolerated Turner, was polite to him, welcomed him to their dressing room. And was secretly terrified of him. Why? Oh, because he thought he might lose his wife to the man? No, oh, that doesn't inspire terror. How was Mary Dew? <clears throat> oh, fighting fit, getting back on tonight. Oh, that's not wise. He should rest. His good wife was of the same opinion. Both of you are doomed to disappointment, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I'm wasting your time. Everything we've heard points to Fragson being right. Hmm? And what about Meridue's fall? Maybe he really was running back for help. Well, you're suggesting that he forgot something that occurred before he banged his head. Well, it's rare, but it happens. Hmm? And your general disquiet? 
Yeah, still there, I have to admit. Well, I have something that might add to it. Oh? Yes, at the end of my meeting with them, Charlotte Meridue went off to collect her husband's clothes, and Meridue said something extremely interesting. <gasps> Good God. Mr. Meridue? I just... I just saw something in, in my mind. A, a fleeting image. Of what? A memory or, or a dream. I, I was in the alley. I, th I think it was the alley. And what did you see? A figure standing in the darkness. Turner? No, not Turner. It was someone else. Someone standing much closer. Standing and staring right at me. Someone... Oh, no, it's gone. It's gone. Oh, it was a dream. What if Mary Dew didn't slip over? Go on. I was just thinking, if there was a third person in the alley, he could have knocked Mary Dew out. But why? Well, perhaps so he could get away unobserved. Yes, but what was he, you know, or she, I suppose, doing there in the first place? Well, we can't be certain that anyone was there. But if Mary Dew was right, perhaps Turner wasn't acting alone. No, that's ridiculous. Could it have been a passerby? Anyone can get into that alley. Yeah, come on, sir. Uh, enough speculation. We're building on quicksand. Oh, yeah. Presumably that's why we're going to Scotland Yard. Exactly. Mm. To gather material for a firmer foundation. Yeah, this is the one. Oh, are you sure we should be doing this? Relax, Doctor. This establishment owes me a favour or two. And besides, Fragson's still safely at the hospital and won't be back for at least another hour. Now, let's see. A bullet from the wall, another envelope removed from the body of Mr. Henry Turner. Ah, signed by the surgeon and Fragson dated and witness. Almost gives one hope for the future. Ah, Meridue's gun, I presume? Yes. Still loaded. Five unfired bullets, one spent cartridge. That's exceptionally well balanced, but a trifle ostentatious. Silver plated barrel, gold decoration on the handle. Or to look good from the stage, catch the light. Quite so. Ah, Turner's pistol. Smaller, uh, lighter, distinctly plainer. But also with five live bullets and one discharged. Yes. Where was this lying? Did you observe? It was still in Turner's hand. His finger was on the trigger. Indeed, an interesting detail. And details are always important. One way or another, exactly. This barrel's very interesting. It says the grip. Yes, I wonder. I wonder. Um... Oh, you've seen something. What have you seen? Yes, you like that, don't you, Tilly girl? <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll join you. Poor man's dry feet and rabbit on Sunday. <laughs> oh! Oh! Good shooting. Thank you. Sirs, sirs, what's going on? Oh, we're conducting an experiment. Well, what sort of experiment? The sort with two parts. <sighs> oh, I know that look. The experiment didn't work, did it? Not as well as I'd have liked. I might be able to sympathise a little more if you tell me just why you did it. Well, because you're right and Fragson's wrong. What was meant to happen in that alleyway wasn't at all straightforward. What was meant to happen? We're dealing with a cold and calculated murder and a plan that went awry. Yeah, they'll be arriving soon for the first house. Let's see if George has forgiven me enough to let us wait in the war mall. Holmes, I don't feel comfortable in here. A performer's dressing room should be private. Contain your scruples, Doctor, and look at this splendidly unartistic photograph. Mm. Oh, this must be their old act. What was it, um, Billy Madison and Maisie? Well, surely you see the vital detail? I'm afraid not. The guns! <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> well, I... Oh. George didn't tell us we had visitors. Because I asked him not to. 
and guaranteed obedience with the brand new bottle of gin I saw on his desk. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Holmes. Good evening. I don't believe I know you, sir. Dr. John Watson, my friend and associate. Ah, oh. oh, so I've been treated by the famous Dr. Watson. I'm honoured. Oh, madam, I'm pleased to see you so fully recovered. Oh, you're very kind. Well, this is all very civilised, gentlemen, but I must ask you to excuse me. I have to get ready. Perhaps you'd care to come back after the performance? Perhaps you'd care to close the door. I beg your pardon? This is a matter which should be discussed in private. Watson? Uh, certainly. Oh, now, just a moment. All right, Charlotte. You're welcome to carry on, Mr Holmes, as long as you don't mind if I do the same. Of course. First, the most basic fact. This whole affair was staged, staged as carefully and precisely as any of the acts on display in the limelight. <laughs> Interesting theory. No, it's no theory. Secondly, Turner's death was not an accident. It was murder. <sighs> My dear Mr Holmes, are you saying that I killed him deliberately? No, sir, I am not. I am saying that he was murdered by both of you. May I ask why we did this? Well, because he was blackmailing you. If you've dealt with as many of those serpents and their victims as I have, the signs are unmistakable. At first, you gave in to his demands, whatever they were. Well, I believe money is the usual thing. And by the time you reached London, it was clear that something had to be done. So, you laid your plans, and obligingly, he fell right into your trap by coming to the theatre. I'm sorry, but you've brought it on yourself. When you started, it was flattering. Flattering? But enough is enough. The exasperated celebrity whose patience had worn thin and the wife whose admirer had caused a rift with her husband. Acting. All of it. You made sure that there would be people there to watch the scene and your victim took up his cue admirably. Watson. He threatened you in public. Exactly as you needed him to do. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you waiting for me to comment? It's most intriguing. Please, go on. After you so publicly threw Turner out of the theatre, I believe your wife went after him. And just why do you think I'd do such a thing? To arrange for him to murder your husband. Say yes. Oh, oh may God forgive me. Yes. Oh. Tell me, did you manage to make Turner think it was his idea? That's exactly the kind of manipulative, emotional touch a woman would enjoy. Is that so? Well, it's not important. What did matter was for you to get him back to the theatre. Oh, don't tell me. Because that was the setting for the final stage of the drama. Yes? I think that Turner genuinely cared for you, Mrs Merridew. Oh. I could see it in his eyes when your husband hurt you. Pretended to hurt her. What was the line you fed to him? That you were in love with him? That you were desperate to escape from an intolerable marriage? That you could make a murder look like something else? It's a clever strategy, that one. Don't you think so, Meridew? You have to provoke him into shooting at you. What? I'll put blanks in his revolver. Let him fire first, then you shoot back. It'll be self-defence. I'll get a gun. Oh, no need. I've got one you can use. Come to the dressing room when the top of the bill's on. He'll be in the wings drooling over the little tart. Oh, there's an alley round the back. Turner arrived to collect your gun, but of course you didn't give it to him. He must have been amazed at what happened then. And now our leading man took centre stage. You appeared, dead on cue. You burst in here, and that's where you made your first mistake, Meridew. You closed the door behind you. A man was threatening your wife, you were furiously angry, and yet you stopped to close the door. You had no choice. If you left it open, everyone would have heard Turner protesting that he wasn't armed. But you were. With two guns, both of them fully loaded. Small wonder that Turner tried to get away. You maniac! Keep away from me! Keep back! Ah! You waited until Turner had almost reached the gate, then jumped down after him. And then you did something rather ingenious. I really must congratulate you. You fired one of the pistols into the wall behind you. Which not unnaturally made Turner stop and face you. For God's sake, man! 
And then, calmly and deliberately and with great skill, you took the second pistol and shot him cleanly through the heart. To complete the picture, all you had to do was plant the first gun in Turner's hand. Simplicity itself, and you did it quickly and efficiently. Oh, that's good to hear. May I ask a question? Please do. This other gun, where did I get it? It was the gun your wife had promised Turner, her gun from the old act. You'd already disguised the weapon by prizing off the gold overlays and removing the thin layer of plating with abrasive. Wouldn't it have been simpler to obtain a completely new gun? And risk the purchase being traced. Ah, of course. Charlotte, this mascara is starting to go hard again. Remind me to replace it, would you? Well, certainly, dear. Thank you. Do go on, Mr Holmes. And then, then your grand plan was undone in the simplest, most commonplace manner imaginable. Watson? As you ran back to your own end of the alley, you lost your footing, fell and cracked your head on the flagstones. And that's how I found you. You made a supreme effort to rescue the plan, forcing yourself to stay conscious just long enough to paint your false picture of what had happened. It was probably the finest performance you've ever given, and it will be your last. Well, what can I say? That was truly remarkable. A tour de force, so imaginative. The best outline for a drama I've heard in years. You deny it? Of course he denies it. Of course I deny it. Even if it were true, which it isn't, what else would you expect me to do? Break down in tears? Confess? Oh, Mr Holmes, how can I ever thank you? You've taken such a burden off my shoulders. Is that the usual response on these occasions? I have proof. Scientific proof. Then I'll be fascinated to hear it. Please, the spotlight continues to be yours, and you hold it so well. Turner was found with a gun in his hand and his finger on the trigger, but only one shot had been fired. Any doctor will tell you that the muscles of the hands experience an extreme spasm at the moment of a violent death. The fists close, the fingers grip, the force is more than sufficient to pull a trigger. So where was the involuntary shot? Your argument being that since it didn't happen, the gun must have been put there after the man was dead. Very clever. Then there's Turner's bullet, the one that missed you. The depth it penetrated into the wall matched a shot I fired from three feet away. A bullet from 30 feet left a rather different hole in the brickwork. <clears throat> now that is interesting. Excuse me. Oh, I hate this wig, but it does seem to frighten the ladies. <laughs> Mr Holmes, let's suppose that someone did plan a murder on exactly those lines. Someone intelligent, resourceful and cunning. Don't you imagine that he... Or she. Oh, Freddy, really. <laughs> Would take pains to check every detail in advance by, for example, consulting a doctor on exactly what might happen to a man's hand at the point of sudden death. And if he did, I believe he would learn that uh, cadaveric spasm, that is the correct term, Doctor? Yes, it is. Yes, that cadaveric spasm does indeed occur, but not by any means in every single case. They're so important, these little exceptions in life, don't you agree? Oh, do you know, I think I might treat myself to a different scar for a change. And those bullets. Wouldn't a truly careful murderer find a brick wall somewhere deserted, a wall much the same age and condition as the one in the alley? And wouldn't he shoot at it twice from different distances, exactly as you did? Charlotte, my dear, what do you suppose he would find? Oh, that the difference in the two impacts was actually remarkably small. I think you could well be right. Bluffing doesn't become you, Mr. Holmes. It really doesn't. Five minutes, if you please, Mr. Merrydew. Five minutes. Thank you, Jimmy. <sighs> Heaven knows, gentlemen, I'm no expert, but I believe the relevant phrase is reasonable doubt. Well, thank you for a most entertaining conversation. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go and confess to a murder. Gentlemen. Oh, that devil take the man. There's no helping it, Watson, and that's a rather expensive brandy. How can you be so calm? 
It's, it's abominable. He practically admitted it. Knowing that he was safe to do so. He's right. I can't actually prove a thing. So you were bluffing? No. Oh, it can be a useful technique sometimes, just not this time. I knew they were clever, but I, I hadn't counted on just how clever. Oh, I wanted to wipe that smug smile right off his face. God damn his eyes. <sighs> oh, you're right. What's the point of getting angry? Uh, it's always struck me as a singularly unproductive emotion. Are you actually going to pour the drinks, or will you just be throwing the decanter around some more? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh. <clears throat> Well, you've not been the luckiest of my clients. Mm. Oh, I wouldn't say so. I engaged you to find out what happened in that alleyway, and that's exactly what you did. Thank you. I suppose that nonsense about a third person was just to put you off the scent. When I walked into that hospital ward, it must have given them quite a fright. He rose to the occasion, though. Oh, oh, it was a splendid bit of improvisation. What was the hold that Turner had over him, do you think? Oh, perhaps the rumour's true. A murder in his past. Well, if that was it, then he's killed twice. And shall again. Do you think so? Meridue's a man who thrives on success and he's just renewed his acquaintance with the greatest triumph of all. He's escaped the gallows. That's a thrill a man won't lightly abandon. The first time he killed and got away with it, and the second, he not only got away with it... He bested Sherlock Holmes. So this time the achievement was greater? And the next time will have to be greater still, or it won't be enough. It won't be satisfying. It's the curse of the addict. Greater still? What could he possibly do to top this? I don't know. But I'm rather looking forward to finding out. Oh, they say I killed a man, so they say. Yes, they say I killed a man, so they say. Oh, I killed a man one day in a filthy alleyway. Yes, I shot his chest away. God damn his eyes! <laughs> In the remarkable performance of Mr. Frederick Meridieu, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Frederick Meridieu was played by Hugh Bonville, Charlotte Meridieu by Jill Cardo, Stanford by Malcolm Tierney, Detective Sergeant Fragson and Turner by Jonathan Taffler, Flora by Don LaHughes, and George by Stephen Critchlow. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The pianist was Michael Haslam, and the violinist was Leonard Friedman. The remarkable performance of Mr. Frederick Meridieu was written by Bert Cools from a reference in the short story The Empty House by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. What? English, man. English. Oh, yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Uh, the colonel need you straightway, sir. He has make a discovery. Mallory, what is it? A new chamber. Just the other side of this wall. Harding, it's never been unsealed. My God. We're the first. First in centuries. Wait. Pass me the light. Well? 
What's in there? What can you see? Eyes. I can see... eyes. The Eyes of Horus by Bert Cools with Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson and featuring Colette O'Neill as Lady Mallory and Stephen Thorne as Inspector Lestrade. The Eyes of Horus. Ready, Wilson? Ready, Mr. Loftus. Very good. On the count of three. One, two, three. After you, Lady Mallory. Thank you. Now, vault opened at 2.36. Post Meridian. Casket unlocked at uh, Lady Mary. Of course. <laughs> Two thirty seven. Contents of casket verified by Myself. Lady Jean Mallory. And by me. Under Manager Wilson. And this procedure was followed every time. Every single time, Mr. Holmes. Whenever it was taken out, whenever it was returned. Uh, I've seen the ledger. The records go back at least 20 years. And on this occasion, it was being returned. That's right. Thank you. Carry on, Lestrade. Well, then she unlocked her personal safety deposit drawer, put the gasket inside, and locked it again. And that went down in the book, too. And so did the closing and locking of the vault. Thank you, Mr. Lofting. Wilson. Lady Mallory. My lady. Until the next time, then. If I, I might just say something. Yes? Everyone here wishes to offer their most sincere condolences. Sir Reginald was a fine man. Thank you. And this was uh, three months ago. Almost to the day. And she's not gone back to the bank since. Not until late this morning, when she went to withdraw it again. Casket unlocked at uh, 11.50. And contents verified by... My lady. Lady Mallory. Mr. Lofting, is this some sort of twisted joke? It had gone. Completely. <laughs> it's a pretty little problem. <laughs> I wouldn't advise you to say that to their faces, Mr. Holmes. No sign of any forced entry. Only one door. No windows, no ventilators. Walls. <laughs> Solid. No other ways into the vault. No visible tampering with the safety deposit drawer. And... Uh, Be careful with that, Inspector. No damage to the container. Four keys are needed to get at it. You, Lady Mallory, have two of them. And the other two are held by you, Mr Lofty. And my undermanager, Wilson. Uh, Terence Wilson. The man who came round to the yard. You think I would have sent some junior clerk? Good God, Lestrade, if word of this gets out, the repercussions could be devastating. Yes, sir, you have said. Was he exaggerating? Apparently not. The Commissioner used the phrase international incident. Well, well. You'll be getting the official request to investigate from Downing Street. 
but I was asked to come round straight away. Well, no doubt my brother Mycroft's penning his telegram even as we speak. So, the Eye of Horus. Let's see what we can learn. Well, what did you tell them, Lestrade? Something reassuring in your usual diplomatic style? Tell me the truth, Detective Inspector. The truth? Well, my lady, I don't know how it was done. I don't care how it was done. Can you recover the stone? I'm sorry. I think it's extremely unlikely. How did she take it? Ah, this one, I think. You know the aristocracy. Rather cut out their tongue than show emotion in front of the likes of me. But I think you could say that she wasn't best pleased. Ah, here we are. Here we are. Uh, the eyes of Horus. It's removed from a temple that had a symbol dating from at least 11 centuries before Christ. Uh, yes. Uh, two geometrically perfect three-inch spheres of pure malachite inset with lapis lazuli and mounted in settings of bronze and silver. No gold or diamonds or anything? Now, the ancient Egyptians preferred other materials. Then what's all the fuss about? Well, antiquity brings its own value. Beautiful workmanship adds to it, and rarity uh, sets the seal. And Lady Mallory said it was unique. Well, apart from its twin, yes. The Eye of Horus was a powerful symbol in paintings and friezes, but solid, three-dimensional examples are almost unheard of. Ah, at least you've only got one eye to hunt for. Well, I suppose that's something. Well, I'd be grateful for scraps, Lestrade, especially when there's little prospect of a good square meal. Hmm? Any theories yet? Yes? Begging your pardon, sir. Yes? What do you want? Detective Sergeant Lockwood, sir. We've almost finished interviewing the staff. And? I was wondering where I might find your under-manager, sir, Mr... Uh, Terence Wilson. Well, uh, I presume he's in his office. No, sir. Nor does he appear to be anywhere on the premises. Theories. That's your department, isn't it? Excellent. An illustration. Oh, it's a bonny bauble. Look. Oh, not really my sort of thing. No? Oh, well. You know, I don't understand it. It's not the sort of thing you could fence, surely. Too distinctive by half. In the thief's place, I'd sell it to a collector. There are men who'd pay a fortune for such a prize. Even though they could never show it to anyone else? The collecting mania. Possession is everything. Yeah, there's some strange people in the world. It'd be a dull planet if there weren't. My dear Holmes, the most extraordinary things happened. What do you mean? What have you heard? Oh, hello, Inspector. Uh... Look, if I'm interrupting something... I'll... On the contrary, you arrive with your usual masterly dramatic timing. Yeah, yeah, come inside, Doctor. Shut the door. Oh. oh what's wrong? Well, please, just tell me what you've heard. I, I haven't heard anything. Why am I being interrogated in my own home? Now, you relax, Watson. The good inspector's somewhat on edge. Lestrade, surely you don't imagine that news of the theft has already reached Oxford Street, let alone Epsom Downs? The theft? Epsom Downs? A cursory glance should have told you that the doctors come straight here from the racetrack, stopping only at Bradley's the Tobacconist's, where he purchased that extremely extravagant box of cigars. Uh, I had the most amazing run of luck. Five winners in a row. Congratulations. So, you don't know about it? <laughs> yeah, about what? What, what, what's happened? Take off your coat, Doctor, light up one of those monsters, and listen to the most intriguing tale you'll have heard in weeks. You let me know straight away, right? The minute he shows up. Of course I will, Sergeant. Good. And thanks for your help. Good day, Mum. Good day. Back to the bank, Constable. You got something useful, Sarge? You could say that. I reckon I solved it. Wow. Ah, you're right. That is quite a story. And here's the missing object together with its counterpart. Oh. Oh, they're beautiful. Beautiful. And deadly. All great gemstones are, one way or another. Both removed from the same temple? Yes, but as siblings are wont to do, they went off on their separate paths. And now one of them's been stolen. Is the other one in this country, too? Oh, yes. Have you warned the owner, Inspector? Uh, no, Doctor. Well, it wasn't all necessary. Well, surely... The second eye isn't going to disappear. How can you be so sure? 
W- where is it? In Buckingham Palace. It's part of the Queen's private collection. Ah. Oh. Which complicates matters more than somewhat. Why does it? Because Lady Mallory's family have always made their stone available to the palace for special occasions. So the pair could be exhibited together. The family think of themselves as holding their eye in trust for the crown. And presumably there's a special occasion very soon. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Tomorrow night. State banquet for the new Egyptian ambassador. God only knows what Her Majesty's going to say to him. She could always tell him the truth. Oh, yes, I'm sure that would go down very well. There's quite enough controversy about the damn thing as it is. Apparently the Egyptians reckon the stones belong in Egypt. They want them back. You can see their point of view, I suppose. Well, if it does ever happen, it looks like they'll have to be satisfied with just the one. What do you know about Horus, Lestrade? Well, only what every schoolboy knows. He was one of their heathen gods. There were several deities known as Horus, but we're dealing with the original, the brother of Isis and Osiris. He went by several different names, the noblest and most sacred being Mekentiri. Yeah, Mr. Holmes, is this relevant? Which rather unfortunately translates as he who has two eyes. Losing one of them is probably a deadlier insult than if we'd managed to mislay them both. Shall we go and look at that vault? Anything? Yeah, not a thing. A mouse couldn't get in. Lestrade was right. Intriguing, isn't it? A crime that could have been committed three months ago, three weeks or three hours. Ah, oh, Lestrade, where the devil did you run off to? Been talking to one of my sergeants. There's been a development. What's that, Inspector? The under-manager, Wilson. He's disappeared. And that's not all. According to his landlady, three months back he was practically in Queer Street. Up to his ears in debt. If you want to know a man, talk to his landlady. Oh, I'll bear that in mind. Anyway, suddenly, out of the blue, Wilson came into money and straightened everything out. What do you make of that, then? What am I supposed to make of it? Well, I know you like to complicate everything, Mr Holmes, but it seems to me this is now an open and shut case. (sighs) Wilson stole the eye of Horace. Ah, I suspected an inside job and this confirms it. Ah, yes. Wilson's our man, no question. How did he do it? He made a duplicate of the manager's key. Then once he was inside the vault, he picked the other locks. Well, don't say it's impossible. I've seen you do it. Oh, it's perfectly possible. Who was his accomplice? What do you mean, accomplice? How long do you want the room for? I am... I'm not sure. A day? A week? A couple of hours? A month. I'll take it for a month. Name... Smith's popular. That's it. Smith. Um, John Smith. That's right, Mr Holmes. The vault can only be entered if both locks are open simultaneously. It won't have escaped that eagle eyesight of yours, Lestrade, that the keyholes are some ten feet apart. So we had an accomplice. It changes nothing. Access to this part of the bank is strictly controlled. Wilson couldn't have come down here on his own without me knowing about it, let alone with someone else. Well, we'll see. I've got every available man out on the streets and notices posted at the ports and railway stations. He can't hide forever. (sighs) Mr Holmes, do you wish to interview my staff? Uh, Thank you, no. I believe I'll offer my condolences to the former guardian of the eye. I'm very pleased that you're involved, Mr Holmes. I have the highest opinion of your abilities. If the government hadn't called you in, I would have done so myself. Very gracious of you, Lady Mallory. Ah, here's the casket. Just put it down here, Rawlings. That will be all. My lady. Ah, That's interesting. A perfect bronze cube. Are those inlays gold? Yes, indeed. A worthy home for its occupant. Did you have it specially made, Lady Mallory? No, Doctor. It's been in the family for a very long time. I've no idea what it was originally intended for, but it was the perfect size and it seemed fitting. But why are you so interested in it, Mr Holmes? Because this box represented the final hurdle to our thief. May I have your key, please? Certainly. It's the smaller of the two. Ah. Yes, presumably the other one fits the safety deposit drawer. Yes. You didn't think it prudent to keep the two separate? No? Well, doubtless you know best. 
Yes, padded velvet interior. Mm. No place for concealment. Of course not. Yes, very good. Mm. Yes, no sign of any tampering with the lock. Yes, that's what Inspector Lestrade said. Really? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, how did the stone come into your family's possession? <laughs> It was my late husband's grandfather and his partner who first discovered the eyes. Lord Arthur donated his to the Queen, and the other became part of our family's collection of Egyptian antiquities. Is it housed here, uh, this collection? No. Yeah, at the bank? No. Almost all of the items were disposed of some years ago. But you retained the eye? Obviously. Thank you very much. I don't believe I need to detain you any longer. Watson. Oh, good day, my lady. Wait, gentlemen. Mr. Holmes, when do you expect to make some progress in this matter? I hope to have some news for you shortly. But that's wonderful. Unfortunately, I can't guarantee it will be good news. My lady. Ah, oh, poor woman. What a terrible blow for her. And for the family honour. So soon after losing her husband, too. Did you have to be so brutally honest? It doesn't do to create false hope. We're dealing with a formidable criminal mind. Hmm? Have you thought about the method? Well, of course I have. It couldn't have been easy, however it was done. You know, it's an excellent precept always to reject the complex in favour of the straightforward. You're surely not saying the solution's simple. Driver, stop here. Well, I, I thought we were going back to Baker Street. Wait for me there. If the strayed wants to know what I'm doing, tell him I'm killing two birds with one stone. Within a moment. Now, please take your time. Hmm. Ah, sorry to keep you on there. Ah, oh, a gentleman. <laughs> Very observant of you. I beg pardon, sir, but... I don't often get gentry in here. Oh, oh that's a fine timepiece. That'll give you years of faithful service. Thank you, but I'm hoping to acquire something rather different for my collection. Oh, what would that be, sir? You. Sir? I've been watching you for some considerable time, Mr Newman. What do you mean, watching me? And it's obvious that both you and your establishment are far more than they seem. This place is a clearinghouse for almost all the illicit financial dealing in this part of the capital. Who are you? My card. Ah. Quite. You supply moneylenders with the names of likely clients, and you advise the desperate and the despairing on where best to find help. You serve both the hunters and the hunted. And my good friends at Scotland Yard would be extremely interested to learn your name. I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, fortunately for you, you'll be far more useful to me at liberty. Useful? That's a most valuable source of information. I'm looking forward to years of faithful service. Can I help you? I'm looking for a man. This man. Well, you won't find him here. I haven't seen him. You can tell your boss that from me. Perhaps I'll have a look for myself. And perhaps you'll be crawling back to your governor with a few extra entrances and exits. I'll be watching this place. And you. Then you'll be wasting your time. He's not going to like that, is he? Your governor. He's probably not going to like getting the bill for my new door, neither. You've not heard the last of this. <gasps> oh, for goodness sake, man, get up. I heard a noise. A crash. A bruiser looking for you. Oh, dear God. Oh, don't worry. I told him you weren't here. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. You're in my house. You're under my protection. I'm so grateful. Don't you worry, love. You'll be all right here. I'm afraid I don't think so. <gasps> oh! Because it's likely that that charming gentleman will be back before long. Forgive me entering unannounced, but the front door was open. Uh, who are you? What do you want? Good question. 
Either you're safe as houses now, my friend, or you're really in trouble. Which is it, Mr. Holmes? Mrs. Margaret Hartnell is one of the shrewdest judges of character I've ever encountered. We've been of service to each other several times in the past. It was a lucky style that led you to her door. Just how much do you know about my private business, Mr. Holmes? I know that you were in financial difficulties and that you couldn't look to your own bank. For disgrace. Exactly. So I asked someone who's also in the money business, but a man of your position would be most likely to turn for discreet assistance. He gave me a name straight away. So you know who it is who's persecuting me? I do. Rosen. Oh, that's a name we know well. If you're mixed up with Solomon Rosen, there's no wonder at the state you're in. Do you still owe him money? I repaid the loan in full. And all his outrageous interest. And he's still hounding you? Mr. Rosen is branching out. Blackmail. Exactly. Rosen's a last desperate resort, and most of his clients have a very great deal to lose. If my dealings with him were to become known, he threatened to tell the bank. Unless you paid him more money. It wasn't money he wanted. It was information. The names of clients who might be grateful for his services. Well, I refused. Ah, oh, that was extremely brave of you. Rosen's thugs can be very persuasive. Two of them had been on my tail. I didn't know it. When I went to report the disappearance of the Eye, they saw me go into Scotland Yard. And assumed that he'd gone to the police with a full account of their little racket. They wouldn't believe me when I denied it. I think they'd have used violence there and then if there hadn't been so many people around. The doctor, they threatened my life. Oh, their usual tactic. And it's not an empty threat, I assure you. I believe you. Thank God I managed to get away from them and give them the slip. And have been in hiding ever since. Well, until you found me. Mr. Holmes, what can I do? Rosen won't stop looking for me. Give yourself up to the police. A cell at the yard is the safest place for you, just at the moment. But the police think I stole the Eye of Horus. Ah, but I know that you did not. And does that mean... Do you know who did take it? Yes, I do. And how it was accomplished. I see. Finish your drink, Mr. Wilson. It's time to break the good news to Inspector Lestrade. We didn't get you out of bed then, Inspector. No such luck, Doctor. It's been made very clear that no one rests until this matter is done with. Uh, going without sleep's not a good idea. Get your head down for a couple of hours and you'll be the better for it. I might well do that now. Having Wilson under lock and key ties up a very loose end, even if he doesn't turn out to be a thief. Which is not. If you say so. I do. A word of advice, Lestrade. Treat Wilson well, and he'll help you put Solomon Rosen and his thugs behind bars. Rosen? Wilson's mixed up with him? And unlike most of Rosen's victims, he'll be willing to testify if you play him carefully. Oh, I've been after that gang for years. That'll be a feather in your cap, Inspector. No, I've got to see this bank job business wrapped up first. I... Uh... I can't persuade you to tell me what you know right now, I suppose. No, there are still a few things I have to arrange first. I suggest you take Watson's advice and get some sleep. I rather think you'll need your wits about you tomorrow. Well, Mr Holmes, what is it you have to say to us? Patience, Lady Mallory. All the players are not yet on stage. Nothing can happen until the cast is assembled. Just how much longer will I have to wait? I think they've arrived. Excellent. Uh, we're all down here, Inspector. Right you are, Doctor. Down you go. Good morning, Mr Holmes. Lady Mallory. Wilson, where the devil have you been, man? I trust you're none the worse for your night in Lestrade's tender care. Not at all. He's your prisoner, Lestrade. Then you did steal my property, you villain. I stole nothing. A likely tale. All right, all right, that's enough. Mr Holmes? Thank you. Now, I remarked yesterday to my good friend Watson that it's invariably a mistake to favour the complex over the straightforward. This robbery, if that is indeed what it was... What nonsense is this? If you please, thank you. This occurrence was, on the face of it, 
complicated in the extreme. An unparalleled level of security, and still the fabulous Eye of Horus is somehow spirited off through four locks, through barriers of wood and metal, and through a five-inch steel door. It went on its way. Allow me to show you how. Lady Mallory, may I have your key to the safe deposit drawer, please? You may. Thank you. Mr. Lofting, I believe you now have both of the keys to the vault door. Reluctantly returned to me by the police? Yes, I do. Yes, be so kind as to give one of them to Mr. Wilson. What? You wish me to entrust bank property to a criminal? Just do it, Mr. Lofting. He won't be going anywhere. Under protest, I do this. Wilson? Thank you. Now we require the star of our mystery. The Eye of Horus itself. Are you telling me you have it? Good God, man, all this rigmarole and you have it. Unfortunately, I do not. Watson? Oh, yes. This will serve as a substitute. That's a fitting understudy. A pure gold snuff box with inset amethyst of impeccable provenance. And in the absence of Lady Mallory's antique casket, I offer this. A cigar box? Courtesy of five winners in a row. Hardly an exact match, I grant you, but it will serve. The snuff box goes inside, yes. and two stout rubber bands act as the lock, one this way and one that. Now, I think you'll agree that it's impossible to get at the snuff box without removing the bands. Doctor? Uh, certainly. Mr. Lofting? Yes, yes. Yes, well, then the, the parallel is accurate and our casket is securely closed. Capital. Uh, take charge of it for a moment, would you, Watson? Of course. Thank you. Now, we are about to reenact the events of three months ago, specifically the 16th of August, the day on which the Eye was last returned to its safe haven. Mr. Lofting, Mr. Wilson, you shall play yourselves. I shall take the part of Lady Mallory. Now, if the rest of you would kindly gather along that wall. Oh, hmm? oh, oh. Thank you. <clears throat> Good. Right. Then the action can commence. Mr. Lofting... Well, uh, uh, the three of us came down the stairs, and Wilson and I unlocked the vault door. Who was carrying the casket? I was, of course. Oh, of course. Yes. Doctor? Uh, here. Thank you. Uh, I think we can take the descent down the stairs as read. Mr Lofting, Mr Wilson, please unlock the vault. If I must. Ready, Wilson? Ready. On the count of three. One, two, three. Beautifully done. Who was the first to enter the vault? Lady Mallory, then myself, then Wilson. Thank you. Then in we go. Oh, no, no wait, wait. What's wrong? Our, our recreation's lacking a detail. Mr. Wilson, was it a bandage or a sling? Uh, how in the world did you know? Uh, a sling, Mr. Holmes. On your right arm? Yes. You were injured, Mr. Wilson. Well, we can imagine the sling. On with the drama. First myself as Lady Mallory, then you, Mr. Lofting, and you... Mr. Wilson, and the three of us are inside the vault itself. Uh, do you still have a good view, members of the audience? Front row stalls, Mr. Holmes. Ah, well, I hope you enjoyed the show. Mr. Lofting, at this time, did the casket remain in full view throughout? It did. I'd swear it on the book. As I suspected. Now, Mr. Lofting, if you would move to the table with the ledger, there's really no need to look surprised. It was a simple deduction. Your writing's quite different from Mr. Wilson's. Is that how you knew about my, um, injury? Well, clearly something had prevented you from fulfilling your usual writing duties. Hmm? Mr Lofty? Well, I, I was at the far side of the table, facing the others. Uh, here. Admirable. Uh, please read out the relevant entries. Um, ah. Vault unlocked at 2.36 post-meridian. Well, we've, we've done that. Next. Uh, casket unlocked at 2.37. Then I'll remove our rubber bands. Mm -hmm. Next. Uh, condition of contents verified by Lady Jean Mallory. I look inside the box. Yes. Contents confirmed. And by under manager Wilson. Mr Wilson, here. 
Confirmed. Beautifully done. Next. Casket relocked. Very good. Safety okay. deposit drawer opened at 2.40. Thank you. Now I put in our casket. Uh, close the drawer and secure it. Mm -hmm. As verified by the penultimate entry. Drawer closed and locked. Excellent. And then I presume that all three of our company move back through the door into the outer chamber. Gentlemen. Oh. Ah. Thank you all for your cooperation. It's a pleasure to perform with you. Lady Mallory, was my performance accurate? Mr. Holmes. Ah, the audience grows restless. I think we should probably dispense with closing and reopening the door. Mr. Red, this is the key to the safety deposit drawer. Go and open it, would you? What are you saying? Now, now don't let's anticipate the climax, if you please. Uh. Now what? Be so good as to bring the cigar box back here. Whatever you say. Are the rubber bands still in place? Well, of course they, they are. haven't been tampered with in any way. How could they have been? Quite. The casket is still locked. Please, unlock it. Now, if everyone, cast and audience alike, would care to gather round. Right. Yes? Take off the lid, Lestrade. All right. A neat little trick, isn't it? Ah, that's very pleasant. Now, your security system might be the finest that money can buy, Mr. Loughlin, but I can't say the same for the ventilation in your cellar. This is a most impressive office. Over oh, the love of heaven. Uh, Holmes, I think the audience would appreciate an explanation. Oh, I certainly would. Well, perhaps we should get the most basic point over and done with. The Eye of Horus was not stolen. What? Of course it was stolen. No, Lestrade, it wasn't. But good grief, man, the thing's disappeared. I don't deny it. Oh, this is absurd. Mr Holmes, please don't make this even more complicated than it already is. My dear Inspector, the whole thing is and always has been entirely straightforward and remarkably simple, as was the method employed to spirit the eye away. Well, for pity's sake, sir, tell us how it was done. Well, forget three months ago for the moment. Concentrate on just now. Mr Lofting, did you see, actually see, the snuff box when its presence was verified? Well, of course I... Oh, I... Actually, no. No, I, I, I didn't see it myself. The, the, the table was... Was just too far away. Uh, but Wilson, you saw it. Oh, dear. Courage, Wilson. No, sir. I didn't see it. I lied. You did what? I lied. And so did I. The box was empty. Mr Holmes, you lied too? But hang on, surely... If you were pretending to be... Oh, my word. Exactly. I lied just as Lady Mallory lied three months ago. But, but th this is impossible. And I coerced Mr Wilson into lying too, just as Lady Mallory did three months ago. My lady, what do you have to say? Nothing to you. Wilson, you're dismissed. Have you any idea of the grief you've caused the bank? Mr Wilson is a man well acquainted with grief, Mr Lofting. That was a very neat trick, Mr. Holmes. How did you do it? Watson. Another cigar box? Mm hmm. Complete with snuff box. I had ample time to switch them while Holmes was shepherding you all around. But of course, three months ago, there was no need to switch in a duplicate container. The casket was empty when it left your house. Isn't that so, Lady Mallory? You said it yourself, sir. There has been no theft. It is not possible to steal one's own property, and therefore I have committed no offence. Oh, I'm sorry, but at the very least there's the question of wasting police time, defrauding Don't the bank... Don't bother me with trivialities, sir. Trivialities, my lady. You call it trivial, what you did to me. Now, hold on a minute, one at a time. What did she do to you? Uh, Mr Holmes said it. She blackmailed me into helping her, or as good as. Nonsense. I saved him, Inspector. 
gave him the money to pay off that odious little man, Rosen. How do you know someone like Solomon Rosen? I'm saying no more without a solicitor present. I can tell you most of what you need to know, Inspector. You wouldn't dare. Oh, no. I'll not be intimidated any more. I've made my mistakes and I'll admit to them. Are you honest enough to do the same? Well, Mr. Holmes, gentlemen, thank you. Lady Mallory, I must ask you to come with me. I wish to speak to Mr. Holmes in private. No, I'm sorry, I can't allow Oh, that. for heaven's sake, man. Do you think I'm going to run away? I'll accept the responsibility, Lestrade. Very well. If the rest of you would come with me... Well, I've been thrown out of my own office. No, sir, you're being asked to accommodate the wish of a lady. Under protest. After you, Mr. Lofting. Doctor. We'll be just outside. What will happen to me, Mr. Holmes? That's for the police to decide. The police? I suppose there will be publicity. Very proper. And disgrace. The very thing I sought to avoid. I shan't attempt to excuse what I did. I never expected that you would. But perhaps I shall be given the opportunity to explain it. I wonder if anyone will understand. You understand, I think. I do. Yes. It was perhaps quite a clever plan. Far too clever. A more mundane crime would have been much harder to solve. You should have arranged for the eye to disappear while it was in your house or on its way to the palace. Now, Mr. Holmes, you really can't expect a titled lady to think like a consulting detective. Thank goodness for it. Well... My lady, shall we rejoin the others? Ah, uh, poor woman, to be driven to that. Mm. Well, go on then. You know you're dying to tell me. How did you work it out? By looking for the simplest possible explanation. The easiest way for the Eye of Horus to disappear from the bank was if it hadn't been there in the first place. Exactly. Mm. Most of the rest came from our visit to Lady Mallory's house. I'm afraid that your usual commendable sympathies for a female in distress blinded you to the obvious. Which was? Well, the place was full of the most curious contrasts. New pieces of furniture, but different items had previously stood. Paintings that had been removed and replaced with others. And did you observe the staff? What about them? Well, the butler was obviously long-serving, but everyone else was comparatively new. Ah, you're describing a household that's fallen into decay and is being built up again? Bravo. <laughs> Lady Mallory, or probably her late husband, had been deep in debt and then found a solution, shall we say some three months ago? When she sold the eye to a collector? Mm, but of course she couldn't do so openly because of the stain it would put on her family's honour, a consideration more important than any other. You know, th th there is one thing I still don't understand. Oh, isn't that my line? Sorry. I, I don't know how Lady Mallory found out that Wilson needed money. Well, I thought you might have asked her that when you were alone together. It would have been impolite. Ah. Oh. Well, she knew about Rosen. Is it possible that the family had had dealings with him themselves? He could well have told her. Well, if you're right, Mr. Rosen's activities are even more wide-ranging than we thought. <laughs> the strade could be in for a promotion. While you get no credit at all. The same old story. Mm. Um, what about the international incident? Oh, I doubt it'll be on quite the scale that the commissioner predicted. See, look at this. Huh? Hey, this intelligence from Mycroft. The new Egyptian ambassador specifically requested that none of his country's antiquities be exhibited at the banquet. Good grief. Um, situation surrounding them, too volatile at present. Better if official reports back to Egypt don't have to mention them. Yes, I detect Mycroft's persuasive hand in that. Mm. What do you suppose will happen to Mr Wilson? You know the district messenger office at the bottom end of Regent Street? Oh, of course. The manager's retiring next month. I, I, I might have a word. 
Oh, that would suit Wilson down to the ground. Mm, there'd been rather less strain on his nerves. And you might have a word. That's very decent of you. Not at all. I use that office a lot. I need someone reliable there. Oh, yes, just as you like. What if he falls into debt again? Oh, no, no, I think he's learnt his lesson. Did he mention to you how he managed to get into such serious trouble in the first place? No. I'm afraid he was rather fond of horses, but not too practised in determining just how fast they can run, or how slowly. Gambling can be a dangerous pastime, wouldn't you say so, Doctor? Mm. Though um, not without its rewards, in the hands of an expert. Or someone blessed with uncommon good luck. <laughs> Holmes, would you care for a cigar? Why, my dear Watson, how very unexpected. Thank you. In The Eyes of Horus, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Lady Mallory was played by Colette O'Neill, Inspector Lestrade by Stephen Thorne, Lofting by Stephen Critchlow, Wilson by Jonathan Taffler, Mrs Hartnell by Janice Aqua, The Sergeant by Malcolm Tierney, and The Constable by Paul Ryder. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Eyes of Horus was written by Bert Cools from a reference in the novel The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. I'll tell you again. The last passengers to get on board were a man and a woman. I gave their descriptions to your sergeant. Hurry along there, please. Yeah, first class for you, sir. Here you are. The lady prefers a non-smoker? Oh, of course. Sorry to disturb you. Try this one, Mum. Ah, and all to yourselves here. Uh, allow me. Thank you. Sir, mind away from the door, please. Stand clear of the train. The trip was smooth, no problems, no unexpected stops. As we were coming into Rugby, I looked out and checked down the train. Standard procedure, regulations. And I saw one door just swinging open. The last of the first class non-smokers. So soon as we were on the platform, I jumped down and ran along there. Sir? Mum? And I found... God, is that one empty? Well, you know what I found. <gasps> the Thirteen Watchers by Bert Cools. With Clive Merrison as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson. And featuring Nigel Anthony as Sir Gregory Backwater and Sean Probert as Inspector Athelney Jones. The Thirteen Watchers. Sorry to have kept you waiting, Mr. Um, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Sir Gregory Backwater. Sir Gregory? Uh, Sir Gregory is the chairman of the London and North Western Railway Company. And shortly to be elevated to the peerage. Well, that information hasn't been made public. I trust I can rely on your discretion. Oh, this room has heard many secrets, Sir Gregory. Some of them even more important than yours. How can I help you? The doctor assured me that your case is worth getting out of bed for. I hope you're not going to disappoint me. Yeah, two days ago... Something occurred on one of my trains, the non-stop Houston to Rugby. Two people vanished into thin air. Indeed. And a third person appeared in their place. A young man with no ticket, no money and no identification. He'd been shot through the heart at extremely close range. Hmm. 
Is that everything? The whole thing occurred in an isolated compartment of a non-corridor train, travelling at approximately 50 miles an hour. And if that isn't enough, the dead man was in possession of 13 watches. Well, sir, is that sufficiently interesting for you? Hmm. The couple that vanished, I suppose there's been a search for bodies. Of course. Suicides do happen, though God knows we do our best to keep them out of the papers. Nothing was found. Could the corpse have been hidden in the compartment before the train started? So completely that the guard didn't notice it when he opened the door. Besides which, the train was cleaned and inspected at Euston immediately before it left. No, the dead man quite definitely appeared during the journey. You should have called me in at once. By now the body would have been tidied away, stripped, washed and wiped clean of any useful information. Decency and convention triumph over science. The police saw the body in situ. The police? Who's in charge, Sir Gregory? Oh, there's a local man, Inspector Fowler. Well, that's something. Uh, but I insisted on the Scotland Yard detective. Oh, wonderful. Which of the troop did they send? Well, now, here's a pretty business. Inspector Thelney Jones? Mr. Holmes, always a pleasure. I'm glad you think so. And Dr. Watson. You're looking well, Doctor. No, you too, Jones. <laughs> well, it's true, I can't deny it. It's the brain work, you see. Torns up the mind and the body follows. Oh, good morning, Sir Gregory. Uh, Jones, you, you know these gentlemen, do you? Oh, Mr. Holmes and the doctor have assisted me in the past. I don't mind admitting it. Very kind of you. Our credit where credit's due, that's my motto. Uh, but look, look, you'll have to excuse me. There's a, a message come from the station. The uh, police station, that is. <laughs> Potential for confusion. <laughs> Okay, can you manage without me? We can, but try. Then, um, I'll let you get on with it. The coach where the body was found is waiting for you in a siding. I gave orders that nothing was to be touched until you'd seen it. Oh, thank you, Jim. <laughs> I know you were ways by now, don't I? Know you were ways. <laughs> Excuse me all. <clears throat> well, he wasn't quite what I was expecting, I have to say. Yes, a lot of people find that. Has he made any progress? None whatsoever. This way. Uh, Mr. Holmes, the body was in that compartment, the next one. Yes, but the guard first showed the missing couple to this one, which they rejected. Because they preferred a non-smoker. Uh, or possibly because they wanted to be alone. Uh, tell me about the man who was already in here. Tell you what? Well, the compartment wall's not particularly thick. Did he hear a gunshot? I have no idea. Well, surely he was asked. In the confusion he left before anyone could question him. Oh, not very public-spirited. Look out below. I'll see the scene of the murder now. Hmm. <laughs> Splendid. Cigarette, Sir Gregory? You never got the taste. You're more of a cigar man. Oh, I'm partial to a good cigar myself. Uh, you carry on, though. Thank you. <sighs> How much longer is he likely to take? I'm afraid that's hard to say. Mm. No offence, Doctor, but um, the fellow from Scotland Yard wasn't the only one who took me by surprise. Oh. Yeah. I wasn't expecting him to be quite so abrupt. Oh, it's just his way. One gets used to it in time. Watson, come here. More or less. Uh, excuse me. Now, hang on. Let me hold the ladder. Oh, yes. Thanks. Good. Have you found anything? Uh, a few traces, despite the efforts of the official force to obliterate the lot. Mm. The blood is clear enough. Looks like it fell backwards against the seat here and then slid down to the floor. Yes, then two people walked through the pool of blood while it was still flowing. Uh, the mysterious disappearing couple. Surely you're not thinking of titles already. Uh, sorry, force of habit. Pity the footprints aren't clearer. Anything else? Nothing that answers the main question. Hmm, how the devil did he get in here? Exactly. Mm. Could he have jumped up from the track level? Uh, no. No, it's too far. You'd have to be an athlete or an acrobat. 
Perhaps that's exactly what he was. Mm -hmm. Muscle development is no more than average, if that. He wasn't an athlete. Early twenties, very trim, close shaved, hair well groomed, no particular distinguishing marks. Uh, unless you count the single gunshot to the chest. Ah, there you are. Yeah, welcome back, Jones. Well, what did you think of the scene of the crime, then? No, 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 no. you can tell me on the way. On the way to where? Yeah, it won't take long. I have a carriage waiting. For heaven's sake, Jones, what's happening? We've got another body. <sighs> These bushes are so thick, you can only see them when you get right alongside. There. Who found him? Yeah. Family out for a hike. Apparently, this path runs right along the bottom of the embankment, the whole three miles into town. May I? Well, be my guest. Uh, thank you. <sighs> yes. Mm. Mm. Has he been moved at all? Uh, just enough to make sure he was dead. <laughs> There's uh, no identification. My sergeant's already looked in his pocket. Then I shouldn't dream of checking again. What did you find? Not a thing. No papers, no money, no nothing. Nothing at all? Yes, that is singular, isn't it? Uh, exit wound in the small of the back. And a single gunshot to the chest from very close. Highly indicative. And so is something else. Look at that trail of damage. <laughs> I reckon he came down the embankment. Mr. Holmes? Mm -mm -mm. Oh, uh, yes, quite so. <coughs> yes, but that was before he was shot. There's no blood on the slope. There's no easy access onto the track, so he must have come from a train. Well, judging by the larval growth on the corpse, he died about two days ago. So, he came from the train. <laughs> I'll go further. This is the man from the missing couple. It's a possibility, but there are others. Oh, I'll put my pension on it. I have an instinct for these things. Don't you remember the case of the Sholto brothers? Vividly. Excuse me. So, Doctor, here we are again. Uh, yes, yes. How did the local inspector feel about the yard being brought in? <laughs> Not much choice, really, did he? <laughs> Same as me with you two. I recommend the view from up here, Jones. Most illuminating. Don't tell me. Footmarks. Two sets. You should check them for yourself. No, no, I, I trust you completely. Yeah. Uh, Sergeant, uh, I finished here. Uh, get this body loaded. Two sets. Excellent. Supports my theory in every particular. Oh, I did some research. Brain work, like I said. When it gets to the outskirts of the town, the express from London runs parallel to the local stopping train. Well, what do you reckon to that? Why is it important? Well, I think our young man was alone in one carriage of the slow train. His ticket was on the seat next to him with his wallet. But not his remarkable collection of watches. Ah, those watches. They are a vital clue. You might not know this, Mr. Holmes, but wearing excessive jewellery is a symptom of some forms of mania. Doctor? Oh, it's certainly been suggested. So, he was excitable and impulsive and uh, probably weak in the head. Now, it happened that at one point the two trains were alongside each other and moving at exactly the same speed. It's your case that this sadly deranged individual moved across from his train to the other? Leaving his ticket and identification behind. Exactly. It's dangerous, I grant you. But it's perfectly possible. But why would he do it? Because, Doctor, he recognized someone on the express. Two people, in fact. Why couldn't he just have banged on the window and waved? It's obvious that he had some very strong motive for moving across. Let's say he was in love with the woman. Watson, you have a rival in the romance department. What's more, he hated the man. There was an argument, it turned into a fight. The other man shot the newcomer, then escaped from the train down the embankment. Taking the lady with him? Exactly. Very good. In the fall, he dropped the gun, she snatched it up, and hysterical with grief and horror, she shot him and fled from the scene. Ah, you double the circulation of the newspaper. Oh, you can scoff all you like, Mr. Theorist, but I'm right. Just you wait and see. Oh, yes. 
That's him right enough. He is the man from the missing couple. Poor soul. Yes. Yes, I'm sure. Well, thank you very much. There you are, gentlemen. It all falls into place. Now, all I have to do is track down his companion, and the case is solved. Running Quillior, von Eddy Guess. Yeah. I beg your pardon? Cherchez la femme. Excellent. Now, uh, there is a local train which runs parallel to the express. I checked. You believe Jones's theory? No, I don't. Partly because it relies on too many coincidences, but mainly because I have several pieces of information which the good inspector does not. Are you planning to share them with him? The clues are all there for him to see. He only has to use his eyes. I know he can be annoying, but I, I wouldn't want to see him make a public fool of himself. Ah. Oh, dear. He doesn't look happy. Mr. Holmes! Good evening, Sir Gregory. May I offer you a drink? You may not, sir. Or a light. You seem to have neglected that excellent cigar. Damn it, man! So would you if this had been delivered to your table. What is it? It's a disaster, that's what it is. More accurately, it's a note from a local journalist. He's going to print the whole damned story. Does he have the whole story? Of course not. He's got just enough to turn it into some sort of masculine and cook music hall mystery. Holmes, I relied on you to explain the entire affair before the papers got anything at all. Can you? I regret not. So, it was a waste of my time and my money engaging you. But happily... Inspector Athelny Jones can. So, gentlemen, those are the facts. Uh, yes, all right, one more picture. Uh, wait. <coughs> Ready. Thank you, Inspector. Now, I'm asking for your reader's help to identify the players in this tragic drama. You'll be given these photographs of the two dead men and an artist's sketch of the missing woman based on the guard's description. About five and twenty, modest bearing, very slight... Very slight, dressed, fashionably dressed, hat with, hat with deep floppy, floppy brim, brim, first old white gloves. White gloves. Yeah, really narrows it down, doesn't it? Do you think he's going to find her? I believe it's unlikely. Come on. Where are we going? To do something I should have done the minute we arrived. It is remarkable. Mm, and for once, I can't cite you a precedent. Why would a man carry 13 watches? You don't accept James's insanity theory. Oh, it's been known in women, but only with display jewels and the like, frippery. Mm. In this case, I, I don't believe it, no. Mm. Oh, six plain pocket models, five strikers, and two of these miniatures on wrist straps. I've not seen those before. Mm, it's a new development. Oh, rather good. Yeah, uh, they were in various pockets, but none of the chains were attached to buttonholes. Is that significant? Exceedingly. Did you notice anything particular about the man at the foot of the embankment? Apart from the fact that he was dead, of course. He was, uh, what, in his thirties? Heavy? Well over six foot? Hmm? Nothing else? He was very well dressed. That was a twenty guinea suit. Oh, and more specifically... Oh, you're going to tell me his clothes were made by a left-handed tailor on the south side of a street in Holborn? Actually, I'm going to tell you that they came from an exclusive, bespoke establishment in New York City. He was an American. Mm, his watches are informative, too. Mm, time to find a telegraph office. And then... Uh... And then what? Could you eat some lunch? Would it spoil your appetite if we talk about the case? Oh, not in the least. Remember the smoking compartment next to the murder scene? When I examined it, I found this. Oh, is that cigar ash? Very good. Well, it's not exactly surprising to find ash in a smoking compartment. In this case, it is. This could only have come from an E.H. Gatto, number five. That's not a name I know. No, they're extremely uncommon in this country. <laughs> the curious thing is that it wasn't the last time today that I encountered it. Amongst other places, it was on the second body. There's an excellent chance that just before, or just after, he died, a second murder victim was in extremely close contact with the elusive gentleman in the next compartment. Huh? Now, eat up, Doctor, before it gets cold. Hmm. You know, every town and city has its distinctive odour. Huh. I want to write a monograph on the subject. Mm. Watson? Uh, this case gets more complicated by the second 
Now we're dealing with four people, and two of them have disappeared? Hmm, well, two have met with bloody and curiously similar ends. Intriguing, isn't it? I'd say that's putting it mildly. What are we going to do next? Uh, excellent. Just time. We're going back to London. Ah, the trail leads back to the fogs of the metropolis. Something like that. Fingering in the finale it was fascinating. I must try it. So what's the future Lord Backwater going to say when he hears you abandoned him to go to a matinee concert? It is possible to investigate two murders and appreciate Sarasati at the same time. Besides, our answers lie here, not in rugby. Ah, it's arrived. Hmm. Something interesting? Exceedingly. Don't take off your coat. Right the street, gents. Thank you, cabby. We'll be waiting here for a while. Now, Watson, the address you want is number 42, Mrs. Harris. The address I want? You get on much better with landladies than I do. Well, everybody gets on much better with landladies than you do. Well, there you are. I'll wait for you here. I suppose you wouldn't care to tell me what it is I have to do. I want you to find out about one of her lodgers, a man named Edward Harkness. Try not to appear too suspicious. Oh, of course not. And while I'm at it, I'll discover a cure for the common cold. What exactly do you want to know? Same as usual. Everything. Ah, good afternoon. I'm sorry, sir. No vacancies. Uh, oh, thank you. I, I don't want a room. What then? I'm looking for uh, Mr. Harkness. Uh, Edward Harkness? Do you know him? Who are you? I'm a doctor. Are you his doctor? Well, then you do know him. Uh, no, I'm not his doctor. Did the police send you? The police? No. Or his family? No. Then what do you want him for? It's a private matter. Some people don't know what private means. Is he in trouble? Do you think he might be? Oh, please tell me. Perhaps I can help. Come inside. Did you get any information? Uh, I got rather more than that. Uh, here. Uh, Baker Street, please, cabby. Baker Street it is, sir. Hup, Guinevere. Right. Uh, I'm not the first person to come inquiring after Harkness. A man called at the beginning of last week. Mr. Teddy had been expecting him. He stayed in his room and told Mrs. Harris to send the man away and say she'd never heard of anyone by that name. Fascinating. Carry on. I got a description of Harkness. Mm. Not too tall, very handsome, jet black hair, skinny as a whippet. Yes. It's the dead man who materialized on the train. Well, sounds like him, doesn't it? How on earth did you get his name and address? I mean, I presume they were in that telegram, but who was it from? All of the timepieces bore the same manufacturer's mark, watchmakers in New York. I wired them asking if they had a sales representative in London. Wasn't that rather a long shot? Well, perhaps. Why else would a man be in possession of 13 watches, all of them different? They were resample. Uh, why would anyone murder a watch salesman? I doubt if he was killed because of his job. Did your Mr. Teddy have any friends or regular visitors? One. A deal over six foot, burly build, sandy hair, very sharp dresser. Murder victim number two. So, what's in the bag? Oh, change of linen, collars, cuffs, and toothbrush. Yes, this is the bag of a man who makes last minute trips or is expecting to have to make one. Then why didn't he take it with him? Good question. Oh, now. This is very interesting. Turn around. I beg your pardon? Turn around.
Oh, sorry, Inspector. Didn't know you were still here. I'm uh, just going through the file and see if there's anything I might have missed. Come in, boy. Come in. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, what did you make of him? Well, sir. Off the record, Sergeant. Between colleagues. Well, I've got to admit he's impressive. Those eyes of his. Till I met him, I didn't believe half the things I'd heard. And now? I reckon most of it could be gospel. He's the sort that gets results, no question. But frankly, sir, I don't think he'd last a week on the force. <laughs> You're right, uh, Make him work a few shifts at the yard and he'd break every regulation in the book. Some of us have to play by the rules. <sighs> we'll find her, sir. Bit of old-fashioned police work, that's what it needs. Hard slog and patience. <laughs> and lots of tea. <laughs> Sometimes I think I've got more tea than blood. Mind you, excellent drink. Very healthy, very good for you. Oh, yes. <laughs> Fancy a pint, dear? May I look yet? Patience, Doctor. Nearly there. Nearly where? Right, you can turn back now. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, well, <laughs> pull up a chair and open that pack of cards. That's a good chap. Right. Is this um, relevant to the case, or are we just whiling away the rest of the evening? Oh, it's, it's very relevant. Isn't it? Shuffle them, please. Mm -hmm. Ooh, highly professional. Card. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> I deal us a hand each. What do you have? Um, here. Ace, three, seven, nine, queen. Ooh, not a very good hand, but mine's no better. You see? Oh, that's a terrible hand. Is it? Look again. Good God. Three aces and a pair of kings. I win, I think. How on earth did you do that? Look. <laughs> what the devil's that? They call it a holdout. Strap it to your lower arm, load it up with whatever cards you please, activate it, and it delivers them straight into your hand and removes the originals. That's well, a good job you're on the side of the law. Huh. Unlike the late Mr. Harkness, who seems to have given up watch selling in favour of becoming a professional card shop. Uh, any luck? Yes. Young Stanley Hopkins was still on duty, and he let me look at the files. Oh, I told you it pays to be polite to the Scotland Yarders occasionally. What did you find out? That a new card gang has been working the hotels recently. Several men and one woman, according to the records. Several men? Yes, but the exact number's not clear. The only thing everyone agrees on is that they always work in pairs. Oh. Yeah, the woman and two of the men match our principal players. So all three of them are crooks? What about the man on the train, the man with the cigar? Could he be in this gang, too? Uh, I, I can't think properly in this place. It's too full of policemen. Let's clear our heads a little. Savour that, Doctor. The nearest thing to fresh air you'll find anywhere in the capital. Uh, <laughs> now, two of the gang were caught cheating at the Charing Cross Hotel and had to make a hasty exit. A tall, heavyset man and the woman described as small and slim. A mystery couple. When was this? Three days ago, the date of the murders. Perhaps Harkness knew about what happened at the hotel and went to join them on the run. Yes, it's a pity the guard only had a glimpse of cigar smoker. What was the landlady able to tell you about the mysterious caller? Oh, not much. It was a dark night and she only opened the door a crack. Do you think it's the same man? Well, it's a possibility. I won't go further than that just at the moment. Is there any way of tracking him down? Now, if I'm right, it won't be necessary. And now I should just home and a good night's rest. I have to go back to rugby first thing in the morning. Mm. <laughs> what is all about, Holmes? Mm. I don't take kindly to being summoned to a police station. I thought you'd want to be here, Sir Gregory. There's going to be a major development in the case. Well, there is, is there? And what development might that be? Inspector Jones, sir. Uh -huh. Excuse me, Sir Gregory, mm. gentlemen, but there's a man out front wants to see the inspector about the dead chap on the train. Says it's his brother. That development. 
My name's James Harkness, gentlemen. I'm from New York State. I saw Ted's picture in the paper. My condolences on your loss, Mr. Harkness. Quite. Thank you. You know, I, I don't understand any of this business. Jumping across from the other train, the, the fight. What was he thinking? Who, who were that couple? Mr. Harkness, were you the man who called at Radnor Street asking about your brother? How do you know about that? Answer the question, please. I was, sir, and I... I drew a blank. I reckoned he'd given us a false address. You'd come to this country because your brother had stopped communicating with you and his employers and because you were afraid that he'd lapse into his old ways again. Have you been spying on my family, sir? What I know is the result of logic and deduction. I believe that Edward Harkness fell into trouble with the law, probably in New York. You bailed him out. I didn't exactly bail him out. Let's say I made the problem go away. Money can do that back home. I'm not proud of it, but it had to be done. And you found him a job that took him safely overseas, selling watches, Jones. Mm -hmm. They were his samples. Oh, so he wasn't a lunatic then. Ted was a decent, God-fearing man till that villain Sam Forrest turned his head and put him on a crime. Seems Ted took straight to it. They were at it years before they finally made a mistake. Yes, I reckoned he might have drifted back into it again. So you came all the way over here to find out? He was my brother. I knew he'd be trying the same line as before, so I knew where to look and who to ask. I worked my way around the hotels and the clubs till eventually I struck lucky, and it turned out things were a lot worse than I'd thought. Give me that again. The other man? Great tall chap. Built like a heavyweight. Very nice suit. Accent like yours. <sighs> Hell's teeth. Sir? Uh, uh, nothing. Uh, here. Thanks. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. It was Sam Forrest. Couldn't have been anyone else. Seems I wasn't the only one who'd come halfway around the world looking for Ted. Successful criminals like to stick together. Is that so? Anyway, then I knew I was right. I carried on looking, but I had no luck. Not till I opened my paper this morning. No, that really won't do. What? Tell me what happened when you saw Forrest and the woman at Euston Station four days ago. What are you talking about? Please don't waste my time. You were on the train they caught to rugby. You were the man in the next compartment. What? Is this true, Harkness? The same highly distinctive ash you so sloppily left all over the seat is on your coat and your trousers right now. You smoked one of your gutto cigars in your handsome cab coming here this morning. You're calling me a liar and your proof cigar ash? That's part of my proof. I have five other indications which will interest a jury, but the ash is the most damning. Okay, I was there. But I've done nothing illegal. Well, if that's true, then tell us everything. It could go very badly for you if you don't. I found another bar where they'd been seen. The barkeep heard Forrest talking about how London was getting too hot and how this place called Rugby was supposed to be rich pickings. I thought I'd head there and wait on the platform for them, however long it took. The train was just about to pull out when the conductor opened the door to my compartment, and there he was. The lady prefers a non-smoker. Of course. Sorry to disturb you. Hmm. Now, don't you mention it. Did Forrest know you? Oh, yeah. And the woman? Do you know the woman? I reckon I gave the both of them something to think about. What happened? Come on, you've told us this much. You might as well give us the rest. I've said all I have to say. Oh, for God's sake, man. What's the point of stopping there? Perhaps I can continue the tale. <laughs> With more of your deductions. <laughs> With hard facts. That cigar of yours was very eloquent, Harkness. It told a tale a blind man could follow. Will you quit stalking around and sit down? That's better. Okay, he's here. He's seen us, but it doesn't matter. We'll easy give him the slip when we get to rugby. No problem. Hey, come on, cheer up. You're all right. Nothing's gonna happen. Forrest! You move from your compartment to theirs. 
You bloody fool, you might have been killed. That's not that hard. Much easier than going from one train to another, Jones. Well, why didn't he just wait until they got to rugby? Because what he wanted to say had to be said in private. Forrest! Get the hell away from my brother! Good grief. Yes, Kieran Gavith. Watson? I thought that might be it. Eliminate the impossible. Well done. Mm. There never was a woman. I suspected that from the first. Except that one simple truth. that Everything else falls into place. Harkness, I'm right, aren't I? Yes. Yes, you're right. It's disgusting. I take it your brother had his more conventional clothes with him. In a hold -off. I made him get into them. Didn't Forrest try to attack you or stop you at all? I was expecting it any second. But he just sat there and watched like he had a, a ringside seat. <sighs> That's better. At least you look more like a man now. I am a man. It's just a disguise. You're certain about that, are you? For God's sake, I was going to get changed all along. Sure you were. In case the law's waiting for us. Oh, great. They're on to you again, are they? And I suppose you think I'm going to clean up your mess for you just like last time? Jimmy, Quit I... whining. Put the dress and the other bits into the bag. Do it yourself. <sighs> all right. <sighs> now. Hey! Good riddance! Find that bag, and it'll confirm everything. But what you're getting's the straight deal. I'll swear to it if I have to. Oh, you'll have to, all right. But look, I don't understand. Why all this dressing up, this play acting, or whatever it was? Do you remember reports of a card sharp gang in the Capitol, Jones? An unknown number of men and one woman. Yes. Forrest and Harkness. A lot of them. Go to number 42 Radnor Street with a warrant and you'll find a wardrobe full of disguises. Track down Forrest's rooms and you'll find the same. Different personalities, so they could work the same places more than once. But uh, a woman? Why not? I've done it myself on occasion. Oh, good God. You do know it's against the law, don't you? Well, next time I'll let you know in advance so you can come and arrest oh, me. Oh, for pity's sake, you too. Holmes, what happened there? No, no, wait, wait. I want to finish this myself. Good. I couldn't think straight with those damn things in here. For the love of God! Close your mouth, Forrest, or I'll close it for you. I'd like to see you try. Shut up! Both of you, just shut up! Jimmy, what the hell do you want? What do you think? Ted, why did you let him sweet-talk you all over again? I got you a good job. You could have led a decent life. I like my life just fine the way it is. I like everything about it. And you just can't stomach that, can you, Jim boy? It really sticks in your throat. I told you to be quiet! Yeah? Well, you're not giving the orders anymore. Sammy, don't be a fool. Put that away. He's not so big now, is he, Teddy? Shaking in his boots. Who's the Mary Jane now, eh? <laughs> you damn pervert! Jimmy! No! no. no. Sammy! <laughs> And suddenly there he was, just lying there with his blood spreading out from under him like someone had turned on a faucet. My baby brother. Forrest looked down at the gun in his hand like he'd never seen one before. And then out of nowhere, he opened the door and jumped. I went after him without even thinking about it. I guess neither of us was exactly in our right mind. You both landed on your feet, leaving two sets of unmistakably masculine marks, which you really should have bothered to look at, Jones. They landed on their feet? From an express going at 50 miles an hour? Ah, but it wasn't. Not at that point. Oh, come on. How can you possibly know that? You saw the evidence for yourself, but you didn't realise the significance. The significance of what? Of the train that passed when we were examining Forrest's body. It had slowed right down. I didn't understand why until I climbed up to the line. That stretch of track was new. The ballast was fresh and clean. And there's a strict speed restriction on all newly repaired lines. As I surmise. So, quite by chance, the two of them didn't break their necks, but slipped unhurt down to the bottom of the embankment. Mr. Harkness. Yeah, that's it. You might have been there. And what happened then? You're not going to believe me, but I swear on the book it's a God's honest truth. Oh. 
You... You murdering Marjorie! I'll kill you for that! No. No, you won't. He turned the pistol on himself. And you took the gun, emptied his pockets, and left. That's exactly what I did. Like I said, I guess I just wasn't thinking straight. Uh, what do you say, Doc? Temporary insanity? A shock, certainly. Understandable enough. Right. Understandable. Well, sir, you're the officer of the law here. What happens now? Mr. Holmes. Inspector Jones. If young Harkness had turned his back on his old job, why did he still have the watches? They were too valuable to throw away and too easily traceable to sell, well, in London at least. Yeah, yes, but why carry them around? Once he knew his brother was in the capital, he didn't dare leave them in his rooms. If Mr. Harkness had persevered and managed to get inside there. I'd have known straight away I was on the right track. Hmm. Anything else you don't understand, Jones? Uh, just one thing. How did you know that this man would be turning up here today? My wire from the watch company in New York. They told me their salesman had disappeared, that his family was concerned and that his brother had gone to England. I reasoned that he'd see the pictures in today's papers. He wasn't mentioned in any of the reports, so I knew he'd think he was safe. But good grief! Why did you come here at all? Why risk it? You have to ask? What sort of man are you? To see that his brother had a decent burial. <sighs> Thank you, sir. Oh, I see. Well, I think that covers everything. James Harkness. Inspector. You said you'd done nothing illegal. I did. <laughs> you were wrong. We'll start with failing to report two shootings, robbing a corpse, and removing evidence from the scene of a crime, shall we? Come with me, please. If you'll all excuse me. Gentlemen. This way. Ah, Mr. Holmes. Doctor, I'm grateful to you. Come on. Uh, Mr. Holmes, that was remarkable. Thank you. I'm pleased to have brought your case to a satisfactory conclusion. Yes. Uh, dear old gentleman, <clears throat> a word with you both. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. By what? By the fact that money and position have just as much power here as they do in America. Hushing things up just to prevent a scandal for his railway company. Don't the public deserve to know the truth? The truth? An accidental shooting, a suicide and some petty misdemeanors. Why tie up the legal system over that? The players aren't even English. The courts have far more important matters to deal with. Is that why you agreed to be uh, discreet? What other reason could there be? How about saving the families the shame of seeing the story splashed across the gutter press? The whole story, I mean? An incidental side effect of no concern to me. No, of course not. <laughs> A good thing, though. <laughs> well, what's amusing? Yeah, I, was just, I was just thinking uh, about Jones. As far as the world's concerned, his brilliant theory is still completely valid and he's busy searching for the mysterious missing woman who will explain the whole affair. So, once again, Scotland Yard comes out of it well. Yeah, give him enough time and he'll probably convince himself that it's all true and keep looking for her, which would at least keep him out of our hair for a while. <laughs> true enough. <sighs> to the everlasting tenacity... Of Detective Inspector Thelney Jones. Yours up for your business. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, I'd rather miss him. I wouldn't. In The Thirteen Watchers, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Sir Gregory Backwater was played by Nigel Anthony, Inspector Athelney Jones by Sean Probert, John Harkness by Stuart Milligan, Ted Harkness by Robert Lonsdale, Sam Forrest by Inna Mirza, 
The Landlady by Don Le Hughes, and The Sergeant by Dan Starkey. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Thirteen Watchers was written by Bert Coos and was suggested by a reference in The Noble Bachelor by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and also by his story, The Man with the Watchers. The director was Patrick Rayner. You do it, Tom, Inspector. What now? Stand up, please, Mr. Ferrers. Oh, Mr. Ferrers, is it? That's more like it. Are you going to be polite to me too, Lestrade? Not from choice, I'm not, no. Well, there's a surprise. What do you want? You're free to go, sir. Gentlemen! Gentlemen! As I have said all through this sorry affair, I am a benefactor, not a murderer. Then who do you think killed Mr Radcliffe? That's Th all. Thank you, gentlemen. Alice? I've got a cab waiting. My father's had a very trying few days and he needs to rest. Mr Ferris, would you say that justice has been done? Yes. I said that's all! Thank you. Come on, Father. What about you, Miss Ferris? Any comments? Oh, save your breath, Jack. I have a statement to make. Well, who the devil are you, sir? My name is George Radcliffe. Don't expect me to say that justice has been done. My father was killed. Murdered because he dared to speak out against that man. My father believed that the guilty should be made to pay for their crimes. And so do I. The Ferrers Documents by Bert Cools, with Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson and featuring Stephen Thorne as Inspector Lestrade and Thomas Arnold as Constable Dawkins. The Ferrers Documents. Come on, sir. Chin up. Damn it, Tom. Years I've been after that man. I really thought this time... You'll get your chance. Here. Thanks. Oh, I hope you're right. Well, maybe you are. Never say die, eh? That's the spirit, sir. Never say die. To nailing Ferrers. To nailing Ferrers. Hmm. Mr. Holmes, I, I assume you're familiar with the circumstances of my husband's death? Uh, to a certain extent, Mrs. Radcliffe. I thought you always followed such things. Oh, George, please. Well, that's what it says in those stories. And Mr. Holmes has been engaged on another case. So I know only what has appeared in the papers, which is remarkably little. In the early hours of the morning just over a week ago, as your husband was returning from a public meeting in Aldgate, he was attacked in the street and fatally stabbed. Yes. You have our sympathies, both of you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the late Mr Radcliffe was widely respected for his campaign against the slum housing in the east end of the capital. The subject of his address on the night in question was Mr Robert Ferrers, the owner of a large number of common lodging houses and other buildings in the area. Ruins not fit for pigs. Uh, your anger does you credit. Somebody has to care about these things. I intend to carry on with my father's work. Well, then I recommend a cooler head and a less emotional approach. You must forgive him, Mr Holmes. This is a difficult time. Perhaps so, but it's logic and reason which defeats criminals, not temper and irrationality. Hmm? Now, three days after the attack, the police arrested Ferrers for the crime. Why? What was their evidence? They had a witness. A woman came forward and said she'd seen the whole thing. And she identified Ferrers as the killer. She was absolutely certain it was him. Well, then why was he released? The woman disappeared. And it's not hard to work out what happened to her, is it? 
Well, it doesn't have to be Sherlock Holmes. Ferris had her killed too. Uh, Mr Radcliffe, anything said in this room remains confidential, but I strongly advise you not to make statements like that in public. Do the police believe she's dead? No. According to Mr Lestrade, they're still searching for her. But I, I could see in his eyes that he thinks it's hopeless. Because the woman is a prostitute. How could you possibly know that? No respectable female would be out alone at that hour and in that place. Therefore, she was not a respectable female. So, no fixed address and probably using an assumed name. Impossible to trace. Ferrers found her easily enough. Or his thugs did. Or she simply thought twice about testifying and decided to change her name again and disappear. Whatever the facts, without her testimony, Lestrade evidently has nothing. And so my father's killer walks free. Will you take our case, sir? An unremarkable murder. Oh, for God's sake! Well, I state the facts. A crime with no singularity, no distinguishing features, in an area noted for petty assaults. Mr Radcliffe, your father wasn't the first to speak out against Ferrers. No, certainly not. You know, the man simply shrugs off such things. Why did he feel particularly threatened by your father? Why should he feel the need to kill him? That, sir, is what we were hoping you'd find out for us. It seems that our faith was misplaced. George! I'll be waiting downstairs. The great detective. Ah. I'm so sorry. There is one possibility. Mr Holmes? If your husband did discover something truly criminal against Ferrers, but hadn't yet made it public... But Ferrers somehow knew about it. Yes, that had occurred to me. That was perceptive of you. Have you looked for anything of the sort? Oh, yes. I, I went through all Jonathan's notes, his files, everything. I found nothing. Well, he might have kept something that important more securely than the rest of the material. Mm, perhaps in a different location. That's excellent, Watson. Mrs. Radcliffe, my advice to you is to look again. And if anything comes to light? Well, then, by all means, let us know straight away. Well, is he going to help us? You were insufferably rude, young man. Is he going to help? He gave me some very useful advice. Now, please call a cab. I want to go home. Oh, there they go. Poor woman. Oh. Well, what about that prostitute, huh? Perhaps she didn't change her mind. Perhaps she just lied to gain some attention. No, oh, that and a couple of hours in the warmth of the yard and some of the strayed tea and biscuits, and, well, and then she thought better of it. So it was a simple robbery with violence? Ah, oh, perhaps, yes. You're not sure? Well, I... I need more facts. I thought you weren't taking the case. Well, for my own satisfaction. Ah, you're interested in Ferris? I want to see the man who inspired such loathing in Mr. Radcliffe Jr. That's a remarkable level of hatred against an individual he hardly knows. Thank you for agreeing to see me. Why should I not? I have nothing to hide. An impressive display. You didn't come here to talk about my orchids, Mr. Holmes. No. Then let's get on with it. You've been asked to inquire into the death of Mr. Jonathan Radcliffe, probably by his widow, and you've come to see if I look like a murderer. It's my experience, Mr. Ferrers, that murderers look exactly the same as everyone else. Well, then, do you propose to ask me if I killed him? Did you? No, sir, I did not. I regret his death. As far as I could see, he was a good man, sincere, but like so many good men, he was also naive. Are you familiar with the poorer parts of this city? Intimately. Then you know that those wretched people can be helped only one step at a time. Their most urgent needs are for shelter, beds and enough food to keep them from starving. I provide the first two at a price which allows them to afford the third. And I'm pilloried for it by do-gooders who want to see the entire population of the East End housed in the Savoy by this time next week. Yes, sir. Excuse me, Father. Mr Holmes, I'm sorry, I've only just been told you were here. Good afternoon, Miss Ferrers. May I order you some tea? Thank you, no. Stop fussing, girl. Leave us. In a moment. Mr Holmes... I told you to leave us. When I've had my say. Mr Holmes, my father isn't well. Please don't exhaust him. You may rest assured of that. Thank you, sir. I'll be close by if you should need me. 
She seems to think I'm made of eggshells. Well, Mr. Holmes, have you learned enough? Yes, Mr. Ferrers. I believe I have. Hmm. Are you sure you won't have some more? Oh, to be truthful, I, I don't have much of an appetite. Well, I won't save the London poor by going without yourself. Maybe not, but I might at least feel a bit better about things. I applaud your sentiment, if not your logic. <coughs> Ferrers sees himself as the saviour of the homeless masses. He put up a, a perfectly reasonable argument. The devil quoting scripture. Hmm. Perhaps. One thing about the family will please you. What? They read the Strand magazine. Mm. Oh, so does half of London. Do you think he did it? Based on what we know so far, no, I don't. The daughter is interesting. I didn't know there was a daughter. Around 30, unmarried, unusually strong will for a woman. Interesting. It's all right, Sarah, I'll get it. Well, I suggest you say what you've come to say and then leave. I suppose it was foolish of me to expect a civil reception. Please come in, Miss Ferrers. Would you care for some tea? Uh, thank you, Mrs. Radcliffe. No. I've come to give you some advice. What makes you think I'm in need of advice? If I were in your position... Uh, if you were in my position, you'd be newly widowed and facing an uncertain future. Yes. I'm sorry. But you're trying to reopen the case against my father. How do you know that? I urge you not to. What possible good could come of it? Justice. Uh, good evening, Mr. Radcliffe. Justice for my mother's husband. Justice for his family. Justice for any other good men who are no longer alive George. because they threatened your father's cosy way of life. And yours. I shall overlook that slander. <laughs> But, please believe me, it really wouldn't be a good idea for you to accuse my father again. And if we do, what will happen? I've said all I intend to say. Please take my advice. Good evening to you both. Mm. And will you tell Mrs. Radcliffe that you spoke to Ferrers? Only if she finds something that incriminates him. Do you think she will? No. I believe you've heard the last of this whole affair. Yes, I think you're right. <sighs> oh, I'm, I'm going to bed. I shan't disturb you. No, 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 of course not. Good night. Good night. me. I, I warn you, I, I'm armed. Hello, Mother. What in the world do you think you're doing? I'd have thought that was obvious. I'm taking that man's useful advice. I'm looking for whatever it was that Father discovered. But, but, but this time in the morning, are you insane? <laughs> so everyone seems to think. Why are you wearing a coat? Have you been out? Oh, very good. Yes, I've been out. Out and about. Drunk! And look at the state of you! What have you been doing? Don't question me, Mother! I'm the head of the house now, you know. Georgie! Don't call me that! I'm not a child anymore! I'm going to bed. <laughs> Watson. Watson, wake up. 
What time is it? Approaching 5.15. Mm. Into your clothes and downstairs, Doctor. There is some urgency. Uh, well, well, what's happened? A note from Lestrade. He's waiting for us in a derelict house in the East End. Why, for heaven's sake? Because Robert Ferrers has been murdered. Good morning, Lestrade. Mr. Holmes, Doctor. Inspector, I appreciate your sending for me. The daughter told me you'd been round there asking questions. I want to know exactly how you're involved. And I'll be delighted to tell you, but perhaps it can wait. Uh, you'd better come inside. Watch yourselves, though, and stay close to my light. Uh, this place isn't safe. Yes. Oh, oh. oh it's a wonder it's still standing. Uh, when was the fire? Uh, at least five years ago from the state of the wood. Six. Nasty affair. Lot of deaths. Thirteen families wiped out. And that wasn't all. It's in here, gentlemen, and it isn't pleasant. Uh -huh. Oh. That's a savage attack. I can't be sure in this light, but I think there's at least 20 separate stab wounds. Uh, may I have the lantern? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, uh, you two wait here, please. Oh. Who found the body? An old woman. Lives rough here. Who else has been in this room since the murder? Her, the constable she called, me and Dawkins. Dawkins? Oh, me, Doctor. Detective Constable Tom Dawkins. Good morning. Good morning. I've got the men out knocking on doors, sir. See if anyone heard anything. Good lad. It's an honour to meet you, Mr Holmes. I've studied all your cases in the Strand. I hope you can tell fact from fiction. <laughs> Nothing fictional about that body. Oh, I didn't want this. I wanted to nail Ferrers fair and square. But the state of his buildings? Well, that's part of it. Some of them are death traps. Well, just look around. Well, this was one of his. It's what they call poetic justice, isn't it? But it's not just the buildings. It's, it's what goes on in them. If you were a villain looking for a hideaway or a place to stash loot, Ferrers was your man. How is it you never put him away? He was clever, Doctor. Always managed to stay one step in front of the law. Well, you've got him now, however it happened. Oh, how it happens, plain enough. Someone lured him here, or forced him here, one of the two, then just went for him. Well, there must have been quite a struggle. Now, that's the old thing. What is? The fact that there are no signs of any sort of fight. Strange, isn't it, sir? First thing I noticed. Excellent. Have you nearly finished here, Lestrade? Just waiting for the cart to move the body. Then we'll see you back at the yard. Uh, what, Watson? Yes. remarkable. No struggle. Uh, no signs of a struggle. The absence of clues can be a valuable clue in itself. What do you mean? The killer went to a great deal of effort to clean up the scene. He wiped the floor, then spread fresh dust and ashes. When we get there, I'll wait upstairs for the strain. Hmm? You go to the mortuary and wait for the body. A good look in decent light should tell us a lot. See him this clearly at the scene. We're looking for a madman. Mm, quite a wide blade. Double edged. That's odd. What is? Well, look there. And, and there. Actually, it's on almost all the wounds. You see? Um, there, that, that mark. Sort of square indentation at one end of the cut. You're right, sir. What does it mean? I'm not sure. But it's unusual, and anything unusual is valuable. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting too old for this cracker dawn stuff. Hmm. Watson told me once he wished criminals would operate to a convenient timetable. Very tidy, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it just? But there's about as much chance of me becoming chief constable. Stuck behind a desk all day, you'd hate it. No, oh, I don't know. Out in the field, that's a young man's game. Dawkins will do well for himself. Bright lad. Yeah, so, how do you come to be mixed up with the Ferrers family? Mrs Radcliffe came to Baker Street. With that hot-headed son of hers? He was there, yes, making his feelings very clear. Did you know that he threatened Ferrers in front of a crowd? No, but I can't say I'm surprised. Criminals should be made to pay for their crimes. 
What do you think? He was completely convinced of the man's guilt. And he has the passion and the strength. Yes. Ah, the stupid young fool. They left you alone, Doctor? Oh, I think they trust me not to steal anything. That's your impeccable bedside manner. Rather wasted under the circumstances. Yes, I suppose so. Anything interesting? Definitely. Now, <clears throat> look at the wounds. Ah, yes, wide-bladed knife. It's two-edged. Exceedingly sharp and not too long. Mm -hmm. yes, on, on most of these cuts, I... Our killer drove the blade in right up to the hilt. Leaving those curious indentations. Yes. What do you think caused them? Well, presumably they were made by the cross guard. Then why only at one end? Uh, the design isn't symmetrical or the knife's damaged. Either way, it's a distinctive weapon. Do any of the Strade's men know about the marks? I pointed them out to Dawkins. Ah, the shining protégé. What did he make of them? Not as much as you. Good. Come on, we must get home. We should just have time for a quick breakfast before Mrs. Radcliffe calls again. Oh, she's coming back? Why? Mr. Lestrade has arrested George. Yes, I rather thought he would. Uh, does he have any evidence against my son? That's a most interesting question. What do you mean? It suggests, Mrs. Radcliffe, that you believe such evidence might actually exist. Oh, dear Lord. I think you'd better tell us exactly what happened last night. I went to a pub. More than one. We'll need the names. And after you'd had a skinful, what then? I just walked. I was angry. I, I wanted to... I don't know. I wanted to think. About Robert Ferrers? Yes. And about what he did to your father? Yes. So you went to where he lives, threatened him with a knife, took him to the ruined house and killed him? No. No. Describe the state he was in. He was intoxicated. His clothes were in disarray. It looked as if he'd fallen down. Or been in a fight. Does your son own a dagger? A dagger? No, of course not. Uh, your late husband? Certainly not. He was a man of peace. Well, unless Lestrade comes up with some hard evidence, I don't think he'll be detaining your son for very long. Yes, but... But you want me to prove George's innocence. Not just for Lestrade, but for you. That's exactly it. May God forgive me. Uh, why are we back here? I wanted a more leisurely look round in better light. Ah! ah. What do you think of that? Well, there are broken bits of wood all over this side. Not like this one. Look at this edge. Ah, uh, looks like ash. It is ash. It's forced into the grain, but the wood itself isn't so much as charred. This is the plank he used to wipe the traces from the floor. How on earth did you know it would be there? Because I hadn't found it anywhere else. Right, I'm going to take this back to Baker Street and have a proper look at it, then head for the newspaper library. Hmm. And I? Thank you for receiving me, Miss Ferrers. I appreciate your condolences, Doctor. Well, surely others have called? The neighbours? They don't know yet. Or if they've heard, they don't care. It's even possible that they're glad. Surely not. My father wasn't a popular man. The source of his wealth was no secret. And this, as we are so frequently informed, is a respectable street for respectable people. Hmm. Um, would you mind very much if I asked you about last night? I'm afraid I can't tell you anything helpful. If there'd been a disturbance, would it have woken you? Oh, yes, without question. And the servants, too. But none of us heard a thing. You were right. She is interesting. Did you find out about the family? Uh, yes. Uh, the mother's dead. There are no sons, and she's the only daughter. Hmm. So presumably she inherits the empire. Hmm. Thank you, Doctor. Excellent work. Thank you. How was your afternoon? Uh, not quite so productive. I'll tell you about it on the way to the yard. Here. Mm -hmm. A summary of the press reports on that fire. Ah. Why are you interested in that? 
as the site obviously holds great significance for our murderer. It couldn't have been easy to get Ferris there, so why bother if the place isn't important? That makes sense. Hmm. Uh -huh. It's not pleasant reading. Whole families in single rooms, staircases rotten, most of the windows and the back door nailed shut. Why do that? To prevent unauthorised exits when the local supervisor called for the rents. So when the fire started, most of those people had the slightest chance of getting out. I had hoped to discover the names of the victims, but I was unlucky. None of the papers listed them. Oh, why should they? Just the anonymous East End poor? And it wasn't just the residents who died? No, at least four firemen and two passers-by perished as well. Oh. Trying to get people out. Heroes. Dead heroes. Here you are, Inspector. Thanks, Tom. That's all the top clothes he had on last night. Ah, very good. Hmm. Ah, excellent. What have you seen? It's a question of what I haven't seen. What were you after? A pair of reddish-brown woolen gloves, very slightly damaged between the thumbs and index fingers. I should know better than to ask after all these years. Would you mind telling me why? Because whoever cleaned up the crime scene wore such a pair of gloves. How on earth do you know that, sir? The murderer used an old wooden plank to scrape the ground clear of footmarks. I have that plank at Baker Street. Well, of course you have. When I looked at it through my lens, I found a number of tiny fibres snagged in the wood. Reddish-brown wool in two places, some 24 inches apart on one of the long sides. The conclusion's obvious. That's where it was gripped as our killer dragged it across the floor. Oh, that's wonderful, Mr Holmes. Radcliffe threw the gloves away. Why? He'd have no idea how incriminating they were. The fibres are too small to see with a naked eye. Mr Holmes, are you seriously asking me to release my prime suspect on the strength of something that I can't even see? Yes, I am. I'll be a laughing stock. Inspector, what will it do for your reputation when your second arrest in a row collapses for lack of hard evidence? Gah. I can hold the boy for another 24 hours without charging him. And that's what I intend to do. You made a good case for the boy's innocence. Not really. Oh, what do you mean? Well, he could have got rid of the gloves because they were stained with blood or ashes, or simply because they reminded him of what he'd done once he returned to his senses. Will Lestrade think of that? No, I believe he'll release him. That's what I'm hoping for. Because it will please his mother? No, that's not the reason. I'd prefer not to elaborate, just at the present. Somehow I thought you'd say that. So, what now? I'm going to go home and smoke and think. It's at least a two-pipe problem. Can you entertain yourself until tonight? Ah, Doctor. I hope you passed a pleasant afternoon. At my club. Huh. Have you made any progress? A little. Good. Here, this is for you. I arrived at the door at the same time as a messenger boy. It's from young Dawkins. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, well, well. You remember Lestrade's lost witness from the Radcliffe murder in Allgate? She's been found. Why does that concern us? Because she's dead. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it, but even so. Stabbed more than two dozen times with a wide-bladed dagger. Nothing's been touched, Mr. Holmes. Here. Thank you. I'll see about the cart. I shan't need long. Well, an interesting development, wouldn't you say? Poor woman. What does it mean? Two things. Firstly, I was wrong. There is a connection between the Radcliffe killing and Ferrer's death. And secondly? It's this murder which is the key to the whole thing. Now, let's take a look. Yes, you see? Exactly the same imprints as on Ferrer's. And the same sort of ferocity. Oh, good God, she's hardly more than a child. Let's confine ourselves to what's relevant, shall we? No blood spatter on the wall, no sign of anything used to shield the killer, and no footprints on this surface. There's no need for a plank this time. Uh, look at this. There's something in her hand. Uh, scrap of paper. Ah, there's writing on it. Would you mind? No, oh, thank you. Let's see if I can release it without 
breaking her fingers. Ah, uh, Holmes, you're tampering with evidence. Yes, evidence which even the excellent Dawkins seems to have missed. Her. Ah. Well, well. Fascinating. What does it say? It says 221B, Baker Street. She was coming to us. Someone advised her to see me and gave her the address. If we could discover who it was, we might be able to find out why she was coming. Stop here, please, cabby. Don't wait for me. No! Don't cut me! I'll do it! You'll remember the message. Mr. J's compliments, and if you show your face... Your ugly, interfering face. I can't say that. Your ugly, interfering face on his turf again, he'll... Uh, break your legs. Break your legs in so many places, you'll be able to roll them up and put them in your pocket. Very good. Oh. Now get out of my sight. Most impressive. Who's there? Come out. If perhaps a touch convention. Sherlock Holmes. Shinwell Johnson. Good to see you, sir. What can I do you for this time? The woman's real name was Catherine Long. She went to Johnson because he has a reputation in the East End for helping anyone in trouble. By sending them to you? Yes, if he thinks their problem will interest me. And what was her problem? She'd been persuaded to give false information to the police about the Ratcliffe murder. Then <laughs> threatened with violence if she backed out. Which she did. Brave woman. According to Johnson, the girl was terrified. Absolutely terrified. With good reason, obviously. Did she tell him who was behind it? Unfortunately not. Then we'll never know. Oh, don't be so pessimistic, Doctor. When your road is closed, the logical thing to do is take an alternative route. Get your hat. We're going back to the Radcliffe house. Right, Mr Radcliffe. You're free to go. What's happened? The killer's struck again. So you know it wasn't me, thank God. Wait, who's been killed? Not my mother. You'll find out soon enough. The inspector wants a word. The witness is dead. I'm afraid so. And we've no idea why she chose to disappear. So now you'll never be able to prove who murdered my father. Without the woman, we've no evidence at all. Oh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. Mr Holmes? I've just come from your mother's house, Mr Radcliffe. She was kind enough to let me examine her husband's study. And? And I found what I expected to find. A hidden compartment in his desk. And in it, this. What is that? The late Mr Radcliffe's proof that Robert Ferrers was a criminal. So it did exist. Does it say that father confronted him with it? Oh, it says a great many things, some of them extremely unexpected. Your father documented every aspect of Ferrers' life in the most minute detail. A man after my own heart. I'll take that then, please. I'd prefer to hang on to it for now. But it's vital evidence, sir. Yes, which needs a good deal of collating and interpreting. Give me one day and I'll be able to present you with a whole picture. Mr Holmes. Lestrade, I'm asking you to trust me. In 24 hours you know everything and I shall remove myself entirely from the case. All the credit will be yours. I don't know. Dawkins, this doesn't go beyond this room, right? Of course not, sir. Thank you. Twenty-four hours, and for God's sake, don't let that out of your sight. Who else knows about it? I'm the only one who's seen the contents. Its existence is known to us, Mrs Radcliffe and Watson, and in a few minutes, one other. Dr Watson, good evening. Good evening, Miss Ferrers. I wonder if I might come in. I have some information I think you should hear.
Good morning, Detective Constable Dawkins. What's on the lights? Get your hands off me! Give it up! Dawkins, it's over! I don't think so! Holmes! Dawkins, unless you want a bullet through your brain, I suggest you drop the knife. Drop it! Holmes, are you all right? Yes, I, I believe it looks worse than it is. Pity. Not a word from you, thank you. Anyway, it's a small price to pay. Look at this dagger. My case is complete. Get in there! Ah! Is that any way to treat a prisoner? Shut up! Or you'll get a lot worse. Easy, Lestrade. With respect, Doctor, I'll handle this my way. Dawkins, get on your feet! Get up. Right. Now we'll do this properly. Thomas Dawkins, you've been detained under suspicion of the willful murder suspicion? of... Suspicion? You mean you're not sure? I told you to keep quiet. Lestrade, I suggest you let him talk. And I suggest you listen to Mr Holmes. Isn't that how you get most of your results? <laughs> Talk. <coughs> Just what do you want me to say? Ah, for God's sake. Tell us about your father. My father was a great man. A hero. Who died in the line of duty. Was he in the force? No. He was a fireman. He perished trying to rescue survivors from the conflagration in Ferrer's boarding house. And his son has been out for revenge ever since. And proud of it. I've done nothing I'm ashamed of. Good God above. Come on then, Mr Holmes. Let's have one of your brilliant speeches. Sum up the case, lay out the evidence, confound the guilty. I think he waited patiently for the opportunity to strike at Ferrers, and when Jonathan Radcliffe was killed, and it was just a random attack, Lestrade, nothing more, you saw your chance. The man you hated was an obvious candidate for the murder. All that was needed was some hard evidence. The witness? Did you pay that girl to come forward? Oh, very good. Yes, I did. Paid her well, too, double-crossing drab. But you refused to commit perjury and condemn an innocent man. You call what he did innocent? Can you honestly stand there and tell me that Ferris didn't kill my father? Yes, I can. Not according to the law. Then the law's not enough. Perhaps not, but it's the best we've got. And that has to do. You've gone beyond the law before now. I don't recall ever hearing about you being behind bars. I made you release, Ferrers. What must you have been thinking? That I was tired of waiting. So you went to his house in the early hours and forced him at knife point to get dressed and go with you to the ruin. Why didn't he put up a struggle or call for help? Oh, the man was a coward. A weak coward. He could barely stand, let alone fight. Lestrade, I'll do you a favour. All these years, you've been after the wrong person. Ferrers ran the houses, but it's the daughter who's behind everything else. Oh, he did eventually show some spirit, but he was no match for me. And it was then that your control snapped and you turned into a frenzied killer. Yes. It was one of the most fascinating experiences of my life. It was me, and it wasn't me. It was as if I was standing back, watching myself. I felt like you, Mr. Holmes, observing, noting the evidence. The dust and the ashes showed quite clearly what had happened. So I tidied everything up. What did you do with the gloves? They're burnt now. Thanks for the advice. Until you spoke up, it hadn't occurred to me that they could incriminate me. Seems I've still got a lot to learn. Why did you have to butcher the girl? Because I found out she was going to you two. I've got my own informants out on the street, you know. Something else I learned from you. Don't you dare compare yourself to Mr Holmes. <laughs> Why not? I have a damn sight more in common with him than you have. You disgusting little... Oh, Lestrade, enough's enough. Ah. When I discovered Radcliffe's dossier on Ferrers with all its detailed information, you knew there was a good chance that it mentioned your father by name. It was the only thing that linked me to Ferris. So naturally, I had to destroy it. I made a good burglar. Except for the small detail, but you walked right into my trap. As I said, still a lot to learn. Well, did it? 
Did it what? Did Radcliffe's evidence implicate me? I brought it along for you, Lestrade. Ah. Yeah, see for yourself, Dawkins. <laughs> What's so damn funny? <laughs> oh, that's so clever. Oh, oh, it's wonderful. Almost worthy of me. Thank you. Well, <laughs> what is this? What's he talking about? Probably the fact that those papers are all blank. How long had you known about Dawkins' father? Uh, the name cropped up in one of the newspaper reports. But if you knew about the link, why set that trap? Well, it might have been pure coincidence. I, I could have set out as good a case against the Radcliffe boy or the dead man's daughter come to that. So that's why you had me tell Alice Ferrers about the evidence? Which I've no doubt you did with your customary sincerity. Well, of course I did, since at that stage you hadn't bothered to tell me it was all fake. It was essential that she believe you. She could, she could well have been the killer. Uh, mind you, there was one highly significant piece of evidence. Ah, here we are. I knew I had a picture of it somewhere. Ah, you see? Ah. Wide tapering blade, not too long, and that cross piece. Square section, curled up at one end and down at the other. Well, what sort of knife is it? I've never seen anything like it before. Yes, it's an unusual feature, isn't it? That guard, mm. found in some French and Italian weapons from the late 16th century, but preserved in only one place now. What you're looking at is a picture of the ceremonial dress dagger of a London fireman. Good heavens. Shh. Well, he obviously saw it as the perfect instrument for revenge. Yes, well, uh, there is a certain logic to it. Yes. <laughs> what a waste. What, Ferrers? The girl? No, oh, Dawkins. That mind, that intelligence, it could have risen high. What sort of mind is it that kills a man simply because he happens to own a particular house? Murders have been committed for far less. Ah. Sobering, isn't it? to think that one isolated incident can ruin so many lives. There's no armour against fate, as the old poet said. Ring for some tea, there's a good chap. In The Ferrers Documents, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Constable Dawkins was played by Thomas Arnold, Inspector Lestrade by Stephen Thorne, Robert Ferrers by Jonathan Taffler, Alice Ferrers by Don Le Hughes, George Radcliffe by Gunnar Cawthory, Mrs. Radcliffe by Janice Aqua, and Shinwell Johnson by Dan Starkey. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Ferrer's Documents was written by Bert Cools from a reference in the short story The Priory School by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. or drowned, or, or blown out to sea, or eaten by a whale. There are no whales here. One might have come. Wait. Watch. Have patience. There. Where? <laughs> it's him! Has he got one? Of course. He's got one! Oh, he's so clever. Here he comes. Mrs. Chang? Yes? Why does he always come back? Why doesn't he just fly away? <laughs> Take the fish. Yes. That's right. 
Good boy. Keep still. Yes. <laughs> clever bird. Oh, clever. Clever bird. Mrs. Chang. Mr. Jefferson. I wish I could just fly away. The Malbon Point Mystery by Bert Cools. With Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson and featuring James Lawrenson as Mycroft Holmes. The Malbon Point Mystery, Part 1. Watson, are you busy? Are you about to suggest we do something? Well, yes, I am. Will it involve your playing the violin? No. Then I'm completely free. <laughs> Good. Get your hat for going out. Oh. Is this some... Um, is this to do with your latest case? The mystery of the bogus laundry van? Oh, you know, I, I'll have to find a better title. I wouldn't bother. There's not a story in it. I've solved it here. I'm going to send this to the yard. Yes, uh... Arrest laundry man's apprentice. Necklace is in horse's feed bag. Mm. But you haven't left the house since Lestrade was here last night. A measure of how utterly elementary the whole business was. Is that why we're going out? Just to send a telegram? Not only that. We've been summoned. Summoned? By whom, for goodness sake? Sherlock, my dear. Mycroft. We see far too little of you at the Diogenes Club, brother. You're looking well, Doctor. Mr. Holmes? <laughs> Took you less time than I expected, Sherlock. To come at your whistle. Oh, no, please, it was an invitation, no more. An invitation with the full force of Her Majesty's government behind now, it. Now, now, don't pretend that that made any difference. We both know why you're really here. I've no idea what you're talking no, 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 about. That, that can wait. Did you observe the new doorman? Of course, the retired sergeant major. Recovering gamely from the desertion of his wife. And taking consolation from his three children. The eldest of whom is currently overseas. With the East India Company. Which he joined against his father's wishes. At least two years ago. At three, dear boy, three. Really? Ah, the type-in. The type-in. <laughs> <laughs> of course, well done. Any questions, Watson? Only the obvious one. Would either of you care to explain all that? Perhaps later. <laughs> Sit down, please. Oh, thank you. Good. Now, <clears throat> Sherlock, you've, you've nothing in hand just at the moment. Well, on the contrary. Oh, well, that paltry business with the laundry van. Have you been spying on me? No, it's perfectly obvious that the jewels are in the feed bag and the undermaid's in league with the apprentice. And since I see from your right shirt cuff that you stopped off at a telegraph office on the way here, you've already informed Scotland Yard. You, brother, are as free as air and already bored, and came here in the hope that I might be able to rectify that situation. Am I right? <laughs> Doctor? Well... Exactly. And I can. Would you both care for a sherry? Yeah, <laughs> Mycroft. No, I, I thought you'd appreciate a spot of dramatic tension. No, oh, very well. What you need, Sherlock, is a few days at the seaside. I beg your pardon. I recommend the Kent coast. Well, what do you think? Ah, it's too soon to think anything. Not enough data. You have to admit, though, it does sound intriguing. Well, come on. <laughs> yes, it does rather, doesn't it? And it seems that Mycroft has his uses after all. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you'll enjoy this, and I recommended it to the club myself. Mm. 
That's excellent. Sherlock? The Kent Coast. Ah, yes. Yes, a place called Malbon Point. Do you know it? No. Oh, I can't say I'm surprised. It used to be a fishing community, but it uh, declined. These days, it's just a collection of ramshackle huts on a shingled headland. And why is this place of interest to the government? Oh, my dear. It isn't, not in the least. Now, this is entirely unofficial. There is one thing we can be sure of. And that is? That my brother didn't tell us the whole story. Not by any means. Very well, it's unofficial. What exactly has happened at Malbourne Point? A suicide and a murder. Well, surely that's a matter for the local police. Well, this is well beyond their capabilities. Scotland Yard, then? Hmm. <laughs> They know nothing of it. No, no doubt, because someone's prevented the local force from reporting it to London. Prevented is rather harsh. Let's say persuaded. At least until you've had a chance to take a look. And that same someone's also managed to keep the business out of the press. What's so special about this particular suicide and murder? The fact that the same victim was involved in both. Do you have your notes? Uh, yes. Do you want to go over the details? Please. Very well. Uh, um, yes. Uh, the dead man was called Harold Jefferson, resident in Brock Hill, the nearest village to the headland, uh, 22 years old. And somewhat feeble-minded by all accounts, and therefore unemployed. He liked to spend his time at Malbourne Point. And how and when did he meet his death? Yesterday by jumping from the top of the old Melbourne lighthouse. And late last night, or in the early hours of this morning, by being stabbed. He survived the fall. Well, we don't know. My Croft, you're as infuriating a storyteller as Watson. Just give me the facts, clearly, concisely, and in chronological uh, order. I, I was about to. The old lighthouse... Is there a is new lighthouse? <laughs> Obviously, hence the name. Uh, May I continue? Please do. Thank you. The old lighthouse is a hundred yards or so from the new one, and it's just offshore. At low tide, there is a safe passage to it across the rocks. That's the only means of access. Except by boat, presumably. Uh, no, Doctor, not even by boat. The rocks prevent it on the landward side, and a seaward approach is impossible because the currents are too treacherous. I trust I'm making myself clear. Perfectly, thank you. Good. The new lighthouse is already in operation, but there's to be a grand inauguration this coming Saturday. Now, yesterday, during a rehearsal for the ceremony, the boy appeared on the lamphouse balcony of the old building and flung himself off. His body wasn't recovered and was assumed to have been swept out to sea. Only to turn up later. <laughs> in a derelict hut, with a single stab wound in his back and another in his chest. <sighs> Terrible business for his family. Well, it's just the father. He witnessed the suicide leap. Appalling. Y yes, 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 but where's the mystery? Hmm? The boy survived the fall and the water, somehow made it to land and then was killed. Either that or the body was washed up, brought ashore and then attacked up to death. Uh, why, Sherlock? Why in either case? Why do that to a harmless simpleton? If he was still alive, he must have been close to death's door anyway. And if he was dead... Well, surely the nature of the injuries would give a good idea of what happened. Who, who examined him? The local GP. Oh, you should get a properly qualified man down there. I rather think that's exactly what he's trying to do. Two properly qualified men. Now, don't you find it fascinating, Sherlock? No more than moderately. He wasn't fooled for a second. Actually, I wasn't lying. Not them. It was only after that that the tale became really outré. Well, you see, there are advantages to a slow build-up of suspense. Nonsense. If he'd told me everything from the start, I'd have agreed straight away. He wasted a good 30 minutes of my time. He was enjoying himself. He's a civil servant. He's no business enjoying himself. The boy's father is a local dignitary, in charge of civic ceremonies, that sort of thing. Including the lighthouse inauguration? Well, he's organised the whole thing. Oh. He lives in Brock Hill, just over a mile and a half from Malburn Point. Last night, after the boy jumped, there was a break-in at the house. Indeed. What was taken? Nothing. But something was left. An envelope containing exactly two hundred pounds sterling. Yeah, there are three possibilities. It was a, an apology, a 
bribe or totally unconnected with the boy's death. An apology? By the murderer. What sort of murderer apologizes for his deed? I could quote you at least seven instances. You're right. It could have been an apology. If it was a bribe, perhaps there'll be some sort of follow-up, a note saying what the father's expected to do. Unless he already knows and is keeping it to himself. He wants to be secretive about it. Why reveal that the money appeared at all? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. But it isn't the real story. What is it that Mycroft didn't tell us? Why are you so sure he's concealing something? Because he's Mycroft. But couldn't he simply be worried about his friend? Come. Big pardon, Mr. Holmes. Yes? yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you, Goodall. Show Sir Charles in there. There's a fine chap. Mr. Holmes. Sir Charles Steele, gentlemen. Uh, Charles. No, no, please don't get up. Uh. May I present my brother? An honour, Mr. Holmes. Sir Charles. And his associate, Dr. Watson. Good afternoon. Doctor, I can't tell you the pleasure I've had from your writings. Thank you. Holmes, a child has done this terrible thing. <laughs> Wonderful. Mm. When I'm in number ten, it'll be a knighthood for you. You mark my words. Uh, thank you. No, oh, at the very least. <laughs> now, no doubt Mr. Holmes here has told you all about our local mystery. Local? I'm the member for that district, and my country place is only a few miles away. Malbon Point is my land. Which is why Sir Charles is to be guest of honour at the ceremony. <sighs> and you're concerned that there could be a murderer in the community. You're worried about your own safety. Not a bit of it, Doctor. It's Mycroft who's doing the worrying. Ah, uh, Sir Charles Steele. Had you heard of him before today? Holmes, all England's heard of him. Well, with one obvious exception. I have quite enough to do keeping track of the criminal fraternity. Politicians are of no interest to me, so he's famous. Well, some would say notorious. The youngest man ever to be tipped for the cabinet and possibly even the premiership itself. Oh. And that confers notoriety? Uh, not just that. He's halfway to being an eccentric. Then he should try harder. Not if he wants to rise in the government, he shouldn't. But the public love him. What form does his eccentricity take? Couldn't you deduce that for yourself? Well, nothing beyond the obvious. He's flamboyant, self-centred, outspoken, and has some sort of connection to the theatre. Uh, he owns a chain of music halls and two opera houses. <laughs> and he supports some rather outlandish causes. Interesting. Was that all you got? No, there was one more thing. What was that? However much he denied it, the man is scared. Mr. Holmes... This business has unsettled everyone down there. I want to see it cleared up. I want an explanation. Even if it's just that it was a purely random, senseless attack. The location doesn't suggest that. Then a dangerous criminal, perhaps even a homicidal maniac, is still at large. You must act, Sherlock. You must exert yourself. Very well. I'll look into it. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. You do understand that I can't guarantee success. I might not be able to find out what happened. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. I understand that perfectly well. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Ah. Good evening. And you are? Uh, Constable Powell, sir. I represent the law here. All by yourself? I can call on the stations from three other villages. Or from Ashford Town if I need to. And have you done so in this case? No, sir. Because I've been ordered not to. Ah. And if you'll pardon my saying so, I don't like the way this whole affair is being handled. Directive straight from Whitehall. There's a proper procedure laid down, and this isn't it. I, I, I sympathise, Constable. Whitehall does have the habit of sitting on high, issuing commands and expecting everyone to jump. Well, as long as it's understood that I'm not happy. It's perfectly understood. Oh, yeah. But we shall need your cooperation. You'll get it, sir. I know my duty. <laughs> now, this way, if you please. I have a carriage waiting. Thank you. There are rooms reserved for you at the White Line in Brock Hill. 
And dinner's booked for eight. Very efficient. When was all this done? Well, this morning, sir. Before you agreed to take the case. Exactly. It's nice to be taken for granted. We'll be there shortly. No. Mr. Holmes? It'll still be light for a while. Take us to Malburn Point. What an incredible place. Yes, sir. That's how it takes everybody. And we're barely two hours out of London. This will exercise your pen, Watson, if it ever comes to it. Hmm. The vast expanse of shingle, flat as a billiard table, extends in every direction as far as the eye can see, broken only by the jagged, ruined shapes of the isolated fishermen's huts and shelters. If a giant's hand had swept clear a corner of the globe and randomly planted bizarre sculptures upon the plain, it could hardly be more mysterious and more awe-inspiring. Oh, that's very good. Very good. You should write it down. I shan't forget it. Some of those huts look habitable. Does anybody still live here? Well, we get the occasional artist, sir. Something about the light, apparently. Or the air or something. And once we had a poet, a strange chap. They don't stay too long. The isolation gets to them. So the, the, the whole area is deserted? Well, if you don't count old Mrs Chang. Chang? Is she Chinese? Chinese, Japanese, I couldn't tell you. Nor how old she is. She looks about a hundred. And she lives here? I suppose you'd call her a recluse. Her shack's right down by the water. How does she support herself? As far as I know, she lives off the sea. She's got a freshwater well, so it's fish and water three times a day, I suppose. Wouldn't do for me. It was Mrs Chang found the body. Was it indeed? You'll be wanting to talk to her. Yes, yes, but not just yet. First, I want to see the lighthouses. Ah, the preparations for the grand ceremony. And just offshore, across the rocks, the scene of the suicide. Hmm. A temporary stage at the foot of the new lighthouse. Uh, oh, there was a band here. Yes, sir. Mr. Jefferson insisted on a full-scale rehearsal. He's a very punctilious man. Evidently. Uh, what time was this rehearsal? Same as the actual ceremony's going to be. Nine in the morning. Oh, isn't that rather early? It was to suit Sir Charles, apparently. And the band was gathered over there. Various carpenters working there. And the boy's father. Ah, let's see. Well, um... well, he was up on the stage, sir. Oh, did he tell you exactly where? We didn't need to. I was here too. Oh, what excellent. Show me precisely where he was standing. Follow me. <laughs> Mr. Jefferson was standing right uh, here. Yeah. His assistant, Mr. Lade, was next to him. Uh, and you, Constable? Well, I was up here too, sir. Some of the carpenters are a rough lot. I wanted to keep an eye on them. Yeah, mm. So you, you also had a clear line of sight to the old lighthouse? Oh, yeah. Very good. Is it still manned? No, it's not used anymore. The new one here has been up and running for a week. Mm. You're a keeper? No, it's fully automatic. Quite the modern marvel, apparently. Oh, thank you. Is the old lighthouse open? It's not been locked since it was decommissioned. Indeed. Right, Watson, you stay here. Uh, very well. And I'll, um, I'll see you very soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, cigarette? Not while I'm on duty, thank you, Doctor. Oh, uh, of course, sorry. Mm. How did Mr. Holmes know about the band? Oh, well, you can see where the shingle was disturbed at the side of the stage. A couple of dozen people stood there in a block. There wouldn't have been an audience at a rehearsal, and they wouldn't have been gathered just there anyway, so it must have been a band. Good Lord. <laughs> Did you know the dead man? Well, most people knew Harry Jefferson, Doctor. By sight, at least. And did they like him? Well, somehow that's not the right word. To be honest, I don't think most people thought about him at all. Mm. Did you like him? Me? He was... He was harmless enough. So you can't think of anyone who would have wanted to hurt him? No one, Doctor. No one at all. Uh-huh. Hmm. Now, um, tell me exactly what happened here. Every detail you can remember. You 
two, watch what you're doing! Stevens, for heaven's sake, organize those workmen! Plumber! That barrier is too far forward! Gentlemen, gentlemen! Good God, Mr. Laid, I should just do it all myself. Okay. Yes, sir. Is that what they're going to play as he comes on? I don't know, Mr. Jefferson. We'll find out. No, um, <laughs> no, never mind. Never mind. Um, it'll have to do. I don't need anything else to worry about. No, sir. Actually, it's quite appropriate, isn't it? Rather jolly, if not too pompous. You don't think he'll be offended? All oh, right. Uh, very good. It can, it can stay. Now, um, where were we? Uh, uh, Sir Charles and his party come up onto the platform. They, uh, they take their seats. Mr. Laid, are you listening? Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but... Well, look! Hmm? It was the boy. He was out on the lamp house balcony. How was he behaving? He seemed perfectly calm. Did he look towards here? He did, yes. Do you think he saw his father? I don't see how he could have missed him. It's no great distance. Anyway, then he moved round so he was facing out to sea. And then... Well... He fell almost straight down. Hit the edge of the rocks, but the force of his fall kept him moving down into the water. The current's there. Oh, yes, I've been told. Yeah, there was no chance. Could he have fallen accidentally? I don't think so. Some of the wood on the balcony's rotten, but not around that side. It was fixed not long back. I went up there to make sure. And that cry. It wasn't terror or surprise, I'd swear to it. Right. Thank you. How did his father react? Powell? Look, sir, Mr. Jefferson's an important man. Oh, this is entirely in confidence, Constable. Yes, sir. Well, it didn't seem to me to be a very honourable reaction. Mr. Jefferson, are you all right? Mr. Jefferson? Constable, get a doctor. Yes, no. Mr. Jefferson? Mr. Laid, I'm perfectly all right. Thank you. But surely... Oh, where were we, sir? The rehearsal, Mr. Laid. Where were we? Grief and shock. They can take people in some very strange ways. Grief and shock, if you say so, sir. What do you mean? Oh, there's Mr. Holmes. Hope he watches himself on that balcony. Come in. Well, Mycroft's done us reasonably well. Uh, how's your room? Uh, oh, not bad. Oh, they're not entirely succeeded in hiding the patch in the carpet, but it shows willing. Oh, don't be infuriating. What did you discover in that lighthouse? I know you didn't want to talk while Powell was with us. Yeah, no, just, just a moment. Oh, I, I found these. What are they? Well, it looks like... What do you call it? Um, wicker work? That's because it is. There's quite a bit of it scattered around on the deck of the balcony. From a basket? No, that ledge was only ever used for cleaning the outside of the lamp, and that was done with a metal bucket and a brush. Then what's this stuff doing out there? I don't know. Huh. It's a pretty little puzzle. Ah. Why didn't you go and look at the hut where the body was found? Uh, the light wasn't good enough by then. Another few hours won't make any difference. So that's our task for tomorrow morning? Mm, one of them. What did you make of the local representative of the law? He wasn't exactly overjoyed to see us, was he? Well, he does have a point. We're undermining his authority. Perhaps. I can tell you one thing. He didn't like the dead boy. Really? Fascinating. Do you know why? No, but there was definitely something there. Well done. And something else. He painted the father in a bad light. Didn't turn a hair when the boy jumped, apparently. It's not a crime to hide one's emotions. Oh, just as well. But what emotion was he hiding? We'll find out in the morning. Gentlemen, I can give you ten minutes. 
Then I shall be brief. When you saw your son at the top of the old lighthouse, what was your immediate reaction? I thought he was just messing around. I was angry. Because you knew it was unsafe? Because I could ill afford the distraction. From your duty supervising the preparation? Exactly. And when he jumped? What do you imagine? I was horrified. Uh, had he been unhappy? Uh, depressed? Not to my knowledge. Your son was 22? Yes. In body? Yes. But not in mind? Since you obviously know, why are you wasting my time by asking me? The boy was never right, never quite right. He, he, not from birth. We saw a doctor. He told us there was nothing to be done. Was there any physical handicap? Certain uh, clumsiness, nothing else. Do you know of any reason why he should want to kill himself? None. He didn't leave a note. I found nothing. I've searched everywhere. It's a waste of time. Suicide notes are invariably left prominently displayed. <clears throat> Did your son have friends? Hmm? People in his confidence? I assume so. But you don't know who they are? I am a busy man. Who looked after your son since your wife died? How do you know about that? There are seven separate indications, none of them the slightest interest. Please answer the question. Originally, I engaged a governess, then a male tutor, but the man didn't stay. The job was unfulfilling. So, in short, your son was abandoned to his own devices. You go too far, sir. I'm well aware of my duty towards my son. I sheltered him from a hostile world. I, I gave the boy a home when I could have put him in an institution. I put clothes on his back, a roof over his head, and food in his stomach. And this is the thanks I get. Tell me about the money. It was left on the hallway table. Just loose notes? In an envelope. You still have the envelope? I had a telegram from Whitehall asking me to retain it. <laughs> God alone knows why. Here. Thank you. Oh, good quality stationery, somewhat crumpled, no marks, uh, no inscription, no discernible aroma. Thank you. Where are the notes? In my safe. Do you wish to see them? It's not necessary. When did your mystery visitor enter the house? The lock on the front door hasn't been damaged. He came in through a window at the back. Uh, did the noise wake you or the servants? Uh, no. Was the glass broken or cut? Neither. The clasp was faulty. That window doesn't lock properly. Then how do you know that it was the means of entry? It was discovered wide open. It had been closed the night before. The money was left, but nothing was taken? Correct. What a considerate housebreaker. Mr Jefferson, what do you think happened to your son after he jumped from the lighthouse? Whether he was alive or dead, why should anyone want to attack him with a knife? I've no idea. How long have you had the canary? What? I don't know. Uh, several years, uh, that one. We've always had them. My wife loved them. And you? I enjoy their song. Yes. Hmm. And why do you feel the need to padlock the cage? Yes? Beg pardon, sir. Gentlemen. Yes, Elizabeth? Uh, Mr. Lade is here, sir, in the carriage. Mr. Lade? Yeah, he's from Sir Charles's personal staff. Especially seconded to me. Uh, please say I'll, I'll be there directly. Sir. Elizabeth will bring you your hats. Yeah, she can also show me the broken window. If you insist. I do. Thank you for your time. Gentlemen. Hmm. What sort of man finds his son an inconvenience? No, it was worse than that, wasn't it? An embarrassment. Yeah, the sort who values appearances and position above everything else and who apes the behaviour of his betters. Yes, all that rigidly controlled emotion. Yes, as, as you said last night, just what emotion is he concealing? Hmm? Sorrow, relief, anger, guilt. <laughs> How long has this lock been broken? Oh, ages, sir. Ah, interesting. Can you read anything from the ground? Uh, yeah, very little, but uh, enough. Will that be all, gentlemen? I'm not quite. At your department, Doctor. Elizabeth, uh, tell me about Mr Jefferson's son. What do you want to know, sir? Well, um, I know he liked to spend a lot of time out at Malbon Point. Yes, sir. He did. 
But uh, did you have much contact with him when he was at home? Oh, yes, sir. Looking after Master Harry, that was a big part of my duties. Oh, you liked him? He was a lovely boy, sir. Hmm. So kind and gentle. Do you have any idea why he did what he did? Oh, yes, sir. You do? Of course. Well, would you care to tell us? It was because of the maze. The maze? Uh, well, where is this maze? Oh, no, sir. That's not what I mean. The maze. You know. I'm afraid I don't. I do. Indeed? It's an old country term. You hardly hear it these days. A maze is like a madness. An enchantment. That's right, sir. It's where we get amazed and amazement. Watson, you're invaluable. What form does it take, then? This, this, this madness, is it hereditary? No, you catch it. In most versions of the story, it's just in the air huh. or in the uh, fabric of a place. Huh. And if you're sensitive enough, you pick it up. Master Harry got it out at Marlborn Point. Well, how do you know this? Because he wasn't the first. There was a boy, Billy Huggins. He got it, the maze, and he did the self-same thing as Master Harold, sir. He threw himself off the lighthouse. And he wasn't the first. There's been others down the years. You ask anyone. The maze. He definitely had it, sir, Master Harold. It made him do all sorts of strange things. Such as? Well, like trying to set the canary free, sir. Time and again, that's why the cage is locked. And the last day... The day he went out, well, if he didn't have the maze, why else did he wear two coats? Amazing that these old country superstitions still persist. A place so imbued with an evil influence that it can be picked up like a common cold, if you're perceptive enough. You almost sound as if you believe it. When I was a boy... What did you say? Something wrong with your hearing, Doctor. No, of course not. It's just that in all the years I've known you, I don't think I've ever once heard you say those words. You haven't. Well, then why now? Because now they're relevant. When I was a boy, there was an old house on the edge of our estate. Derelict, virtually. Naturally, I went there to explore, to observe. Naturally. But I could never stay there long. I don't think I was a cowardly child, Watson, but there was something about that old house. I told Mycroft about it. And he teased you? Ah, on the contrary. He explained the whole thing. With some logical, rational explanation? Well, you decide. He looked at me and said, It's very simple, Sherlock. The house doesn't like you, and it doesn't want you there. And you accepted that? I was very young. And now? What do you think now? I think we've just been given an extremely valuable clue. Now, I have a task for you. What is it? Go and see Constable Powell. Have a friendly chat. See if you can't find out why he didn't like the Jefferson boy. Very well. What will you be doing? I'm going to walk back out to the point. Ah, you're going to look at the hut where the body was found. Not only that. I want to see if I can't absorb some more of the atmosphere of the place. Holmes, you're not taking this ridiculous maze business seriously, are you? Yep. Come and find me later. Glorious, isn't it? Mr. Holmes not with you? No, he's um, following up a line of his own. Ah, off duty, are you? No, just snatching the odd moment. Never off duty, really. Can't be since I'm all there is. Oh, quite a responsibility for you. Oh, it's a quiet village. Besides, it's only until they appoint a new sergeant. What happened to the old one? He took sick and died. Oh. Right out of the blue, between you and me, sir, he went a bit strange in the head. It's a good copper in his day. Any chance of you getting the job? Not a hope. Not enough experience. 
Maybe this murder will make a difference. Well, if I solved it myself, maybe, but there's no chance of that, is there? Not now. Uh, Constable, Mr. Holmes likes to keep his name out of things. If he sorts it out, he'll see that you get the credit. Really? Well, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> Look, sir, I'm sorry if I've been a touch distant. No apology necessary. Good of you. You fancy a cup of tea? Day to you. Will you come in, or shall I come out? It is much more pleasant out here, I think. Would you care for some tea? The boy used to come here to see me. Every day. You knew him well? Who can truly know another? I knew that he was deeply unhappy. Do you know why? He wanted to leave this place. An understandable ambition in a young man, do you not think? But his condition? His head was younger than his body, you are quite correct. But he was not a child, even if he was treated like one. And why did he stay here? He spoke sometimes of his father. In what terms? Those of a good son, aware of his duty. To be grateful for home and heart. Yes. Even though walls intended to protect can also imprison. I've been told that he suffered from an enchantment absorbed from the spirit of this land. Do you believe it? This is an extraordinary place. Yes. You have not asked me why I choose to live here. No. Because you already know the answer. Do I? With solitude can come wisdom. I believe that you also seek enlightenment and have considered this path. Had you noticed any change in the boy's behavior recently? Perhaps his spirit was a little lighter. When did that start? Not long ago. A few days, a week. Did he ever say anything about killing himself? Not to me. Did you hear anything that night? Nothing. I am a profound sleeper. Then it was the next morning when you discovered the body. Oh, it was not I who found him. But I was given to understand. Then who did? A cormorant. His name is Peng Yo. Friend. You speak my language. I've lived in the East. Then much is explained. You've trained him to retrieve fish. How do you know this? It's merely a question of using one's eyes. How exactly did the bird discover Harold Jefferson's body? As soon as I released him, he flew straight to the ruined hut and would not leave it. Remarkable. He is a remarkable creature. Mrs. Chang, can you tell me anything at all about what happened to the boy? Mr. Holmes, I deeply regret that I cannot. Whoa there, girl. There we are, Doctor. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the lift. Oh, sorry I couldn't take you any further. Oh, don't worry about it. <clears throat> Let's talk of extending the road out to the new lighthouse. God knows when it'll happen. All those distinguished guests are just going to have to walk the last bit and lump it. Will they be expecting a red carpet? Well, if they are, they're in for a disappointment. Now, you're sure you don't want me to wait? No, no. Once I've found Holmes, we'll walk back. You, you get on. Well, if you're sure. Up there, girl. Watson! Up here! Oh, 
there you are. Hello. Uh, be careful. Watch. What are you doing? Just watch. Observe closely. Yeah, all, all right. Uh, you're retracing the boy's steps. Round to the back of the balcony. Out of sight. Ah, leaning out. Ah, yes, just back in view. Uh, Holmes, I can see you. Oh, my God. Get, get down! It's not safe! Get down! No! Yeah! In part one of the Malvern Point mystery, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Mycroft Holmes was played by James Lawrenson, Constable Powell by Piers Weiner, Sir Charles Steele by Nigel Hastings, Mrs. Chang by Pixen Lim, Harold Jefferson by Joseph Cohen Cole, Mr. Jefferson by Bruce Alexander, Mr. Laid by Richard Delane, and Elizabeth by Tessa Nicholson. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinists were Leonard Friedman and Ian Humphreys. The Malvern Point Mystery was written by Bert Cools from a reference in the short story The Veiled Lodger by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. Mycroft, why is this business of interest to the government? Oh, my dear, it isn't. Not in the least. This is entirely unofficial. Really? And what's so special about this particular suicide and murder? The fact that the same victim was involved in both. It's about Master Harold, sir. I know why he did it. I know why he jumped off the lighthouse. Holmes! Get down! It's not safe! Yeah! The Malvern Point Mystery by Bert Cools With Clive Merrison as Sherlock Holmes and Andrew Sachs as Dr. John Watson, and featuring James Lawrenson as Mycroft Holmes. The Malvern Point Mystery, Part Two. Holmes, Holmes, for God's sake, what were you thinking? All the stupid, ridiculous... What the devil, what's this? It's my coat. <gasps> Holmes! Were you really not sure? Oh, for the love of heaven, do you know what you did to me? Yes, I do, and I'm, I'm delighted. You are the most inhuman individual on the planet. Oh, Watson, it was necessary. Necessary? To test my theory to see if an overcoat, a crude dummy, and a yell into the wind could actually fool someone, which they did in spectacular fashion. You don't deny it? Oh, of course I don't deny it. I nearly died of shock. Look, look at this. It's just bits of old broken lobster pots tied together. Arms, legs, head. You see? Wicker work lobster pots, Watson. Dozens of them lying around the ruined huts. You see the implication? Huh? Well, the tide's turning. I suggest we get back across the causeway before we're marooned on this damn rock all day. Surely you're not still angry. And what the devil do you expect? Good Lord, I've put up with a lot over the years, but making me think you've killed yourself in front of my eyes, that's heartless, even for you. Uh, well, Watson, I'm sorry, but how else could I be sure? And the way you set it all up. You must take me for a fool. That ridiculous story, when I was a boy. That story is true. What, there really was an old house? Hmm. And I genuinely couldn't bear to be there for any length of time. 
And? And I went and did some research. The house was built on a reclaimed swamp. Marsh gas was filtering up through the foundations. Pure methane. Invisible and odourless, but more than enough to affect a ten-year-old boy. But you made me believe... Because you had to accept the possibility that I might jump. Look, look, I I wish there could have been some other way. Hmm? But there wasn't. Watson? All right. Good man. Now, don't you ever do something like that again. You have my word, unless there's no alternative. Oh, you're impossible. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Now that you've done it, what does it prove? Well, it doesn't prove anything. Oh, for heaven's sake. It very, very strongly suggests that Harold Jefferson didn't jump from the lighthouse at all. Well, you're saying he did exactly what you did? Put together a dummy? Hmm. Leaving the fragments of wicker that I found on the balcony and the scattered stones on the rocks. That's why he took two coats out with him that day. Not because he was mad, but because he was carrying out a very clever plan. But the boy was simple-minded. Could he really have come up with a scheme like that? Well, perhaps, or maybe he was just following instructions. So someone else could be involved? Someone else is involved. The killer. Whoever killed him also dreamed up the fake suicide? Why, for heaven's sake? Why, indeed. (sighs) Um, there's something you don't know. There's rather a lot I don't know. That's not what I mean. Your wretched stunt drove it clean out of my mind. Ah, yes, your mission. Uh, Did you succeed? Yes, I did. I'll tell you all about it over lunch. Excellent. And you can pay. So, what's the story? Why did Constable Powell dislike Harold Jefferson? It's to do with Powell's fiance. The landlord at the pub told me you were going to be married. George never could keep his mouth shut. Surely it's not a secret. Congratulations. Thank you. When's the great day? Not fixed yet. Problems? Yes. Well, no, actually, not any... Look, I don't want to be rude, Doctor, but I'd rather not discuss it, if you don't mind. Not in the least. None of my business. <clears throat> These are excellent biscuits. A masterly piece of deflection. So, there had been an obstacle to the marriage, but now it doesn't exist. Hmm? Did you find out any more? Oh, yes, I did. There's a photograph on his mantelpiece. It's a young woman. It has to be his intended. Or a sister. No, it's not a sister. Well, how can you be so sure? Because I recognised her. Powell is engaged to Elizabeth, Jefferson's housemate. Is he indeed? Mm. And it was a big part of my duties looking after Master Harry. Exactly. And not only that, she was fond of him and she knew that he depended on her. So it's possible that she wouldn't have given up her job while he was still living at the house. And Powell would never have tolerated a wife who worked. Hence the resentment. Oh, splendid, Watson. Thank you. So, what now? (sighs) Now we drink up or we'd be late for our appointment. And you know how touchy doctors can be. I tell you, I'm damnably unhappy about this whole business. Would you normally consider murder something to be happy about, Dr Scanton? Don't be insulting. I mean the manner in which things are being handled. Orders straight from Whitehall, no official inquest, it's unheard of. I can't even call in the undertakers. And all because of a power-hungry exhibitionist who conducts himself in public with all the dignity of a circus clown. There is concern for his safety. Then let him stay away. The new lighthouse is functioning perfectly well. It doesn't need Sir Charles Steele breaking a bottle of champagne across its doorway or whatever it is he intends to do. Well, uh, do you want to look at the boy or not? There you are. I'll be back in my consulting room in the unlikely event that you require my assistance. Gentlemen, uh, Doctor. Very good. Now. Oh, dear Lord. If my theory is correct and he didn't jump from the lighthouse, then those head injuries weren't caused by hitting the rocks. They were deliberately inflicted to give that impression. Monstrous. Can you tell when the skull was damaged? Ah, uh, not from the wounds themselves. Perhaps something else. Yes. Yes, look at the hands. You see? It cuts on the palms. Mm, mm. He tried to ward off the knife. 
If the head wounds had already happened, he would have been either dead or unconscious. Yes, and it's definite. It wasn't suicide. Yeah, thank you. No. Anything else? Um, let me look at the chest. Mm. Well, that's more or less exactly what I was expecting. One thrust between the ribs and into the heart. Yeah. And bruising around the entry point. Mm, so the weapon was driven home with considerable force. Oh, now that is very interesting. What, the discoloration? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, help me turn him on his side. Right. <clears throat> ah, ah. There's another wound. The wound in the back. That's different. No bruising and lower than the chest wound. This wouldn't have been fatal. No, it would have been more than enough to stop the boy if he was running from his killer. You think the knife might have been thrown? From far enough away not to penetrate to the hilt. It's, it's all in the dust on the floor of that hut. Then the murderer caught up with his victim, retrieved his weapon, spun the boy round and finished the job. And then staved in his skull. Mm. Oh, can you imagine someone coldly and calmly doing that? Yes, I can. We're dealing with an uncommon foe. Have you seen enough of the back? Uh, yes. Yeah, very good. Mm. Oh, oh, excellent. What is? Look. Well, there's material under his nail. Yes, now, let, let's, let's see if I can get a sample. If it's skin and blood, he might have marked his killer's face. It's not skin and blood. It's something far more valuable. And you're not going to tell me what it is? What was it you remarked on the train yesterday? There's something to be said for the slow building up of suspense. Hmm? Come on, I have to send a telegram. Mm. Excellent. Now, what would you like to do while we wait for a reply? I'd like to talk. Let's find somewhere quiet to sit. I have a theory. Hmm? Oh, go on. Suppose that someone wanted young Jefferson dead, or at least out of the way. We don't have to suppose it. We know it's true. It was a social encumbrance to his father and an obstacle to the constable, and to the maid if it comes to that. Elizabeth? What about her loyalty to the boy and her grief? Were well, neither emotions difficult to simulate? Well, I suppose not. But you needn't confine yourself to just those three. Hasn't it occurred to you that a brutal and inexplicable murder on his own land could be a considerable embarrassment to a rising young MP? Someone committed a murder just to tarnish Steele's reputation? Politics can be a vicious business. No, but you were telling me your theory? Hmm? Hmm. Um, what if one of these people somehow persuaded the lad to jump from the lighthouse? We know he was simple-minded. Surely he would have had to have been positively moronic. Well, if he was depressed enough or lonely enough, it might have been possible. Anyway, at the last minute, he decided not to do it, but to fake the jump instead. You said yourself that it could have been his own idea. And then the uh, someone found out. And used a knife to do the job properly? You have to admit, it fits the facts. Well, to a certain extent. But what about the money that was left in the father's house? I can't explain that. Can you? Yes, I can. I know who put it there and why. And I know that it was the direct cause of Harold Jefferson's murder. He was killed because of the money? I'll tell you something else. I suspect that the boy's death is nothing to do with what's actually going on here. Nothing at all. Ah, sir. Um, here you are. Just arrived. Ah, thank you. Ah. What is it? Another significant development. Oh. Another mystery for you to dangle in my face until you're ready to explain it. My friend, I promise you this. It will be worth the wait. Mm. Oh, hello. What? A happy coincidence, just the man I wanted to see. Ah, good afternoon, Mr. Jefferson. Mr. Holmes. Doctor. When you've finished your business here, I'd appreciate a quiet talk. Somewhere private. Thank you, Elizabeth. We'll serve ourselves. 
Sir. Gentlemen. I'm sorry if I was short with you when you called this morning. A lot on my mind. No, of course. And a member of Sir Charles's private staff scrutinising your every move. A privilege. But also a responsibility. I am accustomed to responsibility. And you enjoy it? I won't deny it. Now, uh, sir, what is it you wish to tell me? Your son did not commit suicide. You're certain of that? I am. Doctor? Uh, the medical evidence is quite definite. Well, thank God. Thank God. I've examined the railings on that balcony. They're extremely unsafe. I don't believe that he intended to jump. So he can have a Christian burial. Mr. Holmes, you take a great weight from my mind. Yes, I rather thought I might. But the stabbing, what on earth does that mean? Constable Powell tells me that the area is sometimes used by smugglers bringing over contraband from France. I believe that your son staggered ashore, dazed and half drowned, and was unlucky enough to stumble on just such a gang. He was killed to silence him. By God! I'll track those men down if I have to call in every policeman in the county. Mr Holmes, Dr Watson, I'm deeply in your debt. What did you think? You didn't believe a word of what you said to him. Of course I didn't. What matters is that he thinks I did. And this is a very small community. The story will spread. <laughs> and now... Yes? I fancy I'm ready for dinner. Mm, well. That was excellent. Food fresh from the land. Uh, could you live in a place like this, Watson? And rusticate my life away? Not a chance. Why do you ask? Just out of interest. I know you don't want to discuss the case yet, but will you answer one question at least? That depends on what it is. Are we going to accept Jefferson's invitation to watch the final rehearsal tomorrow morning? Oh, my dear chap, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Dr. Watson, good morning. Good morning. Constable Powell, excellent. The cast is assembling. And Mr. Jefferson, you look worried. Mr. Lay, he just had to go back to London. Oh, is that a problem? No, I suppose not, but he was to have stood in for Sir Charles in the run through. Mr. Holmes, I don't suppose you'll care. Oh, I don't know. I'd be delighted, but I don't think it's going to be necessary. What do you mean? Simply that there's an even better candidate available. Look. Well, I, I can't. Oh, good lord. Well, not quite, but no doubt he'd tell you that it's only a matter of time. Good morning to you, Sir Charles. Mr. Holmes, a pleasure. Doctor, and you must be the excellent Jefferson. Sir Charles, a great honour. Just thought I'd take a look and see how things are going. Anything I can do to help? Oh, my dear sir. Good oh. Mr. Holmes, don't rush away afterwards. I'd appreciate a word. <laughs> I hear you've solved the case. The boy's fall was an accident and he was killed by smugglers? That is my opinion, yes. And so I'm in no personal danger. There's no mindless maniac at large here. No, there certainly is not. Well, that's excellent. I'm grateful to you. I'll tell my brother that all his precautions were unnecessary and the investigation can be handed over to the local police. Young Powell will appreciate that. Good, very good. Mm. Shall I see you at the ceremony tomorrow? Alas, the doctor and I are returning home today. Well, I'm pleased to have met you both. Mr. Holmes? Sir Charles. When we get to London, I have to see Mycroft. Oh. What do you want me to do? I'll go to Baker Street and while away a few hours. Then pick up your thickest gloves, a good, warm scarf, a dark lantern and your revolver. We're going back. We're going back. This place is unearthly at night. Yes, it's a worthy setting. 
Now, I suggest we take up our position. Where, Mr. Holmes? Inside the old lighthouse. Doctor, do you know exactly what's going on? Mr. Holmes didn't explain. He just told me to expect you two tonight and have the carriage waiting. What's it all about? Something big. Ah, I was right. It's not here yet. It? I wish we should conceal ourselves. I suggest the stairs just below the next level. Yes, this will do admirably. Clear view of the door. And now we wait. If I'm correct, and I am, it shouldn't be for too long. It was the tide that gave me my first clue. The tide? Mm. And the time of the ceremony tomorrow morning. Hmm? Highly suggestive. But what has that to do with young Harry Jefferson? Watson? Nothing. His death isn't connected to the real case at all. Then what is the real case? Quiet. I can't hear a thing. Silence. Don't move a muscle. Good evening, Sir Charles. What the devil? Thank you for not keeping us waiting too long. What's the meaning of this? You boy. Powell, isn't it? What's going on? Well, so... An excellent question. Perhaps you'd care to supply the answer yourself. No? This is outrageous. I'm leaving. And not just yet, if you wouldn't mind. Doctor! How dare you threaten me, sir? Lower your gun at once. I think not. Constable Powell takes Sir Charles into custody. You want me to arrest him? But what's the charge? The charge is high treason. Good God. Good evening, Sherlock. Doctor. Well, Constable, I repeat, the charge is high treason. But, sir, I mean, who are you? I, sir, am the British government. Now. Do your duty. Go on there. <coughs> Up you get. Kindly do not manhandle me. I had to have this business handled as discreetly as possible. So you came yourself? Surely we could have managed things. Of course, Doctor. But as my brother is just about to explain to you, tonight's events are far from over. Sherlock... Shouldn't you be getting back? Ah, uh, yes, we should. You'll send the carriage back out for us. Of course. Happy hunting, brother. Holmes, just who are we after now? <laughs> Come on, Watson. It's almost time for the big finish. Holmes. Shh, shh, shh. I'm listening. Good. Not yet. It was the one weak link in my plans if it already arrived. Someone's coming here to meet Sir Charles? Exactly. So we're in for another vigil, I'm afraid. Back to the stairs, is it? No, I think we'll wait down here this time. Nothing like a spot of variety. <laughs> Ooh, variety. <laughs> Come on. And your best whisper, if you would. <laughs> I don't know which was the bigger shock. You're telling me that Sir Charles was a traitor, or your brother appearing in that doorway. I had no idea that Mycroft had followed us down from London. As you say, it's not exactly in character. It does give you the measure of the situation. I told you he didn't tell us the full story. How long had you known about Sir Charles? Not long. I still don't know the details. It's possible I never shall. Well, surely there'll be a trial. I think you'll find there are less public ways of handling such matters. Oh, but that's appalling. Well, I can tell you this much. Steele knew that his activities were suspected. How do you know that? Well, why else was he planning to disappear? And you accuse me of telling stories backwards. I thought you'd have seen it by now. 
Indulge me. That's what this whole affair's been leading up to. He was planning to fake his own death and start a new life, almost certainly abroad. Good Lord. At the ceremony tomorrow morning? Exactly. You've got it. It would have been quite a scene. A huge crowd, the gentlemen of the press. But where is the guest of honor? Consternation. And somebody spots him. On the balcony of the old disused lighthouse. And before their horrified gaze, he flings himself off. And his body is swept out to sea. Another victim of the mysterious maze. In reality, of course, he waits in here until he can get away unobserved. That's why the ceremony had to be at high tide, to make sure the evidence would be taken away by the currents. Then the boy, the Harry Jefferson... ...was a trial run, a rehearsal, which ended in his death. By God, that's callous. So steals a murderer, too. No, 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 no. The scheme wasn't his. He doesn't have that sort of mind. He had an advisor. And that's who we're waiting for now? Yes, yes. He'll be bringing the wicker work dummy for Sir Charles to use. That's what I was looking for earlier. They couldn't risk arriving together. Oh, no, no. Too dangerous. What sort of man can come up with a scheme like that? Well, you tell me. Oh, devious, calculating, devoted to detail. Jefferson. Quiet. He's here. Sir Charles? Sir Charles? Well, come on, you can speak, it's safe. There's no one for miles. That's not entirely true, I'm afraid. What's that? Who's there? Oh, my, uh, my apologies. Let's add our lantern light to yours. Watson, here. Watson? Uh, as in Dr. Watson? The same. So, good grief, are you Sherlock Holmes? Bravo. Very convincing. One of your finest performances. Watson, meet the elusive Mr. Laid, personal advisor to Sir Charles Steele and the mastermind behind this entire affair. Allow me to relieve you of that. Hmm? Ah, not as good as mine. <laughs> this is nonsense. You know, I really do congratulate you. This whole business was planned in the tiniest, most intricate detail, and it very nearly worked exactly as it was supposed to, smoothly and flawlessly, like a well-tuned machine. You sound as if you admire him. But not his aim or his methods. I admire his skill. I admired him last time we met, too. Well, you know this man? And so do you. I've never seen him before. There you are, then. Another tribute. It really, it really is an excellent disguise. Now, personally, I'd have used a rather thinner beard and a, yes, perhaps a lighter shade for the skin colour. But the, the wig, the wig's that's very fine. Uh, and so is the voice. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't see where this is going. Well, then, allow me to demonstrate. Ah, no resistance, good, very, very sensible. Now, first, the beard, and the wig, and the spectacles. Et voilà. You. In person, all this week. Good evening to you, Doctor. There. Very good. Extremely comfortable. What? Mr. Holmes, just who is this man? Constable, allow me to introduce you to a musical artist, actor, master of disguise, criminal genius and multiple murderer. Mr. Frederick Meridew. Hmm. Can't say I've ever heard of him. Ignorant fool. I assure you the loss is yours. Annoyed, Meredith. <laughs> Fame is a fickle thing. You're not in London now. <laughs> I play the entire country. Not for much longer, I fancy. In any case, we're a long way from the nearest music hall. False hair and makeup in case somebody recognised you. Totally unnecessary. I fancy the same could be said of some of your own disguises. Hardly. Oh, I think so. So you two know each other well? Yes. Yes. They've crossed swords once before. And I emerged triumphant. You deny it? Of course I deny it, Mr. Holmes. Let's suppose that someone did plan a murder on exactly those lines. Someone intelligent, resourceful and cunning. Don't you imagine that he would take pains to check every detail in advance? By, for example, consulting a doctor on exactly what might happen to a man's hand at the point of sudden death. And if he did, 
I believe he would learn that cadaveric spasm, that is the correct term, Doctor. Yes, it is. That cadaveric spasm does indeed occur, but not by any means in every single case. They're so important, these little exceptions in life, don't you agree? Heaven knows, gentlemen, I'm no expert, but I believe the relevant phrase is reasonable doubt. Thank you for a most entertaining conversation. Is that really what happened? Mr. Merridew's memory is excellent. That's true. I remember it so well. Not being arrested, not going to court. And getting away with murder. Oh, did I? You'll not escape me this time, Merridew. I can put together every single link in the chain. I've been following your career with great interest. I'm flattered. The first tentative steps, offering your services as a consultant to the underworld, the, the escalation of the crimes, the growing fame in criminal circles, the higher stakes, the more and more illustrious clients. My dear Mr. Holmes, it sounds as if I was merely following your excellent example. So you admit it? By no means. Just joining in your little game. This is no game, Merridew. Oh, some people simply have no lightness in them at all. Don't you ever get tired of it, Doctor, being the upright, moral gentleman every second of every day? I'm supposed to have a sense of romanticism, a vivid imagination. Don't you ever apply it to yourself? Don't you ever want something different? Don't you ever want to fly? Holmes, let's get this over with. The air in here is foul. This went on until finally you were approached by Sir Charles Steele. Didn't it bother you in the least that you were working for a traitor to the realm? What is it you once said, Mr. Holmes? A client to me is a mere unit, a factor in a problem. A sentiment worthy of, well, of myself. And it was quite an intriguing one, his particular problem. You saw the lighthouse ceremony as the perfect opportunity. You came down here, insinuated yourself with Jefferson. That was no challenge. And then you persuaded his son that he could have the new life he longed for. All he had to do was bring an end to his old one by seeming to kill himself. Death cancels all obligations. You exploited his trust and his simplicity for your own twisted purpose. An atrocious act. Nonsense. The boy was every bit as behind bars as I am right now. He deserved to be set free. He didn't deserve to die. <laughs> that was his own fault. He didn't stick to the script. Mr. Late! Mr. Late! I'm here. Mr. Late, it worked. Just like you said it would. Where did you go? I've been waiting. I've been home. Home? What do you mean you've been home? There was something I had to do. Something important. Well, why don't you tell me all about it? I believe you'd given him some money as an earnest of good faith. And to start him in a new life in London. You seriously intended to help him achieve that? And why wouldn't I? I'm not a monster. I probably felt sorry for him. Until you discovered that he'd left the money for his father to find. Oh, is that what he did? I think something else happened too that night. Or didn't happen. You didn't leave the note. I forgot, sorry. Can we go to London now? Yes, yes. Of course we can. You come with me. In you go. Here, take the lantern. Right. Why are we here? Oh, you'll see in a minute. Good. Mr. Laid? Mr. Jefferson? Thank you ever so much. This is the nicest thing anyone's ever done for me. You snivelling idiot. What? You pathetic, stupid, irresponsible little moron. I'm not. Don't call me that. Weeks of preparation, a plan of genius. And what do I hear? I forgot. Uh, but I did. What's that? It's called a knife. Quieter and less bulky than a gun, but every bit as efficient. You made a mistake, Meridew. You let your emotion get the better of you, and you made a mistake. Not in killing the boy. Careful, Holmes. You're shocking the good doctor. Not even in mutilating the corpse. Which presumably I did for insurance. Just one more puzzle in case it was ever found. But in killing him there. And leaving him there, where the body could so easily be discovered. Easily? In the middle of that godforsaken wilderness? That wasn't a mistake. That was inspired. It's hardly my fault that a chance in a million occurred. 
Who did find it anyway? I've been wondering about that. Well, you can keep on wondering. It will give you something to occupy your thoughts while you're waiting for the hangman. Oh, now that really is a trifle presumptuous, don't you think? Married you, I'm tired of this. Well, well. Now who's letting their emotions run away with them? Where's your proof, Mr. Holmes? Your incontrovertible proof? I can place you in the hut. Your movements there are written as legibly as a newspaper headline. I know where you were when you struggled and the boy knocked you down. I know where he fell when you knifed him in the back. I know where you stood when you threw away the bloody stone you used to cave in his skull. Traces in the dust. You planning to produce them in court? I plan to have them photographed and shown to the jury. Who will see that someone was in the hut, that someone fought with the boy, that someone knifed him to death. Someone who could have been anyone. Yes, that's quite true. Holmes? Oh, my dear sir, what a waste of both our times. It's the Turner case all over again. No, sir, it is not. Oh? Because I'll show the jury something else, too. The fragments of your false beard, the crystals of dried spirit gum, and the smears of your skin makeup that I took from under the dead boy's fingernails. Chemical analysis will match them beyond any doubt, and I'll tell them about the journey of the evidence, Meridue. The journey provided by the struggle from your face to his hands, from his hands to yours, and from yours to the skin of his chest, where you braced yourself against his lifeless body to pull out the knife. I can put you and no one else in that hut, as surely and securely as if I'd seen you there with my own two eyes, and all thanks to your disguise, the disguise you thought was so necessary, but that you didn't need at all. It's your vanity that's going to hang you, Meridue, your vanity and your arrogance. Pure science. Applied to detection, your own innovation, I believe. You are quite correct, Mr. Holmes. You called me a genius. Allow me most sincerely to return the compliment. Mr. Meridue, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. Good morning, Mrs. Chang. You have news. Yes. The boy's killer will be brought to justice. That is pleasing. Oh, one moment. Good, Pang Yao. Clever, Pang Yao. Here. Remarkable. How did you know I had taught him to do that? The early training involves fitting a ring to the neck so the bird can't swallow any large catches. Once it's learned what it has to do, the ring can be removed. Only in the most intelligent of creatures. And the marks where the ring was fitted are still just visible, if one knows where to look. Very impressive. Elementary. Oh, I do not think so. And neither, I suspect, do you. Perhaps not. Thank you for telling me your news. I'm pleased that you succeeded. Yes, so am I. Cheshire Sayin, Miss Jack. Pukachi, Mr. Holmes. Remember my words. The wise man does not deny his one true past. Yeah, thank you. Uh, brother? Brother? Hmm. I still don't see why we couldn't have met at the Diogenes Club. They have a rather better cellar. Mycroft, only you could turn up out of the blue at the most isolated spot in the entire southeast at two o'clock in the morning and yet still object to making a ten-minute cab journey. He's annoyed with me, Doctor, because I didn't tell him everything right at the start of the case. And you find that irritating, Holmes? Really? Just how much did you know when you sent for me? Oh, we'd known for some time about Steele's... Um activities, and we'd been looking into anything unusual that happened around him. The Malburn Point business was simply the latest instance. And I, I'd no idea that it was tied up with the plan for him to disappear and, uh, until you deduced it. Well, if it was nothing special, why did you use me? Why not one of your own people? I told you. 
I knew that you were bored. And obviously I didn't want to spoil your enjoyment by giving you too much information. Obviously. Don't be sarcastic, Sherlock. It's extremely undignified. I must go. Oh, one last thing. If your attitude to the honours list has changed since the last time I inquired... It hasn't. <laughs> Stubborn as ever. Oh, well. Good evening, brother. Good evening. I'll see myself out. Doctor. Oh, Mr. Holmes. I wish you joy of him. Thank you. Ooh. Oh. Uh. Yes. Oh. It's been an interesting case. Rewarding, too. Oh, yes. And to think it's all thanks to a trained cormorant. Hmm. If that bird hadn't found the body, the whole business might never have come to light. God only knows what damage steel could have done to the country. A dumb creature saves the state, unique in the annals of crime. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, uh, you know... There wouldn't be just one thing that you don't understand still? Actually, it's two things. Doubtless my lack of imagination. Oh, I hope you didn't take that to heart. No, of course not. Good. What are they, the two things? Your telegram. To the manager of the majestic chain of music halls, Meredy was due to perform in his houses this week and last. You asked if he appeared. And was told that he broke his contract and never turned up. Well, not conclusive, but highly suggestive. Uh, second thing. Um, the money. Why did Harold Jefferson leave the money for his father? Well, you remember the man's words to us. I gave the boy a home when I could have put him in an institution. I put clothes on his back, a roof over his head, and food in his stomach, and this is the thanks I get. Do you doubt that he said exactly the same thing to the boy himself? Hmm? Time after time. His son was repaying his debt. Yeah, a handsome, generous act, however misjudged. The act of the gentleman his father thought he could never become. Oh, if only he'd been shown just a shred of affection. And the whole business would never have happened. Huh. Behold how destinies can change and lives be shaped by the lack of a kindly word. Uh, would you mind? Oh, not in the least. Thank you. You played that for me just a few days after we first moved in here. Did I? I didn't have the least idea what to make of you. Have you now? Oh, I think so, yes. Maybe. You know, I love these moments. The case is solved. Everything's over. We're back here in the warmth and comfort. Until the next client comes along. <laughs> and then off we'll go again. I wish it could always be like this. Watson. It will. How can it? Nothing lasts forever. It will because of you. Because of your stories. Don't you see? It doesn't matter what happens here in the real world. We're more than reality, you and I. You, my friend, have made us immortal. That's quite a thought. It's the truth. As long as there are mysteries and murders... And fog and fear... And terror and injustice... Then Sherlock Holmes, private consulting detective... And John H. Watson, chronicler, comrade and friend... Will be ready... Waiting for the dramatic ring at the doorbell. <laughs> 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 the, the game's, game's afoot. afoot. In The Malvern Point Mystery, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. John Watson by Andrew Sachs. Frederick Meridew was played by Richard Delane and Mycroft Holmes by James Lawrenson. Constable Powell was played by Piers Weiner. Sir Charles Steele by Nigel Hastings, Mrs. Chang by Pick Sen Lim, Harold Jefferson by Joseph Cohen Cole, Mr. Jefferson by Bruce Alexander, 
Dr. Scanlon by John Biggins, Elizabeth by Tessa Nicholson, and The Postmaster by Bert Cools. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinists were Leonard Friedman and Ian Humphreys. The Malvern Point Mystery was written by Bert Cools from a reference in the short story The Veiled Lodger by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The director was Patrick Rayner. <laughs>